In response to requests representing millions of listening friends, the National Broadcasting Company is pleased indeed to bring you again The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Hello? Me, sweet... What number have I got? The Sam Spade Detective Agency, but... Oh, oh, well, me, sweetheart. Something's happened. Call me later, Dwight. Dwight, yet. Look. I didn't know you You were in town. You didn't write to me or... Effie, Eff. Eff? This is me in the flesh, Sammy the Spade. Oh, oh now what? Goodbye. Effie, I'm in a payphone. My nickel is running out. Oh, Dwight, how can you be so cruel and play jokes at a time like this? Wait, wait, listen. Ella, you listening? Yes. I am not dead. Don't believe everything you read in the papers. Huh? Or here on the radio. Yes. You were at my funeral. Is that what you were about to say? Yes. And it was lovely. Don't believe that either. Stay right where you are, sweetheart, because I'll be there, alive and handsomer than ever, with an account of a caper which proves you can kill some of the people part of the time. My exaggerated report on the death of Sam Spade. NBC welcomes back to the air a character who has captured the public imagination more completely than any other since the birth of Sherlock Holmes. William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Ain't it grand to be blooming well dead? Candles at my feet, candles at my head. we're not open for business today. I mean, Mr. Spade's office is closed right now because... because... I'll wait. I'll wait. Oh, you look just like Mr. Spade. What's your name? Spade. S-P-A-D-E. Spade. Sam never told me he had a twin brother. He doesn't. But then you... I'm me, Sam. Oh, no, you... Oh, wait. Come here. <laughs> now, do you believe me? Well, I, I don't know why. Oh, what's the use? <laughs> oh, oh, you're so much like him. Oh, never mind, never mind. Now, get your pencil and paper and take it. Date, November 17th, 1950. To Miss Effie Perry. That, that's me. From Samuel Spade. That's me. License number 137596. You must have been the last one to see him alive. Did he tell you to give me a message? Shut up. Subject, my death. Dear Effie, since the sight of me in the flesh, breathing, hungering, and living doesn't convince you, maybe this report will. Think, if you can, back to last Monday. Now, if you recall, it was about 11 o'clock. When on the flimsy pretense that we needed stamps for the office, you drew two dollars from petty cash and stepped out to buy a pair of step-ins. And that's when my client materialized. He was small and thin and carried with him the unmistakable odor of stale flowers. His black alpaca suit, string bow tie, elevator shoes, and white gloves had no bearing on his conversation. Oh, dear. My name is Chester Swan. Are you sure? Y- yes. Uh, my name is Spade. What can I do for you? How tall you? are you, Mr. Spade? Six feet in my feet. Wait. 178. I always notice a man's bone structure, don't you? Oh, always. Open. Do... Huh? Open. Let me see inside. Oh, oh. Uh, I guess? Mm-hmm. Uh, all right? Fine. Oh, well, now that you know me this well, Mr. Swan, what can I do for you? Oh, dear. Perhaps I... Perhaps I shouldn't have come here at all. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Spade. Well... Really? Oh, dear. Oh, hello again, Mr. Swan. You wanted to talk to me? Yes, but I I, I, I can't talk now. Uh, Mr. Spade. Still here. There. I, I live at 8516 Claremont in Berkeley. I'll be there tonight. Oh, dear. This time, as he made his exit, he left $50 on the edge of my desk. And so, stupid me, I was at 8516 Claremont at the close of the day. It was a small white cottage with green shutters and a white picket fence. There was a hill in back and a brook in front. The sun was beginning to set on it, and it was all very picturesque. In fact, so much so that a girl with red hair, blue jeans, purple smock, oils, and canvas was making it immortal. She liked me immediately. Here, hold this. Certainly. Like it? Oh, yeah. This is my first landscape. I'm a sprouting artist. Obvious. Makes your own? Not when I can get somebody to do it for me. Who are you? Oh, I might be a fellow artist. Don't do that. You're a liar. You're Sam Spade. I saw your picture in a newspaper clipping when I was helping Chester clean out his desk before he moved it. Mm, But I... You don't know an easel from a palace. Oh, but I could learn. I take it seriously. Well, then so do I. I doubt it. 
You've never tried to get away, to stand off, to throw off the shackles, have you? No, no, I'll have to admit that the urgency of living, the pressure of merely existing, has had a... Catfish, Sam. By the way, I'm Amy Goodrich. Catfish? The world is full of unhappy people who never try to get away from it all. Well, honestly... Stop it. But I wanted to, really. Honestly, Sam, get away from everything. Leave, dissolve. I've dreamed of it. Never return. Cross my heart. Mm -hmm. What are you doing here? To see Mr. Swan. He isn't home yet. His house is a wonderful subject. Look, Sam, colorful, moderate, pleasant. Mm -hmm. That is, until the sun stops shining. But picture it at night in the fog. Mm -hmm. Crushed with barrenness, full of death, brooding, ominous. I'm trying to capture that, too. It's what we've got to get away from, isn't it? Absolutely. You and I... Sam, as you start up the hill on Claremont, there's a green apartment house on the right. I'm in 420. Well, maybe we'll find a way out together. Maybe. I waved her a fond farewell and sat on the steps of my client's house until he showed up at 6.15. He took me inside where the only furniture was an army cot and a portable barbecue. I'm so glad you kept our appointment, Mrs. Spade. I'm so frightened. I've been upset all week long. I didn't know what to do. I just didn't. And what have you been so upset about, Mr. Swan? Well, lately, Mr. Spade, infrequently, for the last week, I've noticed a man. I think he's following me. Mm. Hmm? At first, I'd see him in a car following my bus when I went downtown. Mm -hmm. Then he'd be waiting around at the bus stop in the evening when I came back. Oh. I've sold my house, and I'm ready to move. It's unnerved me so much, but... Did he follow you home tonight? No, no, but well, I... Well, would I... anyone be following you, Mr. Swan? Well, I, I, I don't know, Mr. Spade. I don't know. I really don't. All right, I'll try another tack. What does this man look like? He always wears dark clothes and a hat. I'd say he was about your height. Six feet. I remember. Maybe heavier. Same bone structure, though. Yeah. You haven't been to the police. Oh, dear, no. A man in my business can't afford off-color publicity. No? What kind of business is that? The Bonton Mortuary. Oh. 25 years. Ooh. Same location. <laughs> oh, and I've worked hard. So very hard. <laughs> and if there's something behind all this, something that has stopped me from being made the executive secretary of the Undertaker's Breakfast Club when they hold their annual election next month, I don't know what I'll do, Mr. Spade. <laughs> I just don't really know what I'll do. I just don't. I... Oh, go ahead, Mr. Swan. You'll feel better. Just let it all out. Just really do. <laughs> and he did. When he stopped crying, I instructed him to go about his daily habits as always and left, assuring him I'd get to the bottom of it all. I walked down to the corner ostentatiously, which is a neat trick well calculated to throw nefarious observers off the track and lull them into false security. And when the bus showed up ten minutes later, I got on it, rode three blocks, walked back, and took a plant across the street. A clever ruse, as you see, to invite a showdown. Two hours later, a man about my size and dark clothes appeared over the hill and crept stealthily to the front of my client's cottage. He had his eyes glued to the window when I walked up behind him. Hey, let go, let go of me. Come on, you're going inside. Listen, I'm no peeping Tom. No, no, you're the bloodhound type. I'm inviting you in for a real sniff at oh, your Oh, no, party. you don't. I... Well, all right, then. I'll go quietly. Okay, that's better. Now we'll just walk on. The kick he landed on me wasn't according to Queensberry. I couldn't move for three or four minutes, and by that time he disappeared. When I recovered my faculties, I reported the incident to my client, who cried himself to sleep. After I bolted him in for the night, I stopped on my way down the hill at apartment 420 in the little green apartment house. She was still wearing the blue jeans and the purple smock, and she still had the same ideas. Come in, Sam. You said you were serious about getting away from it all, and a whole day has passed. It was that pressure of living... I'm, I'm here to apologize. Mm, you are not, but go ahead. I'm sorry, Angel. I love to be fooled, Sam. You're forgiven. Uh, how's the painting coming? The, the one of Swan's Cottage. Slow. Fog is always tough. Looks nice, though. How long you been on it? Three weeks, all told. Well, then you've had a pretty good plan on the house, haven't you? Ever notice a tall, broad-shouldered guy in a dark suit casing the place? Tall, broad-shouldered? Pretty much like me. Could anybody be pretty much like you, Sam? No, you're right. Sam, is there something wrong? No, no. Well, then don't stand there doing nothing. Do something. Who, me? Amy fixed me a small dinner which had a strong turpentine taste to it. And then we mixed oils and painted and made fudge. 
Next afternoon at the Hall of Records, I did a little spade work on Chester Swan. His application and permit to practice undertaking in the city of San Francisco were dated 1938. Details, unmarried, 52 years of age. Graduated from mortician school in Ohio. Listed one living relative, nephew, Theodore J. Swan, Toledo, Ohio. I was gathering the above information when I smelled whiskey over my shoulder, which is always good luck. It was Al Torrington, who was also in the private investigation racket in this city, and he was leaning, peering from my face to the card that I held in my hand. <laughs> uh, he yeah. get over to you too, Sam? Who got over to me, Al? Him, that thinny with the tears. What's his name? Um, uh, my eyes ain't so good. Swan, Al. Chester Swan. Mortician. Yeah, yeah, that's him, Sam. The same one exactly. Came to my office two weeks complaining about somebody following him. And he did... Nothing about it. Said I was too fat. Oh, well, you are, Al. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. And some other, the boy, said he was around there, too. Wanted a private eye, but he wanted a man who looked just right. How right? <laughs> Obviously as right as you are, Sam, because it looks like he picked you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, F, it did look like he picked me. And I thought that over, and I didn't like it. And I called my client at home to tell him he was fired, but he didn't give me a chance. Oh, dear, I'm so glad you called, Mr. Spade. I really am. I called for a reason, Mr. Swan. I'm resigning this case. Oh, dear, Mr. Spade, you can't do that. You really can't. I don't think you've been quite honest with me, Mr. Swan. Oh, oh dear. Tears I... will get you nowhere. I made a routine check on your reasons for hiring me, and they don't quite fit with the reasons you gave. Mm -hmm. They really just don't quite, Mr. Swan. It's no game, Mr. Spade. Believe me, he... He's back tonight. Right now, he's standing beneath the lamppost outside my window, and I'm frightened to death. Mm. Uh, please hurry over, Mr. Spade, and let's get this business straightened out. Please, please. And stupid, stupid me, I went over. And I found that little white cottage on the hill looking grim and gaunt in the heavy fog. Amy's words about it being crushed with barrenness, full of brooding and death, came back to me. And Mr. Swan's frightened words about a mysterious man in dark clothes waiting beneath the streetlight also came back to me, particularly when I noted there was no streetlight near the house. However, there was a light somewhere in the rear of the house, and the front door was ajar. Oh, Mr. Swan! Mr. Swan, are you here? Oh, Mr. Swan, it's me, Sam Spade. Are you here? Mr. Spade? Is that you? Are you out there? Where are you? Ah! I... Things happened fast. I turned around to find the front door filled with a man in a dark suit. He had something in his hand. It looked like a roll of cotton candy, but it felt different. It only staggered me against the wall, but it made me forget where my arms were. Easy, Spade. Easy does it, boy. Easy. He let me down to the floor gently. I could still see the lights somewhere in the back of the house, and I could hear him talking way off. Take off his coat. Quick, quick. Give me the needle. I, no, hurry. I, hurry. I can't watch. I, I'm going upstairs. The needle went somewhere in my left arm, but not before somebody pulled my coat off, and for no reason I could think of at the moment, also tried to pull my finger off. Well, I couldn't dwell on it. By that time, the stuff in my arm was going other places, and I was going with it, even though there was action all around me. This ought to do it! No, no, stay away from me! Get out of here! Vaguely, somewhere, somebody was shooting Roman candles or having blowouts or playing bebop. I just didn't care at all. I just didn't. The first thing I saw was sunlight. It was the kind you see in a picture. It was a picture of a little white cottage with green shutters. You guessed it. I was in Amy's apartment where we made fudge together. I got to my feet somehow. I knew the best thing to do with me. There was a fire escape and a window. I got out there and I weaved against the wall. What do you mean he's gone? He couldn't have gotten away with that load he was carrying. I don't know. I don't know. He was unconscious when I left. Well, don't just stand there. We've got to do something. There might be trouble. Now, let's get going. I didn't wait to find out what they were going to do. I made my way down the fire escape and started walking for the street. And, and that's when I noticed my shoes didn't fit me anymore. They weren't mine. And neither was the gray flannel suit with the label marked Tidkeys. And neither was the blue shirt. While I was at it, the ring on my finger engraved Emerson High 1936 wasn't mine either. My new belt buckle had a big letter T on it. 
which is not my initial. It really isn't. And I didn't have any use for the eyeglasses in my coat pocket either. You were out when I walked in the office, F, but you'd been there. There was a black crepe done up in a white satin ribbon hanging on the door. The desk blotter was drenched with salt tears. And a newspaper folded back to page 13, and I'll sue the Chronicle on this if it's the last thing I do, gave me a two-inch spread. Item, November 15th, 1950. Fifteen? What happened to the 13th and the 14th? Detective perishes in Berkeley fire. I read it through once. Then twice. It was my obituary. You are listening to the first in a new series of adventures involving radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Later tonight on most NBC stations, Duffy's Tavern comes your way with another merry half-hour session, starring Ed Gardner as Archie the manager. There's a full serving of laughs garnished with chuckles and whipped up by Archie and his unpredictable friends, Miss Duffy, Clifton Finnegan, and Eddie the waiter. It's just one of the many great Friday evening entertainment features on NBC. It's Duffy's Tavern, your cue for better listening where the three chimes always mean good times. Make it a Friday evening habit to tune early and stay late at your favorite NBC station. And now back to Caper Over My Dead Body, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I left the crepe on the door and went out to buy a new desk blotter and some more newspapers. The Hobo News had the best story, which wasn't much. Samuel Spade, licensed private investigator, perished Wednesday night in a fire in a vacant house in Berkeley. His warm friends will feel regret at the passing of a man who was always kind to the poor. None of us ever asked Sam Spade for a handout without receiving a kind word and bon mot as he turned us down. This was nice, but I wanted more figured I was fairly safe to wander about unrecognized. My ill-fitting attire acquired from my unknown benefactor would be disguise enough when combined with my two-day beard. Engine Company 16, Berkeley Division, had handled the fire, and half a block away was a grog shop called the Shamrock. I waited for a fireman to come in. Bartender. Bartender! What kind of a place are you running now? I've been here five minutes already. All right, shut up, Patty. You just arrived. Well, it seemed like five minutes. A, a, a wee bit more than if you uh, don't mind. That's enough for you, Patty. You're still on duty. I am not. I'm off now. The chief said I could be off. It ain't every day I receive such a shock to me system. You received your shock three days ago. And I'm still shaking, man. <coughs> oh, the sight of him was terrible, terrible. Burnt as black as the good saint's beard. All twisted and horrible in death. He was probably dead drunk and didn't know what happened to him. And were you there fighting the flames and finding him like me? Hmm? Oh, it was terrible, terrible, terrible. <sighs> terrible. It wasn't that bad and you've had your limit. And who says so? I say so. Oh, you do, do you? And who are you? Your brother-in-law. Well, now. Well, maybe I can spot you one, Pat. I never drink with strangers. What's your name? Uh, old Doolin. Well, you heard the man. Go ahead, pour. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. <coughs> uh, fireman, you had a terrible experience three days oh, ago. Oh, that I did, Mr. O'Doolan. That I did indeed, that I did. I've heard it a dozen times. I'll be at the other it was end three of the nights bar. ago, Mr. O'Doolan, and we get a call to the house on Claremont is a fire. Well, sir, when we get there, it's about all gone. Can't understand why it went flames so fast. Wood. It was the funeral pyre of a man who lived in sin. Huh? A detective fellow. Sam Spade, he was identified as. Ooh. Oh, one moment, fireman. I've heard fine things about him. Ah, some of those uppity police fellows from the Division of Homicide said he was a nice fellow. But some of the boys at the fire station and myself, well, we got our own ideas about that. Oh, what kind of ideas, Patty, me boy? What kind of good can any man be accomplishing in an empty house late at night, I ask you, Mr. O'Doolan? Mm-hmm. Oh, he was done to attorney was when I burst in the door with me axe. Save Satan the trouble. 
charge. Empty whiskey bottles scattered all about. Sin, O'Dolan, sin. He'd gone to sleep with a smoking cigarette that set the whole place off. Vice rampant. <laughs> From there, I went downtown to a telegraph office where I sent a wire to Toledo on a long chance. And while I was waiting for an answer on a not-so-long chance, I slunk into the Bon Ton funeral parlor to pay my respects to the departed. I stood in the back of that dimly lit chapel and scanned the scene. Three of the boys from Homicide were there, blowing their noses. Two chorus girls I thought had long since forgotten me were there in black deep v-necks. My insurance man was there looking awful worried. One chronicle reporter with photographer and a shoeshine boy from our building and the bailiff from the courthouse, just to mention a few I could make out. And you were there, Effie, up front near a closed casket. I made out a bar of flowers from robbery detail. It said, goodbye, Sam. Maxie from the city morgue was the only one who looked at ease. All right. Does anyone wish to, uh, you, miss? Many called him shaman. But I called him friend. Uh. On this, his last caper. <laughs> I was touched, Effie, and I would have stopped the whole thing then and there, but I had to find out who was in that casket. I reeled out the front door with tears in my eyes and slid around to the back door and into Chester Swan's private office. And there I made a phone call and got an answer to my telegram, which caused me to make another call to his bank. By that time, most of it was right in place. A search through his desk revealed nothing and a safe standing in the corner the same. But then my answer walked right in the door. Oh, Sam, darling, I was so worried when I found you'd left that I saw you at the funeral and I thought you'd be here. And the guy was with you? Was he worried, too? Oh, him, him. That was Dr. Jesslin. Sam, you'd been out for two days and I didn't... Oh, Sam, you're safe. You got away from it all. You've escaped, darling. Yeah, yeah, they're burying me right now. I'm dead. It's so wonderful, Sam. Only one thing. Where do you fit? Hmm? The caper. I was supposed to burn up in that fire, and what was left was supposed to look enough like Theodore J. Swan, class of 1936 Toledo, Ohio, to let beneficiary Chester Swan collect a nice pile of insurance money. Sam, what are you talking about? Who, who's Theodore J.? What did you say? Chester's only living relative. They're burying him right now. Somebody lost his caper. You want to tell me? Darling, I, I was at the house the night of the fire, working on my foggy picture. You didn't see me when you went in, and later on you didn't come out. And I went over... And I was on the floor, and a man was bending over me. He changed clothes with you, Sam, and I screamed, and he pulled out a gun, and I hit him with a hoe. And I drug you out on the lawn. And then what happened? I put, put you in my car and took you home. I, I was going to phone the police, but I decided it was something you were working on, and I went back to the house, and it... And it, it was burning, and you knew the man you'd hit on the head was in there. Believe me, Sam, I didn't know the house was going to burn down. I wouldn't kill anybody, Sam. I only wanted to... You help. only wanted to help me, and you did right, Angel. Oh, Sam. That's all right. I'm your witness. You didn't start the fire. You mean somebody really started it? Chester. He thought it was me lying on the floor in there. The bank tells me he's about to go busted. He figured this one out with his nephew to scare up some insurance, though. I'm about the same Hold size. Hold me, and... Sam. Hold me. It's been horrible. This is the kind of thing I was trying to paint. Now I'm smack dab up against it and I'm sick. I'm scared. Easy, easy. Sam, you're really dead. There's our way out, Sam. Just leave oh. now. Let it go the way it is. They all think you're dead. Oh, dear. Huh? But we know different, don't we, Mr. Spade? He was holding a Navy Colt revolver in front of him with both hands. I couldn't make up my mind to rush him and count on his bad aim or stand still and be a perfect target while I tried to talk him out of it. Either way, he was a crazy man with a gun. He was getting ready to use it. Sam, he's going to kill us. Mr. Quiet, Spade. Amy. Because my nephew was stupid enough to wear your watch and your suit when he exchanged clothes with you, I'm going to lose the bonton. And that puts you in quite a spot, doesn't it, Mr. Swan? Until a moment ago, yes, but now. Mr. Spade, the newspapers all say you're dead. A death certificate says the same thing. All of your friends are following your casket and my nephew's corpse to the cemetery at this very moment. Everybody expects you to be dead, Mr. Spade. Thanks to you, Mr. Swan. But now... 
<laughs> Nobody would miss you if, if I killed you. <laughs> I'd miss you, Sam. But I'd have to kill you, too. Oh. Did you notice you're still wearing Theodore's clothes, even his ring? Why, Mr. Spade, I, I could kill you and put you in a fire somewhere and collect my insurance on Theodore now, couldn't I? No. Why, that's a terrible thing to think. Huh? Oh, you're not reasoning properly, Chester. You really aren't. How would you explain Amy? You just said you'd have to kill her. And what about the coroner's office? You know how they are. But if I... But yeah, really... don't forget the medical examiner's got something to say, too. Not to mention but... the fact that you'd have to really burn me up to cover up the bullet hole. I... And furthermore, Chester, when you shoot me, oh. if you happen to hit a rib and chip off some bone, they'd no. know I was shot before, and then homicide would be in on it. Oh, no, stop, then... stop, stop. Nothing works for me. I'm a failure. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Swan. Let it all out. You'll feel better. <laughs> And he did. And he's still crying in his cell downtown. Period. End of report. Oh, Sam, you were so brave. You actually stood there and talked that crazy man out of, out of murdering you. You were wonderful. True, Effie. Amy thinks so, too. She's uh, going to do me in oils when they let her out of the pokey. Amy's in jail? What for, Sam? Oh, technical charge of an involuntary manslaughter. They'll spring her as soon as the coroner's inquest is completed. Dear Amy. Did she make good fudge, Sam? Fudge? Oh, that was the least of it. Oh? What do you mean? After the fudge. What then? Panucci. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Say, go type that up, sweetheart, while I see if there's any mention of my miraculous resuscitation on the radio page. <laughs> go, go. Scoot, scoot. There certainly is a mention of Sam Spade on the radio page for Friday. Sam Spade is one more in the list of great shows to join up in NBC's Parade of the Stars. Have you heard The Big Show? This Sunday, The Big Show comes your way once again on NBC. Listen to just a few of the star names who will be appearing this week. Bob Hope, Jimmy Durante, Perry Como, Jose Ferrer, Mindy Carson, Eddie Cantor, Meredith Wilson and his orchestra, and many, many more. And, of course, your MC once again will be the lady who invented the snappy retort, Tallulah Bankhead. Yes, it's The Big Show. It's big in music, big in drama, and big in comedy. Be sure to hear The Big Show Sunday. Well, here it is, Sam. All typed up. Good. I will sign it, and you will keep it always, to remind you that I'm still here. Oh, Sam. Living, breathing, brave, and handsome. A paragon. Mm. Sam, what will we do about the mail? The mail? What mail? Where? Which... All the letters and postcards and telegrams and all that came in when people thought you... Oh, where were we? You weren't good. When they thought you were... Oh, there have been enough tears tonight, Ellie. Oh, Sam, it's so good to have you back. Will you be the same as you always were? Well, I'm going to try it. Well, because then you can't help but be, like they say, the greatest private detective of them all. We'll see. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by E. Jack Newman. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Frank Worth. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Hear the magnificent Montague, then visit Duffy's Tavern on NBC. Personal notice, dangers my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. For just a second, I'll be right with you. Now, let me see. Uh, whispering... West, whistle, wet, white, white. Oh, here it is. White arsenic, white bait, 
white clover, white cloud that cried, white elephant. Ah, oh, that's it, white elephant. White elephant, a term in common use to designate a gift that causes the recipient more trouble than it is worth. Well, Webster was right, because that's exactly what happens to George Valentine in our Let George Do It adventure. Oh, maybe I should add that it's called the White Elephant. But you'd have guessed anyway, wouldn't you? You sly boots. My dear Mr. Valentine, I don't write letters very often these days. Having friends with whom one exchanges the best of one's mind and heart has rather gone out of fashion. To exchange anything less is death already. Now, you mustn't misunderstand, Mr. Valentine... My brother and I have enjoyed our life of seclusion. After all, we've lived this way almost entirely, ever since our dear parents died in a train accident and left us alone at the age of ten. I only speak a little sadly because, as every person must, I've been going through the unpleasant task of making out a will, and I think you should be informed of the fact that I'm including you in my will. Yes, Mr. Valentine, I'm leaving you the sum of one thousand dollars. You will receive this legacy when you have caught my murderer. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. When? Miss Alice May Edmund, number one Bartholomew Square. Oh, that's the commercial district. And on the letterhead, there's an engraving of a white elephant. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Excuse me. No, no, I was just going to ring the bell. Is this number one Bartholomew? Go Square? away, no peddlers or agents allowed, no soliciting. Oh, but no... we're not peddlers. I'm saving you trouble, that's all. You'll only have an iron deer thrown at you. That isn't a house. It's a booby hatch. A 42 okay, room booby Fred, hatch. Okay, thanks very much. Goodbye. All right, go on in. But me, I'll still go out. Keeper of the white elephant barker for the train seals. I'm warning you, someday I'm going to kill that woman in there. Well, yeah. what do you suppose is the matter with him? Hey, look, Angel, three stories high. Gardens. Hey, you can't even hear the street in here. It's right in the middle of the city. Yeah, a whole block of a house. Old-fashioned gigaws on the wood. It's white, George. Painted white. Huh? Guess this is it, Booksy. The white elephant. Milk, Mr. Valentine, should only be drunk at a certain temperature of warmth. Oh. My brother Stephen taught me that. We much prefer it to tea in the afternoons, but naturally, if you would like a cinnamon wafer or... Oh, we don't care for anything, thanks, Miss Edmund. It's tea time. You'll have something. You'll join me. Jensen? All right, Miss. I'll... Look, Miss Edmund, In the we... first place, this house. And I do wish you wouldn't stare about so. The oh. animacasses are quite clean, young lady, and I crocheted them myself. Well, I, I didn't mean... It I... has 42 rooms. Yes, 42. Though I'll grant you I've closed off a number of them. But even with the ones that aren't, it's large, it's quite large, and I like it that way. It's old-fashioned, it's gracious, and it absolutely is not a white elephant. Well, an anachronism, maybe, in the middle of the town like Because this. the white elephant, I am afraid, is me. Huh? Yes, on my stationery, the little white figure. It's the only way I have to, to get back at my family, to show them I know what they think of me. Your family? Oh, I know I have none, just my brother and me all alone in the world. He's such a wonderful person. There aren't any gentlemen like him anymore. But we're wealthy, don't you see? Anybody who's wealthy has a family, Mr. Valentine. That man you bumped into on the way in here, that Clarence Morley, only a second cousin, but he calls me Aunt Alice. He kisses my hand. He simpers all over himself trying to get into this house. 
And as for a cousin, you... All right, Miss Edmonds, so much for your family. What I want to know about is your murder. Last week, someone tampered with the wiring, apparently, so that I was very nearly electrocuted. But didn't you call the police? Mr. Valentine, it's probably incomprehensible to a person as young as you, but I didn't do anything. I wasn't even sure, and I... I... I don't particularly care. If I die. No, 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 please. Please, why should I? I've outlived my time. In many ways, I seem so indestructible. It would be rather a relief to be murdered. Here's the tea stuff, miss. I told you I'm not much in the kitchen. That's the only service I could... All have. right, Jensen, all right. Now get out of here. Get back to your cottage. Go on. Uh, gladly, me. Do you know something? The family I spoke of, they made me take him. But I generally won't let him in the house. For 20 years, Miss Brooks, I've done every bit of housework in this place myself. Yes, yes. All by myself. You uh, are... Miss Edmund, a second ago you were saying... Excuse me. Stop that, will you? For heaven's sake, stop that thing and go on, get out of my house. I'll turn it down. Take it easy, Alice. Yeah, that's good enough, isn't it? Oh, it's you. <laughs> Volume control. Unusual in the gramophone. Wouldn't bring more than fifty dollars, though, I don't believe. Curio, maybe. <laughs> Mr. Valentine, this is Yule, I think I spoke of him. Yeah. Another one of my cousins. A dear, dear relative. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. Mother's side was third cousin. And get your hand off that sheriffin. Oh, this chair? <laughs> oh, no, 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 dear. Late 19th century imitation. It is not. He is so kind, Mr. Valentine. He buys and sells for me. Oh, could be mistaken. There's a real one in the library. An antique dealer, wouldn't you know from the beard? Now, Alice. I don't want to talk business today. I don't want to. Well, I only hung around from the meeting to look at some things. Get out, will you? Please, get out, please. All right, all right. <laughs> but you don't look well, Alice. You ought to let us come visit more often. Uh, what was the meeting he spoke of, Miss Edmund? I said, what was the... He was playing Molly Brannigan again. It's a song a girl used to sing. A red-headed Irish servant girl. She went back to the old country 20 years ago. Oh. She was like a breath of sunshine. Miss Edmund, what are you trying to say? My brother and I have always been alone here since we were 10. Mr. Valentine, I am peculiar, you know. The meeting? Oh, it was the relatives, that's all. I try to act like a heroine is supposed to. But I'm terrified of them. Oh. What's the matter with you, Miss Edmund? Oh, I'm all right. They want me to get out of the house. I don't really have any money. It's all in the house. It's valuable property. But it's mine, and I want to stay here. I don't know why I'm rambling, so I... They want to make me get out. But how can they? Oh. Miss Edmund, this brother you talk about, this Stephen, can't he help? Stephen's so kind. He, he won't let anything. He won't let... Miss her. Edmund. Oh. Miss Edmund! Hey, Brooks. Ah! This glass, Brooksy, the milk. It's the milk she drank right in front of us. Somebody was trying to murder her, Brooksy. It was poisoned. Now, take it easy, Mr. Valentine. I said we can't tell yet. She's all right. She's alive. And from my experience with her in the past, she has a constitution... It was strychnine, wasn't it, Doctor? And from the smell of that milk there... Undoubtedly an overdose. But I've treated her with it in the past. You what? It's a legitimate remedy for certain conditions, you know. It was kept in the cupboard down by the butler's pantry. Okay, I'll take a look. Have you called the police? No, and I don't intend to. What? Not yet. Now, please, listen to me. I've known and admired Miss Edmund for a very long time. That bravado of hers is all front, you understand. She's a, a very shy person. Well, what's that got to if do with... If she it? should live, Miss Brooks, she'd probably call off the investigation herself rather than risk invasion of her privacy in the house here. No. 
No, it has to be done from the inside. By you, Mr. Valentine. And suppose she dies, Doctor? Well, you've met the people who would benefit, Morley and Cousin Ewell. If one of them should conceivably be a murderer, he'd have only accomplished what they're all trying to do anyway. Get her out of this house. So you don't think they testify against each other, do you? But why do they I want... I get it, I get it. This property's worth a fortune, isn't it? Precisely. The white elephant. Every day that she lives, she has to borrow against taxes. So they have to get her out. Or in a few years, there won't be any fortune left for them to inherit. Yeah, here's the bottle, all right, Angel. Stricken. Somebody certainly had a choice. Sleeping powders, all of the medicines right here by the... Hey, wait a minute, look at this. Hmm? The ring on the counter, see, for moisture from the glass. Well, Jensen says he poured the milk and then left it for her. Uh-huh. So anybody who happened to come in right then, golden opportunity. Just spike a drink what a little What is and... all this you're talking about, young man? You. I thought you left the house, went out. Oh, I saw the doctor's car, came back. What's the matter with her? Well, he'd better tell you. But you can tell me something. Mm-hmm. Where's Miss Edmund's brother? She confused me on that. Stephen? She... Her brother, Stephen? <laughs> that brother of hers has been dead for 20 years. Dead for... Valentine, come here. Well, oh, doctor, is she... No, no, she's alive. She's going to be all right. But perhaps you had better call the police. What do you mean, doctor? I thought it would be so simple to track down just one person. That's why she's alive. A barbiturate acts against Strickland, you see. A barb... What in the name you of... You saw that stuff there in the cabinet. Sleeping powders. I'm trying to tell you why she's all right. It was in the milk, too. Agent and reagent. Poison and antidote. Yes. Yes, believe it or not, the poor little white elephant is still with us because two people tried to poison her. Two people tried to murder her. Listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now, back to George Valentine. Poison and antidote, and a little old lady who didn't particularly care whether she was killed or not, whose only desire was to be left alone in her strange, old-fashioned house. At first you wondered what reason there was for her fears, but now you know the only reason she's alive is because not one but two people tried to poison her. Two negatives make a positive, and the poisons were such that they canceled each other out. Well, if your name is George Valentine, all you know is that now you have to work twice as fast. Miss Edmund, did you see anybody touch that warm milk of yours today? Oh, I forget. I don't know. It's so much more real 20 years ago. <sighs> like that brother you keep talking about, I suppose? We took care of each other. We weren't like the rest of the world. The scramble, the suffering that people call excitement. I talked about Stephen as though he were alive, didn't I? Miss Edmund, perhaps we'd better... And about her, too, the Irish servant girl. Because she was the last happy thing in this house. Please listen to me. I still don't see what you're driving at. She would have fitted in so beautifully. She was young, too, only 19. So much younger, but it didn't make any difference. So full of life. Cousin Ewell knows. He knew him. Miss now, Edmund. let it go on, Brooksy. But Stephen was in love. I hated her afterwards, but now I don't. Wherever she is, she's probably never even guessed. There was a boy in the old country. She showed me the cablegram. I helped put her aboard ship that same afternoon. I begged her to stay, but she left to be married. Not thinking, just happy. My brother came here, home, and went out. 
and I never saw him again. Well, you've heard her. You've seen how she acts. That wasn't what I asked you, Mr. Morley. But what's the sensible thing? You don't just stand by and watch anybody throw money away. And there's a first mortgage already in. Who'd benefit, Mr. Morley, if she had died an hour ago? Well, I would, for one. I don't mind telling you. The police will want to hear that, too. Now, see here. They're already running tests on the poison in the glass. Well, I didn't touch it. I was on the telephone at the time. Business downtown, five or ten minutes. My office will verify the that... telephone in the hall, Mr. Morley? Yes, crazy old fangled contraption. It's the only one in this The door room. to the butler's pantry was open, George. And if you were standing in there at the telephone, Yeah, that's you... right, Brooksy. Glass would have been right in plain sight, wouldn't it? Well, I didn't notice. I didn't even see it. Why did that stupid Jensen leave it there in the first place? Stupid he... Jensen, my friend, is a servant that you hired for her. Huh. Well, who else would stay here except a thick-skinned old coot like him? Mr. Valentine, she's been getting worse, fussy, picky, and this preoccupation with her brother. We know all about that, Mr. Morley. We also know what her own doctor thinks about her. He's a fool, too. An old admirer of Alice's. Valentine, what would you think if you came in and found her prowling among her brother's old things? Of course it was a tragedy for her. But now, 20 years later, to find that she's reopened that room of his, nosing around and mooning over the old things. Is that what happened to you? Yes. Just yesterday. She was trying to pretend that she hadn't seen. Just cleaning, she said. Get out, she said. Leave me alone. Do you think that a normal person I don't acts know. like... I don't know, Mr. Morley. But why don't you tell me how she acted today at that family meeting? The meeting? Yeah. Well, you saw my reaction. She said she wouldn't ever leave this house. Not ever. And no court order could make her. And for us to stop bothering her. Or she'd make us stop. The stubbornness. Just insane. Just insane. Insane, my friend? No, I finally realize little Miss Edmund has been pointing in the right direction after all. That brother Stephen, dead 20 years. Yeah, that's how we solve it. George, this was the maid's room. Yeah, sure, Brooksy. And it's been closed all this time, too, hasn't it? And Stephen was in love with her. Uh, look at that. The old style maid's sitting room for a little red-headed Irish girl. Not very big, is it? Wait a minute. I'll get the lights. There we are. Look at the dust and the cobwebs. George, look. On the mirror. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> she collected things, all right. True to type. Paper flowers, dance program, carnival doll. And the snapshot. Huh? Don't you recognize him? What do you mean? Without that stomach and antique dealer's mustache. It's cousin you. Oh, yeah. A day at the beach. We knew she was the sunshine girl. <laughs> Probably played the field. Say, isn't there anything from Stephen? George, you see this. The tea was just perfect, and I reward you with a rose. Won't you join my sister and me for some phonograph records in the parlor this evening? What in the name? Notes from Stephen. George, she saved them. There's nothing to give us even a hint about his death. Isn't there? Wait a minute, Brooksy. Listen to this one. Today I told Alice May we should leave this house. It is gloomy. If you would only say yes to me, there is nowhere on earth we couldn't go in with blessing. You have shown us what sunshine can be. Well, if she'd accepted him... But I certainly can't blame her. I'd have run to a fuddy-duddy no, like no, that. that's not what I meant, Brooksy. Stephen offered to leave this house. Don't you see what... Mr. Valentine! Listen, Miss Edmund. Yeah, but where is she? What... George, she must be up at the head of the stairs there, from her room. These lights, you can't Mr. see... Mr. Valentine! Where are you? Mr. Valentine! Ah! There had already been two attempts on this lady's life, and now a third. It was a police matter in the first place, Valentine. Take it easy, Riley. Please, take it easy. Hello, Doctor. Oh, it's about time you got here. I came as quickly as I could. Didn't even know where the maid's quarters were. Here, I'll take her. Oh, I was... I was... I, I, I'm all right. I was uh, all... Now, uh, now what happened, Miss Edmund? 
You ran out to the head of the stairs. You called Valentine. All right. Sure, sure, you're all right. Just lie still. Look, Valentine, I said I'm taking over. Earlier today, any one of these guys could have got at that milk. What did you say, Riley? I said any one of them. The milk sat there for a good half hour. Any one of them wouldn't have used two poisons, Lieutenant. Huh? That counteracted each other. Well, no, I grant you, oh, but... Wait a minute, uh, wait a minute. Uh, Morley and Yule, uh, why don't you go in the other room? You too, Doctor. Miss Brooks can take care of her all right. Well, that's a good idea, Valentine. Sergeant, keep your eye on Mr. Valentine, I'm trying to remember. I was frightened. I was at the head of the stairs. No, no, wait, please, Miss Edmund. Uh, Riley, what did you find out, the, the records on Stephen's death, huh? Well, he committed suicide. Shot himself. Went out to a public place, got drunk, just like ordinary people. Yeah. He had been jilted by a red-headed girl half his age who went away and left him. But he couldn't just cry in his beer. He pulled out a gun, shot himself in front of witnesses. They don't have people like him anymore. <laughs> yes, yes, I told you what it was, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> Didn't I? Uh-huh. We thought your brother's death might have had something to do with all this today, but... Well, I guess we were wrong. No, it's simpler than you think, Angel. Miss Edmund, you waited to drink the milk until I got here. I what, George? Brooksy, you just said no one person would give two poisons that worked against each other made someone just a little sick. Well, Miss Edmund is one person who would. Yeah? What is all this? What the name of... What and she's you... taken the medicines long enough. She would have known how they'd act. The doctor could have told her. So, Miss Edmund, you wanted me out here to see it all, didn't you? Because that family out there was going to get you out of this house, and you'd sworn you'd stop them. Well, that was your idea of how to do it, wasn't it? But that is... Look, what... Miss Edmund, you're, uh, you're quite fussy. You're, you're meticulous. That glass of milk of yours sat handy on the counter after Jensen prepared it for half an hour. Now, the first words you said to me today were, milk should always be drunk at a certain temperature of warmth. Warm milk. Well, in half an hour, it would have been cold. So why didn't you say something? Why did you drink it without noticing? Unless you were the one who doctored it yourself. What if I did? What if I did? It's my house. Why shouldn't I fight for it? It's mine, not theirs. I can go bankrupt if I want to. So, so that's all it was, huh? Tempest in a teapot. <laughs> I'm sorry, you poor thing. If it meant so much to you not to leave this place... Yeah, yeah, Riley. We thought the key to the whole thing was her brother. And I wish I didn't have to say that maybe it is. What are you talking about, George? Hmm? Brooksy, we'd left the door to this room open. She could see us from the head of the stairs. And I suppose she called out in terror and fainted and fell. Valentine, I I don't get it. She wasn't pushed, Riley. It was terror at seeing us in this room. Yes, Miss Edwin. It's an old-fashioned maid sitting room, Riley. Now, it's only a guess. It's all it can be. But I can think of a way this would all tie together. And all for her brother. What's through there, Miss Edwin? Bedroom? Okay, it's a closed-off place. And why Miss Edmund wouldn't leave this house, maybe? Why she couldn't? The memories that held her. The memories of herself. Of things she'd done 20 years ago. Okay, let's see what's behind this curtain. Good Lord. Red. Red hair. White apron. Oh, yeah. 20 years. It's the Irish servant girl. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Oh, George. I know, Brooksy, I know. 
But when people become hermits like that, there's generally a reason. She was the only one who ever told anybody she'd put the girl on the boat. Uh Uh-huh. Including the guy she did it for, I suppose. Only when she told him it didn't do any good. He killed himself. She did it and still lost her brother. She had to stay on and on in this house. This prison of her own making. Mm. Miss Alice May Edmund. All kinds of loves, I guess, Brooksy. All kinds of people. The white elephant? There's an understatement. You have just heard The White Elephant, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happened when you let George do it. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time for that weekly visit with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Ah, oh, there you are, Mr. Bell. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Well, have you quite recovered from your holiday festivities? I think so, my boy. And I was particularly flattered by the number of friends who were kind enough to remember a rather elderly and lonely doctor at this time of year. Well, as long as you keep telling those swell Sherlock Holmes stories, you'll never be lonely, Dr. Watson. Then I'd better get on with tonight's new adventure. <laughs> It involved us in one of the most shocking scandals of the 19th century. A scandal that, had it ever emerged in the light of day, might easily have brought ruin and disgrace to one of the most famous men who ever came a member of the House of Lords. This one I've got to hear. But first I have a message for our listeners. Today, more than ever before, I think men realize how important it is to keep their hair neatly groomed. And men, may I ask you this about the preparation you use? Does it give your hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look? When you run your hand back over your hair, does your hair feel greasy, sticky, or dirty? Does grease come off on your hand or hat band? If it does, then be smart, men. Change at once to Kremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why Kremel keeps your hair in place longer with such a handsome, well-groomed look. When you use Kremel, you can run your hand back over your hair, and, men, it's really a pleasure. No grease comes off on your hand. And I'm sure you'll enjoy the way Kremel always looks and feels so clean on your hair and scalp. Let it keep your hair looking handsome at all times. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson... How about the 19th century scandal in which you and the great Sherlock Holmes became involved? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure began in the very early days of the great man's career. World acclaim and handsome fees were some years ahead of him. And in those times, we spent many long evenings discussing whether a decent living could be obtained by the practice of criminal detection. On the day that this particular story began, we just finished our breakfast. Holmes... A curved pipe clenched between his teeth was scanning the personal columns of the morning paper. I can almost hear him now, as he said... Dear me, Watson, the agony column of the Times is more than usually barren this morning. Are you looking for a possible client, Holmes? Naturally. 
Since we already owe Mrs. Hudson for two months' rent here, and our doorbell has been frighteningly silent during that period, I must see what possible service I might render these unhappy correspondents. Well, I glanced over the column, but I couldn't see anything very promising. No, Watson, it's a rag bag of bizarre happenings. What a chorus of groans, cries, and bleatings. One skims through them, and what does one glean? Lady with a black bow at the Prince's Skating Club wishes to meet gentleman who was kind enough to... That we may ignore, I think. Yes, she doesn't sound as though she needs your services. Well, here's mine. a item. <laughs> Surely Jimmy will not break his mother's heart. Hmm. That appears to be irrelevant. If the lady who fainted on the top deck of the Brixton bus... She doesn't interest me either, Watson. No, probably anyone else who wasn't on that bus. Every day my heart longs for... Ah, bleat, Watson. All this twaddle is unmitigated bleat. Very disheartening, Holmes. You haven't had a case for over two weeks. Yes. Sometimes I think I chose the wrong profession. What do the public, the great unobservant public, who can hardly tell a weaver by his tooth or a compositor by his left thumb, care about the finer shades of analysis and deduction? As to my own little practice, it seems to be degenerating into an agency for recovering lost lead pencils and giving advice to young ladies from boarding schools. Holmes, come over here to the window. What's wrong, Watson? Uh, look at that man walking down the street. He's looking at the numbers of the houses. Let's hope 221B is the number he's searching for. What do you make of him, Watson? Well, let's see. What do I make of him? Well, I would say that he is a foreigner. Uh, yes, foreigner. Look at those flashy clothes and his pointed moustache. Oh, don't be misled by externals, old chap. Observe the steady, controlled gait. No trace of the light agility of the Latins or the military heaviness of the German. No, Watson. I think an English gate in foreign attire would suggest an expatriate Englishman, only just returned from a stay abroad. He is coming here, Holmes. Meet him on the stairs, Watson. It'll save Mrs. Hudson a trip. Yes, so that you are. It's all right, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, how do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, would you please come along up? That's right, sir. Straight up here. Uh, in, in here. Which of your fellows is Sherlock Holmes? I am, sir. And your name is... Uh... Tremaine. Reginald Tremaine. I'm Dr. Watson. Uh, sit down, won't you, Mr. Tremaine? My business won't take long. Holmes, I need protection, and I'm prepared to pay for it. Protection from what? My life's been threatened. The police wouldn't do a thing for me, so I've come to you. I'm told you detective fellows will do anything for money. Oh, really? Then you've been misinformed, sir. My friend... Your here, friend well... is very interested in Mr. Tremaine's problem, Watson. Mm -hmm. Pray continue, sir. Holmes, I want you to warn my cousin. Tell him you'll get nowhere by threatening me. Frighten the wits out of him if you can. I'll give you 20 pounds uh, and another 20 if I need you again. And uh, who is your threatening cousin? Lord Darlington. Oh, really? Charming fellow. I He's a him... scoundrel. Oh, but his title impressed Scotland Yard. That's why they wouldn't help me. Well, even a title can be vulnerable. A public scandal would shake him. And that's what is going to happen if he threatens me any more. And you can tell him so from me, Holmes. I've always heard of Lord Darlington as the very model of an English aristocrat. Why should he threaten you, Mr. Tremaine? That's none of your business. Oh, my soul, none of your, your job is to see that he doesn't carry out his threat of thrashing me with an inch of my life. Very well. For 20 pounds, I shall warn Lord Darlington that I stand between you and a thrashing. The fee will be paid in advance, please. I have it in this envelope here. And I expect immediate action, Holmes. You shall have it, Mr. Tremaine. Holmes, the man's insufferable. Why'd you take on the case? He's a bounder. Let him get thrashed. These four crisp five-pound notes persuade me otherwise, Watson. We owe money to Mrs. Hudson, and your medical practice shows little signs of picking up. I must take what fees I can. Oh, how can my practice pick up when I spend half my time chasing all over the country with you? In any case, Watson... Ask yourself why such a man as Lord Darlington should threaten Tremaine with physical violence. Obviously, only because Tremaine is himself in some way a threat to Lord Darlington. There may be yet another fee in this case, and a much fatter one. You're going to see Lord Darlington at once? Yes. I'd ask you to come with me, old chap, but after your remark about chasing all over the country, I hesitate to waste your time. Rubbish. I was only joking, and you know it, you silly fellow. Of course I'm going with you, Holmes. Get your coat and hat. The game's afoot. T. 
Ten thousand pounds, my dear cousin, or the scandal will be spread all over London. It's preposterous, Reginald. And I warn you that if you continue in this vein, you'll get that thrashing, I promise. Oh, no, I won't. I've engaged a detective fellow by the name of Sherlock Holmes. He's going to act as a bodyguard. So you'd better not try any tricks. He should be here at any moment. How dare you bring a stranger into this mess? How dare you? <laughs> That's right, my dear cousin. Bolster up your courage with the brandy bottle. Oh, be quiet, Reginald. It'll cost you £10,000 to keep me quiet. I won't pay it. The scandal will make pretty readings in the newspapers. Before we go any further, Reginald, I insist on one thing. I shall bring Lady Darlington to her, and you must make this shocking accusation to her face. I shall be delighted to. Yes, Jenkins, what is it? Excuse me, Your Lordship, but there's a Mr. Sherlock Holmes and a Dr. Watson to see you. I told them that you were engaged, but they seem most insistent. Better have them come in, my dear cousin. We may need independent witnesses. Oh, very well. Show the gentleman in, Jenkins. Yes, Your Lordship. And then if you'll ask Lady Darlington to come here, I'll be very glad to make my accusation in public. It's blackmail, Reginald. That's what it is. You'll never get away with it. <laughs> Won't I? I think you'll be surprised. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Allow me to introduce my cousin, gentlemen, Lord Darlington. How do you do? How do, you do? Uh, Jenkins? Yes, Your Lordship. Ask Lady Darlington to step in here for a moment. Yes, Your Lordship. Lord Darlington... I greatly admired your speech in the House of Lords on tax reform. I only wish we had met under different circumstances. As it is, it is my duty oh, to reform... Oh, that's all right, Holmes. I've already told my dear cousin that I'd engaged your services. I want you both here as witnesses. Witnesses? To what? Reginald has made a shocking accusation. As soon as my wife comes here, I'm going to insist that he repeat the statement to her face. Now, oh, there you are, Clara. Well, I'll just put Gordon to sleep, dear. Hello, Reginald. How are you, Clara? My dear, I want to introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? But do sit down, won't you? Oh, thank you. Albert, what's wrong? You all look so dreadfully serious. Clara, my dear, Reginald has made a shocking accusation. It concerns you, and I insisted that he repeat it in your presence. An accusation against me? Yes, Clara, my dear. You see, I'm requesting a paltry sum for concealing my knowledge of the Darlington substitution scandal. Substitution? What on earth do you mean? Well, who should understand me better than you? The baby asleep upstairs. The supposed heir to the Darlington title is not your child. That's a lie. How dare you say that, Reginald? Lord Darlington, surely you were present at your son's birth? Well, as a matter of fact, I wasn't. I was abroad on government business at the time. My wife went to the country with a paid companion. My son was born there. Oh, no, my dear cousin. A son was born there, and then it was passed off as yours. That's a foul lie. Albert, make him leave this house. I'm afraid, Clara, my dear, that, well, he's threatened to go to the newspapers. We must hear him out. Lord Darlington, surely the matter is not hard to settle. You say your wife had a companion. Confront her with a story. She can establish the truth of the matter. Oh, yes, of course she can, but where is she? I haven't seen Maud Harris since she left me a year ago. Then I have a surprise for you, Clara. She's waiting in my cab outside now. I'll tell Jenkins to send her in. Jenkins? Yes, sir? Ask Miss Harris to join us. She's waiting in my cab. Yes, sir. Albert, I don't know what devil's work Reginald's up to, but you don't believe him, do you? Well, of course not, Clara, darling. Mr. Tremaine... How did you get in touch with this uh, Miss Harris? For an employee, you ask a lot of questions, Holmes. I met Maud Harris at Brighton last week. As soon as she knew I was the black sheep of the Darlington clan, she thought we might profitably put our heads together. And so you organized with the idea of blackmailing this poor lady. And such a valuable secret is surely worth a few thousand pounds, Dr. Watson. Maud. Yes, Lady Darlington, it's me. You're just in time to settle a most important truth. I'll handle this, Reginald. Young lady, as I understand it, you claim to know that the boy lying upstairs is not my son. Who should know better, your lordship? He's mine. Maud, how can you tell such a lie? It's no lie, and you know it, Lady Darlington. Your child was born dead. Albert, make her stop saying such things. Here, my dear, control yourself. Let's hear this shocking tale to the end. Well, go on, young woman. You were abroad, Lord Darlington. When her ladyship lost her child, she was terrified. She knew how much you longed for a son, and she made this plan. Oh. I was a widow, and I was going to have a child, too. 
We fooled the villagers, even the doctor, by giving each other's names. And so my son was born as the Darlington heir. Lord, that's the most shocking lie I've ever heard. I can't stay here and listen to any more of it. Mr. Holmes, I understand you're a man of discretion and ability in such matters. What am I to do? I would like to ask this young lady a few questions. Miss Harris, why have you chosen to reveal the supposed truth now? I thought that money could compensate me for the loss of my boy. But I was wrong. A mother's love can never be stifled. Indeed, and I suppose Mr. Tremaine's plans for blackmail are purely incidental. Oh, keep out of this, Watson. It's no affair of yours. Establishing truth and justice is anybody's business, my good man. Mr. Holmes, I'll pay you any fee you name to disprove this monstrous story. Oh, no, you don't, my dear cousin. Holmes is employed by me. Mr. Tremaine, I've undertaken to protect your physical safety. That pledge I will keep. Otherwise, I'm a free agent. Then you'll accept my commission? Yes, Lord Darlington, on one condition. And what's that? You have asked me to disprove this story. I would prefer that you ask me to establish the truth. Of course, Holmes, and spare no expense. Remember, the honor of the Darlingtons is at stake. Little did I think when Tremaine called on us this morning that we'd end up the day tramping a village lane in Surrey, looking for a Dr. Godfrey. And yet that gentleman must surely be able to give us the final answer. Lady Darlington said that he attended yes, her. Yes, but supposing the companion's story was true and they had changed names. Even so, the good doctor will certainly know whether the boy was born to a slight blonde woman like Lady Darlington... Or a brunette Amazon like Maud Harris. Well, here's the doctor's house. They said in the village it was the one with the gabled roof. Hmm. No lights visible. I hope the doctor's not out. Doesn't seem to be any answer. Couldn't find it. I don't believe there's anyone at home. And you will observe, Watson, that this morning's delivery of milk still stands on the doorstep. Curious. Let's explore a little. Well, perhaps the doctor's got away for a few days. If so, he's a very careless man. Look, that window's wide open. Well, do you think we might go in and look round? We not only might, we will go in. Too much is at stake to stand on ceremony. Strike a match, Watson. Right, you are. I'll light that lamp. There you are. Holmes! Holmes, look, look, look! The figure slumped over the desk. Someone has reached the doctor before us. He's been shot through the chest. He's dead, Holmes. How long would you estimate he's been dead, Watson? Oh, uh, about 24 hours, I'd say. So now we become involved in murder as well as blackmail. Well, the answer's perfectly obvious to me. Tremaine came here and shot him. He knew that he could never blackmail Lord Darlington while this doctor was still alive. Not necessarily, Watson. If the story of the substitution is true, you must realize that one other person would have an equal motive for murder. Well, it's cut, Holmes. Who? Lord Darlington himself. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes as they endeavor to solve the mystery. But first, they say New Year's resolutions are made to be broken. But here's one which should pay you big dividends to keep. Resolve to take better care of your hair, to keep it better groomed, your scalp hygienic. Start using Kremel hair tonic at once. You see, Kremel is a highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps hair neatly in place longer and gives the hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never greasy or sticky. But men, Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking attractive. Its light oils have a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes loose dandruff. And a quick massage with Kremel stimulates the circulation of blood in the surface of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. And men, you like to rub Kremel on your scalp because it's such a clean hair tonic. Never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and looks as if it had some body to it. So, men, for better groomed hair and a hygienic scalp, change to Kremel. 
K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, so you went to interview that village doctor and arrived there to find him dead. Yes, Mr. Bell, but before we reported the tragedy to the police, Sherlock Holmes conducted an intensive search of the dead man's room. After a moment, he turned to me and said... Watson, we must see what the inanimate objects in this room can tell us. Aha, here's the doctor's appointment pad. Let's see who his last visitor was. Look, look, there's the name of Darlington. Yes, but that tells us little. If the companion's story is true, the word Darlington could refer to either of the women or to Lord Darlington himself. But what are these letters scribbled before the word Darlington? Why must doctors have such illegible handwriting? Doctors don't have illegible handwriting. I disagree. Hmm? In fact, I've often thought they train you to write badly in medical colleges. Yes. The letters are R-E, Re. Re, Re, Darlington. That means that someone was calling about the Darlington case. A fact we already knew. Yes. Let's see what else we can find. Hello. Look over here on the sideboard. Brandy decanter with a stopper left out. And one glass that has been drunk from. The killer must have had a drink after he shot the doctor. And in so doing, I think he gave us the clue to his identity. Oh, how? There's a speck on the rim of this glass. I think it's... Ah, the very thing, the doctor's microscope. Most convenient. What does it tell you, Holmes? Uh, wait a minute. Uh-huh. I was right. This speck on the glass is wax. Wax? Then that means the murderer used a candle. Oh, no, Watson. Oh, didn't... Come on. Oh. We must go back to the village and report his death, and then we'll catch the next train to London. Uh, aren't you going to stay here and help the police? Why should I? Beyond telling them the name of the murderer. You mean you know who did it? Of course. And so should you. Well, I don't. But we don't know the answer to the Darlington substitution scandal. That answer, Watson, still lies in London. Nine thousand, nine thousand five hundred, ten thousand pounds. Well, there you are, Reginald. Thank you, my dear cousin. I'll put the money in my bag, Reginald. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Lord Darlington. That sheaf of banknotes in Miss Harry's hand. Surely you didn't pay the blackmail. I discussed the matter with my wife, Mr. Holmes. She's deeply upset. We both agreed that the scandal, once started, would cling to us for life, even if it was disproved later. That's why I paid the money. You engaged me as your representative in this case, Lord Darlington. Miss Harris, give that money back at once. It was a gift from Lord Darlington, in front of a witness. If you try to touch it, I shall send for a policeman. That won't be necessary. Two of them are waiting in the anteroom now. Police? Oh, Holmes, you shouldn't have done it. I wanted no breath of this scandal to emerge from beyond these four walls. The fact that police are here has nothing to do with the problems of blackmail. I brought them here to apprehend a murderer. A murderer? Well, what do you mean? Dr. Godfrey, your wife's physician, was shot dead during the past 24 hours. He was killed before he could tell us the true answer to the parentage of the child upstairs. Murdered? Oh, what a dreadful thing. Have you any idea who did it? Every idea, Lord Darlington. But before I expose the criminal, I'd be obliged if you'd bring Lady Darlington here. And also the child. Oh, very well, Holmes. This is going to be a terrible shock to her. You're suddenly very quiet, Mr. Tremaine. Am I? I was wondering who might have killed Dr. Godfrey. Fortunately, we don't have to wonder. The murderer left a clue. After he'd committed the crime, he made the mistake of taking a drink. Darlington's quite a drinking man, you know. And you have been known to take a drink on occasions too, Mr. Tremaine. For instance, uh, after you'd killed Dr. Godfrey. After I'd... What rubbish are you saying? You see, the murderer left a tiny blob of wax on the glass. Oh, what does that prove? Merely that someone had been carrying a candle. But this wasn't candle wax. It was cosmetic wax, such as you used to wax that pointed moustache of yours. Reginald. All right, all of you, I'm getting out of here. <gasps> he snatched my bag. Reginald, come back here. I'll go after him. No, no, Watson. The police are prepared to arrest him, but not the young lady. We shall need her cooperation in the last act of this little tragedy. But surely the whole thing's clear by now. If Tremaine killed the doctor, obviously the whole story about the substitution is, is a lie. Not necessarily. Even if it were true, the doctor was still a menace to his plans. How could he and Miss Harris ask the highest price for their secret when the doctor also knew it? No, Watson. Tremaine had a motive for murder either way. In the meanwhile, I must set the stage before Lady Darlington gets here. Where'd I put that parcel? 
Oh, here it is. What the devil have you got in there, Holmes? A present from a plumber friend of mine. Though the object in this pass- package is only a simple tool of his trade, I feel that it may give us the answer to a peer's inheritance. Upon my soul, you're being very mysterious. In a few moments, I propose to conduct a test. You must hide outside the windows. When I turn down the gaslight over the mantel here, Watson, I want you to strike a match, apply it to the object in this package, and toss it through the open window. At the same time... Cry out the word fire at the top of your voice. I remember that. I think the results of the experiment may prove quite startling. Lord Darlington, now that all the principals in this case are assembled, I shall conduct my experiment. Very well, Holmes. I don't see why I had to bring the boy down here. It's long past his bedtime. I assure you, Lady Darlington, that his presence is absolutely essential. Please place him in the bassinet on the sofa. All right. Uh, That's it. And you, Miss Harris, will you be good enough to place your handbag on the table? Mm, Very well, Mr. Holmes. But no funny business now. The police took it away from Reggie and gave it back to me. That money's mine. Each of you ladies claim to be the mother of that boy. Since scientific tests of parentage are notoriously unreliable, I shall conduct a simple experiment which I think may give us the truth in this matter. Now... I want both you ladies to come toward me with outstretched hands. That's it. I turn down the gaslight over the mantel. So. Ah! Ah! Oh, dear, oh, darling! It's all right. It's all right. If you look closely, you'll observe that this object is a perfectly harmless plumber's smoke rocket. Ah! Oh, ah! You can drop the masquerade, Watson. The case is solved. Ah! Oh, is it home? Holmes, what on earth are you up to? You'll notice that on the cry of fire... Miss Harris ran for her handbag containing the 10,000 pounds. Lady Darlington instinctively rushed to her son. I think, Lord Darlington, that there can no longer be any question of the child's parentage. Midnight. (laughs) Been a long day, Holmes. Yes, but... uh... Profitable, Watson. A very profitable day's work indeed. Here's a thousand guineas from Lord Darlington. And uh, don't overlook the 20 pounds that Mr. Tremaine well, gave me. Sean, he retained you for protection and you end up by sending him to the gallows. A fate that he richly deserves. I only wish I could have persuaded Lord Darlington to prosecute Miss Harris. Blackmail is a devilish crime. It's funny to think that a simple plumber's rocket smoked out the truth. Yes. Though, you'll remember, I've had occasion to use the instrument before. When a woman thinks her house is on fire, her impulse is at once to rush to the thing she values most. It's a perfectly overpowering instinct. Well, you certainly took advantage of the fact. Ah, well, Watson, you may remember the old Persian saying, there's danger for him who taketh the tiger cub, and danger for whoso snatches delusion from a woman. Oh, really? Oh, yes, Watson. There's as much sense in Hafiz as in Horace and as much knowledge of the world. Well, Dr. Watson, that was a very exciting story. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Incidentally, don't you think you'd better tell our listeners about the change of day and time for our next meeting? Yes, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, our next broadcast will be on Monday, January 13th, over these same stations. And better consult your newspaper for the time. Girls, have you noticed how men can't help but admire the bright, shimmering highlights in a woman's hair? Then why not follow the advice of the famous Million Dollar Powers models? Girls noted for their glossy, bright hair. Powers models wash their hair with cremel shampoo. This amazingly beautifying cremel shampoo actually glamour bathes each tiny strand of hair and uncovers all its natural radiant luster. Yes, and cremel shampoo never dries the hair. In fact, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Its luxurious active foam thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. So, ladies, buy a bottle of cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing loveliness. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. 
Now, Dr. Watson, how about next week? It's not next week, uh, Mr. Bell. It's a week from next Monday. Yes, of course. Well, what story are you going to tell us a week from next I Monday? I think I'll tell you about the Devil's Foot. The Devil's Foot? What was that? I won't tell you now, Mr. Bell, but I will say that Sherlock Holmes and I never encountered a more gruesome or a more horrible mystery. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Scandal in Bohemia. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting you to be with us one week from Monday. That's January 13th when Dr. Watson will tell us about the devil's foot. <laughs> is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Desert Betrayal. There are five times in a day when a foreigner like myself tries to stay off the streets of Cairo. That's at dawn, noon, late afternoon, sunset, and just after dusk, when the Moazin appears in his minaret to call the faithful to prayer. At that moment, all activity stops, and the devout Moslem kneels on his rug facing Mecca. Keeping away from them at those times is one speck we can pay their religion, and they appreciate that respect. But I guess I wasn't watching the clock this particular evening. My cafe tambourine still held the intense heat of the day, so I got out and walked down the crowded Sharia Nagoon toward the Nile to try and catch a cool breeze. I just stopped to glance at a big poster, something about a rally for the politician El Marmot Bay, when I heard the voice of the Muezzin in the minaret high above me. Suddenly all sounds of activity stopped as the natives faced east, their foreheads to the ground. As quick as I could, I ducked back through a narrow passage off the street that led to the winding stairs of the minaret. I waited there until sounds from the street told me prayers were over and the Kyrenes were again about their business. Then I was about to be on my way when... The scream came from the minaret. As I turned and looked up, I saw the bearded Muezzin in his flowing robe stagger out of the tower, pitch headlong down the winding stairway. He rolled over and over, and he didn't stop till he sprawled at the bottom, almost at my feet. It was like something out of a bad opera. For a split second, I couldn't move. But the red splotches from stab wounds spreading across his white robe snapped me out of it, and I rushed over to him. All right, easy there. Try not to move. Who did this? You've got to tell me. Listen, who did it? I guess he figured he was done for, and there was a look almost of ecstasy on his kindly face. But I didn't want to give up that easy. I made a move to try and stop the bleeding when I heard heavy footsteps coming down the stairway. It was another figure in the robes of a muzin, only he had a black field boots on. Come on, hurry up, will you? Help me with this man. Shut up and get back. We gotta work fast. He's sure to. I said and move. I'm not Must going anywhere. I tell you again. Since when does a muezzin carry a luger? Don't touch him. You've stepped in where it doesn't concern you. Yeah, maybe it's lucky I did. Think again, my friend. It's your misfortune. <laughs> I felt the blow of his heavy luger across my face, and that was all. Only a roaring like a consonant in the desert, and me spinning with the wind, till it seemed to pitch me back down to the foot of the minaret. 
The pain in my head drove me to my senses, and when I opened my eyes, it was pitch dark. Dead body of the kindly Muezzin lay beside me. Just as I realized I was clutching something tightly in my hand, a flashlight stabbed right in my eyes. So, it is you, Mr. Jordan. Get up at once. Uh, well, good hunting, Greco. Who called you? There was no police call. Ali! I'll rush, Sergeant Greco. Take the knife from this man. Knife? The one in your hand, Mr. Jordan. You need not feign surprise. You do not deceive me. Hidden ideas already, Greco? Hand over the knife. I'll take it. I don't use knives. Indeed. However, it is in your hand, stained with the blood of the sacred Moes and lying dead by your side. Look, don't you know a plant when you see one? Enough. This time you have overstepped yourself, Mr. Jordan. Okay, arrest me. Get it over with. Perhaps that will not be necessary. I need only to call the people in from the street to witness this thing. What are you getting at? When the news spreads that their revered religious leader has met violent death by the hands of an unbeliever, you will be disposed of very quickly. You'd like that, wouldn't you? I would be helpless against the mob. You see, Mr. Better Jordan? get some sense now, Greco. If the Moesian's death gets out, there'll be a lot of repercussions. You think Sabaya would put another stripe on your sleeve if that happened? My personal ambitions have nothing to do with this. Think it over. Uh, Mr. Jordan, uh, you will understand that I had no intention of disclosing this to anyone uh, as yet. Sure, Greco, sure. Uh, Ellie, bring another man. You will take the Moesian to the Miraret and hide his remains there. It will be done. Uh, one moment. Under no circumstances will you breathe a word of this to anyone. Is that clear? It is, Sergeant Greco. Quickly now. And you, Mr. Jordan, will come with me. Greco waited only long enough to watch his aides lift the Moesin and carry him carefully up the steep winding steps to the tower. As they disappeared into the dark, he gave me a shove and I walked ahead out into the street. Neither of us spoke a word on our ride to headquarters. I was taken to Sabaya's office and a couple of guards held me there for maybe half an hour until Sam made his appearance. Greco was with him, and they motioned the guards outside. It was all just a little too deliberate. Uh, Greco been telling you things, Sam? They keep silent until spoken to, Mr. Jordan. Then let's get at it. Jordan, I have Greco's statement. You were found at the foot of the Mongar minaret beside the dead body of the Muezzin. Did he tell you I'd been knocked out cold, Sam? A trick, Captain. He was trapped and could do nothing but pretend that he also had been attacked. Then explain the shape my face is in, Greco. Your face gets smashed up in many ways. One Mr. moment, Jordan. Greco. Now, Jordan, I will hear your full explanation of this affair. I was standing at the foot of the tower stairs during the last call to prayer. Did you, an American, not know better than be there at such a time? I ducked in there to get off the street. Mm. Go on. And the Moesian rolled down the steps right at my feet. Before I could get anything out of him, somebody else in a Moesian's robe showed up. There is no other Moesian at the minaret. You're right, Gregor. He wasn't a Moesian. He wasn't an Egyptian. He had on German field boots, and he carried a Luger. Jordan, what fantastic tale are you trying to make and me listen believe? Listen to me, Sam. The guy roughed me up against the wall and then slapped his gun across my face. He's lying, Captain. Ask Mr. Jordan how he got this knife in his hand. You can see for yourself. Put the knife on the desk, Greco. I, I do not wish to look at it again. As you wish. The Moesian had been stabbed four times. I thought it best, under the circumstances, to have his body hidden in the menorah. Yes, 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 yes. You acted most wisely, Greco. I was only doing my duty, Captain Sabaya. Uh, Jordan, about this man with the Luger. Would you recognize him if you saw him again? You bet I would. Uh, you, uh, you have told me everything? That's right. And you can explain nothing of the other similar acts of violence against our holy man here in Cairo? Well, there have been others. This is the third Muezzin to die in the past month, all by the knife. But why, Sam? What's it all about? I do not know, but I intend to find out. Jordan, there are things a man like you would not understand, that my people take their religion most seriously. Quite often, our emotions become strongly involved. Well, maybe I do understand, Sam. Every man has a religion, whether he knows it or not. But there are differences. Sure. I've knocked around enough to learn to respect another man's beliefs. That's why I get off the street. We will not go over that again. Oh, okay, but you can't hold me, Sam. Indeed I can, Jordan. You will be committed to jail pending further investigation. So that's the way it is. That will be all. Greco, I must hurry to the El Mahmoud Bay political rally. We have promised him police protection. Put Jordan in a cell. This way, Mr. Jordan. Oh, Greco, you had best place him in the old cell block across the alley and under heavy guard. <laughs> I know better than to try and figure out what goes on in Sabaya's mind. But I had a hunch he was locking me up more than anything for my own protection. And the old cell block would be the last place a mob would try and hunt me out. 
Greco made a big thing of it as he and two others directed me down a corridor to the back door. A dim bulb over the entrance was all that lit the alley. Greco motioned across to a dingy sandstone building about 30 feet on down, and I moved ahead. I had taken not more than a dozen steps when it began to happen. A whole bunch of them came out of nowhere. Everyone hooded, surrounded Greco and his guards. They made quick stop, work of it. Stop it once. I come back. One of the hooded men was out of the scuffle and had me by the arm. Get moving, Jordan. What is this? We call it a rescue. Maybe I don't want it. Shut up, you fool. Now move. By that time, they were all around me, dragging me up the alley. Somewhere back, I could hear an alarm sounding and the shouts of more men running out of headquarters. But already, we had reached a side street where a light field truck was waiting, its motor running. The hooded figures piled me in, the driver put it in gear, the wheels spun, and we were careening off down the narrow winding streets. Now we must have traveled every side street in Cairo to shake the police. Finally, the truck roared across the Bulak Bridge of the Nile, through Giza, on west and north above the Nile Valley as it meets the desert. As the truck picked up speed, the men relaxed their grip on me, peering ahead to the onrushing road. So I had a chance to come over. Well, the top man had called it to a rescue, but I knew better. Every one of them was wearing German field boots and carrying a Luger. A jump was a risk. I knew there was nothing alongside but soft sand and was the only way. I waited till we hit a sharp, bumpy curve, and I was on rolling. The fourth time over, I was on my feet, clawing my way through the brush. Then they opened up. I died for a ditch with the wind knocked out of me, and I stayed there, with my face in the sand, waiting for them to flush me out, knowing exactly what would happen when they did. You are listening to Desert Betrayal, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Travel to the ends of the earth tomorrow night with Dick Powell and Sidney Hasso, who will recreate their original screen roles on CBS Radio Theater. To the ends of the earth is the story of the expose of an international narcotics ring and makes for an exciting story. Remember Dick Powell and Sidney Hasso tomorrow, Monday night at 6. <laughs> Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Desert Betrayal. It was a peaceful evening as I stood at the foot of the minaret and listened to the Moazin's call to prayer. But all that was changed a few seconds later when the Moazin lay dying at my feet. A man wearing German field boots and a gun to match planted the killing on me. Not long after, as I was being taken to a jail cell, the same man with a lot of helpers broke it up, dumped me in a truck, and roared out into the desert. I remember jumping from the speeding truck, some gunshots, and not much more, till a breath of air hit me. And it wasn't air off the desert. It smelled of cheap gin, like my cafe tambourine after a hard night. It came from somebody bending over me. Get up, monsieur, before they find you. Where are they? Searching the brush and the other side of the sand dune. Up with you now. Where where, where are we going? To my hut. Only a little way. Allez, monsieur, allez. Somehow she got me to her hut and dropped me on a cot. The dive off the truck must have jolted me plenty because right then I passed out for a while. The next thing I knew it was daylight and I was wide awake and choking for breath. She was sharing her cheap gin with me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the gin, it helps, n'est-ce pas? Oh, they sell stuff that bad? Oh, so I it can't... is champagne you wish. No, no, I'm sorry. I woke up too quick. Oh, it is nothing. Anyhow, you took a lot of chances, sister. I am Suzette. Perhaps another drink now? No, 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 no thanks. As you wish. Yeah. Any of those guys come around? No, monsieur. They went away. Uh, looks like you got a good hideout here. Oh, well, we all hide from something, Naspa. Yeah, me from too many things. You, uh, you do not tell me who you are, Monsieur. The name's Jordan. And an American who flees from many men with guns on the desert. Oh, I hopped off a truck. They were taking me someplace. But why? Your guess is as good as mine. Many trucks have been going into the desert. Yeah. Where to, Suzette? I do not know. 
But something is going on out there. You, you were captured, monsieur? Oh, rescued, they call it. <laughs> you make a strange riddle. Oh, yeah, it's a beauty. I'm always in a stab to death in Cairo. Not the first to be killed. But whoever did it figured I knew too much. Before the police could salt me away, this gang grabbed Monsieur, me. Monsieur, what were they like? Well, they weren't Muslims. They were men who speak good English and carry lugas. Oh, sacre nom. Have you got it figured, Susan? Oh, always it is the same. So it was with the betrayal of France. Always I do not realize... What are you talking about? Monsieur, in France they call me a traitor. It was not so. I did not know I was being used by the enemy. It makes some sense, huh? Oh, now I am a poor French woman in Egypt without credentials. I must exist as best I can. When there is an opportunity to sell munitions and guns in Egypt, what can I do? The trucks are taking munitions into the desert? We. Oui. But I did not Who's know. Who's the deal with, Suzette? Oh, it is a bad deal. Hey, come on, never mind the gin. Oh. Who'd you sell the stuff to? Well, there... There is a man named Frank Kruller. Where do I find him? A, a houseboat on the Nile. The Habi are 16. All right, let's, let's have some more. No, no, Monsieur Obladega, you've said too much. You rest now. Uh, you will need much strength for what is ahead. So I waited out the burning heat of the day in her hut. All the time I tried to get more out of her about Kruller and the munitions going into the desert. How that tied in with the Moazin's death. But from then on, Suzette closed up tighter than the cap on a bottle of Coke. Well, with a little food and a lot of sleep, I was ready to go by sundown. Suzette helped me into Giza. From then on, I was on my own. I thumbed a ride across the bridge, but before I went down along the river, I decided on a phone call. Captain Sabaya speaking. Hello, Sam. Jordan, so it is you. I just didn't want you to worry about me. Where are you? What are you doing? Oh, relax. I'm all right, I tell you. You don't have to rescue me. Rescue you, indeed. You will return to headquarters at once. Sorry, I got a big date. Where are you going? To see a guy named Kruller. Kruller? Frank Kruller. Any objections, Sam? Jordan, listen to me. There are things you do not understand. Why not? You are not a mortal, but I am. And I can tell you that you are in great danger. For your own protection, come back to jail. Uh, thanks for the advice. See you later, Sam. Jordan, for the last time... Then I was on my way to see Kruller. I couldn't have missed his Dahabia on the Nile if I'd tried. It was a floating palace, all lit up with music coming from someplace and real important-looking people going on board. With a day's growth of beard and so on, I wasn't exactly in shape for a party, but I went anyhow. Only a big pile of muscles at the entrance stood in my way. Retrace your steps, uh, friend. Don't get upset, Buster. I didn't come to see you. State your business here. Huh? Maybe I got invited. Only those of influence and wealth come here tonight. Ah, uh-huh. something uh, real special, huh? A reception in honor of the great El Marmad Bay. I've known bigger politicians. Yeah, back to the streets with you, English. Not till I see Frank Kruller. He's not here. Well, let's look around. Yeah, back now, stop it, cop! What is going on here? <laughs> Somebody was coming through the lighted doorway toward it. The one man I wanted to see more than anyone else. I'd last seen him under the minaret as he slapped a luger in my face. Who is this man? He is no one. I tell him to go away. I will handle him, Jerub. So it is you, Jordan. Yeah. I take it you're crueler. I am. You know, Jordan, you interest me. <laughs> I'll bet. You made good your escape last night. Is it not foolhardy to walk back into another trap? Not if it gets some answers. It so happens that I would like to talk to you, too. Come this way. No, no, let's talk here. Sorry. I fear you have no choice. A glance at the shadows told me there were others besides Jarub covering for Kruller. So I followed along with Jarub close behind. We went down some steps away from the party going on above, through a narrow corridor to a door that Kruller opened. He motioned me in. I was face to face with a guest of honor. One Napoleon-sized, puffy, gimlet-eyed Egyptian politician sporting a monocle. El Marmad Bey. Who is this man, Kruger? The person who persists in making trouble for us, El Marmad Bey. Ah, Jordan, of course. Excellent, excellent. You the top man in this deal, Marmad Bey? Perhaps more than you know. 
What audacious motive brings you here? A lot of question marks about guns and munitions you got your hands on. Stuff that's being hatched out on the desert somewhere. Most interesting. From whom did you learn this? Oh, skip it, Mormon. I'm not on your side yet. <laughs> I had hardly hoped for that. What else you know, Jordan? Just that you're playing for something pretty big. Killing Muslim leaders is dangerous business. What are a few lives if they serve my purpose? You tell me. El Mahmoud Bey, your time is most valuable. The others are waiting. As you say, Cruella. The hour grows short. Jordan, finding the source of your information and how much of it you have divulged to others is most important to my cause. I'll bet it is. We have ways of getting it from you. With a luger? Wait, Cruella. Jordan, who else knows you have come on this Dahabia? A lot of people. It is possible. Let him go, Cruella. What happens to this man after he leaves here, you may decide. Of course. The rope. Bring the others. Throw this man out. Once, Aren't you up to it yourself, Cruella? No, no, not that way, the rope. Out the window. Perhaps, Jordan, the waters of the Nile will drive you to your senses before it's too late. <laughs> I got plenty of Nile water, all right, but I didn't head for the shore. I saw them moving along the bank waiting for me. Then a little boat took off downstream trying to pick me up. But they didn't know I was hanging onto the anchor chain. In a little while, I was pulling myself back into the little room. It was empty now. The noise of the party upstairs covered for me, and I started looking around. A couple of shoves, and I had the closet door open. What was inside didn't surprise me. A stack of small arms, lugers, man liquor rifles, and cases of ammunition. Next, I tried the desk in the corner. The minute I cracked the top drawer, I had what I wanted. It was a list of various muezzins in Cairo. The top three names were scratched out, and I figured they were the ones who had already died. Maybe the rest were next. But it didn't say why. I folded the sheet and shoved it in my pocket. Suddenly, there was a soft step from behind. Before I could move, there was a silken cord around my neck, drawn tighter and tighter, and once more, thick blackness poured in. I was slow in coming out of it. First, I thought I was still lying at the minaret beside the dead Moisin. Then I was in a ditch with a gin-soaked woman bending over me. Finally, I opened my eyes. The light from a window almost blinded me. Outside, I could see other buildings, and I knew we were in some abandoned army camp. I tried to move, and I realized I was tied securely to a chair. The bare room held just me and Frank Kruller. I salute you, Jordan. For a chance adversary, you have proved quite formidable. Ah, skip the build-up, Cruller. Where are we? To the south is the Guattara Depression. It was used as an anchor in the battle for Egypt. Only you're using the place for something else. As a temporary hideout, it serves our purpose. And a munitions dump, too? Spare your strength, Jordan. You'll need it. <laughs> like for what? El Mahmoud Bey, Mr. Jordan awaits you. Well, Jordan... For a man with big plans, Marmite, you give me lots of attention. Why? Because I wish to know what people are in possession of certain information. Who are they? I'll give you an answer. But to my question, not yours. Because I soon will become master of Egypt. Yeah. Hmm. It will be done. El Mahmoud, is it wise? Let him know. There are but three of us, Cruella. He has no means of escape but the eternal sand. Thanks, my man. I know about the munitions and guns. Now, where's your army? <laughs> you Americans are indeed naive. Superior intelligence is more powerful than armies. Your brains and who else? At this moment, my loyal followers are at strategic points in Cairo and elsewhere in Egypt, awaiting the hour. You think that's all it takes? Clive took India with only 123 men, Mr. Jordan. Ah, I had it right, didn't I? You start out killing a few Muezzins, one by one. Nothing upsets a Muslim quicker than an offensive toward his leaders. And now more of the Muezzins are to die. 
When the people see their government is unable to cope with the atrocities, they will rise up and overthrow it. You got it all figured out, haven't you? Already there have been incidents. Soon the anger of the populace will move it to frenzy. There will be uprisings growing in violence. And that's when you step in. Yes. At that moment, the great El Marma Bay will appear as their liberator. Yeah. The only trouble is it won't work. Indeed. Again, the mind of the West finds the mind of the East an insoluble riddle. Well, don't get me wrong, Marmé. You might use the religion of your people to get into power. Only you've forgotten one thing. Yes. What is that? Your people will still have their religion. How long do you think they'll be fooled? We Americans have a saying for that, if you're interested. I am not. Your interest, Jordan, is in your own welfare. Well, think about it. When the people find out they've been duped, what do you think happens to you? At that time, my power over them will be assured. Egypt will enter an era greater than the pharaohs ever knew. Ah, uh, hold it, Mohammed. Back that idea up with some more figures. Give me one example of a tyranny founded on religious oppression that has ever lasted. Mr. Jordan, the fact of the moment is that you will die. Tell us what we wish to know, and death will be swift and painless. And if I don't? Death in the desert is very slow. No man has ever withstood the heat or the sun in his eyes. Need I say more? I get the general idea. What is your answer, Jordan? I told you, it won't work. Mm -hmm. Very well. Krilla, take him outside. I suggest that you turn your attention to me, El Marmad Bey. At first, I didn't recognize him without his uniform. But it wasn't a mirage was Captain Sam Sabaya. Kruler grabbed his Luger from the table as Sam kept walking right on in. How did you get here? That's important, Kruger. Watch that Luger, Sam. I'm tied here. I can't help you. That will not be necessary, George. So, Captain Sabaya, the desert must claim another victim. That we shall soon see, El Marmad Bay. But you had no way of knowing. Not everything. But certain things have come to my attention. When Jordan phoned me he was going to Kruler's Dahabia, I followed along. And I've been following ever since. You think your authority amounts to anything here? My authority and my uniform remain in Cairo. I come here only as a Muslim to write a grievous offense to my religion. You come to this forsaken place alone? Without even the proof? You can find proof, Sam. Look in the other buildings. They're loaded with arms. Search Kruger's houseboat. In good time, Jordan. Enough of this. Kruger, dispose of this man at once. A very great pleasure. <laughs> Kruler aimed, and then it happened quicker than I could follow. Sam's foot came up a second before the shot, and the gun clattered across the room. Kruler dived in. Sam crouched like a panther, and then slammed Kruler over his head in the arms of El Marmot Bay, and they went down. I'd always thought Sam was pudgy and slow-moving, but he gave me the show of my life. He used every trick on those two guys, and I'd have known a lot more. The second time Marmot came up, his stomach got mixed up with a left, and he was finished. But Kruler tried for more. All the time, I couldn't move. Kruler went to work with his heavy boots, and that's where he made another big mistake. Sam flipped him into a corner, where he piled up like a stack of ten pins. Then suddenly it was all over. Hey, I could book you for a main event, Sam. Jordan, you will make no joke about this. Such, such tactics are, are most distasteful to me. Okay. How about getting me loose here, huh? Well, you will, you will tell no one of, of this incident. Sure, sure, just untie me. You know, Jordan, there are many things that you do not comprehend. Sam, get me out of here. Well, Sam finally untied me. We got El Marmot Bay and Kruler back into Cairo, and from then on, Sam was his old official self. It didn't take him long to round up all the Bay's loyal followers, and I don't have to tell you what happened to them after that. I, uh... I was going to send Suzette a case of good gin, but she'd done a fade-out, and nobody tried very hard to find her. Me? Oh, I've learned a few things. Sam Sabai has given me jiu-jitsu lessons.
It's CBS, again at this same time, next week, for another story of adventure and intrigue. When we take you back to Cairo and the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Jack Moyles plays the title role with tonight's script by Harry Roman and Gomer Cool from a story by E. Jack Newman. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wait a minute. Have you heard the whistler? I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, it's time for another strange tale by The Whistler. Each Wednesday evening at this same time, The Whistler brings you an unusual story of conflict and emotion. Tonight, The Broken Chain. The thought had first occurred to him six months ago. And of course, he'd shuddered a little and cast it out. Of course. Arnold Stanton, respectable businessman, citizen taxpayer, would be horrified at such an idea. So he went back to his routine and resolved never to let himself think about it again. But in spite of him, the thought did come back two weeks later. Then only a week after that. Then at more frequent intervals until he found it popped into his head at least once every day. It was worse on weekends when he had to be with Evelyn all the time. When her helplessness, her utter dependence on him for everything rose up and almost smothered him. By now, the thought didn't seem so horrible anymore. It had attained a kind of normal, logical quality, and he found he liked to dwell on it, like a problem in mathematics. In short, Arnold Stanton was ready to murder his wife. Is that you, Arnold? Yes, Evelyn. You're a little late tonight, dear. Did you miss the bus? Sam Moore drove me home. Oh, of course. It is Monday. Yes, Evelyn, it's Monday. You look so tired, darling. I think you've been working too hard. Kiss? Of course. <laughs> That's better. You know, we ought to take a little vacation, a day or two. A week, perhaps. We could get a cabin, cabin at, at Wilder's Cove, right? Well, what's the matter with Wilder's Cove? Nothing. It's been good enough for the past ten years. I suppose it'll do for the next ten. Oh, you're a darling, Arnold. You always manage to see things my way. And Miss Roberts could look after things at the office while we're gone. Dinner will be ready in just a minute. Oh, how is she these days? How is who? Oh, Miss Roberts, silly. Same as ever. You know, darling, we ought to have her out to dinner some evening. Not that I want to share you with another woman. But I think about Miss Roberts, and I feel sort of superior. She must lead an awfully dull life. I don't know. She seems to have her interests. Oh, such as they are. Poor dear, working so hard in your office all day, going home to that dreadful, lonely apartment. Oh, darling, I'm so lucky to have you. I don't know what I'd do if anything should happen. But we won't ever talk about that, will we, dear? We're so happy, Arnold. Now, you sit right down with your paper, and I'll have dinner on the table in just a second. Very well, dear. There's nothing wrong, is there, Arnold? No. Why? Well, you, you've hardly said a word. What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? <laughs> oh, there's a dear. Now, I'll call you in a shake. I have a special surprise. Baked beans, just the way you like them. And apple turnovers, and then I... Yeah. 
Yes, Arnold, this Monday night is different from all the rest. Six months ago, it was just a vagrant, horrifying idea. Now it's an obsession, isn't it? It's a terrible decision, Arnold. And there's no one to talk it out with. No one in whom you can confide. You sit there, staring at the newspaper without seeing it. Thinking. Thinking how you hate her and the senseless prattle you've had to listen to for ten years across the dinner table. But you can't walk out, Arnold. That's the strange part of it. You've decided it would be too cruel to walk out. She leans on you. She's dependent on you for everything. No, Arnold, you can't walk out. Arnold, come on, darling. The beans are on the table. Yes, dear. Coming. It's odd, isn't it, Arnold? How a random thought like the one that struck you six months ago can take hold and grow and finally solidify into something very real as evening after evening of Evelyn's nonsensical prattle drives you closer and closer to it. Yes, you've decided it has to be tonight, haven't you, Arnold? And you're smart enough to realize that most murderers are tripped up by their own cleverness, that the plan surest of success is the simple one. As usual, you help Evelyn with the dinner dishes, but tonight your mind isn't on your work. That's my best Havilah and China. I don't know why, but it struck me tonight that there's no use letting it gather dust in the closet. We almost never use it, and I said to myself, there's no use having nice things if you can't enjoy them. I think that's right, don't you, Arnold? Don't you think that's right? Arnold, aren't you listening to me? Oh? Oh, sorry, dear. Yes, yes, of course. Oh. (laughs) Well, here's the casseroles. Uh, Be careful, dear. I was saying about using the Havilah for every day. Yes, there's no, no use, use having, having nice things if you can't enjoy them. Well, I hope you don't think it's wrong, Arnold. It is lovely china, but after all, what's the use of, course, of having dear, nice... Of course, Of course. Oh, do be careful with that casserole, dear. Aunt Leona gave it to us for a wedding present, remember? Poor darling. She'd be alive today if it weren't for that terrible accident. What? Accident? I don't remember. Oh, of course you do, dear. The bathtub. Bathtub. Arnold! Our best casserole! You try and comfort Evelyn, but she's heartbroken. Her best casserole, Arnold. You do feel sorry for her, don't you? It's clear now that you could never leave her. Why, that would be more cruel than the other way. So there's going to be an accident, isn't there, Arnold? A simple, ordinary accident. Like Aunt Leona's in the bathtub tomorrow morning. Everyone knows she sleeps late. That you always have breakfast in town. That you're at the office working before she gets up. It's ten o'clock, dear. Time we were in bed. I suppose so. Uh, I'm awfully sorry about the casserole, dear. You probably think I'm being silly about it, Arnold. But after all, it's Haviland and you just can't buy it these days. It, it simply isn't to be had, and it's the only thing Aunt Leona gave us. You do understand, don't I'll you, Arnold? I'll try and find another one tomorrow. Oh, it's no use, Arnold. Haviland just Let me try, be... dear. Uh, about tomorrow, I forgot to tell you that the coffee shop where I usually have my breakfast is closed for redecoration. I was wondering if you'd mind getting up early tomorrow and fixing me a little breakfast. Why, I'd love to, dear. You know I love waiting on you. Yes, I know. Oh, it'll be fun, Arnold. We'll have hot cakes and sausages. And eggs are... Oh, oh my. I am sleepy. <laughs> I, I better run up to bed if I'm to get up with the birds. <laughs> oh, it'll be fun, Arnold. I, I think it'd be nice if we did it more often. Perhaps it would. <laughs> Good night, darling. And you do understand yes, about Evelyn, the casserole. Yes, Evelyn, I do understand about the casserole. It's a long night, isn't it, Arnold? The longest night you ever spent in your life. You lie there, wide awake, looking up at the ceiling, at the shadow of the chandelier and the moonlight, the black silhouette of its chain against the pale gray of the ceiling. Yes, Arnold, a chain. That's what you're going to do tomorrow morning, isn't it? Break the chain. Smash it into a thousand pieces. Huh? Oh. oh, Evelyn. Are you awake, Evelyn? She's gone. She's down 
downstairs. I'm too late. I should have known she... Oh. Uh, Evelyn? Is that you, darling? You see, I didn't forget. I'm just getting into the tub, and I'll have breakfast ready before you get dressed. Don't hurry. There's plenty of time. Excuse me, dear. There's just one thing before I go downstairs. With the prologue of The Broken Chain... CBS brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. You know, when you mix nitric acid and glycerin together, you get a pretty explosive combination. And when you add an unlimited supply of gasoline to that tired pre-war car of yours, the result can be just as dangerous. 15,750 people died on the country's highways during the first six months of this year. 40% more than the same period last year. And the toll is rising daily. Remember the next time you get into your car that it can't always happen to the other fellow, and don't take a chance. Have your lights and brakes checked regularly, and then keep a cautious foot on that accelerator just to make sure. Now, back to The Whistler. So the chain is broken, Arnold, after 12 years. And Evelyn lies dead where you left her, of an accidental fall in the bathtub. There won't be many questions. There can't be. There were no questions about Aunt Leona, were there? Lots of people fall in bathtubs, hit their heads, and drown. And it's so simple, Arnold. You take the 713 bus, as usual. Drop into the coffee shop for breakfast, as usual. Report to the office at exactly the usual time. The neighbors all know she sleeps until well after you've left, that she must have been alone at the time of the fall. All you have to do now is to carry on exactly as you always do, to be careful that nothing happens on this day that will distinguish it from the all the other drab, monotonous days before the chain was broken. Uh, Mr. Stanton? Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Roberts. Where was I? Let's see, uh... We will appreciate anything you can do to expedite shipment, since we are committed on delivery by February 1st. Oh, yes, Merton Amalgamated Foods. Please add this, Miss Roberts. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paragraph. Uh, Incidentally, Mrs. Stanton wants particularly to be remembered to your wife and suggests if Mrs. Merton is accompanying you east that you make it a point to stay with us. Uh, Regards, and I think that ought to do. I'll get it out right away. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, by the way, how is Mrs. Stanton lately? Same as ever. She was sleeping like a baby when I left this morning. You know how she is about getting up early. Yes, I know. Oh, it's 11.45, Mr. Stanton. Remember, you have a luncheon appointment at 12.30. Oh, thank you, Miss Roberts. I'll remember. Eleven forty-five, Arnold. Business as usual. They haven't found her yet. They'll call you as soon as they do, and it can't be much longer. 11.45. Who'll find her, Arnold? The grocery boy or the mailman, perhaps? No, they wouldn't go upstairs. It'll probably be Mrs. Bronson down on the street. Nosy old Mrs. Bronson coming around just about now, pounding on the back door. Oh, oh, oh it's you, Richard. Oh, what's the matter, Mr. Stanton? You nearly jumped out of your chair. <laughs> Tuesday, you know, our day to go over the accounts. Oh, yes, the accounts. Business as usual, Arnold. Everything you do this day is going under a microscope. Richards will remember how you jumped just then. Concentrate on the figures, Arnold. 44, 45, our account with Great Western Stores amounted to to 72,800... But you can't concentrate. 
No matter how hard you try, Mrs. Bronson will knock on the back door and no one will answer. But how will she get in to discover Evelyn? Did you leave the door unlocked, Arnold? You were so excited that you might have forgotten. That would mean you'd have to find her yourself tonight when you come home. No, no, I can't do that. What was that, Mr. Stanton? Oh, I'm sorry, Richard. You said you couldn't do something. Yes. I mean, I, I can't spend any more time on the reports right now. Would you mind leaving them here so I can check them this afternoon? Is anything wrong? No, nothing's wrong, Richard. Please go now. There was a Mr. Weston Haverhill to see you while you were out to lunch, Mr. Stanton. Haverhill? I don't know any Haverhill. Well, rather nice-looking young man. Was he here on business? Well, he said it was personal and quite important. I see. Anything else? No. Were you expecting anything? No, Miss Roberts. Nothing. Oh, well, here's your letter to Mrs. Merton. I uh, included that additional paragraph about your wife and... Oh, that reminds me. Huh? Reminds you of what? Oh, I'm sorry. There was another message while you were out to lunch, and I don't know how I could have overlooked it. It was right on my pad. What was it, Miss Roberts? Well, it was nothing urgent or anything like that. What was... was the message? It was from your wife. She said she's playing bridge at Mrs. Bronson's and, and may be late getting home this evening. She didn't want you to worry about her. That's all. <laughs> Don't faint now, Arnold. You don't want Miss Roberts to see you faint. What she said wasn't so remarkable, just an ordinary telephone call. Business as usual, Arnold. Wait until she gets out of the room. You better say something, anything. Thank you, Miss Roberts. Oh, not at all. Uh, if you'll sign the letter. Yes, of course. There you are. Thank you. All right, Arnold, she's gone. You can let go now. She won't be back. That's it. Put your head down on the desk and let everything go black. It can't be true. She's not alive. I saw her die. She's not alive. I'll go home and... No, I can't go home. I can't take the chance. Business as usual. <laughs> Miss Roberts might have made a mistake, Arnold. Perhaps the message came in yesterday, a week ago. Perhaps she looked at the wrong page of her book by mistake. Yes, Mr. Stanton? Uh, Miss Roberts? Yes, sir? I was just thinking. I was wondering... Yes, yes, sir? No, never mind. I found what I was looking for. Never mind. Well, if there's anything... What's the matter with me? I can't make an issue with the I'll stand out like a sore thumb afterwards. She, she, she... I know she's wrong. I know it. Well, but I gotta rest. I gotta get myself together. Yeah, rest. I'm trying to forget about it. Oh, I must have dozed off. I've been working a little too hard lately. Mr. Stanton, is something wrong? No, why? Well, you, you've acted so strangely all What's day. What's so strange I... about a man getting tired and falling asleep? Well, I, I, I don't know, Mr. Stanton. I'm sorry. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, too, Miss Roberts. It's late now. It's after five. You better run along. I, I, I'm going, too. I don't want to be late. Evelyn will be waiting dinner, and I... I, uh, I am... I thought I told you, Mr. Stanton, she's playing bridge. Oh, yes, that's right. I forgot. Uh, by the way, Miss Roberts. Yes? Were there any other calls this afternoon? Oh, I, I'm glad you reminded me. Mr. Averill called again and said not to disturb you, that uh, he'd see you tonight at home. <laughs> Mr. Haverhill, 
Mr. Haber. You don't know who he is or what he is, Arnold. And you haven't got time to think about it now. Perhaps he's a plain clothes man, a detective. Anything is possible, isn't it? You've been such an awful failure. Business as usual, Arnold. Nothing you've done today was usual. Barking at your secretary, jumping at open doors, falling asleep exhausted for four hours this afternoon. And they'll remember everything when the time comes, Arnold. But still, you can't run out now. You've got to go through with it. You've got to go home and find out once and for all. Leave it unlocked. Evelyn? Are you there, Evelyn? 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 Stop with your hand on the bathroom doorknob. Somehow you can't go in and face it, not yet. Not until you're sure, Arnold. The answer is just inside the door on the right. But you can't take it right now. You stand there for a minute, not thinking, not moving, feeling the pulse pound in your temples. And then you find yourself fumbling for a cigarette. Gotta take it easy. Cigarette. You tear it to pieces trying to get it out of the package. And then find you have no matches, so you skip the cigarette for the time being. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Bronson? Yes. Arnold, Arnold Stanton. Oh, yes, Mr. Stanton. Uh, I don't want to bother you, Mrs. Bronson, but... Well, is anything the matter? You don't sound quite like yourself. No, no, nothing like that, Mrs. Bronson. I, I just... Yes? There was a message for me this afternoon at the office. Something about... Evelyn playing bridge, I think. Oh, yes. She... She isn't there with you, is she? Why, uh, uh, yes, Mr. Stanton. She's right here. Would you like to speak to her? Yes, I would. Well, just hold on. Evelyn? Evelyn, dear? Hello? Evelyn? Evelyn? What's the matter with you? Evelyn, I, I don't understand. Wait I'm... a minute, Mr. Stanton. This huh? is Mrs. Bronson again. Evelyn isn't here after all. I'm terribly sorry. She must have left while I was talking to you. Probably on her way home now. Ought to be there. There she is, Arnold, just as you left her this morning. There's only one answer now. They discovered her and they're trying to trap you. Mrs. Bronson knows. Miss Roberts knew this afternoon. They all know. You run to the window at the end of the hall and look down onto the porch. A tall, serious young man is waiting at the front door. You know who he is, don't you, Arnold? You have to face him, Arnold. One thing more and you'll be sure. Slowly, you walk to the front door. What is it? What do you want? I'm sorry, Mr. Stanton. Get I... over with. What do you want? My name's Haverhill. I've come to talk to you about your wife. I thought so. It's a rather serious proposition, you know. Well, can't, 
Well, can't you come back later? No, I want to... Listen, listen. Just give me five minutes. That's all I want, just five oh, minutes. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Stanton. Go away. Yeah, look, come yeah. back later. Go away. Go away. <laughs> It's a mile across the living room to your desk and the pistol in the middle drawer. You'd given it to Evelyn Arnold because she was afraid while you were away at the office. Because she couldn't stand being without you alone. Then raise it slowly. Your hand tightens on the trigger. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. You know, it's beginning to look like all predictions about summer travel this year are being topped by the actual figures. Mr. and Mrs. America are bundling the suitcases and the kids into the family car and taking to the woods for the biggest vacation season since 41. And, of course, we have it coming. But please remember this. Be careful with fire. Don't throw tobacco or matches from your car, even if you're sure they're out. Use the ashtrays instead. Build campfires only in areas where they're permitted and make doubly sure they're extinguished before you leave. The forests are ours to enjoy, but they're our responsibility, too. So remember these simple rules and do your part in helping to prevent forest fires. Now, back to The Whistler. So the chain was broken, Arnold. Not in one place, but in two. Mrs. Bronson, of course, was the first to discover it. She'd been concerned over the way you sounded on the telephone and had hurried over to find you sprawled in the easy chair by the fireplace. A half hour later, Sergeant Cook was there, too, and the pieces began to fit together. Now, Mrs. Bronson, you say you know something about all this? Yes, in a way, I feel sort of responsible. Responsible? Well, you see, Mr. Stanton called me just before it happened, and... Well, I told him Evelyn was at my house. Oh, I know I shouldn't have, but Evelyn was such a dear friend of mine, and... Well? Well, I don't think I was a party to it. I never really approved, but there was this other person, a Mr. Haverhill. Mr. Weston Haverhill. Yes, Evelyn had been seeing him for some time. I told her she was very wrong, but the least she could do be tell her husband she was in love with someone else. But she felt so sorry for Arnold, said he was so dependent on her. Yes? Mr. Haverhill wanted to have it all out with Arnold to be above board about the whole thing. But Evelyn couldn't face it. So I... I covered up for her. What do you mean, covered up for her? Well, Evelyn and Mr. Haverhill were going to spend the day together, something special. And I called Mr. Stanton's office and pretended I was Evelyn. Said she was at my house playing bridge. Then when he got home, found she wasn't there, he called me to check up on her. And you told him the same thing? Yes, I told him she just left. What else could I do? It must have been a terrible shock when he found her there in the bathroom. Yeah. Arnold couldn't stand it, poor man. He just had to be with her. You know? Huh? It makes sort of a perfect ending. He never would have been happy without her. He loved her so. Next Wednesday at this same time, The Whistler will return with another strange tale. Featured in tonight's production were Elliot Lewis and B. Benaderet. This program is a featured production of the Columbia Broadcasting System and was directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Robert Libet and Frank C. Burt. Music by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The 
Avenger. The road to crime ends in a trap that justice sets. Crime does not pay. Avenger, sworn enemy of evil, is actually Jim Brandon, a famous biochemist. Through his numerous scientific experiments, Brandon has perfected two inventions to aid him in his crusade against crime as the Avenger. The telepathic indicator by which he is able to pick up thought flashes, and the secret diffusion capsule, which cloaks him in the black light of invisibility. Brandon's assistant, the beautiful Fern Collier, is the only one who shares his secrets, and knows that he is the man the underworld fears as the Avenger. And now, The Avenger and the Ghost Murder. At the end of a long table in her darkened seance room, Princess Stella, the renowned mystic, sits motionless. Opposite her, a man leans forward, nervous and expectant. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a swirling spiral of white mist appears, takes shape. And from it comes a ghostly voice. I am the spirit of Martha, your wife. Horace, do not sell our house. We were so happy there. It holds many memories still dear to me. Keep the house, Horace. Keep it. Now I must leave you, but I will come again. I will return. Martha! Martha! Don't leave me! Come back! Martha! She's gone! Princess Stella! Call her back! Call Martha back! Princess Stella! Wake up! Wake up! Help! Help! What's the matter? What's the matter? What happened? Well, it's the princess! I can't wake her! Don't be alarmed. I'll turn up the lights. She uh, must have had a manifestation always affects her this way. Yes, yes, she brought my wife back. Princess, wake up. Princess Stella. She'll come out of it in a minute. Princess, wake up. What? Oh, what is it? Oh, it's you, Mr. Jordan. Yes. Are you all right, Princess? You frightened your client. Oh, I'm so sorry. Was the seance a success? Yes. You recalled another spirit for a lonely soul. Uh, Princess... I, I saw my wife. She spoke to me. Mm, I'm glad. I think we'd better leave the princess alone now. She must rest. Oh, of course. This way. Well, how much did he pay you, Jordan? Fifty dollars, Stella. <laughs> Penny. No, Stella. Well, I'm getting sick of going through this routine day after day for that kind of money. You promised Have me patience, that... Have patience, Stella. I told you that before long we'd be cleaning up. Well, and I meant it. Well, you'd better pull something out of the hat, or I'll retire. And then where'll you be, Jordan? No, Stella, that's no way to talk. After all I've done for you. After all you've done for me. Ha. Shut up. There's a woman in the waiting room. You've got to see her now. Yeah, well, she's in for a disappointment. I've had enough of ghosts today. You've got to see her and talk to her at least. Ah, well, all right. I'll bring her in. Then I have to leave. 
I have an appointment uptown with a fellow by the name of uh, Brandon. <laughs> Jordan, what can I do for you? Well, Mr. Brandon, I represent Princess Stella, the mystic. Uh, no doubt you've heard of her. Well, yes, I have. Well, Princess Stella is going to try for that $50,000 prize the Rollins estate is offering for a genuine manifestation. Isn't that rather a waste of the princess' time, Mr. Jordan? What do you mean? Well, so far, every medium who has tried for that prize has failed completely. Every so-called manifestation was promptly exposed as a hoax. Oh, Princess Stella is in a class by herself. Those others were, were charlatans. Princess Stella is a true psychic, a genuine, a genuine spirit medium. Mr. Jordan, suppose you come to the point. What brought you here to see me? You may be a scientist, Mr. Brandon, yet I feel that some of your ideas may be in sympathy with those of the princess. Why? Well, you've written some... Brilliant articles about your experiments in the field of mental telepathy. So I thought you might be interested in endorsing Princess Stella as a medium. Your word would go a long way in helping. Uh, just a minute, Jordan. Let's clarify our terms. My telepathic experiments have to do with the concentrated thought waves of the living. That is a science. Oh, but Princess Stella is, is a uh... very clever actress, no doubt. No sale, Jordan. If we win the Rollins Prize, we're willing to cut you in for 10%. No, thank you. I'm not interested. As a matter of fact, I'm on the other side of the fence completely. You mean you're going to fight us? In a way, yes. You see, I promised Neil Hayden, the Rollins lawyer, to act as a judge when Princess Stella puts in her bid for the prize. You what? <laughs> I'm willing to give your client a fair enough chance. If Princess Stella really can produce a ghost... I'm sure the whole scientific world will sit up and take notice. Well, thanks for being such a sport about it, Brandon. I think you understand my position. Even a true artist needs a little, a little clever exploitation. <laughs> yes, that seems to be a generally accepted idea. Anyway, I feel we'll get a square deal from you, Brandon. I'm merely interested in keeping things in their proper places, Jordan. Mm -hmm. I think Princess Stella's so-called manifestations belong strictly in the field of entertainment. Not to be confused in any way with any branch of science. Well, perhaps the princess can convert you. Well, I won't take up any more of your time. I'll see you at the seance next Thursday. Right. I'm looking forward to it. I can find my way out. Uh, thanks for the interview. Not at all. Goodbye. Well, of all the nerve, trying to offer you a bribe, Jim. That's the limit. I don't see how you kept your temper. Fern, Jordan is playing for big stakes. And he's not the sort to leave any stone unturned. Well, I don't trust a man like that. He's not only too glib, but too well-dressed. <laughs> he's a dandy, all right. Uh, did you notice the spats? How could I miss them? Jim, I didn't know you'd been asked to be a judge at this thing. Yes. Princess Stella is by far the cleverest medium to try for the prize. And Neil Hayden isn't going to take any chances of being duped in carrying out the extraordinary terms of the Rollins' will. Who are the other judges, Jim? Oh, you've met them both, Professor Gans and Dr. Strong. <laughs> Princess Stella isn't going to have an easy time of it. No. Even though Gans and Strong are constantly at odds, they'll probably agree this once, that Princess Stella is a colossal fake. Jim, can you arrange for me to go to the seance? I don't believe in ghosts, <laughs> but I would... <laughs> would you like to see one, huh? Well, yes, I'd like to see what passes for a ghost. All right, Fern. But in the meantime, we have a great deal of research to do. What kind of research, Jim? We're going to look into all the tricks that mediums use, all the accoutrements that the earthly ghost is heir to, the blaring horns and trumpets, the moving tables and the tilting chairs, and all known devices that have ever passed for ghosts. Sounds interesting, Jim. We mustn't underestimate Princess Stella, Fern. This seance will be a kind of challenge, and we can't let science take a back seat. <laughs> You're late, Brandon. Strong and I have finished with that side of the room. Nothing unusual there. You don't mind if Fern and I have a look, Professor Gans? Well, if you're not willing to take our word for it. Go ahead, Brandon. There's plenty of time. Thanks, Strong. This way, Fern. So this is what a seance room looks like. I always thought they were done in black velvet. This one's completely in white. Yes, the princess knows the value of contrast. Uh, she's a showman, all right. Now for the inventory. White painted walls. White rug that completely covers the floor. 
Eight straight back white chairs. Help me examine them, Fern. Right, Jim. Hmm. They're all metal. No false bottoms. Nothing could be hidden in these chairs. Let's take the table next. It... Hmm. That's all metal, too. Examine the legs, Fern. They're single strips of metal, Jim. Nothing there. Nothing under the rug. Jim, there's no place to hide any ghosts in this room. Certainly doesn't look that way. No windows. In fact, there's only one thing about this entire room that strikes me as a little odd. What's that, Jim? There are four radiators, two at each end. Well, this is a very large room. In cold weather, I imagine all four of them are needed. They're all cold today. Are you ready, Brandon? Uh, yes, Strong, I think so. Oh, just one other thing. Did you and Gans go over the room for hidden wires? Yes, we covered the walls and floor with a detector. Guess that takes care of everything, then. I'll tell Jordan we're ready to begin the seance. Put your flashlight on that corner. There's someone there. Yes. Jim, look. Something white floating there near the wall. It's a ghost. I see it, Fern. Turn on the lights. There's something there, all right. I'll do it. Hurry, Jordan. It's gone. Good heavens, Jim. It must have been a ghost. <sighs> look at the Princess Stella. She's in a trance. Uh, wake up the Princess, Jordan. Wake her up. Of course. Princess Stella. Princess, wake up. Jim, this is more than I bargained for. She's coming, too. What, what happened? Brandon, strong. Help me examine this end of the room thoroughly. This sort of thing just isn't possible. That was the strangest thing I ever saw. A truly wonderful performance. There doesn't seem to be a trace of anything to mark the passage of that ghost. Well, fellow scientists, what are we going to do? If we can't explain this manifestation, we have to award the prize to Princess Stella. Not so fast, Strong. Well, what do you suggest, Gans? I don't know. What do you think, Brandon? There's no denying it. We saw the ghost, and it's up to us to explain exactly what it was and where it came from. I think we'd better call for a repeat performance. Right. I'll tell Jordan. Uh, Jordan! Jordan! Come over here. Yes? Yes. What is it, Professor Gant? Uh, we're not convinced, Jordan. We're calling for another seance. No, no, I cannot. I am exhausted. I cannot. Princess, the judges are within their rights. The terms of the will stipulate that two tests may be demanded. Oh, I am faint. I cannot go through all this again. Now, gentlemen, the princess is nervous and upset. Uh, could we postpone the second seance until tomorrow? Well, I don't see why not. What do you say, Brandon? I think that's an excellent idea. Are you agreed, Gans? Yes. In fact, I prefer that. I've just remembered something that may prove helpful to us. I'll need a little time to check on it. Uh, we'll meet tomorrow, then, hmm? Yes, Jordan. However, I'd like to speak to you privately for a few moments. Now. Oh, certainly. Come into the other room. This way, please. Mm. Uh, now, Professor Gans, what is it? Uh, have you and the princess traveled much abroad? Yes, widely. About 20 years ago, did you bill yourselves as the countess and the clown? Why, no. That must have been... Uh, Someone else. Why do you ask? They were a popular carnival act in Austria when I was teaching there. Something about you two reminded me of them. Well, the princess and I are not exactly a vaudeville team, Professor. I wonder what became of that act. I must find out before the seance tomorrow. Really, Professor, what can that have to do with Princess Stella and the Rollins prize money? It may have everything to do with it, Jordan. I'm rather certain that the Countess and the Clown are fugitives from justice.
And now, back to the Avenger and the ghost murder. Fern, we can't let Princess Stella get away with this ghost business. There's got to be an answer here in the seance room. Examine that radiator, Fern. I'll take this one. This one's cold, Jim. That's strange. This one is warm. Turn the valve, Fern. Maybe the heat's turned off. Okay. I'll see about the other radiators. Right, Jim. Fern, one of these radiators is warm and one is cold. What do you make of it, Jim? Don't know yet. I turn the heat on. We'll give them a chance to warm up. Even though we never held the same ideas, Gans, I never thought you'd deliberately oppose me in a thing like this. I had it on good authority that your vote was the only one against me. I admit it, Strong. I don't think you're fitted to be head of a research foundation. Such a position requires an older man. Wide experience. Like yourself, I suppose. So that was the reason for it. You want the position yourself. Now listen here, Strong. Mind your tongue. Gentlemen, what's the trouble? Brandon, Professor Gans blackballed me. I'd have been elected head of the Lansdowne Foundation if it hadn't been for him and his petty personal ambition. this is a matter between you and me, Strong. Let's keep it that way. I voted in good faith for what I believe to be the good of the Foundation. Your day is coming, Gans. I'll get you for this. Are you gentlemen ready to begin? Everyone is waiting. Well, Jordan, I see you've decided to brazen it out. If you have anything to say to me, Professor Gans, say it in private. I'm afraid that won't be possible. My news will be of interest to the public. But I have decided to let you put your show on first. My news can wait. I'll call everyone in, then. Just a moment, Princess Stella. Will you sit at this end of the table today? Very well, Mr. Brandon. It makes no difference to me. Thank you. Turn out the lights, Jordan. I'll keep my flashlight on you. All right. Now... Take your place in the circle, and everyone join hands. Hayden will hold my right wrist so that my hand will be free to turn on this flashlight in an instant. There. Are you ready, Princess? I am ready. I call upon some friendly spirit. Let my voice penetrate these walls and travel on wings of wind. Out there in the vast unknown, I seek a friend. A lonely, unhappy spirit. I would call you back from the dark, lost valley of the beyond. Come, spirit, manifest thyself. The veil is lifting. The boundary between the living and the dead is not a barrier. It is but a frail cloud of mortal man's uncertainty. Come, kind spirit, appear, appear. The spirit approaches. Who calls? Who calls me? There it is, in the corner. Ghost. It's there, all right. Keep your hands joined, everyone. I'll turn on the lights. Hurry, Brandon. It's already disappearing. Oh, it's gone. Jim, look. Professor Gans, he must have fainted. Help me, Brandon. We'll get him out of here. Don't touch him, Strong. Why not? Look closely. There's a small dagger below his heart. What? Professor Gans is dead. <laughs> have confirmed my suspicions, Fern. Professor Gans was killed by a poison dagger. Any prints on it? It was too smudged to be of any value. Jim, up until now, I've never believed in ghosts. But you'll have to admit that no living person in that room could have thrown that dagger. No one broke the circle for a second. So you're willing to pin this murder on a ghost? Well, how do you explain it, then? The ghost is the only one that we can rule out. Because, you see, there wasn't any ghost. There wasn't any? But, Jim, we saw it twice. What we saw was nothing more than a clever mixture of muriatic acid and ammonia vapor released through tiny holes in the dummy radiator. One radiator at each end of the room was a dummy. But how did the ghost disappear so quickly? The gas was operated by an automatic pressure gauge in the basement. It was timed to last for ten seconds. And that spiral whirling effect was due to the intermittent release of air which circulated about the vapor. At the end of ten seconds... The whole thing was dissolved by a very light spray of ammonia and water, also released from the radiator. Gosh, 
I almost believed in that ghost. Especially after you placed Princess Stella at the opposite end of the table for the second seance. That's why they had two sets of radiators in that room, just in case a skeptic made a request like that. But what of the voice, Jim? It didn't come from anyone in the room. It came from the ghost. Well, that's easy. Princess Stella is an accomplished ventriloquist. Well, there goes my ghost story right up the chimney, or I should say right down the radiator. Fern, I don't want any of this revealed until we know who murdered Gans. All right, Jim. But I don't see how we're ever going to find that out. At the moment, neither do I. But we'll keep trying. Is the inspector still questioning Jordan, Strong, and the princess? Yes, but we'll have to let them go for lack of evidence. I wonder if Jordan had time to put on his socks before he went to headquarters. His socks? Yes. Our fashion plate disillusioned me. He appeared at that last seance without any socks. Well, Fern, get your coat. We're going to the gymnasium. Whatever for, Jim? I'm interested in seeing a little professional boxing. I've often heard those French savat boxes are something to see. Stella, what are you doing? I'm packing, Jordan. I'm going to pull out. Don't be a fool, Stella. We're under bond. You've got to stay here and stick things out. You suit yourself. I'm leaving. Now listen to me, Stella. We still have a chance to pull through all this and win that $50,000 prize. You've got to go through with that seance today. If we stay here, we'll wind up in jail no matter how the seance turns out. What are you getting at? The police have no evidence against us. Strong was the only one with a motive for killing Gans. We're in the clear. You're wrong, Jordan. Jim Brandon knows we had a motive for killing Gans. Brandon? How could he know anything? I heard the inspector tell Brandon to search Gans' apartment. Since Gans know who, knows who we were and all about the trouble that you got us into in Vienna, he must have had some proof of it. Brandon has that proof now, and he's just waiting for the proper time to use it. That does put us in a spot. We've got to get out of here, Jordan. I'm afraid. What are you afraid of, Stella? Did you kill Gan? How dare you say that? Now, you... take it easy, Stella. Listen, I'll make a deal with you. If you'll stay here and go through with this seance, I promise you have nothing to fear from Brandon. What are you talking about, Jordan? You wouldn't uh, try... don't worry about what Brandon knows, that's all. Is it a deal? I don't know. How do I know I'm not next on the murderer's list? You're being hysterical. Now, come on now. Get things ready for your performance. If you make it a good one, Stella, we'll be on easy street. Oh, Mr. Jordan, may I speak with you a moment? Uh, of course, Miss Collier. What is it? Well, Mr. Brandon is busy at police headquarters and won't be able to get here for the seance. But, but he must. This is the final test for the prize. You're to go on with the seance as usual. It is understood that if you convince Strong and Hayden that Princess Stella has brought about a genuine manifestation, the prize is hers. All right. I'll call the princess. We are ready. Close the door, please, Mr. Jordan, and uh, turn out the lights. Yes, princess. Jordan, wait a moment. What was that noise? I don't know. It seemed to come from just outside the door. But there's no one there. Well, close the door then and let's get started. <coughs> Join the circle, Jordan. Let me warn you all. Do not break the circle, no matter what happens. Let silence reign a moment. Spirit of another world, come to us. Manifest thyself to those who do not believe. Show thyself within this room. Come, spirit, appear, appear and speak. Who calls? Who disturbs this spirit? I am the spirit of Alvin Gans. Something is wrong. Turn on the lights. Stay where you are, all of you, and hear me out. Ghosts of the murdered have a right to speak. Turn your flashlight on him, Dr. Strong. There's no one there. I'm here, but you can't see me. It cannot be a ghost. It cannot be. You admit before witnesses, Princess Stella, that you have no power to produce a ghost? Yes, yes, I but tell me who you are. I am the Avenger, Stella. I am here to accuse Claude Jordan of the murder of Professor Gans. It's a lie. That's a lie. This is some sort of trick you're playing on me, Stella. It's no trick, Jordan. I'll turn on the lights and produce the evidence. It's a frame-up. Stella! Strong and Hayden, 
Search Jordan. Right, Jordan. No, Examine us with a flag. You'll find something interesting there. Let me go. Why, there's a small bow and arrow attached to his leg. And fastened underneath it is a small dagger like the one used to kill Gans. Yes, oh, that's right. This is Strong. Call Inspector White. Tell him Jordan is ready to give him an exhibition of some amazing footwork. Finish the clue that solved this murder case. I did? What, Jim? You noticed that Jordan wasn't wearing socks at the seance when Gans was killed. Well, how was that a clue? The thing that had us stumped until then was the certain knowledge that no one at that seance could have used his hands to drive that dagger into Gans' heart. That's right. But what if a person were just as dexterous with his feet as with his hands? You mean he could have thrown the dagger with his feet? Hardly thrown it, but he could have aimed it with his feet. Oh, I see. That little bow and arrow fastened to Jordan's leg could be set, aimed, and released by his other foot. That's right. After I'd figured that out, I realized that the smudge print on the dagger could have been a toe print. Oh, so that's why we went to the gymnasium to see those savat boxes who boxed with their feet. Yes. One of those boxes uh, demonstrated my theory of how the crime was committed without moving the upper part of his body at all. Jim, just what was it that Professor Gans knew about Princess Stella and Jordan? The motive for the murder? Jordan was mixed up in a killing in Vienna about 20 years ago that Gans happened to remember. He intended to expose Jordan after the seance that day, and Jordan knew it. There seems to be no limit to the methods of murder. <laughs> they don't give us detectives a chance to grow complacent. No. This one really had you on your toes. Oh, a pun, Miss Collier, that some would call a very murderous weapon. <laughs> Characters, names, places, and plots used in the Avenger program are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a thought. A thought. A thought. Remember, listen for another adventure of... The Avenger. Suspense. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present radio's famous couple, Ozzy and Harriet Nelson, in Mr. Diogenes, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Well, here's a letter from Hap, still on vacation. Let me read this. Uh, dear Harlow, 
Dear Harlow, this is the light. He must mean double life with those thrifty wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs that give you double the life as compared to ordinary spark plugs under equal service conditions. I've been saving up my voice to tell you. Saving? He knows that only wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs can give him greater gas savings. That I feel like singing. And with auto light resistor spark plugs, his car engine idles as easily as a song. Home, home on the rain. Ohm is right, and that exclusive built-in 10,000 ohm Autolite resistor found only in Autolite resistor spark plugs permits a wide spark gap that makes smoother performance, double life, and greater gas savings possible. So next time you visit your service station, ask your dealer to install a set of the new Autolite resistor spark plugs in your car. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with Mr. Diogenes and the performance of Ozzie and Harriet Nelson... Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. It was last summer. David and Ricky were at camp, and Harriet and I were spending a few weeks at our old apartment in New York. The excitement began with six cents, a nickel and a penny. I didn't find out about the nickel until later, after it was all over, but well, that's the way things go sometimes. Caesar didn't know about Brutus, Custer didn't know about Sitting Bull, and I didn't know about the nickel. The conversation must have gone something like this. Hello. Uh, this is Hector. You crazy fool, I told you not to call me. But no one could be listening in on your switchboard, my dear. As you realize, we are on the very brink. Before proceeding further, I must have your assurance there have been no changes. I told you that. Nelson is still the one. Right. But, gee, I'm getting worried. Oh, calm yourself, my dear. So he talks afterwards, so they start asking him questions. You have my assurance he won't talk. Yeah, but just... No one ever got a straight story out of a dead man. What? Oh, dear dead? me, I thought you understood that. No. No, I didn't. Listen, Hector, I don't want any part of this. Unfortunately, my dear, you already have a part of it. Nelson is down the street in a tobacco shop at this very moment. We'll be good friends inside of ten minutes. Goodbye. Ah, uh -huh, you lose the bet, Eddie. You haven't gained a pound. Take a look at the card. Oz, are you sure you had both feet on the scale? You mean you're questioning my word, the word of an Eagle Scout emeritus? Eagle Scout. Troop 3, Ridgefield Park, New Jersey. A scout's honor, see? Both feet on the scale. Now, as I recall, the bet was two bits against a can of pipe tobacco. I'll take gold nugget. No dice. All out of gold nugget ever since they started that crazy radio program of theirs. Uh, let's see. How about some of this, hmm? What's the matter? See, that's a funny one. Look, I'll refund your penny. No, 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 no. No, the, the card here. Now, look at my fortune. Today will be the most memorable day of your life. So what? So it's memorable. Today's our anniversary, you know. Yeah? Hmm. Oh, it's just a coincidence. Sure. Did you ever see a card like this before, Eddie? Ah, uh, as every time a guy gets weighed, I don't run right quick and peek over his shoulder. No, but the wording is so peculiar. The most memorable day of your life. That's a pretty broad statement for a scale company to make. Tell you what. If it turns out a bust, come back tomorrow and we'll dope out a nasty letter to the scale people. <laughs> well, okay, Eddie. Thanks for the tobacco. Forget it. So long, Oz. So long. Most memorable day of your life. Oh. Kind of strange at that. Most memorable day of... Oh, you know. oh I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not at all, I was just not at all, sir. It. My fault entirely. In a hurry, didn't look where I was going. Forgive me, please. Uh, my fault entirely. Should have looked where I was going. Sorry. Hey, hey, wait a minute. You dropped your wallet. Hey, mister. Hey, just a minute, will you? Huh? Oh. Here, you dropped your tonight. wallet. Wallet? Oh, yes, I know. It's lucky I caught up with I'm you. I'm quite aware I dropped my wallet, young man. Thank you so much. You mean you make a hobby of dropping wallets? <laughs> you hit the nail on the head, sir. This is a red-letter day on my calendar. The most memorable day of my life. Oh, well, it, it was... 
What did you say? The most memorable day of my life, Mr... Uh, 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 Nelson. Uh, Ozzy Nelson. Mr. Nelson. Allow me to introduce myself, sir. My name is Diogenes. Diogenes? Hector Diogenes. I seek the honest man. Oh, well, <laughs> that's very interesting, Mr. Diogenes. <laughs> the wallet, you see, is full of stage money. I have dropped it at the feet of a hundred, oh, nay, a thousand candidates, just as I did a moment ago. Allow me to congratulate you, Mr. Nelson. You are the first to pick it up and return it to me unhesitatingly. Oh, uh, tell me, uh, do you plan to be home tonight? Well, as a matter of fact, no. It's our anniversary, and Mrs. Nelson and I plan to celebrate. Oh, dear. Too bad, too bad. You'll simply have to change your plans. There's no other way. I beg your pardon? <laughs> I, I admit, sir, my methods may seem a bit eccentric, but this I permit myself. With five millions of dollars, a man may allow himself the luxury of eccentricity. My goal, my target, has never changed from the first. To discover the honest man, then to indoctrinate him with the wisdom of my ancient namesake, Diogenes the Cynic. Well, that hurdle passed. My fortune, my resources, everything are at his disposal. Well, but, now, wait a minute, just a minute. Let me get the thing straight. Oh, it's very simple. Here, in this leather-covered book are the discourses of Diogenes, the wisdom of the greatest thinker the world has ever known in 20 short pages. Now, you will take this with you, Mr. Nelson, and commit it to memory tonight. Tomorrow morning at nine o'clock here at this very place, we shall meet, and I will hear you recite. Uh, now, time is Thank of the essence, sir. Spend it well, spend it gloriously tonight at the feet of Diogenes the Cynic. Your fortune, your future, nay, the world itself, are within your grasp. <laughs> and now, uh, good day, sir. Well, wait now, no, uh, just uh, a minute. Good day uh, Mr. and uh, Godspeed. Good day. <laughs> aren't you? Yeah, I guess so. How's the new hair dryer work? Oh, wonderfully. See? All dry. Oh, well, for once, I gave you something useful for Christmas. You <laughs> certainly did. Oh, gosh, I'm so excited about tonight. Oh, that's nice. Dinner, a show, and maybe dancing afterwards. Shouldn't I be excited? Uh, Harriet, that brings up a very touchy problem. Oh? A strange thing happened to me today. Sort of weird, you might say. In fact, I don't know what to make of it. Well, you've heard about that already. About what? The tickets. Tickets? Oh, I thought that's what you meant. Everybody in the building here got a free pair of tickets to South Pacific tonight. You're kidding. No, sir. They were stuck under all the front doors. No note or explanation, just a pair of tickets in a plain white envelope. South Pacific? Holy smoke. They're worth a small fortune, you know. How come? Nobody knows. Well, I, but a thing like that just doesn't happen. There must be a reason. You say everybody got them? Well, not quite. Twelve apartments, eleven envelopes. Three guesses who missed out. Us? Uh-huh. But I took it gracefully. I told everybody we were still going to celebrate our anniversary, even if we had to buy tickets to something. Gosh. Harriet, does something about today strike you as kind of different? Well, sure, it's our anniversary. That makes it different. No, no, I mean something strange. You might even say memorable. Memorable? What I mean is if somebody happened to predict that today would be a very memorable day, all this would sort of bear him out, wouldn't it? Ozzy, has Madame Zaza been reading your palm again? Well, not Madame Zaza, but a scale. On my way to work this morning, I got on the scale at Eddie's. Oh, I'll get it, dear. Oh, hello, Mrs. Pearson. Mrs. Nelson, I hope you don't mind the intrusion. Hello, Mr. Nelson. Hello, I Mrs. guess you heard Lemmy mm -hmm. Woods. Oh, my husband, Captain Pearson. Ship got in last night, and as usual, Lem's completely done in, but completely. I couldn't get Captain out tonight with a team of wild horses, so I want you to have these. Oh, what's this? The tickets. To South Pacific? Yes, I heard you folks missed out, and it seems such a shame being your anniversary and all. Oh, that's very sweet of you, Mrs. Pearson, but I should think your husband would love... Not the captain no sir. home he is, and home he stays. So take him and have a good time. No skin off our noses. We're going to stay home tonight and watch the television. The fights are on, and Lem's never seen our new set, you know. Oh, and speaking of television, there was something I did want to mention, Mrs. Nelson. I hope you won't take offense. Well, of course not. What is it? Uh, it's that thing over there on the table. 
The hair dryer? Uh-huh. It's strange, but every time you turn it on, we get buzzing on our television. I was hoping while Captain's home, you could use it daytimes instead of nighttimes. Oh, why, of course. I wish you'd told me before. Oh, I don't mind for myself, but now with Lem home. Oh, I'll remember, Mrs. Pearson, and thanks for the ticket. Oh, sure, it's nothing at all. That's what neighbors are for, you know. Have a good time now, and happy anniversary. Oh, thank you, and, and good night, good Mrs. Night. Pearson. Good night. <laughs> Oh, boy, that was a seven-day <laughs> blow. I know, but she is sweet. Isn't it wonderful, dear? Now we can go after all. Uh, Harriet, before we go any further, I'm going to have to ask your full cooperation. That sounds like a speech. It is, uh, a short one. To state it as boldly as possible, I don't know whether we ought to go out and celebrate or stay home and study Greek. Harriet, Say I... Say it again. Slower. I said we have one of two alternatives, to go out to South Pacific or stay home and study Greek. Now that I hear, I realize it calls for a short explanation. See, while I was at the school... Do you mind the radio, dear? No. But what is Caesar to a cynic? But Zeus, who hath deputed him and whom he serves. I'm glad you asked that. Oh, please. I'm it's 7.30, to... dear. I just thought you might like to know. Uh-huh, get this. Right on the subject. Mm, I'm listening. A woman came upon Diogenes, sitting before his hut during the revels of Bacchus. Foolish man, she said, why do you turn your back on this festival? Why rest idly here while others go to play at the theater? A very good question. What did Diogenes say? And the man answered simply, Woman, I am Diogenes, the cynic. Ah, uh, he was cheating. He didn't answer the question at all. Well, what do we do? I think it's a practical joke. No, not necessarily. Nothing unusual about a loony millionaire, you know. I read about a woman who left six million dollars to a cat. It's a gamble. If we go out tonight, and he shows up tomorrow, we lose a fortune. On the other hand, if I stay home with Diogenes, I'll... Uh-huh. I'll lose it anyway. I couldn't memorize this thing for $10 million. Where's your coat? I'm in it. Here's your hat. You're always ahead of me. Here it is, the show you've been waiting for, the Gold Nugget Gold Rush. Get the radio, will you, dear? Yes, folks, here it is, the show that just loves to give money away. No refrigerators, no mink coats, no... We can grab a taxi down by the drugstore. Did you lock the back door? Yep. Say, maybe we better go down the stairs, it's quicker. All right. Hey, look, the elevator's coming up. Well, that's funny. I thought everybody was out to the show tonight. Well, maybe it's the Pearsons. No, they're on the first floor, right next to the lobby. Well, look who's here, hey, for heaven's hey, sakes. Hey, good evening, Mr. Nelson. Uh, uh, Harriet, this is Mr. Diogenes, the man I was telling you about. Oh, uh, how, how do you do? do? And may I present my assistant, Mr. Mordecai Moran. Uh, ah, we, uh, yeah. Oh, how do you do? Uh, we we uh, decided to go out after all, Mr. Diogenes. Uh, I sort of skimmed through the book and... and well, frankly, I could never get it down pat by tomorrow morning. Ozzy always was slow to memorize. Yeah. <laughs> I have to write things down. That, that's right. Uh, but, Mr. Nelson, I thought I made that amply clear. You simply have to change your plans. Well, I, I'm afraid it's too late for that. See, my wife has been very anxious to see the show. Yeah, you know, it's... He's stumped. Uh, he's stumped, boss. He don't get it. <laughs> Does this help any, pal? Uh, uh, Mordecai, for the moment, you may put away the gun. Oh. Is this part of the joke, Ozzy? Well, I, I hope so. On the contrary, Mr. Nelson, this is most assuredly not a joke. I must warn you not to cry out or create a disturbance. If you are so rash as to do so, Mordecai knows he is free to use his gun with impunity. Yeah, impunity. Yes. Now, get in there now. Oh, what was the one? So you... Autolite is bringing you Ozzie and Harriet Nelson in Mr. Diogenes. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Now, let's see what else Hap has to say in his letter. Yesterday, I visited the Grand Canyon. What a wide, 
gap. Ah, good old Hap. All he can think of is the extra wide gap of auto light resistor spark plugs that give you smoother engine performance on leaner gas mixtures, actually save you gas. Sometimes I think of you back there telling folks about auto light resistor spark plugs. Ah, he's on the beam, all right, because only auto light resistor spark plugs can give you greater gas savings, smoother performance, and double spark plug life. And don't forget those auto light bullseye sealed beam headlights. Don't worry, I won't, because auto light bullseye sealed beam headlights are the new safe headlights guaranteed to give light even when the lens is cracked or broken. Harlow, you remember everything. So, friends, see your Autolite dealer tomorrow and get a set of wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs for your car. Then, wherever you travel, whatever you drive, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our stars, Ozzy and Harriet Nelson with Joseph Kearns in Mr. Diogenes. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It took a little while to get rid of the notion that Mr. Diogenes was pulling a practical joke. He had just walked out of a comic strip somewhere. But he wasn't kidding. His little pig eyes had greed in them now. There was something cruel about his floppy, fat jowls and his thick lips. He's like one of those blown-up animals in Macy's Christmas Parade. And Mordecai, he looked like he'd crawled out from under the reptile house at the Bronx Zoo. The men at the door closed, both of them headed for the radio. Hmm, it's a nice radio you have here, very nice. Where would the switch be, Mr. Nelson? Oh, yes, sure. Now are. listen to me, before you settle down for the evening, whatever you want, we don't have. Can you understand that? It's some other Nelson. New York is crawling with Nelsons. There are more Nelsons in New York than there are in Sweden. Furthermore, we aren't rich. Mordecai. We don't collect yeah, plans for atomic Ozzie, look out. That's enough, Mordecai. Everything in its place, Mr. Nelson, and in its proper time. Now, here it is, everybody, the Gold Nugget Gold Rush. Week number 16 of the Gold right, Good Ozzie? Nugget Gold Rush yeah. Bonanza. Quiet, Get this please. now stands as the biggest prize ever offered on any giveaway program anywhere. Tonight, after 16 weeks, nobody has yet identified poor Mr. Hackaway, the man who smokes the wrong kind of pipe tobacco. And our Gold Nugget Gold Rush Bonanza jackpot stands at the all-time high of... <laughs> $58,000 in cash! Ozzy, what is this? I don't know, but I think I'm catching on. Tonight, as usual, our phone call will go out to one of the thousands of discriminating men who long ago discovered the rich, bite-free mellowness of gold nugget pipe tobacco. And tonight, as usual, our Pony Express rider is waiting at his post with $58,000 in greenbacks in his saddlebags, ready to go if our contestant correctly guesses the identity of that unenlightened, misguided, long-suffering fella who smokes the wrong kind of pipe tobacco, poor Mr. Hackaway. Now, while we're getting Mr. Hackaway out of his wheelchair and up to the mic, stand by your phone. Uh, uh, turn that down, Mordecai. Yeah, boss. Yeah. I couldn't help uh, hearing you say you were uh, <clears throat> catching on, Mr. Nelson. Ozzy, they're calling you tonight? Ask Mr. Diogenes. Exactly, exactly. Perhaps you didn't realize, Mr. Nelson, how lucky you were. Well, how did you find out about hey, it? Boy, shall I... No, 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 Mordecai. I, uh, I don't think we need concern ourselves with the possibility either of these charming people will behave uh, <laughs> indiscreetly after it's over. I became acquainted a short time ago with the telephone operator on this program, Mr. Nelson. And she informed me, uh, in return for a share of the proceeds, that you were selected early this week. It then became a simple problem of ensuring against intrusion by the other denizens of the building here. That's where the tickets came from. Oh, precisely. And ensuring also that you would be at home at the time the call was made. Hence my little gambit with the wallet this morning. Now, attend me carefully. The call will come through in a moment. I shall take it. A word and outcry from either of you, and Mordecai shoots. Is that quite clear? Yeah, but you know you'll never get, get away with it. up, enough already. Yes, sir. Here's the big moment now, folks. The phone call is going through, and while we're waiting for the connection, here once again is poor Mr. Hackaway. He scratches a match. He lights his pipe. He inhales. 
And of course, because it's the wrong kind of pipe tobacco, <laughs> that's all there is to it. The rest is up to the lucky man who's getting tonight's call. Who is Mr. Hackaway? All right. Steady now. Don't take your eyes off the motor car, Hatch. Hello. Uh, this is the Gold Nugget Gold Rush radio program, sir. For security reasons, we are identifying you only as Mr. O.N. Would you give me your name, please? Oswald G. Nelson. Fine, fine. You, sir, are our lucky contestant tonight. Is your radio tuned to our program, sir? Indeed it is. Good, good. Then you know about poor Mr. Hackaway. Have you any idea who he is? I think so. Remember, you only have one guess. If correct, our Gold Nugget Pony Express rider will arrive at your home with $58,000 in cash within the hour. I don't need to point out that's a load of hay. So don't hurry. Think carefully. Think, Mr. O.N. Take your time and think. Now, who is poor Mr. Hackaway? Harpo Marx. Harpo Marx! Harpo, you're absolutely correct! Harpo Marx it is! Congratulations, Mr. Owen! You've just won yourself $58,000 in cash! Our messenger is on his way home! Goodbye, Mr. Owen, and congratulations! Yes, goodbye, sir. All right, what happens now? Mrs. Nelson and I shall remain here to receive the messenger. You will retire to the rear with Mordecai. All right, quickly now. Take him in back. Well, he shoved me in the bedroom closet and locked the door. And I heard his steps fade off a little, probably to the bed across the room. A string hit me on the nose, and I remembered the light in the closet. It was 8.15. The messenger would be here in a half hour, maybe less. After that... I didn't want to think about after that, so I tried to fix my mind on something else. And that's when my eye lit on something lying next to a hat box in Harriet's side of the closet. It was the new hair dryer. For some reason or other, this made me think of Captain and Mrs. Pearson. Doggone this thing. Lem, dear, it's as simple as ABC. Look. I don't know what happened, Mary. All of a sudden, the picture listed heavy deport and she began to spit at me. Why, there's nothing to it. It's beyond me how you can drive a steamer, Captain, yet throw up your hands when it comes to a television. Yeah. See this knob here? Uh -huh. This is for sound. And this is for your picture. Oh, dear. Uh, 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 you see? That's what happened before. Why, I don't understand it. Let me... Oh, I know it's Mrs. Nelson. Is it? But it can't be. Can't it? No, I gave her our tickets. They're out. What are you talking about, Mary? Her electric dryer does that. Maybe she changed her mind and stayed at home. I'll run no, right no, up no, there. No, 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 forget it. No use raising a hob over a little thing like that. Well, how, how, how do you turn it off? Well, here, let me... The fights don't come on for an hour anyway. She'll likely have her hair dry by then. Funny they didn't go to the show. Wait a minute. If I'd known that, I'd... Mary. What's the matter, Lem? Wait, wait, don't turn it off. Let me listen. Ah, there's the messenger. Now remember, Mrs. Nelson, not a sign, not a move. Go ahead. Yes? Oswald G. Nelson? Yes, that's right. Happy prize money to you. <laughs> Happy prize money to you. Happy prize money, Mr. Oswald G. Nelson, from the Gold Nugget people to you. <laughs> Here's your package, sir. Congratulations. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, who are those gentlemen with you? Uh, these bums? Uh, oh, uh, these fellows are from the armored car people. Mr. Nelson, for security reasons, your name won't be released to the press until tomorrow afternoon. Mm -hmm. We suggest you tell no one about this until the money is deposited. That's very sensible, very. Yeah. Thank you, my good man. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> yes, uh, good night, sir. Uh, Mordecai! Mordecai! We've got it! We've got it! <laughs> Ozzy, hold my hand, will you? Sure. Shut up. Mordecai, you bring the car around as quickly as possible, understand? Yes, sir. 
I don't want to seem nosy, but where are we going? <laughs> Mordecai and I are going to Cuba. What about us? Where are you going? Oh, yes, indeed. Where? That's a good question. But perhaps a little beyond us, don't you think? More a question for a metaphysician or a philosopher, I should say. Yes. And now, if you'll step out into the lobby, we'll... <laughs> Who's that? I don't know. Stand right there. Wait a minute. Don't move lest I blow you to Davy Jones with this hair seat going 45. Ozzy, it's Captain Pearson. Ozzy. <laughs> oh, dear, he's passed out. <laughs> Stars, Mrs. Nelson, you certainly lived a lifetime in the last hour. That clever husband of yours making a Morse code SOS with that hair dryer. I get the shakes when I think how close we come to turning the television off. Me too. Who's that man with Ozzy? I don't know. He come up just as Lemon, the officer, took off in the patrol car. Oh, would you excuse me for a minute, Mrs. Pearson? Sure, go ahead. What are they doing? I guess I figured it wrong then. I, I get $2.25, but if you say $1.79, well... I guess you ought to know. Good. Well, shall I let you have it now? I, I just happen to have some spare change in my pocket. Yeah, well, I, I guess I'll be all right. Okay. Uh, there's a dollar, uh, fifty, seventy-five, and two, four. So I'll make seventy-nine, right? Right, and here's your package. Uh, all square. All square. Thanks a lot, Mr. Nelson. Good night. Good night. Ozzie, you gave him the fifty-eight thousand. Well, sure, everything's settled now. It's all square. Who was it? Well, the income tax man. Oh, no. Come on, silly, let's find a taxi. We've still got time to make the second act. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's stars, Ozzie and Harriet Nelson, with Joseph Kearns playing Mr. Diogenes. Ozzie, I've been hearing you and Harriet on your H.J. Hines program, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. Oh, thanks. And we've been listening to suspense regularly. They want to quit while you're even, Harlow? No, no. I want to tell you about Autolite resistor spark plugs. Look out, Ozzie. The man's trying to sell you something. Oh, no, Harriet. Autolite resistor spark plugs sell themselves. Really? Oh, then what do they need you for, Harlow, old boy? Yes, you're talking yourself out of a job. Maybe I should have quit while I was even. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, Harlow. <laughs> now, we want you to keep on working. Uh, what else is there to tell about your Autolite resistor spark plugs? Well, just this, Ozzie. They're one of more than 400 products made by Autolite for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants, coast to coast. And these Autolite products include complete electrical systems used as original equipment in many makes of America's finest cars, batteries, spark plugs, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, and bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. <music> Next Thursday for Suspense, Rosalind Russell will be our star. The play is called Consideration, and it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Mr. Diogenes is an original play for radio by Harold Swanton. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Kirk Douglas, Marlena Dietrich, and Richard Widmark. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Rosalind Russell. You can buy Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite stayful batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. From Maine to California and in far-off overseas outposts, the USO flag is flying once again. Those of us back home can now be sure that the USO is taking good care of our sons and brothers and loved ones on active duty with America's armed forces. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details.
greetings as always, Mystery Lover. Time for another visit with Valentine. I think our menu for mayhem is particularly enticing this adventure. It's called the Blue Plate Special. And it was created especially for those of you who are trying to lose a few pounds. You see, it doesn't contain a single protein or calorie, or even a vitamin for that matter. Just a couple of fat heads, which you should be able to digest very easily. Now, if you'll take your elbows off the table, I'll tell the chef to commence serving. How much did you say? Uh, uh, what's that, Josh? I said, how much did you say? Oh, uh, well, a uh, dollar seventy-five is what I said, but you know me. Yes, Sam, I know you. Uh, been in the family a long time, I suppose. Must have meant a good deal to your dear old mother, rest her soul. How much, I ask you? Uh, uh, of course, with you boys, it's a little different, but I want you to understand nothing would make me prouder than to do business with the Higby family. Never mind that old maid business of uh, yours. Uh, but I mean, uh, well, what did I say? Uh, 250 Was that what I said? Uh, oh, sure, Josh, I'd be glad to pay you uh, uh, three dollars. Three dollars you pay me for that plate. Oh, Josh, no. Well, for three dollars, I'd break it over your head. Do you hear me? Let me go, Josh. Please, look out. You oh, no, no, little no, chip artist no. trying oh, to please. take me for a dodo. Oh, well, I'll break every plate no. in the house before you get it. No. And I'll break you, too. Dear Mr. Valentine, you've got to come to Hickby Corners before something terrible happens, before I'm ruined. Mr. Valentine, I want you to, to steal a plate. Yours truly, Sam Ferris. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Here we are, that big place with the iron deers. Way out in the country, isn't it, Mr. Ferris? Why up here, next door? Uh, some of these iron deers always turn out to be <laughs> live dogs. What? Oh, but don't you worry, none. They won't bother us if we walk on the gravel and make a lot of noise. That's what I always do. Now, wait a minute, not so fast. Uh, from what you've said and from the looks of their house, uh, these Higby brothers practically own this part of the country, right? Uh, Josh thinks they do. Well, they have got a pile of money, I guess, And yet but... you told us he wanted to sell you a plate, of all things, to raise cash. Oh, well, it's a farm, you see. Josh wants a new tractor, that's all. And it makes sense, that house of theirs full of heirlooms they never even look at. But what kind of a plate? Early to bed, early to rise. That's what it said. A what? Well, you see, I run a furniture store here in the corners. Yes, we know that much. Well, in this part of the country, a man gets to have a nose and reputation for antiques. Know what I mean? <laughs> well, some of them early chinaware, hand-painted, mottos and things on, you know the type. My gosh, they can get me $200 a piece sometimes in the city. Only this one you looked at wasn't any good, huh? This one I looked at was a fake. Cheap imitation you could buy for a dollar. But out of the kindness of my heart, I offered more than that. You mean out of the fact you're scared to death of Josh Higby, right? Um, well, <clears throat> Mr. Valentine, I've been in business around here for 27 years. I got a standing, know what I mean? Well, so's Josh Higby. But he's mean and vindictive, too. And once he starts after you, you might as well move out of here. He thinks that plate's worth $100 or more. I know it's not. But he's already telling people I'm a liar and not to be trusted, and they should take their antique business to somebody honest. And I suppose you want me to steal that plate so you can prove to people that it is a fake, right? <clears throat> you, uh, won't do it, huh? <laughs> what do you think? Well, of course, I didn't exactly mean steal like an ordinary thief. I know, <laughs> but it seems to me that this whole thing is nothing but a tempest in a teapot anyway, so why don't... George, we... wait. Oh. Somebody's coming. Oh, well, now, 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 careful what you say. People can get killed in tempests, you know, and when Josh gets all riled up... Well, and... for the land's sake, 
Sam, what are you doing out here? <laughs> oh, it's you. <laughs> you think it'd be anyone else? Saw you standing out here in my front lawn, finally thought I'd better either chase you away or ask you in. <laughs> Just baking some cakes, and they're not all on order. So why don't you and your friends come in for a piece, uh, huh? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, this is Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine, Widow Parsons. Hello, Mrs. Parsons. Yes, cottage in the trees there, that's hers. But if you'll excuse I know, us, Widow... I know, I know. You think you're going next door, don't you? <laughs> well, there's no one home. Well, isn't Josh or Amy... I heard both their cars drive out hours ago. Oh, well, if they're gone, we we'll just... <laughs> And I suppose that makes you prick up your ears, because that makes you think the coast is clear. Yeah. Oh, look at him blush. Oh, no, 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 don't be shit. Uh, coast clear for what, Mrs. Parsons? Well, to steal behind their backs. Oh, I... Sam, I know you're all right, but the way those two Higbys look after her, you would have a chance. Not that I blame you, Eddie. I guess every man in the country has eyes on her, and after all, the way she primps for them. Her? Oh. Whom are you talking about? Why, that little secretary, that Doris Drury. She's spending the summer there. Uh, didn't you know? And those two Higbys acting like 17-year-olds and Sam here. Oh, 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 look at him blush. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh no, 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 stop it. She don't mean anything to me. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Well, I got bad news for you anyhow. She's not home either, making her weekly trip to the city, and she's not back yet. So there, Sam, you little conniver. Oh, <laughs> you come all the way out here and brought your friends on a false alarm. <laughs> Oh, oh, that blasted nosy nuisance. No, no, Sam, no, I'm still interested. In fact, in the morning, I'd be only too glad to investigate this case of the uh, plate. Yeah, there might be more to it than I thought. Well, the dog makes a lot of noise, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh -oh. Hello there. Good morning. What? You Mr. Higby? What? Oh, yes, yes. What do you want? Well, this may sound a little silly, but I want to talk about a plate. Huh? Oh, from Sam. Oh, no, no. It's Josh you want. I am Amos Higby. Oh. I don't know where my brother is. Now, please don't bother us now. I'm sorry. Oh, hey, wait a minute. Well, I just My want brother, to talk... Josh, is a fine man. A fine man, you hear me? He's... No. Go away. I'm sorry. Well, what's the matter with him? Oh, I don't know, Brooksy. But if Josh isn't here, it isn't him I want to see anyway. Come on. But if there's nobody here, why go in? That girl, Angel. She's supposed to be back from the city by now, isn't she? Well, maybe she can tell us why people get so excited about chinaware. The plate. It's broken. And in the hall there, there are others broken. <gasps> yeah. The plate can be a pretty good murder weapon, can't it? I guess that's the secretary. And she's dead. Take it easy, take it easy, all of you. Nobody's upset but you, Sean. Sure. All right, hang it, I am upset. Why shouldn't I be? You, Pete. Yeah? Get those men out finding Josh Higby. Okay, sir. What about Amos Higby? He was the one we saw coming out of the house, and the doctor says it didn't happen over an hour or two ago. Yes, yes, sure. But he wouldn't hurt anybody, not Amos. Well, it was quite a fight, no matter how it happened. Yeah, hair and curlers, bathrobe. I guess she must have come down for breakfast. Come on, I have an idea, Sheriff. Where are we going? Well, it was late when this happened, wasn't it? You said so yourself around breakfast time. Well, if there was a real fight here, what about that next-door neighbor? Isn't she supposed to be a snoop? No. No. I didn't hear anything. But, Mrs. Parsons, are you sure? Honestly, it's, it's too far to hear anything. Uh, she's right, Valentine, it is. Skip it for a second, will you? Mrs. Parsons, uh, those two Higby brothers both have been making eyes at their secretary, isn't that right? No, no, no. They're really nice. It, it wasn't that way at all. Uh, of course they made eyes at her. They couldn't help it. No more than any other men around. She was somebody sent to them by their lawyers in town to help out with the books. But she didn't want to be a working girl all her life. She was a nice girl. I talked to her several times. Oh, Mrs. Parsons, you've sure changed your tune. <laughs> well, what's that? Well, I don't mean you really were critical of anybody last night. 
But now there's been a murder, so everybody's perfect. Oh, huh? I didn't mean that. Uh, but it doesn't do any good to... It might do some good if I pointed out your kitchen window has a nice clear view of their front door. And their front hall where the murder took place has glass across no, no, the front. No, no, no. It won't do any good. What won't do any good? Mrs. Parsons, who are you afraid of? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I mean, oh, please. You saw it, didn't you? You saw who was in there with that girl. Leave me alone. I've been their neighbor for 12 years. You can't make me say things. I'm sorry, but who was it, Mrs. Parsons? I I saw him come out. I saw her. I was going to you. It's such a lovely morning. Did you see the murder? I heard her scream. They were alone because I saw him leave earlier for the field. Oh, wait a minute. Who? Which is the him that left? It won't do any good, I tell you. You can't hear anything but a loud noise like a scream, and and, and and then I saw her fall, and then he slammed the door shut. And you've just been sitting here ever since, scared to death. Yeah, we'll take care of you, don't worry. <laughs> and it's good enough eyewitness for a jury, all right, only in the circumstances. Yes, Mrs. Parsons. You still haven't told us who it was. It's no good, I tell you. I don't know. I couldn't hear, but I could see him. Hey. Wow. Hello, Higby. Oh, no. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mrs. Parsons. I guess this is the one, huh? Hey, Miss Higby. What's all this? My name is Josh Higby, stranger. Heard you wanted me, Sheriff, and I thought I'd well, better... Wait, hold it, would you? You're the same guy we talked to out in front of your place only an hour ago. You're Amos. Yeah, you were scared and you ran away. I'm, I'm sorry. It won't do any good. Are you trying to make a liar out of me, stranger? Oh, shut up, Josh. Valentine, you don't understand the circumstances, that's all. But you realize, Josh and Amos are identical twins. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine. It all started over a plate. Or did it? Apparently, a visiting secretary from the city, the girl named Doris Drury, was quite a dish herself. Or at least both of the Higby brothers and every other middle-aged man in the vicinity thought so. But now, Doris is dead, struck down by one of those same heavy plates. Well, for a moment, the crime looked simple. There was practically an eyewitness, and it was obviously a Higby who did it. All right, but which one? Because if your name is George Valentine, you've just learned that the Higbys are identical twins. Uh, at least it was one of you twins. That's something. Sure, that's something, all right, Sheriff. Well, now, is that all you're going to say, Josh? Don't know yet. Haven't talked to my lawyer. All right. But in the meantime, i got to lock you up. You know that. Well, don't apologize for it. Mrs. Parsons says it was one of you. You heard her say that, didn't you? There on the farm, you're both dressed about the same. I heard, I heard. Oh, laughing blabbermouth. She can't help it. Should have sicked the dogs on her the first time she borrowed a cup of sugar. Oh, uh, get in there. Hmm. Don't see Amos anywhere. We'll get him, don't worry. Now listen, Josh. I'll get your lawyer, but he's going to advise you the same as I am. That you should tell everything you remember about what happened. Oh, so, so. Be glad to. Well? Well? Well, pretty sore at this furniture guy, this Sam. About one of your family's heirlooms. A plate, I think he said. Sam's a liar. I'm no authority, but those plates, everything in the house is as good as... What's that got to do with it? Well, you see, Josh... Hold it, Sheriff. Let me with you. Oh, nothing, Josh. But that girl, Doris, was certainly pretty. What? In love with Amos, I understand. What are you trying to do? Leave her out of it. Well, that's a little hard to do in the present situation. This is our town, not yours, mister. Because you'd been putting on the dog for her, too, isn't that right? Get him out of here before In fact, I... you murdered her, didn't you? Why, you met me, Josh. Oh, no. Josh. No. Well, you're quite a temper. Did you kill her, Josh? You still haven't told us anything. What time did you get up this morning, Josh? 
Usually out in the fields early, both of you. But which one was first? Oh, come on, Sheriff. Let him wait for his lawyer. Can't make a man talk, you know. No, but you can trip him up. We'd better work fast before you get a permanent puzzle thrown in your lap. Hey, where are you going? To start at the beginning where I came in. On a plate. Okay, Sam, how many items have we found now that are fake? Well, now, let me see. There's the Dresden doll. That's strictly Detroit. Uh-huh. And, and, and three plates out of the ten there on the wall. I'll go take a look through the other rooms, George. Okay. Now, let's stick to just the stuff we saw so far, Sam. That's all of it, I think. Plus the early to bed, early to rise. And uh, uh, that pair over there. What's the total value, I mean? Of the fakes? Well, I don't get you. Oh, yes, you do. Because each one called for an imitation, Right. Well, sure, to match out the sets and so, so on. So what's the total value of the fakes if they were real? Oh, oh yeah. Well, say 150 times 3. And Dresden, of course, is higher prices. Oh, just in rough figures, please. Uh, $1,000? All told, 1200 maybe. Uh-huh. But that's not enough to go killing people over. I don't get what you're driving at. Don't you? Sam, maybe the reason Josh was mad at you the other day was because he really had no idea there were imitations in here. Yes, what is this? Oh, yeah, Brooksy. How much do you suppose this one's worth? What's that, a package? Yeah, all neatly wrapped up. It's almost oh. ashamed to open it. Let me see. Where'd you find it? It's in this suitcase under the stairs. Oh, wait a minute. Take a look at this, Sam. Hmm, another plate. It's a real one, all right. It is, huh? Mm. And the initials on the suitcase are D.D. George... Doris Drury. Well, say, she used to make trips every week to the city for the Higgins. Yeah, I know. All begins to fall into place, doesn't of it? Of course. She took things back and forth all the time. Well, her trips were for business. I mean, the Higbees wouldn't have known the difference. And she could have picked up imitations to replace things with. That's the idea. She was killed, but it was a crime of passion, a fight. Sam here started the ball rolling. Well, he got Josh all upset. Josh told Amos. And if one of them found out what Doris was yeah, doing... Yeah, that's he'd... right. It'd be a pretty big blow. Especially to a middle-aged guy who thought he was the reason for lowered eyelashes from a good-looking young woman. And then he finds out she was stealing and not even large amounts. It would... George, are the police all through here? Hmm, what do you mean? Well, they were out of the house even before we came back, but just now I felt a draft behind me. It must be from the back hall. I- I'm getting out of here. Somebody's back there. I don't want any part of this. Listen. Come on. Be, be, be careful, Valentine. Why? There's only one person that can be. All right, Amos. Come on. Get out of my way. Oh, no, you don't. Bust Look out. Out. Amos, the gentle one, huh? Well, maybe this will work. No. No, I, I, I don't know. Don't know what? Come on. What's your story going to be? No, no. No, I, I won't tell you anything. But you were hiding here, and earlier you ran away. Your brother's already accused you of the murder, you know. What? What did you sure, say? Sure, he said you No, no, no. I don't want to hear it. I won't tell you anything. Very good. Very fine. At least we got both of them, haven't we? Well, Sheriff, I tried one bluff on Amos, but it didn't work. Don't worry. I'll keep them separate, all right. And I suppose sooner or later we can cross-check and break down their stories. We hope. The attorney's going to kill me if I hand it to him this way. It's going to be one for King Solomon. Mm Mm-hmm. Twins are identical in appearance. One of them committed murder. The other one is keeping quiet to protect him. And keeping quiet so neither one can be tried for first-degree murder. Holy smoke, you can't hang two men when only one did it. What's the court going to do? End up by saying they both aided and abetted a criminal? Lawyers could argue till doomsday. Uh Uh-huh. Hey, Sheriff, will you trust me? No. Oh, I don't know. What do you mean? (laughs) I always wanted to play King Solomon. Why? Because he had a thousand wives? No, never mind. Just give me those keys, will you? Give you what? Your cell keys. Then meet me back out at the Higbee's. Don't worry. Your Deputy Pete can tag me. Now, look. I want those guys kept apart. The only way we're ever going to saw this twin act in half is... You want the murder solved, don't you? Okay. Let's throw a little party. Sit here, Josh. I'll be right back. Why not? 
It's my own driveway, isn't it? Yeah, sure. Come on, Brooksy. George, are you sure you know what you're doing? I want to get Mrs. Parsons. I'll get her. You stay there and watch. Hey, Pete. Yeah, right behind you, Mr. Valentine. Come on over here, please, will you? What about Amos here? I can't leave him alone. Come on, I said. Step on it. Well, okay. Get the sheriff in the house already, but... Hey, that's Sam over there. Yeah, yeah, both of you. Come on, step on it. George, you can't even see the cars from here, let alone the Higby. Hey, listen. That was a car door. They're getting together. Say, look, Stand I better... Still, will you? I know this is all against police practice, but there's a reason. Mr. Valentine? Yeah, Mrs. Parsons, over here. Come on out. I want you to take a look at something. I'm sorry, I got a job. Those two backs there, where am I supposed to take Hey, them? wait, wait. They're handcuffed, aren't they? Oh, for the love of... Bring her over, Brooksy. George, no, look. The Higbys aren't in the car. Where are they? Hey, stop you guys. Sam. There's one of them after Sam. Oh, get away from me. Sheriff. George, help him. Hey, hey, you. Did you see how Josh came at me, Mr. Valentine? You put Mrs. Parsons up to it, just sniveling little oh, horse. Oh, 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 oh. What is all this? Mrs. Parsons, can you tell these two men apart? Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry, Amos. Of course I can. Josh, I didn't mean to. All right, to. now, take it easy, please. I can tell him apart myself now. But you couldn't at a distance, I know that. Well, it's true. Josh may be a bit more aggressive than I am. Sure, but... Amos. And Josh jumped for Sam because Sam put Mrs. Parsons up to something. He what? Hey, now, looky here. But I... I think the boys will talk now, Sheriff. How about it, Josh? Did you mean, did I kill her? No, I didn't. I don't believe that. See what I mean, Sheriff? Easy way out of a riddle. How about you, Amos? She was a very sweet girl. Why would I kill her? Oh, I'm so glad. I told you I didn't want to say anything, but... No. No, I still saw what I did. Sure. We're just as bad off as we were, Mrs. Parsons. But at least we know now that the Higbys kept quiet because they hadn't checked with each other yet. Uh, now, wait a minute. Sam, get over there and stand beside them. Huh? You heard me. Well, he's about our size... Now, Dolly, I, I know you've known us for years, but you could have been mistaken about us. Hold it, all of you, please. I'm afraid this is pretty simple. There were a couple of tip-offs. I didn't think they were strong enough, but I guess they are. Josh, your secretary made weekly trips to the city, didn't she? Hmm. Oh, well, that's right. You see, we got a lot of holdings and investments. But last night, she came back from the city. So if she were stealing some of that authentic china... She'd scarcely wrap one up and leave it in her suitcase until next week's trip. Hey, that's right. In other words, somebody planted that there after the police left the house. So we'd think Doris was a thief. So we get the wrong idea about motive. What's all this stealing plates? I don't even know what you're talking about. Take it about. easy, Josh. Take it easy. You couldn't have done it anyway. You were in jail. Besides, it was too neatly wrapped. What's that? <laughs> well, I couldn't wrap a plate that neatly. I doubt if any man could. Uh, Mr. Valentine, I... Uh, except a dealer in those things? Now, now, wait a minute. Oh, I, I... No, Amos, I thought of that. But there's another clue. Same type. Mrs. Parsons, you bake cakes on order, don't you? So uh, I guess you haven't too much money. She's all right, Mr. Valentine. Now, you've lived here for years. Been in and out of the Higby's house. You could have stolen a few things, couldn't you? Not much, but enough to help out. I saw somebody out the window. I was at my kitchen window. Nobody else out here but you and the Higby brothers. So you grabbed at the straw of being a witness. I was And honest. it might have worked, too. Only this was a real crime of passion, wasn't it? The pretty young thing from the city, sure, primping and getting all the eyes. She was awful. Oh, no, she wasn't. But the Higbys have a lot of money. And I guess she might have had her cap set for one of them. Anyway, she'd be rough competition for a middle-aged widow. No. Well, what happened? She decided you were a nuisance? She find out about the plates and threaten to tell the Higby? No, no, she didn't. And she wasn't any good for him. Oh, cut it out, lady. The girl had come downstairs to talk to somebody. Josh and Amos always went out to work early. She came down in a bathrobe with curlers in her hair. Well, did you ever see a woman who was trying to make an impression come downstairs with curlers in her hair looking like a mop to meet a man? George, that poor Mrs. Parsons. Well, she committed murder, didn't she, Angel? So come on, let's get out of here. We can figure the rest on the way home. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Pretty easy 
to see how it happened, I guess. Yeah, sure. Living next door for years and years. Probably consider the Higby brothers her private property. Hope to marry one of them. <laughs> then along came Alana Turner. The only thing I don't understand is why Mrs. Parsons would steal from them. Well, consider their property hers, too, I guess. Jumping out a gun on what she hoped for the future, maybe. It wasn't much through the years, but she yeah. probably... She must have been panic-stricken when the girl found out about it. You know, George, sometimes you're very brilliant. All those feminine-type clues, wrapping packages, curlers and hair. That surprise you? Huh. Well, your secret, Angel. I've spent a good many years observing women. Imagine. Oh, but you should have caught on to that business. No, no, not I. I've spent all my time observing men. Oh. We ought to get together sometime. Now, there, Fred. There's an observation. You have just heard Blue Plate Special, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey will start as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men. Alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Man from Damascus. Damascus, capital of Syria. Population, 300,000 or so. They say it's the oldest city in the world that people still live in. Uh, I wouldn't know. But I do know there's a street in Damascus named the street called Straight. And I also know I once met a man from Damascus. And he was as twisted as they come. But back to a hot Wednesday afternoon. Chris was at the bar serving up some arak. And I was standing at the front of the cafe looking out into the Cairo streets. That's when an old man, dressed in a boy's postal uniform and riding a bicycle, stopped in front of the tambourine. When he came in, he was carrying a wet envelope in his hand. I have for the Mr. Jordan one special delivery letter. Would the Mr. Jordan sign his name on this line? The Mr. Jordan would? Oh, thank the Mr. Jordan. Yeah. Here you are, Pop. Buy yourself an ice cube. Muta Shakir. Muta Shakir, then. It was a white envelope with some dirty finger smudges and a Cairo postmark. There was no return address. I looked at it for a moment, then tore it open. The first thing I saw, flat and crisp, was a pack of Egyptian pound notes. And I did a quick tabulation. One thousand Egyptian pounds, five thousand American dollars. And clipped to the money was a short note. Partial payment for services to be rendered, one thousand pounds. I'm waiting for you at 16 Sharia El Nazar. Seven o'clock this evening will be fine. And it was signed... The man from Damascus. Well, I don't take easily to somebody's bidding. If someone wants to see me, he comes to me. So I put the money in the safe, but figured that wasn't the end of the man from Damascus. Exactly seven o'clock that evening, I knew I had figured right. Rocky. Hmm? What is it, Chris? Fell out to see you. Where? In your office. I tried to stop him, but he... Oh, that's right all right. I'm sort of expecting him. Uh, Mean-looking guy. Want me to come with you? No, no, I'll handle it. Yeah, take over the till, will you? Sure, Rocky. 
Hello, Jordan. Make yourself at home. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. <coughs> Pretty good booze. Too rich for your taste, buddy. Put it down. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Figured you differently. Everybody in town says you're a right guy. Or maybe you've been talking to the wrong people. What do you want? <laughs> you. You have been talking to the wrong people. I'm not for sale. That thousand pounds is just a start, pal. There's more where that come from. And there always is. Ah, come on, big shot. Button up your shirt. It's seven o'clock. You got the point, man. I can't make it. Ah, that's a big mistake. Your money's in the safe. You can have it back. Ah, that is not my instructions. Oh, so you're just a leg man. Yeah, something like that. You and me, we're working for the same man. All right, buddy, you're through talking. There's the door. Get away from the door, Jordan, or I'll pin you to the wall. <laughs> Seven-inch blade, Jordan. Damascus steel. Got it? I got it. All right, put the knife away. You'll cut your hand. I'll, uh, I'll come with you if your boss wants to see me that badly. I wasn't going to argue with a seven-inch double-edged blade, especially the way that monkey was waving it in the air. Well, we left the tambourine, climbed into his car, and drove through the Cairo streets, out one of the city gates. We ended up in front of a place called the House of Sand. It should have been called the Pile of Scrap, because that's what it looked like. But the knife man said it was a hotel. Two minutes later, my pal knocked on the door of room 12. Who is there? Jordan. He's come for the rest of the dough. You're taking a lot for granted, Buster. Quiet, you. All right, you may let him come in. Go on in, Jordan, and meet your new boss. I walked inside. My pal with a knife shut the door behind me and stayed outside. Then I saw him. The man from Damascus. He was tall and big, but I couldn't tell what he looked like. His whole face was wrapped in bandages. And he reminded me of those pictures I once saw of the invisible man. Hello, Mr. Jordan. Nice of you to come. Sit down. Uh, I'll take it standing. Well, it's good to meet again. Is it not, Mr. Jordan? Again? You do not remember? But you should. Damascus, 1939. Well, maybe it's my new appearance. I had a face then. What do you got now? Let's talk about Damascus. All right. You wish a drink? No, I just gave it up. Mr. Jordan... You wronged me in Damascus. I did? Yes, you wronged me most severely. So severely that I've never forgotten. And I said to myself that someday I would come for you. Well, I am here. Welcome to Cairo. Jordan, I'm not just talking for pleasure. You sure you got the right guy? And do not try to tell me you do not remember. You are the right man and you know it. But you are fortunate, Mr. Jordan. Yeah, how's that figure? I'm going to give you a chance to erase our difference and make a little money besides. You see, there's someone in Cairo that I want even more than you. So how do I figure? You are going to bring him to me. His name is Alex Zarko. Zarko? It's a pretty big order. I know, but I think you can do it. The police have had a dragnet out for two weeks trying to track him down. And I want to get to him before they do. I think you can bring him to me. You know Cairo better than any man I know of. You know where men like Zarko would hide and how to get to him. Ah, oh, sorry, friend. You've got the wrong guy. Jordan, listen to me. I would find him myself if I could. I just do not know Cairo. And I cannot go wandering around like this. I'm giving you a chance to square a dirty deal and make a little money on the side. I will double that thousand pounds and call off our little difference. Uh, what have you got against Zarko? He took something from me. What? My face. Oh. I want to find him, Jordan. I must. You do not know what it is to feel that you can never walk the streets again without a covering on the thing you once called a face. Well, what about it, Mr. Jordan? No, no deal. You got a private vendetta with Zarko. Keep it that way. Yeah, there's your thousand pounds back. Buy yourself another boy. I walked out of the house of sand, and the knife man was gone. I found a taxi and headed back for the tambourine. Alex Zarko. Yeah, an all-around no-good guy. The Egyptian police wanted him on an attempted assassination, espionage work, with an assorted killing or two thrown in. The police had all the roads covered, the trains and the flights out of the city. They figured they had him bottled up pretty well, and it was just a matter of time before they bundled him. 
Well, back at the tambourine, I drew myself a beer, found a back table, and did some thinking about the man and the bandages in the city of Damascus. What's up, Ralph? Hmm? Oh. Nothing, Chris, just thinking. Say, uh, did you ever hear me talk about Damascus? Damascus? Yeah. Spent nine months there once working for an oil company. No, I don't remember you saying anything about it. Why? Oh, nothing. Just trying to bring back a little memory. Drop it. It doesn't matter. Sure, I'll, I'll get back Excuse to Excuse me, gentlemen. You are Mr. Jordan? That's right. May I talk with you, please? It will take but a moment. Uh, all right, Chris. I'll talk to you later. Sure, Rocky. Sit down. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Jordan. I did not wish to trouble you, but I found that I had no other course. My name is Sandra Marr, and I'm from Damascus in Syria. Uh-huh. You're traveling in Cairo's on the Grand Tour. This is not a trip for pleasure. I'm looking for someone. Uh, if his name is Alex Zarko, you've got lots of company. No, his name is not Alex Zarko. It is Paul Marr. He is my husband. Paul Marr. I don't know anyone by that name. You may not know him by his name, Mr. Jordan, but I'm positive that you have met him. And how do you figure that? Oh, Paul said he had some business in Cairo. He left Damascus four days ago with a man whose name I do not know, but he was the same man who left the tambourine with you earlier tonight. It is my belief that he took you to see Paul. Oh, I get it. I tried, but I was not able to follow you through the streets of Cairo, so I've waited outside your cafe till you returned. I must see Paul. Would you take me to him? Nope. Would you tell me, then, where he is? Mr. Jordan, Paul's business, as he calls it, it is, it is trouble. Some terrible sort of trouble, I know. Oh, you're right there. He's a fine man, Mr. Jordan. A wonderful man, but... Things have not gone well since his face. He's in trouble, and I've got to help him. He's got a revenge on, lady, with a guy named Zarko and me. There's nothing fine about that. Revenge? Paul? Oh, no, it must be something else. He's not that kind of man. Well, then you don't know him very well. It is true. We have not been married for long. Uh-huh. Look, why don't you just go back to Damascus and forget it? You're in for trouble here. Something's going to happen. Where is Paul, Mr. Jordan? A place called the House of Sand. Out of the city, through the gate of the Bar El Nasser. Taxi will take you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Jordan. I shall not forget the help you've given me. She walked out of the tambourine, and I hoped that that would be the last I'd see of her and the man from Damascus and Alex Zargo. How vain can your hopes be sometimes? Well, we rolled the last on-the-cuff customer out of the TAM about 1.15 in the morning. Chris threw the lock on the front door, and I doused the lights. I'll just scoot out the back way, Rocky. Oh, all right, Chris. Good night. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Rocky, look out! Find the guard against quick. Vengeance, Jordan! Vengeance! Rocky. Do you hear me, Jordan? Quiet, Chris. Well, if you do and you are not dead... Then I will come for you again! You are listening to The Man from Damascus, an adventure with Rocky Jordan. Remember that 5 o'clock Sunday afternoon is the new time for Rocky Jordan, so join us each Sunday at 5. And plan to tune in 30 minutes earlier to hear Call the Police at 4.30. So you will have a full hour of excitement and action. And now we take you back to Cairo for another adventure with Rocky Jordan, the man from Damascus. Well, after the man from Damascus threw those slugs at me, I took out after him, chasing him through the darkened streets. But it's easy to lose someone in the winding Cairo streets, and that's just what I did. I got back to the cafe tambourine about 45 minutes later, and Chris wasn't there alone. Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo police, was there, too, waiting for me. Well, Jordan, so you've returned. Oh, hiya, Sam. What brings you here this time of night? I phoned him, Rock. I told him. I thought you'd be better. Uh, All right, Chris. Uh, See you tomorrow. Sure. Good night, Captain. Uh, Good night. Well, Jordan, I'm waiting. Waiting? For what, sir? For you to tell me what this is all about. There's nothing to say. Jordan, 
The man who shot at you from the alley called out vengeance. This much Chris told me. Therefore, I can assume that this man is after you for some hurt he believes you have inflicted upon him. Yeah, it's close. What is it that you have done to him, Jordan? Beats me, Sam. Jordan, how can you expect me to I believe... Tell you, Sam, I don't know. Then I shall let that pass. Jordan, who is this man who shot at you? I'm afraid that's my business. I'll just handle it my own way. Jordan! Oh, I... stop worrying about it. You got your hands full with Alex Zarko. Oh, fear not. We will capture Alex Zarko. Tell me, has Zarko something to do with this shooting? You mean, did he throw those slugs at me? No. I meant exactly what I said. Does Zarko have anything to do with the shooting? Maybe. Oh, Jordan, you you are most exasperating. Oh, just a little trick I picked up in my travels. Very well, very well. I cannot force you to speak. However, I wish to warn you that if someone else is injured, some innocent party drawn into this private conflict of yours, I shall hold you responsible. Oh, thanks, Sam. That's swell of you. No one will get hurt, believe Except maybe that friend of mine. For your sake, I hope you are right. I would not wish to use my office, Jordan, to have you expelled from Cairo. I started out bright and early the next morning to see if I could find the man from Damascus. Stop number one was the House of Sand, room 12. I pounded on the door, no answer. I rattled the doorknob and the door came open. I went in. I could see why no one had bothered to throw the lock. The room was empty. Paul Marr, the man from Damascus, had done a quick checkout. I moved down to the front desk to see if I could get a forwarding address. Sitting in a rocking chair, rolling back and forth, was a wrinkled relic left over from the days of the pharaohs. A chortling sound was coming from her throat, and then I saw why. She was reading a U.S. comic book called The Phantom Menace. A lady... Hey, lady, you got a customer. Oh, young man, you are observing an old lady being devoured by pleasure. Well, I'm certainly glad you're having fun, but could you give me a minute? Oh, the phantom menace has captured the brick brawn, thrust him in wire, and is dipping him head first into a barrel of pickle brine 100 times. Very fun. I'm being consumed with joy. Well, if you can grapple yourself for a minute, you can earn a pound note. My laughter has suddenly left me. Oh, fine. Look, I'm trying to get a forwarding address on number 12. Uh, that would be a short, fat man with a bald spot. A seller of fly paper. That would be a big man with bandages on his face. A seller of death. Death comes higher than fly paper. Could you make it two pounds? I would. Uh, alas, now that I find a fortune at my fingertips, I cannot claim it. What does that mean? I do not know where your friend has gone. And indeed, you are not the only one who is seeking him. A young lady came this morning. She said she was his wife. Uh, where'd she go? I gave her room ten. She said she would wait to see if her husband returned. If you wish to see her, I can call no, her. No, no, no. no. What time did number twelve leave? Six this morning. How? By taxi. I called one. Do you know the driver? Do I know him? A kelp, a no good evil dog. Has well, he got a name? Hali Amar. Residence 303 Sharia Shaman. It is worth two pounds just to mention his name. Ah, uh, here. Keep it. And thanks. Oh. Go on back to your reading. <laughs> I shall, I shall once again bait in ecstasy. And she did. I left her sitting there, wetting the pages, and looked up Holly Amar. It cost me two more pounds to open him up. Then all he could say was that he left Mar off at an all-night dive called the Harem. So that was my next stop. A couple of hundred pounds of fat was pushing a wet rag over the counter in slow motion. A red-headed Englishman, deep in his cups, was throwing darts at a picture of a dame short of clothes. But what I was looking at was a guy at the end of the bar tilling a bottle of beer. It was the knife man who had first taken me to see Paul Mar. I moved his way, but he saw me and lit out for the back door. I took out after him fast like the super chief on a downgrade. He took me through the backyard, over a fence, across an empty lot. But I put a stop to the marathon with a flying tackle, and we rolled into a mud hole. He reached for his knife, and I need him, and the fight started to go out of him. All right, where is he? Who? You know who that Damascus friend of yours, Paul Moore. How did you know his name? That doesn't matter. What I want now is his address. Do not worry, Jordan. He will come to you. Well, I can't wait. Now give it. My, my throne, your knee. The address? I cannot tell. We'll try a face full of mud. Then. All right. All right, I tell. 
1042 Sharaev Akar. A small hotel by the name of Little Nile. Uh, okay. I'm going to put you on ice at the tambourine. Chris will take care of you till I have a chance to talk to your boss alone. <laughs> Little Nile was a termite trap on Sharia Fakar, and Mar was holed up second floor back. I stood in front of his door a few minutes later, listening, trying to catch any sounds from inside. I didn't hear a thing. I tried the doorknob easily. The door was locked. So I took a deep breath, kicked at it, and all the rotten wood gave way. The first thing I saw in the darkened room was the figure sitting in a chair across the room facing the door. The second thing I saw were the bandages around his face, so I knew it was Paul Mar. And the third thing I saw was the Italian made gun in his hand, pointing toward me. What has kept you so long, Jordan? All right. Sorry, I didn't know you were waiting. I would not advance toward me any more steps, Jordan. That is wise. Well, you have come. I had assumed that if I did not kill you last night, you would come to me. It saved me parading my conspicuous appearance through the Cairo streets. So you have found me. But unfortunately, I have the gun. You're not going to kill me here, Mar. Sabaya knows you're after me. You'll never get out of the city with those bandages. You may be right, Jordan. Perhaps I will not kill you. My original proposition still holds. Bring Alex Zarko to me and our little difference shall be forgotten. I've forgotten it already. Jordan, I want Zarko. I want him more than I want you or anything else. Bring Ma. him to... Sandra's in town. Sandra. Your wife. She's in Cairo looking for you. She's at the House of Sand right now, waiting for you to come back. No. I saw her. She came to me to ask about you. You know, she thinks a lot of you. She doesn't believe you're the kind of a guy to have a vendetta on. She doesn't believe you could kill me or Zarko, regardless of what he did to your face. Stop it, Jordan. Do not unnerve me. And do not attempt to change the subject. I want Zarko even more than you. I will let you go if you help me. Here. I shall show you my good faith by throwing my gun into the corner. That was a mistake, Mar. You know I can't help you. I told you once already, and that still goes. I'm not butting into a private feud. But I am, Jordan. Sa- well, you get around, don't you? I know you well enough, Jordan, to realize that you would not allow someone to shoot at you and then forget it. So when you would not tell me who had done it, I knew, too, that if I followed you long enough, you would lead me to him. You always do. Look, Sam, this is a private thing between Mar and I myself. have told you once, Jordan, violence is not a private matter. I will not allow killing if I can help it. And I will not allow you, Jordan, or Mr. Mar to interfere with the police capture of Alex Zarko. Then you haven't got him yet, eh? No, but I shall have him in time. Mr. Mar shall not. Mr. Mar, you will please remove the bandages from your face. What? I said that you will please remove your bandages. Better do it. Sam's not kidding. Very well. Very well, then I shall remove my bandages. I shall step into the light, gentlemen, so that you may see all, so that you may see what was once a face. I watched Paul Marr unwind the bandages, uncovering first what once was a chin, then the battered skin around the cheeks, the nose over the forehead. Then I noticed his stare, a peculiar, hard kind of stare. Then I saw where it came from. A left eye that couldn't blink. There. There you have it. Now you can see why I feel as I do about Alex Zarko. I am most sorry I had to subject you to this, Mr. Marr. But I still cannot allow a personal revenge to interfere with my execution of the law. It is customary in Cairo in affairs of this nature to use the following procedure. There is a train leaving Cairo for Alexandria in one hour and five minutes. You will please be on the train. Sam. And you, Jordan, shall remain in my custody until Mr. Marr has left the city. And what about Alex Zarko? He is and shall remain my problem. You have then one hour, Mr. Marr. I will meet you at the Cairo station to make certain you have boarded the train. Now you may put the bandages back on your face. Well, Sam and I left Paul Marr at the hotel and headed for police headquarters. We didn't talk much about Paul. There wasn't anything to say. I was still trying to figure out in my mind what I could possibly have done to him in Damascus, but nothing came. 
And seeing him, or what was left of him, stirred no memory. At headquarters, Sam had a few things to do. So did I. I put in a call to the House of Sand and asked for Sandra Marr. Yes, this is Sandra Marr. Uh, Miss Marr, this is Rocky Jordan. Who? Oh, how did you know I was here? Oh, never mind that. There's something I want to tell you. About Paul? Uh, sort of. Throw your clothes in a suitcase and go back to Damascus. Oh, I thought you had some good news for me. I thought you understood I will go no place without Paul. Well, you're not going to find him in Cairo. The police are moving him out. Police? What have the police to do with Paul? Paul will tell you if he wants to. Now, go on. you got a better chance of seeing him again in Damascus. But, Mr. Jordan... And see if he can keep him out of trouble, huh? Good luck. Well, that was that. All that remained was to see Paul Marr climb on the train for Alexandria and hope he could straighten himself out. And hope, too, that he and his wife, Sandra, would get together. Well, a little while later, I drove to the train station with Sam, still in police custody. There weren't many people there in the hot of the afternoon, but standing near the end of the platform, next to a large sign of the flying red horse that accented his white bandages, was the man we were looking for, Paul Marr. Sam and I walked up to him, and he glared at us through the slits in his wrappings. Well, Mr. Ma, you will be leaving Cairo in a few moments. Uh, if after a year has passed you wish to return to our city, write me a letter explaining your reasons, and I shall see what can be done to make Cairo available to you once more. Ma nodded and climbed on the train, and it headed out of the city. Sam and I turned and started back to his car. That's when it hit me, and I took off in double time. Jordan, where are you going? For a train ride. I think you better come along. I chased down the platform and caught the thing. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Sam climb onto the train farther down the line. Then I started through the cars, going from one to another, looking for the man in bandages. I traveled through four cars before I finally spotted him. When he saw me, I guess he figured what I had on my mind, because he took off fast going the other way, but I kept right after him. The train had picked up speed, lurching us from side to side. Then going around a bend, the momentum pinned him momentarily against a seat, and I was on it. His fist started working, and so did mine. We had ourselves a fine little fight there, rolling around the floor of the moving train, till Sam Sabaya caught up with us and pulled the gun. That put a quick stop to the fight. Jordan, you will please explain what the meaning of this is. Sure. Glad to, Sam. Have him take off his bandages. But, Jordan, I... I Have him take understand. off the bandages, and I think you will. Very well. You will please remove the bandages, Mr. Ma. Ah, oh, take them off, buddy, or I'll take them off for you. Yeah. That's his stuff. Now, huh. just a little more. Let Sam see who you really are. Well, there you are, Sam. Not Paul Marr at all, but the guy you've been looking for for weeks. The guy who's been trying to escape your dragnet and get out of the city. Meet Alex Zarko. Well, the thing came apart at the seams. It was all an elaborate plan of Zarko's. The police had him trapped in the city, needed a way out. So he got his knife man to dig up Paul Marr in Damascus and bring him to town. Then he had Marr, all wrapped up in bandages, create a fuss, like his revenge against me, which was strictly a phony. Nothing too serious, just enough to get himself run out of Cairo. Then Zarko takes his place, wraps himself in the bandages, and starts to leave, almost with a police escort. It would have worked fine, except for one thing. Marr's disfigured face and his left eye that couldn't blink. Zark couldn't control his, and standing on the platform of the train station, he blinked his eye once. And that was once too often. Well, all that remained was Paul Marr, his face, and Sandra. And later, in Sabaya's office, we got to talking about that. Jordan, where do you suppose Paul Marr is now? In the House of Sand. I told him Sandra was there waiting for him. Mm. You realize, of course, that I must send some men to apprehend him. Yeah. Uh, why do you suppose he allowed himself to aid Alex Zarko? Put yourself in his place. A face like his and a lot of desperation. He was working a business deal, getting money any way he could, figuring he'd use the dough in a plastic surgery job. It would make him look like a, a human being again. Yes, quite so. You understand Ma will have a jail sentence to serve for aiding a criminal. Mm-hmm. And it may be possible for me to confiscate the money Zarko gave him. Sure, if you worked on it, you could possibly take the dough from him. That is, if you don't forget that he's gone. Are you suggesting, Jordan, that I deliberately allow myself to forget that a financial arrangement uh, existed between Mal and Zarko? That's right, Sam. Jordan, I have always suspected you are an unscrupulous man. <laughs> sure I am. 
Remember the time I tried to sell that Monte Carlo swindler a half interest in the tombs of Memlooks? <laughs> okay. Remember? No, no. I, I guess I've forgotten. Yeah. Perhaps I am getting old. My memory is not what it used to be. Thanks, Sam. See you soon. <laughs> It's CBS again at the same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan, starring Jack Moyles in the title role, is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Tonight's story by Adrian Jando and Larry Roman. Life with Luigi will be heard tonight at 8 over most of these stations. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Personal notice, dangerous my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. You've all heard the expression... Beware of Greeks bearing gifts. In case it slipped your mind, a fellow by the name of Virgil said that some 2,000 years ago. But as far as George Valentine is concerned, he could just as well said it today. Want to know why? Well, suppose you listen to our Let George Do It adventure entitled Deal Me Out, and I'll deal you in. Dear Mr. Valentine's, now is your chance to be rich. I am a stranger in town and you should take me. Percentage, cost plus, trade commission of the goods, I will pay whatever you like, whatever. And why? Because five private detectives I am hiring. With what? No satisfactions. Mr. Valentine's, a young friend of mine is having a most desperate situation. And if you can give satisfactions, then I deal you in. The riches are yours. Knowing you like that sort of thing, I remain as ever yours, Ambrose Acropolis. Knowing you like that sort of thing? For the young lady, yes. Money will mean something beautiful. For a man, it is different. To him, it is only like bread and butter, or blood, maybe. Okay, philosopher, but you still haven't told me what kind of trouble this friend of yours is in. Now, isn't that foolish... Would I need you if I knew? Yeah, but I am still... in town to visit. I am a happy man. I like other people to be happy. How should I know? He won't see me. He is afraid. He avoids his friends. He runs around in alleys with his coat pulled up and his mouth full of mumbling. It sounds a little peculiar. Oh, no, 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 no. Do not misconceive. A nicer, sweeter, more innocent boy could not be imagined. In other places, we have spent many happy evenings together. But something has happened to suddenly change him. Why? What? <laughs> I would not be a friend if I, if I did not cock my ear to the ground and scratch my head, would I? Contortionist, huh? Okay, what's his name? I, uh, uh, I have his picture here. And the name is like a haircut. Bob. Sprague. Sprague is his last name. And you can remember that by a spray of parsley. Never mind, I got it. Bob Sprague. Now, uh, where do I find this poor man in trouble? Oh, no, no, he's not poor. Oh, my, no, no, indeed. Oh, rich, like you are. I'll bet he doesn't wear such pretty spats or striped pants. Oh, <laughs> you like them, eh? So do I. I always wear... You are laughing at me. Oh, no, no, really. No, 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 not you, lady. You, sport. You think I'm lying, perhaps, eh? You think I would not know a trouble what I saw? Take it easy. I didn't say anything. Ambrose Acropolis will show you what he means. When in doubt, delay a hand of Jack's or bet. Hey, let go. What is... Come on. Goodbye, young lady. But, Mr. Acropolis... So, me, I will deal you in with Jackson, Jackson, Higby, and whoever. Let a whole quartet of lawyers convince you. (laughs) 
But, Mr. Jackson, the name Bob Sprague means something to you, doesn't it? Oh, just the nephew of a friend of mine, that's all. Why? Why? I will take over here to the explanations I would begin. There is something wrong about this boy, and it is only my desire to contact him. Yes, yes, of course. But Bob is out of town just now, I think. In fact, I'm quite sure he is. Out of town? But his friends did and not say... And there's certainly nothing wrong with him. However, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you want to send him a note or a letter, you may drop it off here, and I'll see that it gets forwarded to the right place. Be glad to. Uh-huh. Uh, why not just give us his address? Well, I don't know it, naturally. Just that he's away somewhere, that's all. Now, really, gentlemen, I'm very Mr. busy. Mr. Jackson, I... permit me to tell you that a young friend of Bobby's has made from you a liar. To me, he is swearing poor Bob Sprague with his coat turned up sneaks into the Afton Hotel here in town every morning. Oh, get out of here. How could that be? What is going on? Go someplace else. Call other people liars. Get out of here. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Well, Valentines? Okay, sport, I'm in. What's the name of that hotel again? Gently, sweet after. What? What's the matter with you? Oh, nothing. I just say that to myself every time I have a glass of beer here at the hotel this time of the morning. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm not insulted. Just sitting here, waiting for the first race at Hylia. Ah, uh-huh. who's the bookie, bartender? Ah, uh, didn't you know? Well, I'm a little new here. Say, uh, your name's Bob Sprague, isn't it? Hey, wait a minute. I just asked, that's all. Look. What do you want? Now, listen, I never heard of you until one second ago. I asked you the same question a guy down the bar asked me about you, that's all. What? Sit down, sit down. He's looking at us. Oh. What's the matter, anyway? You must be popular or something. No sooner had I walked in this place and this guy walked up and asked if I knew you. Then he asked the bartender. The bartender looked at you, but then looked away quick and said no. Bartender's a nice guy. Well, I, I thought maybe I could help with something. You see, well, I... Well, well, well. Fellas, you mind if I join you? Uh, sorry, private club. <laughs> well, that's the way it goes, doesn't it? Man doesn't make new friends without getting blackballed once or twice. What's your problem? There, now there's what's wrong with the world. People don't say what's your happiness, they say what's the matter. Here, here you're going to have one with me now, both of you. Hey, bartender, say, either one of you fellas just happen to know a fellow named uh, Bob Sprague. Now, what's going on in this town? You asked me that just about two minutes ago. Oh, <laughs> so I did, my mistake. But that's the way it goes, isn't it? No, no, it's on me, Bart. Here, kid. What? My key. I got a room upstairs. Hey, you, uh, whatever your name is. Al. Name's Al. Didn't I tell you? No. And you didn't ask me if I was Bob Sprague, either. Oh, look, I'm getting out of here. Thanks, Bob. Sure, see you later. Hey, now, wait a minute, both of you. You mean you're old Bob? Sure, sure, why not? Me, not him. But my mother called me Robert. <laughs> well, holy smoke. Think of that. Uh-huh. So what do you want with me? Just get out of my way, that's all, buddy. But I thought you wanted to see me. It's too early for games. Where's that guy going? Oh, I don't see anybody. You're no more Sprague than I am. Get off my toes. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. Get out of my way. Hey, hey, wait a minute. No offense. If you want to know where the kid's going, just ask. What? Sure. I don't mind telling you. I got a room upstairs. Kid's meeting me there. 612. I just slipped in the key. Huh. What kind of a sucker do you think I am? So he's headed for the street, huh? Thanks for nothing. (laughs) Don't mention it. Sucker. Hey. Hey, kid. Bob. Oh, hi. Get rid of him? Yeah, push over. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Who is he? Called himself Al, but he didn't... I don't know. I've never even seen him before. Just another strong man, I suppose. Brother, you're sure popular. Now, look, let's have it. What are you afraid of? What are you hiding from? (laughs) $40,000. What? Hey, look, I don't get it. Well, come on, come on. You're in trouble. Dodging somebody like mad. Your friend's all covering up for you. Ah, sure. Don't know why I shouldn't tell you. 
You see, it's like this. I... Well, go on. Somebody outside. Well, hello, everybody. What in the name of... So you have got him at last. George Valentine's, you are a genius. I might have known. There was no baggage in the room or anything. Look, get out of my way. Bob, wait. Bobby, my boy, my old so friend. So long, fat so Kid, wait. What's the idea? You, you... lousy double crosser. Wait. Stop him, Valentine. Oh, no. Let him go. What? He's in trouble. He will get away. Get him. Yeah. There we are. That's better. Valentine's, what has come over you? Why did you hurt me? Oh, shut up, Acropolis. Find Bob Sprague. He's in danger. He's hiding from someone. Oh, brother, what a sap I am. The guy he's hiding from is you. Please, please, don't look at me like that. I am an innocent man. Sure, sure. Hiring people right and left to go after the poor guy. But I promised you a God, didn't I? Oh, yeah, sure. Percentage, cost, plus, straight commission of the goods. Why didn't I catch on earlier? $40,000. What is it you're trying to do? Shake him down? No, 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 please. I am honest. We are friends, Bobby and me. We, we spend many happy evenings together at, at, at poker. He lost. Ah, so that's it. A nice kid welching on a gambling debt, and you're the gambler. Valentine's, once in a while to be a gambler is a tragic thing. The government says you must pay income tax, but the laws will not let you collect your debts. And when your debt is run away oh, from you... Oh, my heart's bleeding for you. But, no, wait, this boy is good for it. His uncle is rich. So you want to meet a strong arm for you, huh? But only for a cut. Okay, so here goes. No! Yeah! I guess that deals me out, doesn't it? George, where on earth have you been? Ah, getting a bad taste out of my mouth. What? Yeah. Well, there's a movie on down and the street. And what did you do with Mr. Acropolis? It's been hours since you two left. Oh, skip it, skip it. I'm all through with that. What's the matter? The police just phoned. I've been trying to reach you. The police? They want you out at the house of Bob Sprague's uncle. That's where the other phone call came. Which phone call? The one from the man who said he'd kidnapped Bob Sprague. What? And unless his uncle paid $40,000, Bob would be murdered. Oh, that does it. Do I care? Angel, I dealt myself out of that three-ring circus once. George, I'm not... listen. The butler who took the call said the man tried to disguise his voice, but he did give his name. Ambrose Acropolis? No. George Valentine's. <laughs> listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now, back to George Valentine. Deal me out. Only if your name is George Valentine, you always seem to get dealt right back in. A man named Ambrose Acropolis asked you to help him find a friend named Bob Sprague. And it wasn't until after you found him that you realized why. Acropolis is a gambler trying to collect what he calls an honest debt. The only trouble is now someone has collected Sprague himself. Yes, he's been kidnapped. By whom? Someone calling himself George Valentine's. Ambrose Acropolis. He's using my name, and he's the one you want. No, we just put out an alarm and find him, and it's all over. Simple like that. Well, why not, Johnson? What's wrong with that? You haven't met the uncle yet. Here. In here. Bob Sprague's uncle, the guy with the dough? He certainly has a fancy house. Well, what's wrong with him? You'll see. Mind if we come in? Time, Johnson. Come around here. Come around here. Well, I noticed you there on the patio. Wait, wait. How do you like this, eh? The butler just brought in the package. First one I ever owned in my life. Well, where's the yacht? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dougal, this is Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine. Hello. Pleasure, pleasure indeed. Hi. Can't own the costume without the yacht, eh? It's a very becoming cap. Oh, now you know it isn't, but thanks. That's what I'm hoping my wife will say. Your wife? Wife-to-be. Getting married in a few days. Why not? You think I'm too old, I suppose. Well, of course I am, but there's no... Oh, wait a minute, I... Mr. Dougal. What is all this? You're Bob Sprague's uncle, aren't you? Huh? 
Not my fault. Well, aren't we here to find out about this kidnapping message you received? I'm afraid that's a problem for the police, not for me. What's that? See what I told you, Valentine? Now, why don't we all sit down and have a drink? In other words, you're not even worried? Is that right? Only, what kind of a message did they give you? My uh, butler took it over the phone. The voice said somebody had better show up at a certain address with 40,000 in cash. The lieutenant's got all that. Well? Otherwise, they'd kill Bob. (laughs) Yes, that's right. Now, sit down. We'll all have that drink. Well, uh, what's so funny? Oh, Bob's been in scrapes all his life, just like his father. And I've been silly enough to keep hauling him out. Keep pulling him off the railroad tracks before the trains cut him in two. Uh Uh-huh. Obviously, you don't like your nephew very much. Don't like him? I hate him. He's a blasted nuisance. Gambling all the time. And I've finally grown up enough to realize that I owe him nothing. Peace, it's wonderful. And so you won't pay the 40000 that they asked? Look, I'm going to be married. I'm going to have a wife. I'm going to buy a yacht. And as far as I'm concerned, Bob can save himself from the buzzsaw. I'm not going to. Okay, then. Neither am I. But you will, won't you, Lieutenant? That's your job. Yeah. Play it safe. We'll need money. Acropolis isn't going to sucker for any cut-up newspapers. Well, then take up a collection. Pass the hat. <laughs> or maybe you should just sit out this hand. They won't kill him. What good would it do them? See what I mean? Forget it. Have a good time. Let's everybody just deal ourselves out. Valentine Dougal's right. I've got a job to do. Oh, his uncle can't mean those things he said, Lieutenant. I don't care if he does, Angel. It's Acropolis I want to find. Sure. Who likes to be made a sucker? Think how this is going to look in the newspaper. George Valentine's. Kidnapper or patch? Yeah, sure. Sergeant, have any luck tracing our fat friend? Uh Uh-uh. Says they picked up about ten trails on Acropolis, but none of them... No, 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 I'll get that. Oh, no? Yeah, that's right. What? You did? Who did what? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Sure, sure, right away. He's dead. Huh? Bob Sprague? Oh, no. Wrong guess. Acropolis. Where'd they find him? No, 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 that was the lawyer Jackson just called. Well, don't just stand there. Dougal, I mean. Dougal's dead. Two shots, huh? Yeah. After Dougal put up a pretty good fight. Somebody came in through the patio just the same way we did, I guess. And all this poor guy could think of was about getting married and buying a yacht. Yeah. Makes no sense. Uh Uh-uh, Johnson. There's a perfectly simple reason for this guy being killed, and it ties right in with the rest of it, too. Mr. Jackson? Oh, Sergeant, has the lawyer... uh... Yes, 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 right here. May I see you a second, please? Well, it isn't the inquisitive young man. Ah, sure, we've met before. Now, I want $40,000. I beg your pardon. Well, Dougal's dead, so his money can't be his anymore. And if he wasn't married yet, I suppose his nephew still gets it, check. Well, yes, Bob Sprague inherits, but and I Bob don't is it. being held prisoner somewhere for forty thousand yeah, dollars. But it's ridiculous to pay that. Dougal called me earlier and asked my opinion. I told him the same thing. That's what I was coming out here to talk about when I found him. Bob has been in these scrapes too often before. You also think we ought to just let Bob be killed? Well, but they wouldn't do that. It's ridiculous. They wouldn't dare to. Uh, well. Yeah, yeah, somebody killed Dougal fast enough. Now, look, there's no time to waste. I want 40000 in cash. Just give me those instructions on how and where I pay the money, Johnson. You, George? Sure, sure, here I go again, drawing another hand. Because you see, Mr. Jackson, this is the only way we can find out who's holding the kid. It's also the only way we can find out who murdered his uncle. <laughs> George, that's the address, but the place looks so empty. Just stay out of sight, Angel, and see if I bounce out. If I do, then you'll know it's not. But you don't expect to see anyone. You're you're just supposed to leave the money here. Well, I don't know what's going to happen, but it won't work with a lot of police watching. I know that. Oh, George, wait a minute. So long, Angel. Hmm. Anybody home? All right, where do you want the money? What do I do? Just drop it on the floor and then... No, you don't. 
your aim's bad, Buster. Drop that blackjack. Yeah, that's better. You think I'd walk in here without a gun? Don't shoot again. You heard me and Bob Sprague will be killed. Hey, where have I heard you before? Let's get a little light on this mausoleum. Well, the laughing boy at the Afton Bar. Al, isn't it? <laughs> no, don't that beat all. It's a small world, ain't it? Who are you working for? You got the gun, but I got the boy. Let's not waste time. All right, all right. Want to count the cash? Who, me? Oh, no. Who wants to count money? Oh, it's all there, all right. <laughs> oh, boy. Why work for a living, huh, pal? Five, six, seven, thirty, thirty-five, forty. Now, there's a head of lettuce. I didn't even know they made them that big. Not so fast, Buster. It goes back in the envelope and I keep it. Well, now, look. We got to go through that again. I keep it until you show me the kid. Unharmed. Can't be done. Put up an awful fight. He's got an awful black eye. All right, all right. Don't get anxious. But you know what'll happen if you try anything fancy. Sure. You'll get shot. Now, don't be like that. After all, this isn't a regular kidnapping. A debt's a debt, that's all. Come on, my car's outside. After you. No, no, no thanks. Have it your own way. But I told you I'd bring you down here. There's nothing to be suspicious about. Drop the gun. Hmm? Okay. Regular parade, isn't it? Sure. You're going to play bass horn. Take it easy. Or should we see if he makes noises like a cymbal? Cut it out, cut it no, out. No, no, leave him alone. I'll take the gun. Nice. Where'd you get the gorilla boy, Al? Relax, I tell you. You're among friends. Then stop picking my pocket. That's a debt, that's all. There we are, 40 G. Okay, where's the kid? I suppose he's nowhere here than he That's was the... the trouble with everybody nowadays. No good faith. You see what I mean? Let him out, Louis. Huh, what? Oh, boss, he's a good boy and cause no trouble. Go play lousy poker, though. All right, dopey, wake up. Uh, what do you want? Oh, that's you again. Hello, kid. I wasn't sure I'd find you. Play hearts and flowers. Now, look, this time I'm legitimate. I'm from your uncle. Oh, try again. Will you? I'd rather be locked up. We're going to turn you loose, playboy. Matinee's over. Wait a minute. You mean that old skin flint threw away his fancy blonde, his yachting cap long enough to cough up? I don't believe it. Here's the dough. I still don't believe it. It's your dough, not your uncle's. What? Yeah. Mr. Dougal's dead. He's dead. Oh, now, look, he was... Come a... on, Louie. So long, son. Hey, come on back here. Stop it. Look out, kid. <laughs> All right, let them go. They got their money. They're just hired hands. Look, what's it all about? What's been happening? Who hired them? Same guy who murdered your uncle. Valentine's. Tell Lieutenant Johnson how harmless, harmless I am. I... All right, I'll let go of you, but just be quiet. For Acropolis, I doubt if it's possible. But you are my friend. Valentine's, you are my friend. Did you check his voice on the telephone? Sure, I checked it. What's the matter, Johnson? Not him, huh? Me? Why should I phone to anybody? Why should I be involved with kidnapping? Shut up. So it wasn't him on the phone. What difference does it make? One of his hired hands spoke the piece, that's all. Okay, okay. I left Brooksy out here with Bob. Valentine's, come back here. Don't leave me in this pickle of stew. Valentine's! Why not? It's all over. It's finished. What's that? Well, all except the hard work. But you've already got the lead, Lieutenant. Yeah, what's that? What lead? What are you talking about? Oh, hello, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Valentine Jackson here seems to think that Acropolis... Oh, sure, sure. Everybody's thinking, but skip it, will you? Now, why would Acropolis want my name used? Why would he hire me in the first place if he intended to stage a kidnapping? As I remember, he even tried to get a few other detectives to help him chase down Bob here. I'm a lawyer. I prefer to think logically, if you don't mind. Acropolis is the one the debt was owed to, isn't he? Sure, and that's how the murder ties in. Why, of course. He discovered that Dougal wasn't going to pay up, so he killed Dougal in order to make the boy able to pay. You went through it yourself. It worked. That's what happened. Are you all through? Okay, listen. Acropolis here is all noise. He blunders around so much he couldn't even collect his own debt. Be careful of the words, please. Sports, you hired me to find Bob Sprague. All right, I did. But all the fuss certainly provided a good opportunity for somebody else to blame this all on you. And that's why my name was used, to link it to you, Acropolis. Now, see here, that doesn't make any sense. But for some reason, I was called Valentine's. Yes, but that's the way he pronounced it. Yeah, and the simplest explanation for that extra S is that certain people today must have actually thought that was my name. Well, on the phone, it could have been Al or Louis or the uh, person who hired them. But it was the latter who only heard my name once, and in Acropolis's lovely voice. 
I don't get you. Oh, yes, you do, Bob. Up in that hotel room. He walked in and called me George Valentine's, and you must have thought that was my name. Now, see here. What's the matter, Mr. Mr. Jackson? Don't you think it makes sense that Bob here should have taken advantage of his own predicament to get his uncle's money before the old boy was married and cut him off? Look, I was a prisoner at the time of the murder. Oh, no, you weren't. Sure, Al put on a show for everybody in the hotel this morning. Who's Bob Sprague? Didn't know you. Big menace chasing you. Crazy. And he carried through the act just fine. After all, why not? I suppose his cut is the 40000 he walked off with. But that's not true. He had me locked in a room. I don't know what he said, They didn't but make it... the mistake you did. And I don't just mean that Valentine's business either. Because I don't wear a yachting cap. What? Yeah. And neither did your uncle until the day he told us. Package just came before we saw him. After you'd been, quote, kidnapped, unquote. Okay, Johnson, it's all yours. Just get him to explain how he could mention that yachting cap to me when he'd never even seen it. Except, of course, while he was killing his uncle. Why, you dirty meddling... Sing it sweet, Buster, sing it sweet. Come on, Brooksy. But, George, Mr. Acropolis... No, no, we're not leaving him. Come on, gambler. Let's see what kind of cards we can deal. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. But 40000 Now I will never get my $40,000. Of course you won't. You can't collect it legally, and I certainly don't know how else you could get it from the man who's being tried for murder. You sound so sorry for me. There is an understatement. How many times must I explain to you my honesty? Oh, cut it out, sport. You're not bright, that's all. Maybe you beat Bob Sprague at cards, but he almost got even by hanging this whole mess on you. Valentine's, we will not speak of it anymore. The pleasure of this meeting has been yours. And for the last time, my name is not I'm Valentine. Sorry, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Please? Now we are friends. Of course. I will call you Georges. <laughs> Why, that's stupid, oh, George. Let him go. I think it's kind of cute. George is George. <laughs> You have just heard Deal Me Out, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. You know the old saw about the importance of trivial things. For the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, the horse was lost, and so on. Take a dime, for instance. One thin dime, just chicken feed. Yet it can make the difference between life and death, as it does in the story you are about to hear. Listen, then, and ponder on the potential dimensions of trivia as Lloyd Bridges stars in Chicken Feed. Now. Mr. Lloyd Bridges in Chicken Feed. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. It was a silly thing to fight over, I admit. But there it was, a dime, 
A measly thin dime. Chicken feed. Of course, that was only the beginning. You see, Junior asked for a dime, and I flipped it over to him. And after he left the room, Mary said I shouldn't spoil the kid. It was time he learned the value of money. And I said, well, great, Scott. If I couldn't give my own child a dime without her jumping down my throat... Oh, you know, those things get going. You keep saying things you shouldn't, and she lashes out with an answer. And before you know it, you've stormed out of the house, and you're taking it out in the car. <laughs> Fifty miles cooled me down a little, but not much. I automatically slowed up when I came to the sign, You are now entering Lansing, California. Go slow and see our town. Go fast and see our jail. Everybody knew Lansing. A speed trap. A tough town. Driving at a normal speed through the quiet Sunday street gave me time to think of something besides the biting words Mary and I had slugged at each other. I pulled up at a little cafe next to the police station. Had a whitewashed sign in the window. Best cup of coffee in town for ten cents. How you have your eggs this morning, Sherlock? Same as always. No piece of scotch with a fried potato. I resent that, Officer Brady. And what's more, my whole family resents it. Too over easy, Sam. Heavy on the fried. What's yours, mister? Coffee, please. Coming up. <sighs> Here you are. Say, Officer Brady, how's your stop order? Phillips, they're coming for him in the morning. Think you'll be able to hold him till then? He got out of that Bennington jail like a paper bag. Don't worry, sister. Oh, this will happen here while I sip my coffee. Best cup of coffee in town for a dime. That reminded me of our argument over a dime. Uh, that's about all a dime's good for, I guess. A cup of coffee, newspaper, phone call. There's a stack of the local papers nearby, and I pull one over to look at it. This Phillips was on the front page. Bank robber. Killed the teller. Uh, he had a face I wouldn't want to run into close. After a while, the hot coffee cut through the icy core of resentment I'd carried out of the house with me. Maybe, uh, maybe I'd been at fault as much as Mary. She wasn't the only one who had a bad temper. On a sudden impulse, I left my coffee and went over to the phone on the far wall. I heard the dial tone, then I fished in my pocket for change. It was empty. Uh, say, miss, could you change a dollar for me? I want to use the phone. Yes, sir. Uh, what the... Uh, what's the matter, mister? Uh, uh, my, my wallet, I seem to... Uh, look, I, I, I'll be back in a minute, huh? No, Mary wasn't the only one with a temper. I'd stormed out of the house without changing the contents of my pockets to my clean suit. I didn't have a dime on me, not even a nickel. I uh, rummaged in the glove compartment of the car. Mary sometimes left a coin purse. But this time, naturally, it wasn't there. I felt like a fool. And then... What well, seems to be the trouble, mister? Oh, hello, officer. I seem to have come off without any money. It's embarrassing. Yeah, embarrassing. Uh, I didn't realize it until I tried the phone. I, I'll, uh... Well, I'll, I'll have to send that uh, girl a dime for the coffee as soon as I get back to town. You will, huh? Well, I don't know what else I can do under the circumstances. Uh, I'd better go inside and tell her. Now, hold on a minute. Huh? Where's your driver's license? <laughs> it's in my wallet in San Francisco. You got any other identification? Well, there's the, uh, the registration slip in the car. That's the car. What about you? Me? Well, I, I just got through telling you. Officer, I, I'm Ralph Clark. Clark and Jacobs in the Hatfield building? We're, we're attorneys. Attorney. I, I should have a card here somewhere. You're kind of far from home to be without any dough, isn't it? Well, I, I, I came out of the house without changing the stuff into this suit. You know how it yeah. is. Yeah. Huh? How'd you happen to have the keys to the car? Well, I don't take them out when, I, when it's in the garage. Hey, you, you don't think... Where I... are you headed for? Well, I know it sounds funny, but nowhere, really. See, I, I had a fight with my wife, and I, I just batted out of the house to cool off. I'll tell you what, Mr. Clark, suppose we just mosey into the station house. Station house? Hey, what is this? Nothing, nothing at all. Just next door, and you can call your way from there. I don't see why that's necessary. If you just lend me a dime, I, I could go... Oh, I could go right in here and reverse the charges. Let's go. You can leave the car here. I'll take that key. Now, look here, officer. I, I, I don't get it. Move. I... Come on, move. All right, Jim. What you got this time? Tell you better after he makes a call. Give me the phone, will you, Ross? It's out of order. When did, half an hour ago. Did you report it? Yeah. They said they can't have a man here before tomorrow. Did you tell him this is a police station for Pete's sake? Sure, I told him. Oh, it's not bad, though. We can get incoming calls. We still got the pay phone over there. Yeah, there's the pay phone, Mr. Clark. You can make your call from there. I don't have any money, remember? Oh, yeah. Okay. Here's the dime. 
Gee, thanks. Let me speak to your wife when you get her. Uh, this is going to sound fine, just fine. She'll think I've really tied one on. Operator. Uh, I want to call San Francisco, Geary 49978. And reverse the charges, please. Thank you. Your number, please. Uh, this is uh, 460. It's me, Mary. Take the call. Oh, it's you, is it? What do you think you're doing 50 miles Will you accept the call, madam? I should say nothing. Mary, Mary, wait, hey, hey. I Mary. am sorry. The party will not accept the call. Look, look, operator, get it back, will you? This is important. I will ring them again. Uh, thanks. Oh, why didn't you pick up that phone? Your party does not answer. <laughs> no soap, huh? Hey, they kept our dime. Well, you shouldn't have slammed it, sir. Let me have another one, will you? I'll get a hold of my partner, huh? He'll identify me. Look, we've wasted enough time. Get in there. That's the cells. Right. You're locking me up? Right again. What's the big idea? I didn't do anything. What are you charging me with? Don't have to charge you with anything. I'm holding you on suspicion. Suspicion? Suspicion of what? Defrauding the cafe, for one thing. And then I want to check that car. Do you think I stole it? It's been done. Oh, now, wait. Look, if you let me... You're entitled to one call. You've had it. Oh, this is fantastic. I demand to be brought before a magistrate immediately. Are you kidding? In this town on Sunday? In the middle of dove hunting season? Look here, my officer. Now, if you only let me phone, my partner, he'll clear up everything. Inside. It was one big room. Along one side of it ran three barred cubicles, each just large enough to hold a bunk. Two of the cubicles were opened, and the occupants, a couple of sodden, bleary-eyed drunks, lounged in the open space on a wooden bench that was the only furniture. A sickening odor cut through the disinfectant smell of the place. Hey, welcome to our jail. Stink part of the side of the wave of the valley, eh, Slim? Ah, uh, you said. What's your beef, John? Suspicion. Can you feature that? Suspicion. And they won't even give me a dime to phone. You mean, you mean you ain't even got a dime? No, you see, I, uh... Yeah, well, that's too bad. Ain't it, Pete? Sure is. Wish we could help you out. Well, maybe we could at that. Hey, have you got a dime? Well, sure, I got two of them. <laughs> Will you lend me one? Well, just one, I'll pay you back. <laughs> I- I'll send you ten dollars just as soon as I can get out of here. Well, what's it worth to each of them? I just told you, ten dollars. Yeah, yeah, I know. A fire in the sky, though. What's it worth now? I mean, I, I can get me a pack of smokes with 20 cents. Give you a dime, I can't get me nothing. You, you got any smokes on you? No, I wish I had. I left everything in the pockets of my other suit, but... Oh, <laughs> my wristwatch. Why didn't I think of that before? Well, what's the matter with it? There's nothing. Nothing's the matter with it. It's worth $50. Here. Yeah, you you look at it. it. It's yours for 10 cents. For one thin dime. Look, what can you lose? Yeah, there must be something wrong with it. Is it hot? Hot? You mean stolen? Of course not. Well, what you offering it for a dime for? I want to get out of this filthy place. Oh, you you don't like our company, is that it? <laughs> if you want to put it that way, no, I don't. Hey, what, what do you think of that, Pete? That man, he don't like our company. We don't smell good to him or something. Well, now, ain't that just too bad? What do you think of that, Mr. Phillips? He don't like us. Have you got any dimes, Mr. Phillips? <laughs> followed his glance. For the first time, I saw deep in the gloom of the locked cubicle the face I'd seen on the front page of the newspaper. The face I'd said that I wouldn't want to run into close. Well, it was close. And I was glad that there were bars between us. Of course, now, us guys, we ain't much. Yeah, but Mr. Phillips here, now, he's a big shot. He robbed four banks and broke out of two jails. Killed a man, too. Hey, sure, we're just vags, but Mr. Phillips, he's going to the hot seat. They're coming to get them and take them back to Nevada and burn them. Oh, no, no, Petey. They don't burn them in Nevada. They shoot them. Ain't that right, Mr. Phillips? Mr. Phillips don't want to talk about it. Well, Mr. Phillips don't want to talk about nothing. Mr. Phillips ain't very sociable. Just like this stiff. Oh, now, look, fellas. I didn't mean... Look, I just meant that I wanted to get out of this jail. Here, take the watch and give me the dime, huh? Look here, now, I'll tell you what. I- I'll match your foot. Match me? Yeah, a dime again to watch. Well, uh, well, that's fair. And I got me a fair chance to get my six. And 
you got you a chance to get your dime free. Yeah, but I'd rather... Take run. it or leave it. Well, all right. All right, now, you leave Petey hold the watch. I'll flip the dime on the floor and you call. Heads. Tails, I win. Hey, wait a minute. Get your foot off of it. How do you know it's tails? It's tails. Ain't it, Petey? Well, sure, it's tails, all right. Here's a watch slip. Hey, what is this? Watch it, brother. You're not going to get away with this. Oh, get him, Pete. Don't! Don't! Yeah. Yeah. That'll on you. This is for near me. Hey, don't! Hey! Hey, what goes on Officer, here? These hey, it ain't nothing. This new guy is acting Yeah, it's off. just new well, guy. Quiet down in there. Trying to get us in trouble, huh? No, 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 no. Look, fellas, for heaven's oh, sake. Shut up. Okay. Kangaroo. I'll be judge, you be prosecuted. Right. Uh, All right, prisoner at the bar, stand up. Oh, I said, stand oh, up. Cut it out. Will you? Yes. Shut up. Yeah. All right, counselor. What is the prisoner charged with? Well, you want to know? This man here is a desperate criminal. He's charged with breaking into jail, insulting his fellow boarders, poor sportsmanship, and fighting. He's a very dangerous character, you want to know? Yeah. Guilty on all counts. Uh. I find you <laughs> ten cents. <laughs> you know I'm gonna die. <laughs> Can't pay you. Well then, uh, you can work it out. Rate of one cent a day. Yeah, first job be to shine the coarse shoes. <laughs> shine your own shoes. Oh, she could be like that, huh? Hold him, Slee. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Officer! Officer! Hey, shut up. Officer! I'm down in there! Oh, come and give us something to talk about. You hear that? Another peep out in you. You're going to get it again. You understand? Yes. All right. Now get on them shoes. Well, I, I, I don't have... I don't have anything to shine them with. You got a coat, ain't you? <laughs> now get going. The next hours were unadulterated agony. It was unbelievable the filthy and human jobs they could think up for me to do. It was frightful. With every move I made, I could feel the glittering, steely eyes of the silent man in the locked cage, following me, weighing me. Finally, when they couldn't think of anything more, they forced me to stand at attention, looking right into Philip's cell. They couldn't see his face. It was too close to mine. But he winked at me and nodded his head as though it were a signal. And then his two huge arms came through the bars and thrust me, reeling, across the cell. I fell and hit my head. That's all I remember. In a moment, we continue with... Suspense. No parent we know has ever consciously dodged a responsibility to his children. That's why CBS Radio is sure you'll want to act now and learn what you can do about the crisis looming in our universities and colleges. Right now, our institutions are bursting at the seam. America's high birth rate points toward an acute emergency in education in the years ahead. If your children are to have the higher education they'll want and need in order to fulfill their adult obligations, we must all face up to the issue and do what must be done to make sure our colleges get the space, the equipment, and the trained personnel that will be needed. I'd like to have the facts of the situation, write to Higher Education, Box 36, Times Square Station, New York 36, for a free booklet entitled The Closing College Door. It delineates the problem clearly. It outlines what you can do to help remedy the situation. Write for your copy today. The address again is Higher Education, Box 36, Times Square Station, New York 36. And now, we continue with Chicken Feed, starring Mr. Lloyd Bridges. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I don't know what time it was, two or three in the morning, when I felt a stealthy touch in my shoulder. I opened my eyes. I was still on the stone floor, and Phillips was bending over me, holding a revolver. I started to speak, but he clapped a hand over my mouth. Shh, you fool. You want to wake them punks? Get up quick and be quiet about it. I glanced quickly at Philip's cell. It was open, and so was the door to the corridor. He pushed me out and locked the door behind us. In his office, bound and gagged securely to his desk chair, Sergeant Ross glared at us. The empty holster to his side told where Phillips had got his gun. 
Here. Which is the key to your car? Uh, this one. Okay. Take it and let's move. <laughs> could spring that crock with a hairpin. You nearly done a fine job of lousing things up. What happened to you getting thrown in the can in the middle of the day? Huh? Uh, they picked me up on suspicion. Oh, well, it wasn't supposed to be till midnight tonight. What? And all that phony kid stuff about the dime. The dime? Yeah, all that double talk. When all you had to do was slip me the word that Jerry Diamond sent you. Served you right the way them luscious treated you, acting like a died in the wolf square. <laughs> Jerry Diamond. Diamond. My numb brain slowly put the meaning of his words into shape. He thought... He thought that I was an accomplice. Sent by a partner to help him break jail. That all my screams about a dime had been nothing but a signal to him. A signal that I came from Jerry Diamond. I cast a quick glance sideways at the revolver held loosely but ready in his lap. At the eyes that never lost their iciness even when he laughed. It wasn't hard to guess what he would do when he found out his mistake. Jerry, you got the hideout set up? Uh, yes. Where is it? The hideout? The hideout. We're going to Jerry's place first, right? Then what? Uh, <clears throat> well, I'll take you to Jerry's, and uh, then he'll take over from there. Hmm. How far is it to Jerry's? Can't be more than about five miles, is it? Well, it's... Uh, look behind you. Huh? What's the matter? There's a car following us without lights. Well, I don't see... What? Hey, 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 what's the big idea? You trying to cross me? Uh, I couldn't help it. My, my foot, they uh, slammed on the brake. That car. We've got to get out of here. All right. Go ahead. Get it started. Come on, come get on. Get started. All right. <clears throat> I'm getting out till that car passes. You make for the other side. And no tricks. Just to make sure, I'll take this key. Mm -hmm. I made myself a chance, and I took it. I slipped out of the car on the other side and ran across the fields until I could run no more. After a long time, I found a road. And after a while of tramping along that road, a dark shape loomed up before me, a gas station. And through the glass, I could make out the outline of a telephone. I tried the door. It was locked, of course. But I found a tire iron and sprang the latch. I ran to the phone to make my call. And then I saw the coin slot, gaping at me like a laughing mouth. In a rage, I shook the black box. I could hear the dimes inside, behind a sheet of metal no thicker than a playing card, yet as inaccessible as the moon. But there must be some money in this room. My eyes focused on the battered desk. There was some change in it and a couple of dollar bills, the kind of money that a man will leave as a sop to possible burglars. Burglars? That meant me. Carefully, I abstracted a single dime and went to the phone. Uh, get me San Francisco. Fillmore, 33265. It's Morris Jacobs. Uh, tell him uh, this is his partner, Ralph Clark, and ask him to accept the charges. Thank you. There's an interruption on the line, and there may be a slight delay, sir. Will you hold on, or shall I ring you? Yeah, I'll hold on, but hurry, operator. It's important. One moment, please. As I waited, a glint of light pulled my eyes away from the phone. Far down the road, the headlights of a car joggled over the rise and aimed toward me. It was the first car to come by since I'd hit the road. It might be a stray farmer starting out before sunup, but I couldn't take the chance. Hastily, I hung up the receiver, closed the cash drawer, and snapped the lock on the door. Then I crouched beneath the desk, and not a moment too soon. Off and up! Hey! I've tried to wake this character before. Sleeps like a dead man. Especially if he's back on the bottle again. We'll get him up. Hey, Jerry! Then I heard the creak of bed springs from the rear of the station. The light appeared under an inside door. It opened, and two hairy barefoot legs under a flannel nightgown came through and made for the front door. Who is it? Brady and Ross, up and up. <laughs> You're a fine bunch of cops running out of gas in the middle of the night. Come on in. That's chilly with the door open. It ain't gas, pal. Phillips broke jail. Huh? How'd he do it? Well, there was two of them. He had an accomplice. Said he was a lawyer. First thing I know, I'm looking into the muzzle of my own gun. 
You know, they say Phillips used to work for Houdini once. All and... right, Ross, we don't have all night. Point is, we found their car abandoned on the road back of Ferris's Hopfield. Ran out of gas. It can't be far away. Hmm. Hey, there was a big reward for Phillips after he broke jail at Bennington, wasn't there? Yeah, a thousand dollars. Say, Jerry, you know him, don't you? You were in the Bennington pokey when he made that break. What was it, a drunk and disorderly or something? Yeah. Yeah, had me a little too much and broke a window in the general store. We were roommates for the night. I was pretty scared. How'd he do it? The break. I don't know. I was sleeping at all. Thousand dollars reward, huh? A man could do a lot with a thousand dollars. Not dead, he couldn't. Don't you go getting any ideas now. That Phillips is a killer and so is his partner, most likely. Well, I ain't exactly helpless myself. A nice little fella on my side. Now, you take my advice, chum, and put that gun away. They show up here, you talk soft and let us do the capturing. Sure, sure, I'll play safe. Well, uh, we'll be going. Just wanted to alert you, Jack. Yeah, thanks. So long, boys. All right, you. Come out from under that desk. Come on out, I say. This gun's getting mighty nervous. Now, get your hands up. Stand over there. Uh, now, now, look, mister, I... I'll do the talking. Who are you? you got to believe me. I'm not a criminal. I'm a lawyer. Oh, oh, so you must be the other one. Keep them hands up. I got into this by accident. He helped me escape, yes, but... Where is Phillips? I left him in the car. That's another thing. You can get the reward. I know who he's going to meet. They're going to a hideout. Oh, I see. Well, who is he going to meet? Somebody named Jerry Diamond. There. There, if you let me get to that phone, I can clear up everything. No, you don't. You stay where you are, I'll plug you. But that's my partner, my law partner in San Francisco. I only broke in here so I could phone him. He'll identify me. <laughs> you don't believe me? Oh, I believe you. Well, answer it yourself. Huh? You'll see. Not on your life, mister. You think I'm out of my mind? But you've got to answer it. You don't know what I went through to place that call. You can't just stand it. There... Jerry. You're Jerry Diamond. That's right. Jerry. Jerry. Who's that? Turn off that light, too. Phillips. Stand over there by the window where you see you. Go on. Jerry! Come on in, Phillips. I ran out of gas and that punk that... It happened so fast that for a moment I had no reaction at all. None. I just watched it. Watched Phillips holding his chest with both hands. Watched that giant body twist convulsively on the floor and then lie still. Watched Jerry bend over him and then straighten up. Then as he turned grinning, my emotion, my, my feeling came back. And what I felt was seething, overpowering rage, fury. Everything I'd been through this night was like a boiler that had to burst. Dead or alive. I just made me a thousand bucks. You foul, stinking old man. Huh? You're worse than he is. Ah, uh, shut up. Maybe I'll get a reward for you, too. A small one. <laughs> I could feel the bullet land on my side, just below the belt. The avenues of pain spread out like the cracks in a hammered window glass. But somehow, strangely, it didn't stop me. I kept moving toward him. He backed away, surprised. He was aiming for another shot when we grabbed him. I got the gun, and he got my throat. I stumbled. I held onto his hand that was holding the gun. I wouldn't let go. And as he fell backwards into the chair, I was on top of him. And as we threshed around there on the floor, I brought his hand up suddenly and smashed the gun into his face. And then he lay still. I listened to his heart. He was all right. He was all right. Then I realized that... that I was all right. Yet he'd shot me, hit me. I should be lying there on the plank floor instead of that grotesque heap in the shapeless flannel nightgown. I felt my side where the bullet had struck. Brought my hand away. There was no blood on it. There should be blood. Touch the spot again. I fingered the contour of something small and hard and round. I pulled it out of my watch pocket. A dime. A dime. The tenth part of a dollar. All a man needed to buy a cup of coffee, to make a phone call, to pay a fine in a kangaroo court, to save his life. And I'd had it all the time. I had had it all the time. <laughs> Thank you. 
Suspense. In which Mr. Lloyd Bridges starred in William N. Robeson's production of Chicken Feed by Lawrence Goldman. Listen. Listen again next week when we bring you Francis' letter in Escape to Death. Another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Supporting Mr. Bridges and Chicken Feed were Amzie Strickland, Betty Groverly, Ted DeCorsa, Lou Krugman, Jack Crucian, Charlie Lung, Lou Merrill, and Dick Legrand. Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler, written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. By the way, did you have a good vacation this summer? A nice, quiet time. No unusual excitement. No uh, unpleasant event that shook your nerves so that you jump when a strange hand knocks on your window at midnight. Or... uh, Slow, heavy footsteps come up to your door. That's good. Then you're in shape to go on another vacation with me tonight. It's the story I call... Vacation from Life. The spot I have in mind for your vacation is a tiny harbor along the northern main coast. An isolated beach reached only by boat from the nearest town two miles away. And so lonely, there's only a single cottage. But it's going to be vacant soon. The present owner won't be needing it after tonight. My name is Matthew Clark. I am 40 years old and I teach Greek in New York City. I suppose you could say I'm a typical professor since I wear glasses, stoop a little, am absent-minded at times, and as my wife has said so many times in the ten years we've been married, I hardly know a screwdriver from a monkey wrench or how to replace a burnt-out electric light bulb. A fumbler. That's her favorite word to describe me. Well, she's going to find out it's not true. She's... But I mustn't get excited. I won't be able to finish this if I... if I don't keep calm. I'm writing this in our cottage on Desolation Beach in Maine. It's almost dark, and the waves are pounding on the sand. The wind is rising. There's a real northeaster coming. But four days ago, when I came up here to open the cottage, the sun shone, the water sparkled, and except for the driftwood and seaweed along the beach, there wasn't a hint of the fierce storms that can lash this shore. I made sure that the cottage was in good shape, aired the rooms, and put away the stock of provisions that Seth Thompson had brought from me from the village in his boat. And then while I waited for Seth to call for me, I walked along the beach, poking into the piles of driftwood like a boy searching for treasure. And I found it. I found something that set my heart to pounding and brought a flush of excitement to my face, something that roused my imagination to a feverish pitch. It was a mine... A naval mine torn loose from its moorings someplace in the Atlantic during the war and tossed ashore at last here at my feet. It was hidden under seaweed, a three-foot steel ball with 500 pounds of TNT inside it, waiting for an incautious touch to set it off. When I saw it, I started back in alarm. And then in a flash, I knew. Knew what a treasure I'd found and what it was going to mean to me. I was gloating over it so that I didn't even hear Seth's boat arrive at my dock until he called to me. Professor, you about ready to be heading for town? I turned to see Seth stepping down off my dock. I hurried toward him. Yes, Seth, I'm ready. I um, was just uh, stretching my legs while I waited. Seen you poking around that driftwood. I figured maybe you'd found something worthwhile. 
Seth, what I found was a very dead codfish, an extremely odorous one. <laughs> well, here's the boat. I'll get in. Professor, for Pete's sake, don't never step right on the gunnel of a boat when it's rocking. You'll either fall into the boat and break a leg or go over the side and maybe drown. Oh, yes, of course. You've told me that before, haven't you? Not more than 11 times. Yeah, I'll hop in first. Now, give me a hand. That's it. Now, jump down here beside me. Huh? Professor, look out. Ouch! Oh, Professor, when you lose your balance in the boat, don't ever grab the engine. It's usually hot. Let me see how bad you burned your hand. Well, it's it's not too bad. It it was clumsy of me, though, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. The burn ain't bad. Just a little engine grease and fix it up. There. Now, you sit down back there. Very well, Seth. Stay set down. Truth is, Professor... I don't trust you around machinery no more than I would a baby. My hand burned painfully, but I was too elated to notice. All the way back to the village, and then by train to New York, thoughts and plans raced through my mind. I formulated and discarded half a dozen schemes until the right one came to me. So simple, it would be impossible to go wrong. And then I fell asleep as peacefully as a child. In New York next morning, I hurried down to 10th Street to a tiny apartment six flights up and eagerly rapped on the brass knocker. Why, Matthew. Matthew, it's you. Yes, Ruth. I I know you didn't expect me so early, but uh, here I am. Oh, I didn't expect you so early, but I am glad to see you. Won't you come in? Thank you. I'll make you some coffee. Sit down and be comfortable. I'll only be a moment. As Ruth bustled around making coffee, I sat down and relaxed. The tiny apartment was soothing. There was an atmosphere of peace and quiet about it that delighted me, and Ruth herself delighted me even more. She was small, charmingly feminine. She was a teacher, too, of ancient history. We'd met during one of my summer lectures at the university and quickly found much in common. One of our favorite pastimes was to discuss the life of the ancient world. Uh, Perhaps the Punic War or the history of Greece, she from the standpoint of the historian, I from that of a student of the language and literature. Here, Matthew. Drink this. It's hot and strong the way you like it. Thank you. Oh! Oh, look out! I almost dropped it. Why, Matthew, you've hurt your hand. What have you done to it? It's just a little burn. Nothing to worry about. Matthew, you must take care of yourself. I'm going to fix that burn. Have some lotion right here and bandages. You just sit and drink your coffee while I take care of it. And tell me all about the cottage and the trip and everything. The touch of her fingers was amazingly soothing. And as she bandaged my hand, I told her of my trip, though I said nothing of the mine that I'd found on the beach. She listened to me as a woman should, with interest and appreciation. She made me forget my clumsiness, my awkwardness at conversation, my, I cannot deny it, my insignificance in the world. No wonder I loved her with a devotion that my friends would have thought impossible in poor, dull, dry Matthew Clark, professor of Greek. It was with reluctance that I said goodbye when I'd finished my coffee. I know you have to go, Matthew, but it's sweet of you to drop in. You know that I'd come oftener if I could, Ruth. Of course, Matthew. I understand. Will I... Will I see you again before you take your vacation? Of course, my dear. I'll stop in day after tomorrow. And, uh, Ruth... Yes, Matthew? I hope to have some news for you then. Some good news. Oh, Matthew, you mean... Yes, my dear, I hope so. But for now, au revoir. How different it was when I reached my own apartment in Washington Square... Louise, my wife, greeted me with a brisk contempt, which has been her attitude toward me almost from the first week that we were married. Is that you, Matthew? Yes. Oh, so you're home. Yes, I'm home. Safe and sound, my dear. Safe, but not completely sound, I see. That bandage on your hand, what did you do to yourself this time? Oh, I uh, uh, I burned myself slightly on the engine of Seth Thompson's boat. Well, you wouldn't be you if you didn't hurt yourself somehow. Who put the bandage on? I see it's fresh. The ba- 
a, a very nice young lady in the drugstore at the station fixed it. You see, I, uh, I uh, stopped by to buy some ointment. Never she mind the... the details. Now, I suppose you want me to drop everything and fix some breakfast for you. Oh, no, my dear, no. I, uh, I had a cup of coffee at the drugstore. Well, thank goodness for that. Well, how's the cottage? I suppose it had been broken into and half our things stolen. Oh, no, it was in fine shape. One of the shutters was blown off, that was all. What about the electricity? I suppose you forgot to have it turned on. No, my dear, I attended that first thing. The place is ready and waiting for us. Well, I can hardly believe you haven't forgotten something. But I can't stand here talking. I have things to do. I suppose uh, you'll want to rest. Yes, I would rather like a nap. I didn't sleep so very well on the train. Very well. I'll see you at dinner. There's uh, something else I want to talk to you about. But it can wait. Something else she wanted to talk about. Well, there was something else that I wanted to talk about, too. I was sure it would do no good, but I had to mention it. I didn't see Louise again until dinner, and then she wasted no time in coming to the point. Matthew, I wanted to speak to you about your insurance. My insurance, darling? I said insurance, didn't I? Wish you wouldn't repeat my words after me like a parrot. Well, I'm sorry, Louise. It's just that I, uh... I rather think I'm carrying all the insurance I can afford on a teacher's salary. On a teacher's salary. That's exactly the point. Now, suppose something happens to you. What's to become of me? You certainly haven't been able to save anything. There is my life insurance. Five thousand dollars. A pittance in these times. No, Matthew. You must take out more insurance. With your ridiculous faculty for getting hurt, you might easily kill yourself at any time. Well, that's a rather callous thing to say, Louise. It's practical, that's all. Now, look at your burned hand. You might just as easily have fallen overboard and drowned as fallen against the engine. Louise, I'm not a child. Which brings me to something that I want to say. Well, say it then. Louise, for some time I felt that you were dissatisfied with me as a, as a husband. Indeed. Go on, Matthew. You seem to look upon me as a rather feeble-witted creature whom you must constantly admonish. I'm sure it can be no pleasure to you to be tied to such a man as you think me, Louise. What are you driving at, Matthew? Well, you have a very fine intelligence and, and great energy, and you deserve to be a free woman, able to carve a better place for yourself in the world. Yes. You're a handsome woman. You could easily find a husband more worthy of you. Someone like that insurance agent, Court von Walter, for instance. And just why do you mention Court von Walter? Well, it's uh, just as an example. He's obviously attracted to you, that's all. And so you think I should divorce you? Well, I can't help feeling that you'd be much happier if you did, Louise. Possibly I would be. But I know my duty. Without me, Matthew, you would be quite lost. I'm sure you'd manage to kill yourself somehow within a year. I'm your wife, Matthew. And your wife I shall remain until death, as they say, do us part. Until death do us part. Well, I had tried. I'd done my best to save her. Now I had to go ahead with my own plans. After all, I had a right to some happiness, too. I may be a professor of Greek, but I'm also a man with a man's ability to love and hate. Yes, to love Ruth and to hate Louise. I hadn't even known how fiercely I hated her until after I'd met Ruth. And then hatred had welled up in me with a violence that had astonished me. Some men might put up with such a woman for a lifetime, but I'm not one of them. They are the weaklings of the world. Men, real men, take what they want from life, and I was determined to be such a man. The next day, I did as Louise insisted. I called upon Kurt von Walter, the blonde, handsome refugee who has become so Americanized that he speaks better English than most Americans and who sells life insurance to men by flirting with their wives. I don't like him. His easy self-assurance and blatant masculinity revolt me. But my business didn't take long. There you are, Mr. Clark. An accident insurance policy for $20,000. Able to use so charming wife without a fuss of red tape. Yes, I think it's a waste of money, but Louise wanted it. 
Who can say what will happen in this uncertain existence, my friend? Up there in Maine, the fierce tides, the slippery rocks, the great storms. At any moment, an accident may snatch a man's life from him. I suppose so, but I don't know why Louise looks upon me as such a child. She's just as apt to get hurt as I am. Very true. So why not a policy to ensure her life as well? Of course, I'm just an underpaid professor. I can hardly throw money around for insurance as easily as all that. All the more reason you need it. If something happened to the lovely Mrs. Clark, if I say... Well, the expenses would bankrupt you. I guess they would. So um, let me write a joint policy to cover both of you. The premium will only be a little more. Well, all right. I suppose it is the practical thing to do, and uh, Louise always likes to be practical. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, when do you leave? Uh, tomorrow evening from Grand Central Station. I'll give myself the pleasure of seeing you off. I may be able to help with the baggage. And for now, um, au revoir, my friend. <laughs> So that was that. A fumbler, was I. Incompetent, unable to plan, born to fail in anything. Louise would see. Her life was insured in my favor for $20,000, and Court Van Walter would have to testify that he talked me into it. 20000 What freedom that would give Ruth and me. We could travel, see Europe, Greece, visit the very spots where Socrates walked and Plato composed his immortal dialogues but I concealed my jubilance, lest Louise notice it and, and suspect something. I paid a brief visit to Ruth to say goodbye and to tell her something of the wonderful future ahead for us. Oh, Matthew. Matthew, I can hardly believe it. Greece, Rome, Venice, all the famous spots of the old world. It would be wonderful. Yes, we'll live life for a change, Ruth, instead of just reading about it in books. Then... And your wife, she has agreed to? Yes, she's going to divorce me. I'm not the man for her, and we both know it. Oh, I think you're a fine man, Matthew. Thank you, my dear. But Louise looks at things differently. We'll be back soon, and attend to everything then. Very soon. I promise you. Yes, very soon. Much sooner than anyone but myself could guess. That night, Louise and I left on the main express. True to his word, Court von Walter, smirking and odious, was on hand to see us off, and Louise made a foolish fuss over him. <laughs> oh, you really shouldn't have come to the train with us, Court. It wasn't necessary. But of course not. It was a pleasure, dear lady. And the way you carried all our bags. Poor Matthew could never have carried half of them, even if he hadn't burned his hand. Well, on the other <laughs> hand, I could never have learned Greek. Greek? Oh. <laughs> well, I hope you have a fine trip. Thank you. I shall be up that way myself next week. I'll drop in on you. We'll be looking for you, Kurt. We'll never forgive you if you fail us, will we, Matthew? Uh, what? Oh, never mind. <laughs> oh, dear, it's train time. Goodbye, Kurt. Goodbye, dear lady. Oh, Court, you shouldn't have done that. I'm not used to having my hand kissed. In that case, dear lady. Oh, 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 Court, you're a wicked man to kiss me like that in front of my own husband. <laughs> I, I could not help it. In that case, I forgive you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'll be seeing you soon. Very soon. Yes, Court. Very soon. I pretended not to notice Louise's ridiculous flirting with Kurt von Walter, and we went to our drawing room. The trip passed quickly, and exactly on schedule, late in the afternoon of the next day, we were in Seth Thompson's boat, approaching our cottage on Desolation Bay. There she be, Miss Clark. Cottage come through the winter aren't well. Yes, better than I expected, considering that Matthew closed it up last fall. Oh, the beach is filthy, though. Well, storms last winter piled up plenty of weeds and stuff. Oh, really? I expect you can burn it, though. Hmm. Oh, speaking of burning, how's your hand, Professor? It's getting well, Seth. I'm still clumsy with it, but it's healing. Yeah, them burns can be bad business. I know a fellow three years ago burned his hand and died of it. Yes, sir. Lockjaw. Well, here we are. At last. I'll tie her up and help you unload. Then you folks are all set for your vacation. Only you're going to have kind of nasty weather the next three days. What? Why, is a storm coming up? 
Oh, goodness, the sky has gotten gray since we left the village. Oh, and the dear. wind's kicking up. Look at them whitecaps out there. Yeah, we're in for real nor'easter. I hope you folks ain't forgot nothing, because I won't be able to make it here till, uh, till the storm goes down. A nor'easter? Well, that, that's most provoking. I'll be sure and lay in plenty of firewood. Yes. She'll be cold and damp till it's over. Hmm. Well, I better be getting this stuff ashore. Up that there storm's blowing up faster than I figured. Just listen to that wind. We might at least have had a few nice days to begin our vacation. It is too bad, my dear. Well, you don't seem very concerned about it. If anything, you seem to be quite happy that we're going to have a storm. Uh, do, oh, oh, no, but I'm not. Oh. Now, uh, let's see, everything's put away. Matthew, why didn't you have the phone installed as I asked? The price of running a wire out this far was prohibitive, Louise. Oh, money, money. I'm so tired of not being able to do what I want because it costs too much. Oh, well. Matthew, we need firewood. It's getting very cold, and all we have is that big log beside the fireplace. Yes, of course. I'll go pick up some on the beach. I'll be back in ten minutes. I hurried out of the cottage. The wind howled and the waves were pounding on the beach, sending white foam flying. I strode along the hard, packed sand, exultant. Everything was working to help me. The storm, my burned hand, everything was combining to aid me, as if I'd planned it so. A hundred feet from the house, I found the mine, just as I'd left it, hidden beneath the seaweed. A three-foot globe of concentrated death. Nestling among the driftwood of seaweed and dead fish, covered with barnacles, so innocent looking, so deadly. Carefully, I lifted the seaweed I'd placed on top of it and exposed the detonating horns, those deadly knobs of metal sticking up from the mine and spelling death to any ship that touched them. Next, I found several pieces of wood nearby, just the right size for our fireplace, and pulled from the sand a length of rope, which once had anchored a fisherman's lobster pot. And now came the dangerous part. I had to fasten several pieces of the firewood to the detonating horns of the mine, using the rope to tie them fast. With the wind blowing steadily stronger and the storm coming closer, I worked as delicately as a surgeon. A fumbler was I. Not now. In five minutes, the job was done. The driftwood tied securely to the detonating horns. A super booby trap for anyone seeking firewood on that beach. A strong pull on one of the pieces tied to the mine. And afterwards, what evidence would there be? It would be tragic, of course. But really no one's fault if Louise stumbled into a mine while walking on the beach. I'd mourn for a while. And then marry dear, sweet, adoring Ruth. I was finished. I put seaweed back to cover the mine, leaving the driftwood on top, where it would be easy to see and pick up. And then I hurried back to the cottage, and my heart was pounding in my chest with a noise like the thunder of the waves as I flung the door open and entered. Well, Matthew, where's the firewood? I, I, I'm sorry, Louise. It hurt my burned hand. I, I couldn't carry anything back. I might have known it. You can't even bring in firewood, you fumbler. But I did gather some. I left it on top of a pile of seaweed down the beach, but I couldn't bring it any further. Now I suppose I have to go get it. Well, I'll help you, but I can't pick the sticks up alone. Oh, no, Matthew. You stay here and get the fire started. Uh, maybe you can chop some splinters off that log, even if you can use only one hand. Of course. I'll have a fine fire going when you get back. I, I can handle the axe with one hand. You see? <clears throat> Matthew. Huh? You're acting rather oddly. Your face is flushed. I wonder if you could be getting a fever. I don't think so. Well, then on top of everything else, I'd have to nurse you. I'm perfectly all right, Louise. And I'll have this log chopped by the time you get back. Uh, oh! What have you done? Oh, uh, the axe slipped. I've, what? I've cut my leg. Help me to the chair. Here, take my arm. Here. Now sit down. There. Now, let's see. Oh, oh, my Louise. Look at all the blood. It's a deep cut, I can tell you. Oh, sit still, Matthew. I can't tell a thing with you squirming so. Oh, it's... Now, let me... It's bleeding so. Look, it's coming out in little spurts. Louise, do something. I'm very much afraid, Matthew, that you've cut an artery. Huh? An artery? Oh, no. I always knew something like this would happen someday. Louise, just... 
Don't just stand there. Do something. Put a, put a tourniquet on my leg. No, Matthew. No? What do you mean? I mean that fate has obviously intended you to die, and I don't propose to interfere. Louise, I don't understand you. What are you saying? Matthew, listen to me. When you said the other day that I should be married to someone like Court Von Walther, you were perfectly right. I love Court, and he loves me. He said so. Louise, you're joking. Now do something about my leg. I'm bleeding to death. Yes, Matthew, you are. But I was talking about Court Von Walther. If I were free, he'd marry me. I know he would. But not if I were penniless. He's European, and they're practical about such things. For the love of heaven, Louise, put a tourniquet on my leg. I know it's hard for you to grasp, Matthew... But I'm not going to lift a hand to help you. Well, but you've got to. You're my wife. I won't be for long. Soon I'll be your widow. And I'll have a dowry of $25,000 to bring to court. Yes, you're mad. You're mad. He's not really interested in you. You don't know what you're doing. I do. I'm being completely practical. When I urge you to take out that insurance, Matthew, I think I was hoping something like this would happen. Maybe I was even planning to make it happen. I'm not sure. But now it, ha it has happened with no help from me. I have a right to love and happiness with a real man, and I'm taking it. Louise, Louise, please, please, please help me. Matthew, I'm going outside now. I'm going to watch the storm come up. I'll be gone at least half an hour. Then I'll bring back some firewood. If when I come back, I find you beyond help, I'll be terribly shocked and distressed. But there won't be a thing I can do about it. Oh, no, Louise, wait. Wait. I, I have something to tell you. I'm not interested in anything you have to say but now. But it's important. You mustn't go out. You, you, mu you mustn't pick up any firewood. Goodbye, Matthew. Louise, come back. Come back. That was just a half an hour ago. Louise is out there on the beach now, watching the waves pound on the sand and waiting. Waiting. And I'm sitting here getting weaker. Weaker. I tried to put a tourniquet on my leg, but it only slowed the bleeding. It didn't stop it. I never was good at first aid. I never was good at anything. Just a fumbler all my life. It's too late now to help me. In a few moments, Louise will start back. She'll pick up some firewood on the beach. Probably the firewood that I left so cunningly placed because it'll be convenient. She'll pull hard. The jar will set off the detonating mechanism of the mine. There. That is the explosion and broke the window of the cottage. My scheme worked. It worked. So I'm not such a complete thunderer after all. But I'm getting weaker. I can't write anymore. I just want to say that this is my last will and testament. $25,000 from my insurance policies. I leave to the Handicraft Foundation for boys to be used in teaching boys how to do things with their hands. I especially direct that it be used in teaching first aid and the use of tools. Especially axes. Every boy should know how to use an axe without cutting himself. <laughs> This is the mysterious traveler again. So that cottage is empty now. There's really nothing wrong with it. Just a broken window and a few shingles torn loose by the explosion of that drifting mine that washed ashore down the beach. You could fix it easily. If you'd like to know where it is, I could... Oh, you'll have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. 
All the characters in today's story were entirely fictitious, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead was purely coincidental. In the cast today were Maurice Toplin, Eric Dussler, Vicky Bola, Helen Titus, and Stefan Schnabel. Original music was played by Paul Taubman. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled The Big Payoff, another strange and shivery tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler has come to you from our New York studios. This is Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. A murderer is a psychopathic individual. He has a screw loose, his mind is some of his marbles. No rational, sane person deliberately sets out to kill another human being, or himself for that matter, excepting under one special condition when he gets behind the wheel of an automobile. Then all the rules of human behavior are rescinded. Anything can happen, and with tragic frequency, does. The mild-mannered Mr. Milk Toast becomes an angel of death. Astride his 350 horses, he ranges the highways of the nation with the murderous vengeance of a latter-day Genghis Khan. He cannot be persuaded, he cannot be reasoned with. His headlong rush to destruction, his own or anyone else that might be in his path, is only somewhat deterred by the highway patrolmen who daily risk their lives in the ceaseless struggle against murder on wheels. Of such elements is constructed the story you are about to hear. It is a moral tale, but a chilling one. Listen. Listen, then, as Everett Sloan stars in Speed Trap, which begins in exactly one minute. How can heroism be acknowledged and symbolized? Recognition of outstanding heroism takes the form of America's supreme military decoration, the Medal of Honor. It is awarded to those members of the United States Armed Forces who distinguish themselves conspicuously by gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of life, above and beyond the call of duty, in action involving actual conflict with an enemy. For recipients in the Army and Air Force, the medal is a gold-finished bronze star with the head of the ancient goddess Minerva in the center. A laurel wreath in green enamel surrounds the five-pointed star, which is suspended by two links from a bar bearing the inscription, Valor, and surmounted by an eagle with wings outstretched. The ribbon pad directly above is light blue, with 13 white stars arranged in the form of a triple chevron. The President of the United States is the only government official authorized to present the Medal of Honor. The award is made by the Commander-in-Chief in the name of Congress thus accounting for why this highly esteemed decoration is sometimes incorrectly referred to as the Congressional Medal of Honor. Only a very small number of the many millions of U.S. Armed Forces personnel, past and present, have been presented this great symbol of courage to which free men can aspire, the Medal of Honor. And now... Speed Trap. Starring Everett Sloan, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Sometimes it takes you years to get to know a guy. Sometimes on the highway patrol, you learn all about a man in ten minutes. Like the night Craig Hollister checked me out on my new beat. And there's a soft shoulder here, right? I didn't answer him. I was too busy sweating the grade. The wheel was easy in my hands. Too easy, like it always is on a slick highway. My headlights caught the rain and sleet slanting down from the pass. Hollister wiped the mist off the windshield. I thought of loosening my collar, but I didn't want to make a bad impression on him. I knew he was a good patrolman. They'd told me at headquarters. Well, good patrolmen go by the book. I wiped my hands one at a time and changed my grip on the wheel. A curve coming up. I don't see why they need us on this road. A drive would be nuts to go over 30. Uh, people speed anywhere. This turn's called the corkscrew. It's awful slick in the rain. I found four kids here in a station wagon after the last storm. I was left of them anyway. Well, 
brother. I'll take this one in second. There's another rough curve coming up. We've had three fatalities here this winter. I don't know if I'm going to like this, Pete. <laughs> that isn't bad. Once you get used to the blood. You say you actually catch speeders on this highway? Yeah. That's how I met my wife. She was speeding along here. Oh, that reminds me. A dispatcher, this is 3022. Go ahead, Craig. Say, Joe, will you call Debbie and tell her to pick me up at headquarters? Okay. You better get down here before she does. A doll like her is a safe around me. <laughs> you old relic, she could break your arm. <laughs> uh, Joe. Yeah. It's awful slick up here. Tell her to take it easy on the grave, will you? Ten four and a half. Well, this was pretty good. You wanted your wife to meet you, you gave the dispatcher a call on the radio. That was something they hadn't taught me at the police academy. I sure hope she doesn't try to break any records. Not tonight. You say you caught her speeding on this stretch? Yeah. She was roaring down the grade with her car full of summer tourists, all of them tanked to the eyeballs. Including your wife? Well, I thought so. I wrote it up that way. Yeah? Then what happened? Now, the judge thought otherwise. Debbie cried and... Her father had just given the county a new library, so the judge decided that she'd never had a drink in her life. And there wasn't a dry eye in the courthouse. And you married her? Yeah, the best thing I ever did. I think. You think? Oh, today was our anniversary. I couldn't even spend it with her. She's been up there on the mountain alone all day. That's tough. You know, this beat's kind of lonely for a woman. Maybe says she doesn't mind, but... I think she's bored. Well, here's a good spot. Pull over. Pull over? Yeah, we'll wait here and follow her down. Well, why? Well, sometimes she still drives this great too fast, all right? With us in back of her, she won't take it easy. So I pulled over, of course. I was tired. I was trying to get my own wife moved into our cabin, but the man said pull over and wait, so I pulled over and waited. I lit a cigarette. In the flare of my match, I could see he was squinting up the road. This joker was worried about something. He caught me looking and seemed kind of ashamed. Huh? Oh, oh uh, she'll be along in a minute. Sure, no hurry. But uh, you can't follow her everywhere, you know. Look, Art, uh, I'm getting a transfer, and Debbie and I'll be out of these mountains in a week. It's slick tonight, so it's okay with you, partner. Oh, we'll... sure, sure. Sorry. Hey, what the... What's the matter? Look at those headlights up there. I twisted around in my seat. Half a mile up the grade, a pair of headlights stabbed over the cliff. Seemed to hang there. Hollister gripped my shoulder. The light straightened suddenly and got brighter and brighter. The guy was practically flying. Holy smoke! Hollister was big. He didn't look like he could move very fast, but he was nothing but a blur jumping out of the patrol car. He was around the hood and swinging a flashlight in circles before I could even turn on my red light. The crazy headlights seemed to reach out at him. Hey, you okay, Hollister? Yeah. Well, let's take him. Holy cow, I thought you'd had it. Close, but no cigar. He must be plastered. Did you get his tag? The lights blinded me. Oh, I could just see it was a black sports car, that's all. Looked like a Jag. A Jag? Yeah. Aren't you going to call the dispatcher? Uh, no, no. Pappy ought to be parked near a halfway house. A Jag, huh? Hello, 2429, this is 3022. It was a Jag, all right, and I'd two, caught a flash four, of the driver. Nine. It was a woman driver, three, oh, young, two, blonde, two, with a crazy grin on her face. I felt sick. I'd picked up the pieces two, after four, a few two, wrecks nine. down in the valley. Go ahead, Craig. It's bad enough when it's a man, two, four, two, but nine. a young girl. Three, oh, two, two. Pappy, we're after a possible 502, three miles north of Halfway House. He just about ran me down. Now, be careful, huh? I'll try to take him. 10-4. Her, not him. Make this curve tight, Art. What'd you say? That driver. It's a woman. A woman? I think so. Yeah. After this curve, you can cut loose for about 800 yards, and then try to get me close enough to spotlight her license. Hang on, partner. Holy smoke. Be careful. Can you get the number? Oh, the plate's covered with mud. You must have dragged a wheel on the shoulder. Maybe on the next stretch, I can try again. No, we don't need the number. What do you mean? Well, you saw the car, a black Jag, you said. Yeah. A girl driving, you said. Yeah, why? Well, that's got to be Debbie's car. It's got to be my wife. In 
a moment, we continue with the second act of Suspense. Another visit with Joe and Daphne Forsythe. Joe? Joe? Joe, stop reading that paper and talk to me. I'm listening. Go ahead. Well, I was talking to Mrs. Snyder today. You know, she's the one whose boy had 31% less cavities. Uh-huh. Well, she thinks that we should buy bigger savings bonds. Uh-huh. She says that when people can afford it, it makes more sense. Oh, she says there are a lot of different denominations. They start at $25, but then there are a 50, 100, 200, and even $500 bonds. Is that so? And then with the ones we've already bought through the payroll savings plan, we'd have quite a nest egg. Uh-huh. Are you listening to me? Uh-huh. Did you know that the total accumulated compounded semi-annual interest of the Series E savings bond will amount to 93 and a third percent of the original purchasing price? Uh-huh. I thought so. Joe, what did I say? Uh... You said that United States savings bonds are a safe, easy way of investing. I did. That they help guard our country's freedom. And? They're the best investment in America's future. I said something else, too. Oh, yeah. You said that the total accumulated compounded semi-annual interest of the Series E savings bond will amount to 93 and one-third percent of the original purchase price. Well, now, how did you do that? Husband's trade secret. And now... Starring Everett Sloan, Act Two of Speed Trap. I stared at the guy beside me in the patrol car, then whipped my eyes back to the slick mountain road. So you think that's your wife? Yeah, it's gotta be. Oh, look, there are probably a hundred Jags on the highway tonight. Why does this have to be your wife? You wouldn't know, and I haven't got time to tell you. Well, why would she try to run you down? She doesn't know what she's doing, Art. What do you mean? She's fried. She wanted me to take her out tonight, but I had to show you the road, so we had a fight. She must have sat around and got plastered, I guess. Well, she's going to roll that thing, and that'll be it. Are you sure it's Yes, I'm sure. I can see it coming, alone in that house every day. That's why I put in for the transfer. But now it'll be too late. Art, we've got to catch him. Try to get her before Myers' curve. Well, I'm, I'm doing my best. But these sports cars, that jags like it was glued to the road. No, it isn't glued to the road. It'll roll just like the rest of them. It'll roll. You want me to try to take her again? No, not here, Art, not here. If she speeds up anymore, she hasn't got a prayer on Myers' curve. Just hang back and don't press her. Then he did something that wasn't in the books. He reached over and cut our growler. And he flicked off the red light. I started to turn it back on and felt his hand on my wrist. No, leave it off. Maybe we're scaring her. Art, if she doesn't slow down, she'll never make it. Then she started her turn on Meyer's curve, and it was easy to see she wouldn't make it. It's the roughest turn on the grade, and a hundred-foot drop to the riverbed below. The taillights hesitated for a second like they were making up their minds whether to run into the hill or over the side. The car slid sideways, rear toward the river. She was going over backwards. No, oh, no, 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 baby, please. I took my foot off the gas. Out of the tail of my eye, I saw Hollister cover his face. And then I was fighting to stay on the road myself. Suddenly, the miracle happened. She'd made it. She'd made it. Now we had to do it. Nice going, Art. Nice going. 2429. This is 3022. We're a mile north, still unable to catch the 502. She's doing about 75. Now, I suggest you start up and we'll try to box her, but be careful of her. This is 2429. Did you say her? Yeah, it's a woman. I'm up to 65. Is she slowing down? No. No, she's swinging left. She's wild, Pappy. Be careful. 10 4. No, she, she's swinging right, Pappy. Let her by. Let her by. Let her by. How are you going to make an old time patrolman let a drunk pass him on the road? No, Pappy tried to fight it. He tried to ease her onto the shoulder. For a second, I thought he had her, but the convertible lurched back. The two sets of taillights got closer, and then Pappy was off the road, over the shoulder, bouncing and rolling down the embankment. I eased my foot off the accelerator, praying that it wasn't as bad as it looked. What are you doing? I'm going back for Pappy. Well, what about her? Call the dispatcher. They'll stop her if she doesn't go off the road first. Stay on her tail. What? Are you off your rocker? They'll stop her. That's my wife, and I don't want her killed. Now stay on her tail. But what about Pappy? I said stay with her. 
I'm still running this feet. Yeah, but Pappy... Dispatcher. Joe, this is 3022, a mile south of Halfway House. That 502 just ran Pappy off the road. Send an ambulance. We're staying on her tail. This isn't Joe. This is Sergeant Capehart. I'm setting up a roadblock outside of headquarters, and she won't get through it. Go back and help Pappy. What kind of a roadblock? The works. You aren't shooting at a woman. If she tries to run this block, we'll shoot at her. Now you get back to Pappy. Sarge, that girl... Don't you worry about the girl. I'll take care of her. Get back to Pappy. But that's Debbie, Sarge. That's my wife. I'm sorry, Hollister. She just run my best man off the road, and you said she almost hit you. Now there's trucks and cars coming up the lower grade, and she'll hit one of them if we don't stop her. So we'll stop her if we have to blast her off the road. <laughs> In just a moment, we continue with the third act of Suspense. We have, together, ample capacity in freedom to defend freedom. This is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Very simply, NATO is an organization of free countries which have learned to live together and to work together in the firm conviction that their fundamental unity and combined strength are indispensable to their individual security and the peace of the world. The United States of America is a part of NATO. You should be aware of and alert to the objectives and programs of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And now... Starring Everett Sloan, Act Three of Speed Trap. <laughs> I felt sorry for the man beside me. I knew what was happening outside headquarters. A couple of patrol cars rolling into position, spotlights pointed up the grade, the guys drawing automatic rifles and maybe shotguns, flares set out further up the hill, a reception committee for Craig Hollister's wife. Not what he'd planned when he'd asked her to meet him at headquarters. But there was nothing I could do. I slowed down carefully. Keep going. You heard the sergeant. Pappy might be bleeding to death. He's only a quarter of a mile from halfway house. They can do as much for him as we can. Now, you stay on her tail. Craig, I can't. They'll suspend me. Art, don't make me pull my gun on you. Now, watch this next curve. But what can we do? We can't stop her. If she tries to run the barricade, they'll blow her apart. If she... Hang on. If she doesn't slow down, she won't even get to the barricade. Turn off your lights. Turn off my lights? That's right. When she doesn't see us, she slows down a little. Well, how am I going to see? Use her lights. Her lights. Fine. Great. But what if there was something coming up the grade? I wondered if Hollister had gone nuts. He was peering ahead. He seemed to have got hold of himself. I didn't really think he'd pull a gun on me, but suddenly I knew I'd go along with whatever he was trying to do. I flicked off the lights. It seemed to help. The car ahead lost some of its crazy fear. Now you're gaining. Okay, use this stretch here. Oh, Debbie, baby, watch out, watch out. We're gaining, but if she makes this turn, she's only got a mile to the barricade. Is that a car coming? Oh, it's a truck. Oh, Debbie, Debbie, please get over, get over. She won't make it. She won't. Watch out. Get your lights on. Okay, Art. Right. Now catch her. Hey, you gonna shoot her yourself? I hope not. I hope not. Look, you have to get closer. I'll never do it from here closer, the man said. I was already pushing 80, and the range was still too far unless he was aiming for a lucky hit, or an unlucky one. You gotta catch her by that stretch in front of headquarters. Right. If he was going to shoot out a tire, it would have to be there. The only level shoulder on the grade. But that was where the barricade was. Well, we'd just have to get her this side of it. Hollister rolled down the window, and I felt a spray of rain on my face. And suddenly, I saw the barricade spotlights. She's slowing any. Nah, putting on speed. Well, I can't wait any longer. The range was just too great. It had to be her left rear tire. If she went off the other way, she'd be killed. But she was just too far away. Suddenly, not really wanting to, I jammed down the accelerator. The rear end swayed and lurched. My hands were sweaty with fear. Thanks, son. And that did it. The convertible began to turn, hesitated, headed for the shoulder. It leaped when it hit the dirt, half turned. De Debbie! I skidded all the way through the roadblock. 
The guys from the barricade beat us back to the crash. But it was just as well, because without help, I'd never have been able to keep Hollister from the ruined convertible. Hey, will Come you on, let me let it out? Will you let me off, kill us, sir? Wait till we get her out. The doc's coming now. But will I you killed wait? her. I killed no, her. No, we don't know yet. Here's the ambulance. Doc? Doc, she's right down there. And how's Pappy? Broken leg. Oh. That's the car that ran him off the road? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. A patrolman and an ambulance driver set a litter by the ambulance. Two other guys had Craig in their patrol car trying to calm him down. The girl was hurt, hurt bad, but she was alive. I started back to the patrol car and stepped back to let a convertible pull off onto the shoulder. A girl got out, a pretty girl. And I thought of the kid by the ambulance who would never be pretty again. Then I felt the sergeant's hand on my arm. He was staring at her. Mrs. Hollister. Yes, Sergeant. What happened? Where's Craig? Well, we thought... He thought... You... Oh, look. Oh, the poor thing. She's just a kid. Yeah, but she figured she was old enough to get fried to the gills and make that great on a rainy night. Your husband saved her life. How? Oh, he and Art here almost broke their necks catching her. I'd have blasted her to pieces. Where's Craig? Is he all Debbie. right? Debbie! Oh, Debbie! Oh, Debbie, honey. What's the matter, darling? Oh, Debbie, it wasn't you. I, I you thought that... skip it, Hollis. No. Oh, no. Debbie, you, you ought to know. I want you to. Debbie, I, I, I thought the girl was you. Me? Why me? Well, it was the same kind of a car and, and the speed. Oh, I see. And it could have been me, couldn't it? <laughs> A long time ago, maybe, honey. A long time ago. Well, his arm was around her when they walked away, and Craig Hollister had a kind of thoughtful look in his eye. I turned back to the sergeant. Oh, are you okay, kid? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Yeah. Say, uh, sergeant. Yeah? Uh, about us not going back for Pappy, uh, uh, I was driving, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, well, I I'll guess I should have... it. Did you learn anything tonight? Yeah. I learned a lot. And, Sergeant, you know what? What? I think Hollister did, too. Suspense. In which Everett Sloan starred in William N. Robeson's production of Speed Trap by Hank Searles. Supporting Mr. Sloan in Speed Trap were Ellen Morgan, William Conrad, Jack Crucian, and Lawrence Dobkin. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. <laughs> Suspense has been brought to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Uh, just a moment, please. Hey, boss, uh, Mr. Tom Wilcox wants an appointment. How about one o'clock? Archie, no appointments today. I intend to put some dendrobium offsets. One o'clock will be fine, Mr. Wilcox. You see the Tom Wilcox who was acquitted yesterday of the murder of that singer, Keith Hansen? Uh, Mr. Wilcox, are you the Tom Wilcox who... Oh, you are. I see. What does he want with me? Uh, Mr. Wilcox, why do you seek Mr. Wolf's services? I see. Well, our fee is $1,000 with a retainer of 500 okay? Oh, yes, Mr. Wolf will see you. Uh, what's that? Hey, what was that? Hey, hey, Mr. Wilcox. Archie, stop shouting, hey. He whispered someone was at the window. Then I heard a shot and he dropped the phone. Boss, I'm afraid we've just lost a client. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. This episode is one Nero Wolfe refers to as a slight case of perjury. It all started with the phone call from Tom Wilcox and the ensuing shot which I was sure had brought our newfound income to an early end. Anyway, there was the shot and... Hello? Mr. Wilcox? Hello? Oh, boss, I've certainly waited long enough for him to come back to the phone. We may have just lost a nice bankroll. Nonsense, Archie. Other clients will rescue us. Now for a cold bottle of beer, Archie. We're almost out of beer. I'd better get over there and see what happened to Mr. Wilcox. The beer first. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Oh, Wilcox, you all right? W was that a shot? It was, huh? I'm glad it missed. Tell him to come right over here. Yeah, you dug the slug out of the wall. Well, come right over. Boss, the police never found the gun that killed Keith Hansen. No gun was found. Wilcox said he thinks he was shot at with a 32. He dug the bullet out of the wall. The murderer of Hansen must now be after Wilcox. If Wilcox is telling the truth. He was acquitted. The society gal, Mrs. Patricia Park, established his alibi, said she was with Wilcox at the time the murder was supposed to have occurred. I read the papers, Archie. Where's last night's paper? Wow, boss, look at her picture. Ooh, she's a honey. Archie, will you get me some beer? Well, if you move your arm six and a quarter inches, you can't possibly miss it. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, this is Tom Wilcox, our new client. How do you do? Uh -huh. Archie, the red leather chair for Mr. Wilcox. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I, I'd like your aid in finding the murderer of Keith Hansen. Indeed. Why do you suppose you were shot at this morning? I gave a statement to the press last night, which was printed this morning, saying that I was going to seek out the killer of Keith Hansen. The killer obviously wants me stopped. Uh, here's the bullet, a thirty-two, I'd say. Why did you go to Keith Hansen's apartment on the day of his death? I went there to tell him to stay away from my sister. We had a fight. The manager came and stopped us. I told Hanson I'd kill him if he didn't lay off. The manager heard this. Then I went home. What time was that? About 8.30. The police claimed I returned to Hanson's apartment and shot him. I couldn't prove I was at home all night. It was going rough for me until Patricia Park testified she was with me at the time when the crime was said to have been committed. Why didn't you tell the police in the first place that this Patricia Park was with you? Well, that's the whole trouble. She wasn't. What? Her claim that she spent the hours from nine till midnight with me was a lie. In fact, I'd never met the woman in my life. Have you contacted this Patricia since your release, Mr. Wilcox? Yes, but she refuses to see me. Archie, uh, phone Mrs. Patricia Park and tell her that she must see you at once for her own good. Time is of the essence. <laughs> And what else can you tell me, Mrs. Park? Mr. Goodwin, I haven't anything more to say than I've already said. All I want is a simple answer as to why you lied about being with Tom Wilcox. Well, Tom Wilcox is a very fine man, but he isn't telling you the truth. Did you commit the murder? 
and succeed in establishing your own alibi by swearing you and Tom Wilcox were together ten miles from the scene of the crime? I did not. Do you own a gun? Don has one around. Who's Don? And Don's my husband. Oh, is he here? I doubt it. He's never here. He spends most of his time at the book. He's throwing away every cent he can get his hands on. I've had to cut his allowance to practically nothing. Doesn't he work? No. He studied medicine but gave it up. He was an illustrator for years, but gave that up when his eyes were burned in a plane crash. Mm -hmm. Where's the gun? It's in the desk. It used to be in here. What caliber? I don't know. Where were you at 10 o'clock this morning? Well, I think I was with the cook. Someone fired a shot at Tom Wilcox this morning through the window. No. Oh, no. Archie, please don't continue with this investigation, please. How well did you know Keith Hansen? Not very well, but enough to realize he was no good. Mr. Goodwin, if you'll drop this case, I'll give you $1,000 cash. Not interested. But I am interested in learning why you lied, why Tom was shot at this morning, and why you should try to bribe me. You must stop for your own sake. How will it benefit me to step out of it? The killer tried to stop Tom Wilcox. You might be next, and he may not miss this time. Go on. Why have you been protecting Wilcox? I believe Tom Wilcox was innocent. And I didn't want him to be sentenced to die, so... So I lied at the trial. He told us today he'd never seen you before. That's true. But he looked so innocent, so so clean and good and decent. That's not very believable. If you don't think Wilcox killed Hanson, who do you think did it? Please believe me, Archie. I don't know. I don't, I tell you. Hi, sis. Hey, what's the matter? Are we intruding? Oh, hello, Marge. Brad, come in. This is Mr. Goodwin. My sister and brother, Noah Marge and Brad Keene. How do you do? Hello. What gives? And who's Mr. Goodwin? A private detective, Marge. I've... Just explained to Mr. Goodwin that I wasn't with Tom Wilcox at the time of Keith Hansen's murder. Pat, why did you tell him that? Mr. Goodwin, I hope you will not use this knowledge against Pat. Did you all know Keith Hansen? Yes, and my husband and Keith went to school together. Keith, Don, and I were on the same polo team. Where were you at the time of the Hansen murder, Mr. King? He and Don were attending a horse show at Madison Square Garden. Marge and I didn't want to go. We stayed here. Where were you at 10 this morning, Mr. King? Why, uh... I had an appointment with my dentist, Dr. Flagg, Rockefeller Center. And you, Mrs. King? I was shopping. Ilsa's salon, a salon dresses. Why all this questioning? Marge, someone tried to kill Tom Wilcox this morning. What? May I use the phone, Mrs. Park? Yes, of course. First door to your left. Suppose you try to find the gun. Marge, that gun is missing from the desk. I haven't seen it. Do you know the caliber, Mr. King? Uh, 32, I think. It must be in the house. For your sake, I hope you find it. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. You should have reported long ago. She must be very pretty. Pat Park admits she lied. She claims now she was with her sister, Marge King. Marge and her husband, Brad, have alibis, and all have alibis for this morning. I'll check them before I return. Where were they the night of the Hanson murder? Well, Brad and Don Park, that's Pat's husband, were at the Madison Square Garden horse show. Pat and Marge were together here at the house. Impossible to verify the Madison Square alibi at this date. Check all the rest and come home for lunch. It's Oysters Rockefeller. Has Inspector Kramer arrived yet? He has, and left the police records on the Hanson murder. He has taken the bullet Wilcox brought to be checked at ballistics. Good. Pat had a thirty-two caliber gun in the desk in the library. It's now missing. Indeed. And boss, Pat just offered me a thousand dollars to quit the case. When I refused, she said if I didn't lay off, something might happen to me. Oh, dear me. That would be most upsetting, eh? <laughs> After lunch, I want you to visit the late Keith Hansen's apartment. Bye. Before you join the others, Mr. Goodwin, I want to talk to you. All right. Close the door, Marge. Pat didn't mean anything when she offered you money, Archie. And she wasn't threatening you, honest. I'm convinced. Why the pressure? Uh, well, why don't you sit down? Here, by me. Okay. What's on your mind, huh? Archie, I can add another thousand to what Pat offered. Wouldn't that be enough, Archie? I can give it to you right now. Brad will write a check. Does Brad want me to stop, too? He said you couldn't be persuaded. Every one of you seems to have had a reason for killing Hanson. None of you apparently liked him. Now, be a good little girl, Marge, and stop trying to act like a Delilah. If you're innocent, you have nothing to worry about. You're stuffy. I hope you do get hurt. Thanks a million. Now let's join the others. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, Pat, did you find the gun? I can't find it anywhere. Oh, uh, Mr. Goodwin, this is Don Park, my husband. How do you do? How are you? Have you seen the gun, Mr. Park? Not for ages. You're a detective, eh? Yeah. May I ask where you were this morning, about ten? Why? Well, frankly, I was at my bookies. Where's that? I can't tell you, but I'll call them and you can check it. Were you and Brad together at all times during the horse show the night of Keith Hansen's murder? No. Brad wanted away a couple of times, and I saw some people I knew. You know how it is. We'd meet at intervals. Archie, you're wasting your time. None of us is guilty. I made a fool of myself, that's all. Tom Wilcox was such a decent man that I hated to see him have to pay for taking Keith Hansen's rotten life. If a man's guilty, why should you butt in? You never use your head. Pat is one person who thinks of others before herself. Marge, forget it. Now you've got private detectives snooping around. What are you after, Goodwin? Who are you working for? Why don't you let my wife alone? The case is closed, isn't it? Maybe. Don, this just makes it more interesting to Mr. Goodwin. As a matter of fact, I think you all know more than you're telling. I still think Tom Wilcox killed him. And there's only one reason why Pat should protect him. Don, that's enough. Nice, happy family. Suffering all the torments of a guilty conscience, is that it? What are you trying to do, Mr. Goodwin? Get your nose poked? Not exactly. If not, you'd better leave. Okay, Mr. King, I'll run along. Mr. Wolf will be anxiously waiting to hear about this. So long. Pet Parks, cook ready fighter alibi for 10 o'clock this morning, then. Uh, what about the other alibis? Well, Brad's dentist said that he didn't get to Brad until about 10.30. His appointments had run over. He wasn't sure if Brad was there at 10 or not. The nurse was out at that time. Marge's alibi is no good. And that mob at Elsa's, the saleswomen wouldn't have known their own mothers. Don's alibi checks, if we can take the word of the bookie. Don and Pat, then, are the only ones who have alibis to check, huh? That's right. Are these the reports Inspector Kramer brought? Mm -hmm. Keith Hansen's body showed obvious signs of battery. Lips were swollen and lacerated, clothes disarranged. Knuckles of the right hand were skinned, nose fractured. Major contusion over the right eye. The eyes were closed. Thirty-two caliber bullet was embedded in the left chest wall. Wow, what a battle. I am of the opinion that Hansen was battered by two different people. I think someone arrived after Will Coates was thrown out by the manager, and this someone gave Hansen another beating. Really, boss? Come, let's have dinner. Then you must get over to Hansen's apartment. Boss? Yes, Archie. What have you found at Hanson's place? Well, the desk yielded one thing of interest. Keith's address book. And Marge's name is in there. Apparently, he'd known her before she was married, when she was Marge Van Cott. I see. A married name, King, was added in a different colored ink. Pat's phone number's there, and of course, Don's and Brad's office numbers. There are few bills, but no letters, no clues. Sure. Boss, I've combed the place, and there's not... Hey, wait a minute, I'll call you back. Who's there? Archie, you know I just like the banging of doors. Sign of ill breathing. Archie, what happened to you? Target for tonight, Archie Goodwin. Your forehead's bleeding. You better have Fritz fix it. Well, my head can wait. Some guy certainly surprised me at Hanson's. Creased me on the forehead. Good thing I snapped off the lights. He emptied his gun at me. He scuffled and he got away. And then I dug his slug out of a chair. I think it's a thirty-two. But look at this, boss. A little round piece of glass. Found it on the floor. Hmm. It's very small, very smooth. And concave or convex in shape. Half an inch diameter. Watch, Crystal? Don't think so. The edges are too smoothly ground. I'll examine it under a magnifying glass. I'll get it, boss. Oh, hi, Tom. Come in. It's Mr. Wilcox, boss. Archie, hey, what's happened to you? Somebody tried to scalp me. Good evening, Mr. Wilcox. The red leather chair, Tom. Archie, please finish your report. Did you notice anything else of importance at Hanson's apartment? Is that where this happened? Yeah. Well, there were dozens of gals' photos scattered around. Photos, eh? But no letters, Archie? Not a one. There must be some letters, Archie. Love letters. 
Wherever we have girls' photos and telephone numbers, I assure you they're bound to be love letters. That is what we must find. But then we'd have a motive. Yeah, but where do I look, huh? Go to Hanson's dressing room at the Club Diablo. I have just phoned the place. A female singer is substituting for Hanson. But she won't arrive until supper hour. Mr. Wilcox, accompany Mr. Goodwin, if you please. Keep your eyes open. I need the boy. Then you do love me, boss? Come on, Tom. Let's look at this Club Diablo. Well, I fixed it up with the stage doorman. Here, this is Hanson's dressing room. What a layout. Your dressing room's fancier than most of the Met stars get. Hanson fixed it up himself. A bar, refrigerator, hot plate, television set. He could live here. Some of this stuff could be the new girl singers. I don't think so. Well, let's get to work, Tom. Take the drawers in his dressing table first. What are we looking for, Archie? Mr. Wolf says the motive. He means letters. There's nothing here. Nothing in the desk. New singer must have cleaned it out for her things. Nothing in the books. Don't pass up that refrigerator. Nope. Empty. Hey, there is something here. Back of the ice cube trays. Come here. Oh, well. Mr. Wolf said there had to be letters, and so there are letters. Lots of them. Hey, here's one from Marge. And another. And look here. Really confidential letters from a dozen society gals. There's something else in the back. A bank book. What do you know? A singer like Keith didn't make this much. No, that kind of money didn't come from crooning. This guy Keith was really shaking these babes down. Archie, someone's coming, listen. Quick, behind the door and grab him. Douse the lights. Ah! Run, Mom! Run! Hold it, Mom. Well, it's you two. Oh, you dirty rat. Hitting a woman. Tom, what are you and Archie doing here? The letters. Oh, Archie, you found them. Archie, please, give me those uh, letters. Uh-uh, uh-uh, don't touch... Uh- I'll just put them safely away in my pocket. Besides, you didn't write all of these. Give them to me. At least give me my letters. I'll tell you what. You go on home and stay there, and we'll leave it up to Mr. Wolf. Tom, take him outside. I want to use his phone. Come along, ladies. Let us oblige Mr. Goodwin. I'll meet you at the stage door, Archie. Right. Hey, the lights. Who's there? Put the phone up, Goodwin. Who are you? Uh, uh. Archie, what happened? Are you hurt? Here, let me help you. Uh, I'm all right. I guess. Ooh. My head. Did you see anybody? No, no, I didn't. I shouldn't have left you. Turn out the lights before I saw him. He whispered. Got away with all the evidence. Where are the girls? I sent them home in a cab. Well, let's get over to Mr. Wolf. This is tough luck. If I'm not mistaken, his next move will be to have a little get-together with all concerned. Come on. Archie, the door, I guess, are arriving. Excuse me, Tom. Come in, Inspector Kramer. Uh, good one. Good evening, Inspector. Well, Mr. Wolf, got the killer. You said you'd hand him over to me this evening. In time, Inspector. You know Tom Wilcox, of course. Mr. Wilcox. Evening, Inspector. What about the ballistics report, Inspector? The bullet was shot from the same gun that killed Hanson. And that gun, I am certain, came from the home of Pat and Don Parks. Marge and Brad King also had access to it. I have one more bullet here, Inspector, and one fired at Mr. Goodwin. I'm sure it was also shot from the same gun. However, it isn't important now. It isn't important? It almost cost me my life. You can make it into a charm if you wish. Inspector Kramer, before our other guests arrive, I must tell you that Mrs. Park lied on the witness stand. She was not with Tom Wilcox at the time Keith Hanson was murdered. In fact, they were absolute strangers. What? Sit down, Inspector. Four other guests are due to arrive any moment. Well, who are the other guests? 
Patricia and Don Park, Marge and Brad King, one or all is involved in the Hanson murder. Archie, do any of these people wear spectacles? No, nope, none of them. Do you know why this person killed Hanson, Mr. Wolf? First of all, Hanson was a blackmailer. The girl Marge was the current victim. The letters Hanson held with a threat. I'll explain later. Well, then Pat must have thought that Marge killed Hanson to get the letters, and she lied on the stand to save Tom's life because she believed Tom was innocent. Where is this Marge King? I'll have her picked up. Sit down, Inspector. Archie, I believe our guests are arriving now. Come in, come in. Uh, good evening. Archie, cheers. Inspector Kramer, Patricia and Don Park, Marge and Brad King, and this is Tom Wilcox. Who we met at the Club Diablo this afternoon. All right, Mr. Wolf. which one is it? Patience, Inspector. One of these five people is the murderer of Keith Hansen, a killer. What is this nonsense? Please sit down. Mr. Wolf speaking. Go ahead, boss. Any one of you had sufficient motive to have committed the Hanson murder. Not one of you has established a bona fide alibi. You who are actually innocent must tell the truth, or you shall all suffer as accessories after the fact. Mr. Wolf, you're wasting your time. Marge, several years ago, you were secretly married to Keith Hanson. It lasted but one week. You gave Keith the money to get a divorce from you at Mexico. He didn't, which made you a bigger miss when you married Brad. Keith was all set to blackmail you. He knew your husband, Brad, was wealthy. Marge, is this true? Yes. Oh, please, Brad, I thought he got the divorce. If I'd known that, I would have killed Hanson myself. Maybe you did kill him. One moment, Inspector. Patricia, you lied on the stand to protect Tom Wilcox here because you believed your sister Marge was guilty of Hanson's murder. Why did you believe her, her guilty? Were you at the scene of the crime? Marge, it's time to tell the truth and clear all this up. You won't be satisfied until you're in jail. Will you shut up? Quiet, please. Go ahead, Marge. All right. Keith Hansen was shot from the bedroom while I stood talking to him in the living room. You went there to buy back your letters? Yes, Pat drove me to his apartment. There was no place to park, so she said she'd drive around the block until I came out. That's why she's never been sure whether I killed him or not. That's right. Because I feel I might have shot him if I'd been in your place. Because of what Hanson did. What was it he did? Keith Hanson demanded $10,000 in exchange for the letters. Pat loaned me the money, so Brad wouldn't know. What? Is that true, Pat? You loaned her $10,000? I got to Keith's apartment about 9.30. He looked awful. He obviously had been in a fight. The room was mussed up and his nose was bleeding. Yes, go on. He went to the bedroom to get the letters and came back saying they were gone. I didn't believe him. Keith said he knew who had taken them and... He'd have them back by morning. He grabbed the money from me and put it in his pocket. He was just about to tell me who took the letters when there was a shot from the bedroom door. Keith Hanson fell to the floor, but I didn't see anyone. I, I wanted to get my money from his coat pocket, Pat's money. But I, I couldn't touch him. His staring wide open eyes were horrifying. I ran and I ran. Poor baby, why didn't you tell me? I think you're lying, young lady. You took the gun from your sister's desk, and when Keith Hansen didn't produce the letters, you deliberately shot him. You didn't even offer him any money. You kept it yourself. No, I didn't. I didn't. Oh, Pat, don't believe him. Inspector Kramer, she's innocent. I know who did it. Oh, no, Brad, stop. Oh, Brad, what are you saying? All right, all right, break it up. Yeah, so do I know, Brad. That's why you left the horse show. I thought you were guilty all along. All right, Inspector. Now you know. I don't get this, boss. Inspector, ladies and gentlemen, please. First, which of you had some medical training? Medical training? Well, Keith Hansen and I both went to medical school. Why? That is most enlightening, Mr. Park. Marge and I were nurses' aides during the war. Then perhaps you can interpret this medical phraseology for me. These few lines from this little medical book. Archie, hand it to Don Pop. Will you read it, please? The top of page 75. It uh, says the form of pernicious anemia commonly found in the human is... Now, uh, Don, hold your hand over your right eye and read on. What? Uh, also common to the many lower... Now, uh, cover the left eye and read with the other. What is this? Go ahead. Well, uh, many, many lower animals and... Uh, and this, this light isn't so good. Step close to me. 
Hmm. Yes, thank you. Mr. Park, here is the contact lens for your right eye. I am sure you've been tremendously handicapped without it all day. Inspector Don Park is your murderer. Don't move, Park. Keep away, I warn you. Drop that gun, Park. Now I got his gun. There you are, Inspector. He's all yours now. Okay, come on. Okay, good one. But I'll get out of this. You trapped yourself, Don, by your contact lens. It dropped from your eye during the scuffle with Archie in the Hanson apartment this afternoon. And the gun Archie just took from you is undoubtedly the murder weapon. And the gun that fired the bullets at Wilcox and Archie today. Hey, Tom, are you all right? There's blood on the side of your head. Uh, just graze my scalp. You and I must have hard heads. Well, that's that. Thanks so much, Inspector, for dropping in. Come again, won't you? This is a rough day's work, boss. Send me here, Archie, please. Right. Hey, what was that business about the medical training? Maud said the body of Keith had staring, wide-open eyes, preventing her from touching the body. But the police found the eyelids closed. How did they get closed? Well, he must have bothered Don, too, and he closed them. His medical training. Right. A layman would never touch the eyes of the dead. Marge couldn't, not even to get back the $10,000. Here's your beer. Why did Don do all this, boss? Obviously, he learned of Hanson's blackmail scheme and was trying to force him to agree to split Marge's $10,000. Don was quite startled a minute ago to learn that Pat, his own wife, put up the money. However, when they heard Marge arriving, Don stepped into the bedroom, found Marge's letters in there, and must have hidden in the closet. And then as Keith Hanson was about to speak Don's name, Don shot him and took Marge's money. Of course, he planned to carry on a blackmailing of Marge himself, thinking the money would come from Brad. Yeah. And you are warming that beer with your hot little hands. Poor... You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by Gladys Williams was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Mary Lansing, Gene Bates, Paul Marion, Barney Phillips, Ken Peters, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Lost Heir. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Drug Ring Murder. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the left-handed killer. Well, Mr. Nicholas Carter, are you going to answer your telephone or are you going to take me out to lunch as you promised? There's no reason why I can't do both, Patsy. Nick Carter speaking. Nick, this is Riley at headquarters. Oh, how are you, Lieutenant? There goes my on your mind. Right. Murder. And you're right in the middle of it, Nick. Meet me at the city morgue as quick as you can. I'm waiting here. What's the matter, Riley? Can't headquarters solve this case without me? Who said anything about your solving the case? You get yourself down to the morgue right away, and that's an order. An order, Riley? What are you talking about? The body of a man was washed up on the beach this morning, only he didn't die from drowning. It was murder. Yes? There was no identification on the body. None at all. Except one of your business cards. Nick Carter, private detective. What? I hid the card in my pocket as soon as I laid eyes on it. But there's a chance one of the reporters saw it before I did. 
Now, do I have to draw you a diagram? You've already done it. I'll be there in the double rally. Bye. What's up, Nick? Plenty. Look, Patsy, hold on the office until you hear from me. I'll call you within an hour. I knew you shouldn't have answered that phone. Business before pleasure, Patsy. And right now, I've got business at the city morgue. Where have you got him, Riley? On a slab out here? Uh, He's on ice. In the box at the end of the room there. And I'm telling you one thing, Nick Carter. It's lucky for you that I was here when he was brought in. Now, look, Riley. Surely you aren't trying to pull me into this thing just because the fellow was carrying one of my cars. Well, Well, there are probably hundreds of people I never heard of who carry my name in their vest pockets. Well, if you'd rather be explaining to the captain how your car got on a corpse... Oh, now, take it easy, Riley. You know what it means for an officer of the law to conceal evidence, Nick. How do I know one of those reporters or photographers isn't telling the captain right now that... Let's worry about one thing at a time. You said the body was washed up on the beach on the north shore of Long Island? Yes, it was. Stuffed in a gunny sack with every bit of identification removed. Hmm. Everything was ripped out except a concealed pocket. Yes, I know. With my card in it. Yes. Uh, Here we are. Last box here. Uh, Take a good look, Nick. Well, did you ever see him before? Oh, yes. That's Stanley Phillips. Huh? Dr. Stanley Phillips. He's a research chemist. Sort of an eccentric. Oh, oh, balmy, huh? No, no, just strange. He's assisted me in a few investigations. But for the most part, he was pretty much of a hermit. Didn't like to mix with people. Yeah, that don't make sense. People who mind their own business don't get and go around getting themselves murdered. Where did he live? There's a big house on a Long Island Sound, but his laboratory was on his yacht. It was anchored about half a mile or so up from the house, if I remember correctly. Laboratory on a yacht? Mm-hmm. Oh, he was balmy. Hey, Riley, look. Here in his neck. Well, what did you expect? I told you he was strangled. The autopsy showed he was dead before he was put into the gunny sack and thrown into the water. I know, but that isn't what I mean. Here, look at the prints in his neck. Closely, look at him. Yeah, yeah, well... Lest I miss my guess, Riley, he was murdered by a left-handed killer. Say, maybe you've got something there, Nick. I'll phone the fingerprint expert. Now, wait a minute, Riley. Let me hit the phone first. got to be in my way. Hey, now, now, don't be forgetting you can't take long on this, Nick. The captain will be wanting to question you about your card being found on the body. I can't hold off more than a few hours. Give me those few hours, Riley, and I'll wrap the murderer up in wax paper. Nicholas Carter's office. Oh, hello, Patsy. I, we got work to do. Yes, Nick? I want you to go through the files and dig out all the stuff we have on Dr. Stanley Phillips. That queer duck who did some work for you once? Yeah, that's the one. Research chemist. Uh-huh. Get all the dope on him and meet me down in front of the office in ten minutes. I'll pick you up. All right, Nick. That's all. Yeah, where are you headed for, Nick? The Phillips Estate on Long Island Sound. Meet me there as soon as you get the report on the fingerprints of Stanley Phillips' neck. And apparently neither he nor his sister ever married. After the parents died, they continued to live in the big manor house. What did you say the sister's name was? Rose Phillips. Rose. Go on. Mm, you know all about his laboratory being on his yacht. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be one of the best private laboratories in the country. Used to do a lot of research work for big companies. That's a laboratory assistant, Tom Marks, young man. And let's see what else. Um... Oh, his hobby was writing. Scientific articles they were. Usually about the effects of habit-forming drugs. He had an article in Popular Research last month entitled Morphine Exposed. So he wrote about habit-forming drugs, huh? Hmm. You know, Patsy... This case might turn out to be more than just an ordinary murder. I guess nobody's home, Nick. You're wrong about that, Betsy. Saw the curtains at the window move. Hmm. Pounding on the door isn't going to do any good either. Whoever's in there evidently doesn't want callers today. However... What are you going to do? Open the door. This little lock picker of mine. There it is. All right, come on, Patsy. We're going in. I don't see anybody. Stay behind me. Put your hands up. Over your head. She's got a gun, Nick. You're Rose Phillips, I take it, miss? Keep your hands up. I'm asking the questions. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter, and this Nick is... Nick Carter? Yes. And this is my assistant, R- Patsy Bone. Nick Carter, the great detective, where well, my brother often speaks of you. He thinks you're wonderful. Nick, she doesn't know yet. Miss Phillips, I'm sorry to have to tell you like this, but your brother is dead. He's... He's dead? 
Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid he was murdered. <laughs> murdered? Stanley murdered? <laughs> now, if you'll just put that gun away, Miss Phillips, we'll talk things over. Good, Mr. Carter, I'm sorry. This is all such a shock. It was a fiendish killing. And I'm going to do all I can to bring the criminal to justice. You may be sure of that. Oh, Rose. Rose. I'm in here, Richard. Oh. Well, uh, who are these people? I thought Stanley told you never to let strangers in the house. It's all right, Richard. This is Nick Carter, the detective, and his assistant. Oh. Well, well that's different. How do you do, Mr. Carter? I'm Richard Coles. I take it you've already heard about Dr. Phillips. Yes. Ghastly, isn't it? I can hardly believe it. The police say it was murder. For the life of me, I can't imagine who would want to murder Stanley. He was a strange man, Mr. Carter, very strange. He had a phobia about not letting anyone in the house when he was away. You seem to manage an entrance all right, Mr. Coles. Well, I... Mr. Coles is a very old friend of the family and has always had a key to the house. He's our lawyer. Look out, and... Nick! There's someone at the window! He's got a gun! <laughs> I can't get over it, Nick. You don't seem to be surprised that you were shot at back there in the house. I'm not, Patsy. That's why I was standing beside that suit of armor. That protected me by deflecting the bullets. Nick, your presence on the Phillips case is most annoying to someone. Too bad that window was frosted glass. Mm. Couldn't get a look at the gunman. That tiny crack the window was open. Well, now, did you find what I told you to look for in the cottage occupied by Tom Marks, the lab assistant? Yes, I found a pair of his gloves. Good. I had to go through all his desk drawers to find them, too. Let me see them. Mm-hmm. All seems to be adding up. Almost too neatly. Adds up to a pair of gloves. That's all. Look, Patsy. Coles told me back there's something about the terms of Philip's will. If he lived to be 50, his estate was to go to a foundation. If he died before that, Rose was to inherit all the estate. But that makes Rose the... Oh, no, 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 no. I don't suspect Rose. Her grief seemed genuine. But there's something else I learned. Tom Marks, Philip's lab assistant, in love with Rose... They've been wanting to get married, but Phillips opposed the marriage. Now the field is clear. With oodles of money to boot. But that still doesn't make Tom Marks... Patsy, the... I'm almost certain Phillips was strangled by a left-handed killer. These gloves of Marks you brought me show that he's left-handed. Oh. And that leads us where? Right out to the laboratory and the yacht. I've got to find Tom Marks. <laughs> Nick, why in the world do you suppose Dr. Phillips had his laboratory way out here in the middle of the sound? There's no mystery to that one, Patsy. He told me why once. Well, why? So people couldn't bother him. I'd have used his technical knowledge a lot more often on cases myself if it had been more accessible. Well, here we are. This is the Phillips yacht. I'll tie up here. I've never climbed up a rope ladder before. And you're not going up now either. Not until I look around the boat myself. Oh, Nick, am I helping you on this case or not? You are, but I don't want you taking unnecessary chances. Nick, please. Now, quiet a minute, Patsy. Let's see if we can raise somebody from here. Hello, up there. Hello, aboard the Phillips yacht. It's funny. Tom Marks is aboard. He's keeping quiet about it. Well, we'll find out right now. You better stay here in the motorboat. And let you solve this case alone? Not a chance. Okay, okay. But stay directly behind me, remember? Phew. Climbing this rope ladder is no cinch. I'm glad I'm not a sailor. Can you make it? Uh-huh. I'm coming. What do you think you'll find, Nick? Tom Marks, I hope. Here. Let me give you a hand over the rail. All right. Oops, it is. Oh, Thanks. Well, there's nobody to lay out the welcome rug on the deck of this floating laboratory. Well, that doesn't mean we're alone, Patsy. Come on. We're going down this companionway. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, it leads to Phillip's laboratory. Mm-hmm. This is the laboratory. All right, Patsy, stay behind me. I'm going to open the door. Hey, Marks. Tom Marks, you in there? All right, Patsy. We can go in. Well, Tom Mark seems to have vanished, but he's certainly left a mess behind him. Yes. Overturned retorts. Bunsen burner knocked over. Hmm. Look here on the floor. Hmm, broken bottle. Sulfuric acid spilled and eating into the floor. 
Yes, this is where Dr. Stanley Phillips met his death, all right. And when the killer came at him, he was sitting at this desk writing. Well, how do you figure that? That bottle of ink tipped over. wonder if he has any papers here that'll tell us what we want to know. Well, desk's been rifled. Everything of any value has already been taken. It still all adds up to Tom Marks, doesn't it? Yep, seems to. We'll know for sure as soon as Riley gets the report from the fingerprint expert. Nick! Hmm? Nick, come here. Look what I found in the sink. What? This piece of paper. Let's see. Now, that's in Dr. Phillips' handwriting. Well, somebody tried to burn it out. Then they threw it on the drain board of the sink here. Part of it didn't burn. Let's see if I can figure it out. Like you to know... The man whom I have trusted and worked with these many years is, I have discovered, the head of a giant dope peddling ring. Been using my premises to carry on his business. This man is... Nick, the lights have gone off! (laughs) Patsy. Mm -hmm. Patsy, where are you? Patsy. Nick. Are you all right, Patsy? Uh, My head... Somebody hit me. Stay where you are, I'll find the switch. Do you have your flashlight? Yeah, I'll find the switch in just a second. Oh, the lights won't work. Uh, it must have been turned off the master switch in the engine room. And that means there's more than one person on this boat besides us. One of them turned off the lights and the other one shot at us in here. You were right when you said you felt everything wasn't okay on this yacht. You able to get up, Patsy? Oh, sure. I'm all right now. Just a big hen's egg on my head, that's all. Okay. Come on. Nick, did they take the note? It's just what I want to find out. Let's see. A flash of light down in the sink. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, but wait. What are you going to do? Clean up the sink a little. Ashes don't look well scattered around in a white sink. Carefully now. A little bit. Ah, there we are. Now we're ready. Ready for what? To search this yacht from stem to stern. <laughs> What in blazes has been keeping you, Nick? I've been cooling my heels on this dock for the past half hour here. I hope you'll be here, Riley. Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Patsy. Well, say, you look as if you'd seen a ghost on that yacht. I did. Somebody took a shot at us in the dock. What? Patsy got knocked down the fracas and got a nasty bump in her head. Well, say, who did it, Nick? Whoever it was made a neat getaway. Patsy and I searched the ship afterwards from end to end, but didn't find a soul. Did you see anybody coming in from the yacht, Lieutenant? Oh, nary a soul's come in off that boat since I've been here. In fact, the only two people who've been near here was two fishermen. Are you sure they were fishermen? Am I sure? Now, now look, Nick, don't be giving me that. It was bona fide fishermen, all right. They pulled their little rowboat to shore a ways down the beach, and I saw them bring in their catch. And a nice string of fish it was. Okay, okay, Riley. So they were really fishermen. Well, what about your report, Lieutenant? Oh, oh, that. Well, Nick was right. Our fingerprint expert examined the marks on Dr. Phillips' neck and said he was undoubtedly strangled by a left-handed killer. And now all we've got to do is find a left-handed man who had a reason to murder the doctor. We found him. Uh, well, what's that? Dr. Phillips' laboratory assistant, Tom March, is left-handed. You see, you sure worked fast, Nick. And it's a good thing, too. The captain found out about your card being found on the body. Hey, w- what kind of a scoundrel is this Tom March? I don't know. Haven't seen him yet. Wasn't at his cottage, and he wasn't in the lab in the yacht. Now, let's make tracks, Mr. Private Detective, and search the grounds here. Wait a minute, Maybe Riley. We... Wait a minute. There's one thing more you ought to know. Huh? Whoever killed Dr. Stanley Phillips is the head of a giant dope ring. Do- Phillips was killed because he was about to expose the man. Hey, that would be the laboratory assistant. He'd have access to drugs. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter. Uh, who in tarnation is that? Richard Coles, a close friend of the Phillips and also the lawyer. Oh. O'Reilly, yeah? put this envelope in your pocket. Careful of it. It's a piece of evidence I picked up in the boat. Okay, Nick. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, I've been hunting everywhere for you. Oh, Mr. Coles, this is Lieutenant Riley from headquarters. Oh, I'm yeah. glad you're here, Lieutenant. We're up against a dangerous criminal. Uh, don't worry, Mr. Coles. The law always gets its man. What do you want to see me about, Mr. Coles? Rose Phillips. She's gone. G- gone? How do you know? Come up to the house with me. I'll show you. Something has happened to her, I'm sure. Hurry! Here. Yeah. This is Rose's bedroom, Lieutenant. Well... Somebody was making a fast getaway, all right. Yes. Just look at the room. Clothes strewn all over. One of her suitcases is gone, and this suitcase, half-packed, was left behind. 
She and the laboratory assistant must have been in on this together. If she wasn't guilty, she wouldn't have run away. Oh, she must have been out of her mind. Of course, Rose was in love with Tom and... Nick. What's the matter, Patsy? What are you frowning at? Rose Phillips didn't run away. Uh, what's that? Didn't run away? What are you saying, Patsy? No girl would run away voluntarily and leave all her makeup behind. Well, look at that dressing table. Nothing's been touched. You're right, Patsy. Say, do you suppose... Oh, no, no. What is it, Mr. Coles? Do you suppose that Tom could have forced her to leave? You mean, you mean kidnap her? Yes. Well, he won't get away with it. I'll call headquarters and have a cordon thrown around this entire district. We'll catch Tom Marks before he gets to the next town. Good idea, Riley. Do that. Well, Mr. Coles? Yes, Mr. Carter? I guess Lieutenant Riley has his case all sewed up. His men will have Tom Marks and Rose Phillips within the hour. Well... Mr. Carter, it was nice of you to take such an interest in my friend's death. Um, would you care for a cigarette? Oh, no, thanks. Uh, you, Lieutenant? Why, why, sure, sure, I don't mind if I do. Of course. Uh, light? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Well, good day, Mr. Coles. Goodbye. Carter. Come along, Patsy. Hey, uh, where's the telephone, Mr. Coles? There's, uh, mm-hmm. one right over here on the table. Hurry up, Patsy, we got work to do. I thought you said the case was finished. Not by a long shot. I said that for their benefit. You and I are going over this estate with a fine-tooth comb. I'm not satisfied yet. You see anything, Nick? Come on in. Shut the door. Do you think anyone saw us headed for this boathouse? I hope not. Oh, well, be careful you. Don't step off in the water. Nick, there's a small speedboat in the water. Wouldn't you think they'd put it in dry dock so late in the season? Depends, Patsy. Look up there, mounted in the bow. A machine gun? Mm-hmm. This boat was used for business. Gee, who'd ever think a quiet little chemist like Dr. Phillips kept a mounted machine gun on a speedboat? I believe this setup down here was news to Dr. Phillips, too. Hold on to my arm. We'll look around. Oh, Nick, don't step on the fish. String of fish? Oh, dear. Nick, those fishermen Riley saw must have come in here. Patsy, his catch isn't fresh. What? Those men used the string of dead fish just to fool Riley. And those were the men who made trouble for us on the yacht. Yeah, they must have been. Well, plenty of life preservers stacked up in here. Yeah, that's strange. Here, Betsy, hmm? take the flashlight and play it on this one. Okay. Well, what are you doing, taking it to pieces? No, just examining it. Aha! There we have it. What? A small waterproof pocket's been sewn in here. Yes, and it extends all the way around inside this life preserver. Pretty clever. Look, Betsy. What is it? These secret compartments are filled with dope. About every one of these life preservers is filled with drugs. Nobody would ever think of looking in a life preserver for evidence. I think Dr. Phillips did. And that's why he was murdered. <laughs> Nick. Nick. Are you okay, Patsy? Yes, but I can't stop crying. Well, that's not surprising. Somebody threw a tear gas bomb through the window. Oh. That's right, friends. It was tear gas. Who's there? <laughs> Pretty clever of me using the tools of my trade that way, isn't it, Mr. Carter? But Tom Marks is always clever. So you're Tom Marks, huh? I've been waiting to set my eyes on you. It's too bad your eyes are filled with tear gas. Because now you'll never have that pleasure. Okay, Pete. Come in and get the lady. Right. I'll take care of Mr. Carter okay. myself. Come on, <laughs> hey, come on, sister. Come on. Let her go alone. Yeah, let her go alone. <laughs> you got those iron weights in the bag, Pete? Sure, both of them. This guy will never be washed up on a beach like the doc was. <laughs> good. See you tied a bag good and tight. You know, I think he's passed out. He ain't moving none. I did a job on him before we put him in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Well, listen to that dame, will you? <laughs> Sounds like a hoot owl with a cold in the head. <laughs> Shut up. Oh, no. Oh, tighten the gag, Pete. Okay. Hey, hey. That'll do it. Hey. Say, Carter ain't dead. What does it take to kill that guy? I choked him like a rat and he's still talking. All right. All right, speak your piece, Mr. Carter. Because you don't have much longer. You're not going to get away with this. <laughs> you hear what he said? Uh, I'm telling you. <laughs> I doubt it, Mr. Carter. You're going straight down to Davy Jones' locker. You'll pay for this. I'll have you behind bars within 24 hours. Uh, listen to him. What do you fellas think you're going to do with Patsy Bowen? Uh, he's worrying about a dame when he's going <laughs> to lose his own neck. <laughs> Go easy with her. I'm warning you. Uh, well. Come on. Let's get rid of him. Okay. It's dark enough now. All right. You got him? Yes. All right. All lift right. him up. That's it. I'll get you, one, fellas, for this. Two, three. Uh, let her go. I came as soon as I got your flashlight signal from the shore, Nick. You think the criminals are aboard the yacht here now? You'll see in a minute. The laboratory's right down this companionway. Hey, you're dripping wet from head to foot, Nick. What happened? Well, they tried to pull the same trick on Nick that they pulled on Dr. Phillips. Ah. Only it didn't work, because Nick can expand his neck and wrist muscles. Yes, I had my hands free before I hit the water. There was no trick at all to cut my way out of the sack. And then I clung to the back of their motorboat until it reached the yacht here. I waited for the would-be killers to get aboard, untied Patsy, and here we are. Ah, you're lucky, Nick. He's smart, that's all. Quiet. This is the door. Keep your gun ready. All right. Good evening, Mr. Coles. What? Oh, Nick Carter. Well, come in, Mr. Carter. These two friends of mine and myself were just discussing whether you had found the criminals. I think we have, Mr. Coles. Good, good. There's just one thing more I need to make sure I have the criminals. Riley. Yeah? Give me that envelope I asked you to keep for me. Oh, sure, sure, Nick. Uh, here you are. Thanks. Now, I'll just take the piece of burned paper out of this envelope. Are well, those the pieces you gathered from the drain board? Yes, Patsy. They were from the note Stanley Phillips wrote just before he was murdered. Now, I'll just use some of these chemicals in the burned paper. Oh. You see, gentlemen, even though this piece of paper's been burned, it is possible by using the correct chemical solution to bring out the writing that was on the paper before it was burned. In this case, I expect the writing will give the name of the man Phillips designated as head of the giant drug ring. And... Is killer. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yes, here it comes. The chemicals are beginning to act. The writing is beginning to show up. Good. The name is... Nick, look out! Oh, you got oh, it, boy! Get out of here! Oh. Hey, <laughs> Man, I got these two thugs, Nick. Knocked them out cold. So I had to plug in the shoulder, Coles, but I had to put you out of action. Now, Riley, there's your murderer. Uh, so it was Coles who did it. You're right, Carter. I killed him. Uh, the powers be praised, Nick. I thought Tom Marks was the killer. Coles had me fooled too, Riley. Until this afternoon when he came running down from the house. And then I noticed his feet were wet. As if he'd been in waiting. Then he was one of the men on the yacht. One of the fishermen Riley saw. Right, Patsy. And another thing. The man who strangled me in the boathouse claimed to be Tom Marks. But Tom Marks is left-handed. The man who tried to strangle me used his right hand. And you knew Phillips was murdered by a left-handed man. That's right. I knew I was after a left-handed murderer. O'Reilly, oh, huh? did you notice that when Coles lighted your cigarette for you this afternoon in Rose's room, he used his left hand? See, by golly, he did. Right. Then, then, then he's left-handed, too. Right. When I saw him do that, I knew he was the killer. But I had to make him prove it. Oh, you did that all right. That business about making the writing stand out on a piece of paper after it's burned is a new one to me, Nick. Nick, can you actually do that? Well, it can be done under ideal conditions. But this time, I was just putting on an act for Mr. Coles' benefit. You mean you didn't actually make any writing appear on the burned paper? Not a word, Mr. Coles. And I fell for it like a sap. Nick. Hmm? What's that? Well, I'm not sure, Patsy, but I have a hunch. It's locked, Nick. Oh, Patsy, since when did a locked door ever stop Nick Carter? Quite right, Riley. When did it? This is no time for it to start. So? This one ought to do the trick. There we are. Nick Carter. Oh, thank heaven, Rose. This man with you is Tom Marks, Miss Phillips? Yes, I am. They were going to kill us, Mr. Carter. They tied us up and threw us in here. We heard them planning to throw us overboard. Have you been imprisoned in here all this time, Mr. Marks? Uh, no, not quite. I got a telephone call last night summoning me into the city to pick up some chemicals Dr. Phillips and I needed in an experiment. 
I was slugged as I stepped out of the car. And when I came too late this afternoon, I, I was in here. And so was Rose. Uh, that cause was a smart one. Throwing suspicion on you and then trying to get rid of you in order to make it look as if you'd run away. Smart, but not smart enough for Nick. Well, Riley, you've got your murderer. I have that. And Rose, you and Tom are safe. Yes, thanks to you. And I guess that's that. Oh, no, Nick. You still have to solve my case. Well, what's that, Betsy? That luncheon date you promised me. Oh. Where are you and I going to have lunch at this hour? Why, uh... Well, say, that's easy, Betsy. I know a swell place in town, right across from the morgue. Come on. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called the Drug Ring Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left-Handed Killer. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what can you tell us about next week's story? When a young man who was a very good friend of mine arrived in town to claim his bride, he suddenly became aware that she was not the girl to whom he'd become engaged. You mean she wasn't his fiancée? That was the question that started off the whole case. Yes, indeed. Because we couldn't be sure whether the girl he loved was really the girl he loved, we prevented two murders and saved a gigantic fortune from disappearing. But you didn't save me from disappearing, Nick. Oh, quite true, Patsy, but... After all, you weren't gone very long before we found you. But I'm sure glad you found me when you did, or I might not be here now. So long, folks. Get the rest of the story next week. Right. So long. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Connery. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Substitute Bride, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Night Ferry. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. our office doesn't handle only murder cases. Sometimes, as in this one, the case is a little less physical, but still, it's interesting. You don't have to convince me that being a district attorney isn't dull, Markham. <laughs> uh, this Joe Somer, whom we're going to see, just what is the charge against him? His partner is accusing him of grand larceny. Oh. I happen to know Somer pretty well, and before an indictment is handed down, I want to talk to him. I liked him. Quiet, always considerate. Uh, nice of you to come with me, man. I'm glad of the chance to get out of the office. Good. Well, this is the street you said Somer lives on. This house should be that one. There's a crowd around that house, man. Something's happened. No doubt about that, my friend. Let's find out what. Well, there's a police officer over there, Markham. Yes. Let's find out about this. I'm with you, Vance. Hey, right, stop killing, will you? Pardon me. Sorry. Excuse me, please. Get back, everybody. Get back there. Oh, officer, I'm just an attorney, Markham. Oh, sure. I recognize you, Mr. Markham. It's quite a thing we have here. A fellow lives here. A man named Joe Somer jumped or fell from the roof of his house. What? He was dead when he hit the ground. Joe Somer, Markham. That's the man you wanted to see. Not right now. It was suicide, all right, Mr. Markham. Almost hit a couple of people when he jumped. That's awful. I uh, found a suicide note in the house. There wasn't anybody home, but the note was right where I couldn't miss it when I went in. I'll uh, turn it in with my report. All right, officer. Well, Vance, I promised you a case. All right, it looks like it's over before it even began. That, my friend, is a matter of opinion. Perhaps there is no larceny case. But I have an idea that instead of it, we're going to have a murder investigation. Hey, 
right, Miss Anderson. Uh, GA in his office? Yes, he is, Sergeant. He's, he's on the telephone, though. Well, that's okay. He'll want to see me. No, but I'll let you know as soon as something develops. Bye. Hello, Heath. Hi, GA. Just got a report on that suicide note found at Joe Somer's house. Yes. Completely legitimate, D.A. We had our experts check the writing. There's no question but that Joe Somer wrote it. He wrote a suicide note and apparently jumped from the roof of his house. What do you mean, apparently? Well, Father Vance thought it might be murder. Oh, he did? Yes. That guy thinks everything is murder. I'm waiting for the day when there's a murder case that he'll say is suicide. You'll have a long wait, Heath. Vance doesn't often make mistakes. Ah, everybody makes mistakes, D.A. Even I do. Not you, Sergeant Heath. Yeah, me. And if I can make him, I guess Vance can make him once in a while, too. The possibility is there, undoubtedly. Well? The only thing is, I can't ever remember Vance being wrong for any length of time. don't imagine I'll be too long, Mrs. Somer. All Thank right. you for letting me use this desk. I mean, it's quite all right, Mr. Vance, but just what are you writing? Nothing, really, just scribbling. Are there any more pens in this house? You've tried all of them that I could find, including Joe's fountain pen. What's the big idea? I won't know whether or not it's a big idea until later. Right now, I... Oh, there's someone at the door. Excuse me. Oh, go right ahead, Mrs. Somer. Please don't let me disturb you. Any more than you have, you mean. Yes? Oh, Mr. Dale. Mrs. Somer... Uh, may I come in? Why, yes. Yes, of course. I have company, as you can see. Oh. Follow Vance, the private investigator. Mr. Vance, this is Alfred Dale, my husband's partner. How do you do? Hello, Vance. It took Joe's death to get you over to our house, didn't it, Mr. Dale? Well, I... Too bad you didn't find time to come here while he was still alive. And Mrs. Somer, I assure you... Excuse I'd... me, please. Mrs. Somer, I'm finished with those pens. All right. Now, can you tell me what your husband was doing on the roof? I'm trying to find out if he deliberately went up there to commit suicide or if he got the idea while he was on the roof. He left a note, the paper say. Doesn't that indicate he went up there to jump? Not necessarily. And I believe I was asking Mrs. Somer. Oh, sorry. When I left the house yesterday morning, Vance, I asked Joe to fix the radio aerial on the roof. That might have given him the idea. Yes, it might. May I go up and see the roof? If you like. Wait till I throw a coat over my shoulders and I'll go up with you. Might just as well see the place where... Poor Joe jumped. Like to come up, Mr. Dale? Uh, all right. This way, gentlemen. Up these steps to the second floor, then we go up through the attic to the roof. Lead on. There's a light at the top of these steps. I'll turn it on. Oh. You gentlemen might have a little trouble in the attic. There's no light there, and I'm afraid there are a lot of trunks lying around. There are in practically every attic. Go right ahead, gentlemen. I'll turn on this light. I'll see you, Dale. Certainly. Very well. You know, there's something about this procession reminds me of the three little Indians. Isn't that ten little Indians? Not after seven of them were killed. You're perfectly right, of course. Careful now, it's pretty dark up here. Indeed it is. Just walk straight ahead, Mr. Dale. There are a few steps leading up to the roof. Well, you know, there are times when I... Oh! oh. oh well, Sorry, a... I must have kicked one of your trunks. It can stand it. Find the steps all right, Mr. Dale? Yes, yes, yes. Right here. Huh. Good thing you brought your coat, Mrs. Summer. Yes, I suppose it is. Well, so this is the roof from which your husband jumped, fell, or was pushed to his death. Pushed? My husband killed himself, then. There, see, there's the aerial I told you about. Look over here on the other side of it. You see where there's new wire around the insulator? Yes, I do. Apparently, your theory was right, Mrs. Summer. I imagine so. Hmm. Well... What else do we do now that we're up here? Not a thing. We've done everything I wanted to do. But what's more important, I've found out everything I wanted to know. I'm just about to go to bed, Markham, but I thought I'd call you and report what happened today at the Somers' house. You know, I'm very anxious to hear. What'd you find out? Well, first of all, I met Joe Somers' partner, Alfred Dale. You did? We went up to the roof. What? Vance, what's happened? That was a shot. Vance, are you there? What happened? It's all Vance, right, my I'm... friend. Good. I'm lying here on the floor, out of reach of any second bullet. Besides, there's no light in the room now. Somebody fired at me from the fire escape and got the lamp instead. But, man, how can you be that calm? Somebody just tried to kill you. Yes, I know. And that means you were right. That Somers' death wasn't suicide, but murder. And the murderer was just close to you. That isn't the only thing the shot meant, Markham. It also meant that I am very close to the murderer. 
You're a smart dame, you are. Your husband knocks himself off, and what do you do? You Tony. come running to me. Tony. What is this, a playground? Tony. Tony, Tony. What do you expect from me? Oh, Tony. Are you going to knock myself out crying? I get smart. You're cute, and I like it, but keep away from me for a while. But I don't understand why. I don't understand why. I'll tell you why. You inherit a lot of dough. That special clause about suicide in your husband's insurance takes care of you. Me, I'm a mug. All right, so you go for me. So the cops find out. So what'd they say? What can they say? What can they say? They can say I knocked off your old man so I could get you in that dough. But Tony... But Tony, you can butt Tony me for now. So, there she is. Well, I got you two to get him. All right, now, Lila, take it easy. Well, this is the dame that took my place. I was hoping I'd find her here. I'm going to turn her inside out. I'm going to... Oh. <laughs> out. Now, you heard me. I said out. Oh, no, you don't. I don't get rid of easy. Nobody's moving in till I get ready to move out, and I'm not ready yet. No, no, no. Get out of here, Lila. Why? Because you slapped me? Come on. You slapped me before and I stayed. What's yeah, your... yeah, stop, yeah, stop yeah. Stop pushing me. When I say out, I mean out. Tony, you'll be awfully sorry sure, about this. Sure, sure, sure. I'll make you... Out. Tony, let me in. Let me in. I'm sorry, sweetie. Oh. I guess Lila's got a temper. Tony, you guess she has. You're a pretty Tony. good guesser. I hate to think what that girl would have done to me if you hadn't stopped it. Right now I'm thinking about what she's going to do to me because I did. Now look, Markham, you listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. I don't doubt that, Miss... Uh... Uh, just call me Lila. I'm going to hand you the murder of Joe Soma. Hand him to you right on a silver platter. That's all very well, Lila, except that indications are that Soma committed suicide. He left a note. I don't care what he left. I know a guy who wanted him dead. Just fool around with that. <laughs> Wishing someone were dead rarely is fatal to a victim. Huh? Well, Tony didn't only wish. He gets what he wants. And he wanted Mrs. Soma. Joe Soma was in the way. Tony got rid of him. I don't know how. I just know he did. All right, Lila. Let's concede for a moment that you know he did. How do you prove it? That isn't my job. You're the district attorney, aren't you? I was, when I looked last. Oh, very funny. Just a moment, I want to call Philo Vance. Well, you'd be better off calling a cop and having him pick up, Tony. Up until now, Lila, I've been a pretty good judge of my own welfare, thank you. Hmm. Hello, Vance speaking. Uh, Markham Vance, listen, there seems to be more and more confirmation of your murder theory about Joe Sommer. Well, I'm glad to hear it, Markham. Actually, and originally, it wasn't a theory, merely an idea, despite that suicide note. Which has never been explained. But which will be. Good. Now, what's the extra confirmation you called me about? Well, there's a girl in my office. Markham. A girl named Lila, who is the ex-girlfriend of a racketeer named Tony Lester. She's been superseded by... Guess who? Mrs. Somer. Oh, now, Van. Well, it had to be Mrs. Somer, or it wouldn't have had any connection with this case. In which event, you wouldn't have called me. Reasonable? Reasonable, understandable, and accurate. That's what it is, Vance. Now, this girl claims Tony is the kind of character who wouldn't let a mere murder stand in the way if he wanted something. How right that is. Please, Lila. What? Uh, nothing, Vance. I wasn't talking to you. Oh. Well, I thought I'd let you know about this development. Well, thank you. Now I'll let you know something. Yes? Despite the suicide note, which I'll explain some other time, I'll repeat that it definitely was murder. And I'll tell you something a little more important. And that is? That I also know who pushed Joe Somer off the roof. <laughs> This is District Attorney Markham. The rooftop murder case began with the apparent suicide of Joe Somer. Vance, believing Somer was murdered, has found substantiation of his theory despite the presence of a bona fide suicide note. Inasmuch as Vance insists it is a murder, I know we have three suspects. Tony Lester, a racketeer, Alfred Dale, Somer's partner, and Somer's widow. To continue our investigations, I have met Vance in the office shared by Somer and Dale. Vance, I found the partnership papers right here in the desk drawer. Uh, Vance, you're not listening to me. Oh, yes, I am, my friend. I was just trying out all the office pens. Are you through now? No. There. You now have my undivided attention. Good. What does the partnership contract say? Uh, that in the event of death of one partner, the other partner takes over completely. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me, is Alfred Dale the murderer? I've just found his motive. Yes, you most certainly have. <laughs> Issue properly evaded. <laughs> Very well, tell me this. 
What are you trying all those office pens for? I tried all of the pens at Somer's house. With the cooperation of the homicide department, I borrowed the suicide note Somer left. And I can tell you definitely, none of the pens wrote that note. In fact, I don't believe any of the pens in this office were used either. But the note was definitely written by Somer. So you keep telling me, and I agree that it was. What's the answer? You think Somer wrote a suicide note? The murderer knew he wrote it with the intention of killing himself, but acted regardless? Hardly. What? Well, what's going on in here? Oh, hello, Mr. Dale. This is District Attorney Mark. How are you? you We've been using your office. So I see. We have a search warrant, Mr. Dale. It's entirely legal. It's a little embarrassing. You'll have to admit that. Legal enough. Mr. Dale, if I were you, I wouldn't worry about any embarrassment that might be caused you in this office. Uh, What do you mean? Yesterday, when you and I and Mrs. Somer were on the way to the roof, the attic was very dark. It was that. You were in the lead, but you avoided a trunk that I promptly bumped into. What? Yes, that's true, now that I recall it. Mrs. Somers said you'd never been in that house before. Yet, you avoided the trunk. Oh, I have the... Uh, I have very good eyesight. Or a good memory. What do you mean? I just don't want you to resent our being here, that's all. We do have good reason, don't you think? I don't think I have anything to say. Well, that, Mr. Dale, is probably the smartest thing you've said since you came into this room. What does that mean? That I'm due to be arrested any moment on suspicion of murder? I wouldn't say that. Not any moment, Mr. Dale. I want to be very sure of my proof before Mr. Markham makes any arrest in this case. Oh, but Tony, I'm sorry. Uh, You'll never know how sorry I am. I went to the district attorney. She's sorry. She rats on me. Now she's sorry. Look, I'm getting tired of kicking you out of my apartment. I'll beat it, Lila. Oh, let me say, Tony. I won't be any trouble. Just, just let me hang around. I'll... Ah, oh, you're expecting that summer day. She's going to be here. Shut up, you. Don't you talk about it. Don't even say her name. Oh, I'm not good enough to say her name, huh? I'll say it. I'll scream it so that everybody can hear it. Shut up, I said. All right, get out. Get out fast before I change my mind and start tossing you out. Why are you gone? Tony. Tony, darling. Tony, Tony, darling. You make me sick. How did I ever go for a dame like you anyhow? Sometimes I think I'm... Oh. Okay, Lester, open it up in there. Who is it? Sergeant Heath, oh, homicide. Open up. Oh, you really did it to me, didn't you, Lila? I'm going to get out of here. I can't stand a pinch right now. Oh, yeah, Tony, I left the door unlocked when I came in. Oh, you dope, you. Okay, Lester, hold it. You're not going anywhere. According to you. According to me, I'm leaving right this minute. Hold it, I said. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks for the warning shot. I can take a hint, Heath. You want me to go with you? I I go. No, don't, need, don't Come to think of it, even oh. you'll be better company than this. Well, what is it you wanted now, Mr. Vance? All the clippings you have on a man named Joe Somer. I don't imagine there'll be too many. Well, if his name was ever in our paper, we'd have the clips in an envelope. You don't want the stuff on a suicide, do you? No. Oh, it's a good thing those clippings haven't been filed yet. Uh... T to T U T U to S S S E S E S E S U. Oh, here we are. Silly, Savonsky, Skelly, small. Small, small. Oh, here we are. Somer. Joe. Here's his envelope, Mr. Vance. He feels kind of thin. Well, I expected that. Now to see what's in it. Mm hmm. Two clippings, one dated yeah. five years ago. A little item about the marriage of Joe Somer and Dorothy Blaine. The other... Mm. Interesting, huh? Mm, very. This first clipping is even more revealing, however, in the light of the second one. Listen to this first one. Introduced only three months ago at a beach club, Dorothy Blaine and Joe Somer culminated a whirlwind romance in marriage at the home of so-and-so last night. Couple left for a honeymoon in Bermuda. Well, that's not too unusual. In view of this, it is. Listen, here's the second clipping. Joe Somer, local businessman and partner in the firm of Somer and Dale, was taken to Mercy Hospital this morning, suffering from a nervous collapse. Yeah, yeah. According to Alfred Dale, only his fortunate earlier arrival at the office prevented his partner's suicide. That that means something, huh? It does to me. It's going to mean a whole lot more to Alfred Dale. It's you. Tony, I waited out here in the street to find out what would happen to you. So what? I heard you were arrested. You heard I was arrested. Sure, I was arrested, but I'm out. Did they think you killed my husband? How do I know what they think? All I know is I'm getting out of town. I'm going with you. I don't be a dope. I need you like I need a hole in the head. You're taking me. 
I'm going home to pack right now. I'll meet you at the airport in an hour. Now, listen. You better take me, Tony. It'll be so much better for you if you do. <laughs> I'm a busy man, Vance. I can't be running around town just because you call me and want me to be somewhere. You won't be bothered very much longer, Mr. Dale. That's good. I wonder why Mrs. Soma doesn't answer her bell. You'd better try it again. Did it ever occur to you that perhaps she isn't home? Did it ever occur to you that this house might be watched? And if she were at home, that man across the street, who happens to be Sergeant Heath of the Homicide Department, would have told me. But it's still that. Mr. Vance. Yes, and Mr. Dale, your husband's partner. You two remember each other, of course. Naturally. We're coming in, Mrs. Somer. Yes, of course. I really don't know what I'm doing here, Mrs. Somer. I don't either. What is it you want, Vance? We want to go into the living room, for one thing. We'll talk out here, if you don't mind. Oh, but I do. Well. Well, what's that I see in the living room? A trunk. Going somewhere, Mrs. Somer? Come in, gentlemen. Yes, I was going somewhere. I was leaving town. Any objections, Vance? Definitely. Mrs. Somer, do you own a gun? Of course not. What kind of a question is that? Figure it out. You see, the person who killed your husband fired a shot at me the other night. You're convinced that someone killed my husband? Yes. That he didn't commit suicide? That's right. Dale, do you own a gun? Why, I... I... Oh, come now. It'll probably be on record if you do. All right, Vance. I own a gun. And I carry it. I'll take it if you don't mind. Here you are. Thank you. Pardon my back a moment, Mrs. Somer. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Vance, what are you trying to do? Stop right there, Dale. I want you to remember something for me. Just one second while I lay your gun down on the table. Now. Now what? Mr. Dale, do you recall that about six or seven years ago your partner tried to commit suicide? Yes, I do. You left a suicide note at that time. What happened to it? Why, I... I don't know. I do. It's the same suicide note the police found in this house just after Mr. Soma was pushed off the roof. It had to be. There wasn't a pen in this house or in your office that matched the pen or ink used in that letter. The police found the first suicide note planted here to indicate Soma really did it the second time. What are you trying to prove? And if it's the fact that I murdered my husband, let me inform you that I never even knew him when he tried to kill himself the first time. That's correct. You didn't. Oh, I see what you're driving at. That's good. I took the note six years ago, kept it... Killed Soma the other day and left the note here, and you thought I was in this house before when you discovered I didn't trip over the trunk in the darkened attic. Is that what I'm driving at? Well, it, it must be. But I won't stand for it, Vance. I, I won't be framed for murder. Stop I'm right gonna... where you are, Dale. Do yourself a favor. Don't make me force you to stay. Mrs. Somer. Yes? You killed your husband, of course. So you say. So I say and so I can prove. And you know I'm not bluffing, don't you? You knew you gave yourself away up on the roof the other day. That's the reason you tried to kill me in my apartment. Yes. I know you're not bluffing. I realize what I did. And I realize that I've got to kill you now. You realize that too, don't you? Vance, she's picked up my gun. She won't use it. Oh, no? Now, Mrs. Somer... I won't use it, huh, Vance? That's what you think. Vance, my gun is loaded. He knows. And he must know that I'm going to shoot both of you now. The gun won't fire, what? Mrs. Somer. I took out the bullets when I turned my back on you a moment ago. Now I'll take that gun away. Thank you. <laughs> That will be all, Mrs. Somer. All that is, except my explaining to Mr. Markham how I knew it was you. Well, Vance, I guess there isn't anything more to tell in this case except the most important thing of all. How did you know it was Mrs. Somer? First of all, we know from her confession that she found her husband's old suicide note. Vance, please, how did you know she was the murderer? Well, Markham, she claimed she was not at home when her husband allegedly jumped to his death. Yes? She said he went up to the roof to fix a radio aerial. And that's what gave him the idea to come down, write the suicide note, then go back and jump. That was her story. She said she hadn't been on the roof after her husband was killed until she went up with Dale and me. Yet she knew the aerial was broken. Well, she could have known that without going up there, Markham. A yes. wire dangling, bad reception if a radio set were in good order, a number of ways. There was one thing she couldn't know, though. What was that? How it had been fixed. She walked right over to the spot where a new wire had been wound around the insulator. Yes. Now, the only way she could have known that was if she had been there when her husband was fixing it. Or, of course, immediately after which wasn't likely. It couldn't have been immediately after that. 
She had to leave the house after pushing him off the roof. She probably left by a back exit, went shopping, and returned in time to hear the bad news. Undoubtedly. Uh, when she walked to the aerial, she knew she'd made a mistake. But she wasn't sure that I knew what she had done. Oh? She tried to kill me so as to be on the safe side. But then when I let her alone for a while, she thought perhaps I hadn't noticed her error and she didn't try to kill me again. Yes. I let her alone, as you must realize, because I wanted to be absolutely sure about her. I know that. Her motive was money. Money and her love for Tony Lester. Vance, one thing has always puzzled me about this case... You never knew Joe Somer. All you saw was his covered body the day we went up to his house. Yet, you didn't believe it was suicide even then. Why? Something you said, Markham. Something I said? Something you and the police officer said, rather. You told me how considerate a man Joe Somer was as we were driving over to see him. Yes, that's right. The policeman said that Somer narrowly escaped hitting some people who were walking in front of his house when he jumped. Oh, I see what you mean. A considerate man would have made sure he wasn't going to injure anyone else, even though he had decided to do away with himself. That's right. Uh Of course, I wasn't sure. But subsequent events convinced me I was right. All I can say is that fortunately for us, we had you to get to the bottom of this murder. Thank you, but that's completely unimportant. The only thing that matters is that when we reached the bottom of the murder, we reached the end of the rooftop murder case. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The campaigns of summer, done now. And on stony terrain of Broadway, litter and debris of strategies and memory, of summer conquests, summer defeats. And Broadway leans hard against the September nighttime, tries to hold back the departing flow of the summer veterans. And still, the street empties of out of town girls going back home now to dip once more in out of town moons. And the lad of the sun bleached hair, knapsack strapped to shoulder, who lolls for a while against the cooling stone of a night wall closes his eyes for an instant, files the memory, then hits the road to other and newer summers. But chin up. Nighttime has not yet run out, and the autumn replacements are moving in. Chin up. This is it. And east of Broadway, 34 stories into the nighttime, and above river, and where autumn gold will touch first. Penthouse apartment, and a smiling man, a man who stares, who lies rigid, against deep and swirling greens of an expensive carpet. Paralyzed man. Man shot in the spine. Kneeling at his side, a woman in silken nightdress held close against her throat. Michael, do you hear me? And against the tapestry, face held in light of expensive porcelain lamp, Detective Muggerman. Maybe he hears you, Mrs. Austin. Maybe he doesn't. Condition your husband's in. He's got no way of letting you... Please, please, please. Okay, lady, okay. Michael, it's me. It's Sylvia, baby. Mrs. Austin. Is he alive? Is he dead? Tell me. Just tell me so I'll know what to... So I'll know how to behave. So... Just take it easy, Mrs. Austin. No, no, no. Don't you touch me. I'm going to be very calm, very well behaved. All I want to know from you is, is my husband dead or alive? Well, let's put it this way, Mrs. Austin. Let's say it's a moot point. Let's say where that bullet lodged in the you back of the neck... You stop it, you hear? You don't talk to me like that, you hear? It's my husband. Come over here, Mrs. Austin. Sit down here. That awful smile... He never smiled like that. And staring. Just staring. If you like, we can go into another room. We can... I'll get it, Danny. No. In here is all right. All right. Now, try to tell us what happened, Mrs. Austin. It's very late, isn't it? Michael and I were asleep in there. I was restless. Who's that man talking to? Who are you talking to? Yes, thanks. I'll give it to you. You, I asked you who you were talking to. It's the elevator boy, Danny. He said he's airmailed Mrs. Austin's envelope. And he brought back change. Give it to me. Sure, Mrs. Austin. Thank you. Uh, you were saying you and your husband were asleep and... And I was restless. And I heard a noise from in here. And I woke Michael. And I made him get up and see what it was. And I waited for him to come back. 
And I called. And then there was a shot. And he must have been coming back to me, and that's why... Oh, oh my God, oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, come on in, boys. Boys from the lab, Danny, and the other fellas. And they came in, the boys from the lab, and the two young fellas in white, and the pictures taken, and the chalk marks made, and the steel tape applied to distance between sleep and violence, and also degree of probable angle from gun of unknown assailant to a smiling man's spine. Also statement from paralyzed man's wife. Also sedative. Offered by young Wella and White, accepted by woman in silken nightdress who must sleep. You understand, don't you? I can't keep crying like this. Michael mustn't see how. And who kisses Michael as young fellows carry him away, and who closes the door, and behind it, sleep. And the night time runs out. And at headquarters the next day, there's noon, and there's the ham on White, and the container of milk. And there's the surprise offered by Sergeant Gino Tartaglia if... If you'll eat every mouthful, Danny, and drink nice your milk, at the end of it, a surprise. Gino... A fudge brownie. This one. Look at it and smack the lips, Danny. But first... You get that rundown on Michael Austin I asked for, Gino? Yes, Danny. But on an empty stomach, it's... Just give it to me, huh? It's your life, Danny. From Dr. Sinsky... Report that condition of Michael Austin unchanged. Paralyzed, dying. Also, gun which did same located in alley below. No prints. German Luger will be practically impossible to trace. Go on. From interrogations made by Detective Mugovan earlier this morning, Michael Austin, a very, very wealthy man, from his father, Mr. Austin Sr., inherited a fortune from which Michael has lived by certain type investments. So you mean stocks, bonds, things like that? What I mean... That is, what Detective Mugovan meant is the investments were of the type crab games, roulette, the GGs, the fights, the baseball, the football, the blackjack. I think I get the picture, Jim. It goes without saying, Danny. Also, Michael Austin has lost heavily in these type investments according to the word along the streets. No one could put a finger on a number how much, but also Michael Austin was seen much in the company of Johnny Wesley. Johnny Wesley, the one I know? The one we all know. Gino... I told him to hold the squad car till you finished your fudge brownie. However, eh, it's your life, Danny. Outside now and ride a September day rich with sights and smells of a city turning into autumn. Tweeds and college colors and pungence of frying hot dogs. A small drifting breeze that for a second turns into a wind and then drifts again. Youth and books and the first co-ed met and walked with through the park and swift tumble of leaves, past playground and tragedy of a scraped knee and nursemaid running to attend it, past museum and sitters upon the gray stone steps, people who always seem to be reading or waiting or just knowing something secret and gentle, and cross town and park into a shop remarkable for its serenity of decor established by the large display of paper lawn upon which rest rain sprinklers of every description, not turned on, of course. Only the clerk is to that section of the newspaper which contains race results, so that he is somewhat startled to see a customer, is somewhat nearsighted, but then very courteous when he makes out the significance of the police badge, then goes away and comes back with permission for you to see Mr. Wesley and go right in that way. Hello, Danny, come on in. Have a seat. How you been? Good, thanks, Johnny. How about yourself? Oh, back from Vegas. How can a fellow be? How'd you do in Vegas, Johnny? I like this, you know. Nice life, huh? Sell enough rain sprinklers to be able to afford the... Well, how long were you in Vegas? Oh, just a week, Danny. But then you go every week, don't you? Every other. Every other. Johnny, Uh how long has it been since you've sold a rain sprinkler? Oh, you want to know? Well, just so I can tell it downtown, often mug of and wonders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I sold one the day before yesterday, Danny. A dollar and a half item with a year's warranty. This is our biggest seller. Johnny. What? You know a man named Michael Austin, don't you? Hey, you want to see something, Danny? All right. Come over here. <laughs> you know what they are in this tank? Yeah, I know what they are. Goldfish. Goldfish, that's right, yeah. Austin was shot in the back. Hey, you fishies. Hey, fishies. Come in, come in. <laughs> 
One day, Danny, sprinklers, goldfish, real lawn, roses, the wakes. You know, I'm going to have... Last every... night, he was shot in the back, Johnny. Now, what do you want me to do, throw fit? Go get yourself a newspaper. Read what's happening to people every day. You shoot him? Go drop dead, huh? Word says he was seen yes, in your... Yes, seen in my company. Yeah. So? So was once the king of Albania. Look where he is now. <laughs> I'm a real Jonas, huh? A hexer from the hills. Just tell me about him. All right. Rich boy who bet. He won, he lost. That's the business I'm in, you know? That's why frequently you can't find me in my shop. Because I'm in Vegas or I'm in Reno. You know Austin's I'm... wife? Go lead up to whether she was seen in my company. Well? I got a friend greets me as soon as I step off the plane, wherever it is, so who needs Sylvia Austin? What else you want? Ask Mr. Prescott for a free sample sprinkler on the way out, Danny. Tell him I said schmo. That's our password for free sprinklers. <laughs> Danny? Yeah? Going home? Uh-huh. Well, wait a second. I want to finish this up here. Uh, my wife called. She went bowling. You want to come oh, no, over? No, thanks. You didn't even wait to hear what I want you to come over for. Well, thank your wife for me. And You're listening to what I'm saying. She didn't invite you. I did, and it's... Lieutenant mm. Clover's office. Muggerman speak. Yeah, Doc. Yeah. Well, sure, I'll tell him. Look, what's the matter with you? Don't you think I can deliver a message? Yeah, I'll tell him. What's the matter with everybody? Tell him what? That you're not going to accept my invitation after all. Dr. Sinsky wants you to get to the emergency hospital right away. Mike Lawson? Yeah, he was just brought down from surgery. Should be out of the anesthetic by the time you get there. Uh, good night, Lieutenant. Good night. In here, Danny. <laughs> Mrs. Austin. I can't tell. I can't tell. What? The open eyes. Expression. Around his mouth, the expression. I put my cheek close to him. Whether he's breathing. <laughs> Wait, I'll see. Tableau at bedside, doctor and stethoscope, and patient. Man of severed spine and locked away knowledge. Man of staring eyes and mouth of small smile, so small you must look close to discover it. And his wife. Well? Well? Motionless man. He's dead. Murdered man. Well. Well, at last now I know. And his wife. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Most common forms of blindness can be prevented. This month, sight-saving month, resolve to do something to achieve better understanding of the preservation of sight, one of man's most precious senses. Send for the free booklet, I have Facts, by writing Prevention of Blindness, Box 426, Radio City Station, New York 19, New York. Let IFAX spare you and yours unnecessary eye discomforts, or worse. Twilight skims Broadway, and it's the pleasant time. The heat is gone, and the September breeze is a thing composed of puffs of coolness and sudden smiles. And walk the avenue where shadows are rosy before they slip into corners and darken and melt together to become evening. And overhead, the clouds that fluff an autumn moon to get it into shape for night. It's the time for evening's first beer. Kids with ice cream on a stick. Strolling time. Boy and girl time. The pleasant time. Where I was at headquarters, quality of time at the homicide division is assessed according to how cooperative a murder suspect is, how easy to read the fingerprints are, how identifiable the victim, or how hysterical a murdered man's wife. For instance, Sylvia Austin. 
remarkable the things a human being can go through. I'd like a cigarette. Yeah. Here. First one I've had since... Well... Uh, you feel like you can talk to me about your husband now? I'm going to devote my life to practically just that. Even if I marry again, Michael... Michael lost him. Well, you know what I mean. The fact that he was a gambler... Was doesn't... he? Yeah, I think he was. Everything we've been able to find out, but... What does gambler mean? Oh, come on, come on. It... Well, what does it mean? Played the horses, bet the fights. Is, is that the kind of de definition you want, Mrs. Austin? Well, what if he did? He lost a lot, didn't he? Won a lot, too. I, I understand that... I'm his he... wife. Did you find all this out about my husband from me? You didn't, did you? No. Now's your opportunity, Mr. Clover, if you want to find out what really... Well, I'm not going to tell you the size of my bank account, if that's what you're after, but... Oh, I'm sorry, Danny. I didn't know Mrs. Austin. That's all right. Come on in. I got some with me I want you to meet. Uh, come on in, Mr. Scarpia. Hey, where'd he go to? Hey, Mr. Scarpia. Come in here, will you? This guy's in the furniture business, Danny. He's been walking around clucking his tongue at our furniture. I'll go. Uh, Dr. Sinsky said he wanted to see me before I went home. Said he was worried... That's all right. I... Sit still. Oh, uh, right in here, Mr. Scarpia. Lieutenant Clover, Mr. Scarpia. Oh, uh, Hello, Scarpia. Lieutenant. Nice to know you. Yes. And uh, the lady I know, yeah. Hi, Mrs. Austin. I don't think I've met you, have I? Well, I don't remember you wearing glasses, Mrs. Austin, but uh, I'll get close up so you, so you can remember me. Hey, Joseph Scarpia, from Scarpia Furniture. Mr. Clover. What? It's not because of this man. I'm ill, that's all. What about this man, Muggerman? Uh, tell him, Mr. Scarpia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, J Joseph Scarpia, from Scarpia Furniture. I bought all of Mrs. Austin's furniture. I found a buyer for, one, piano which fits this lady's piano's description, and two, a book buyer who buys books by the pound. And Mrs. Austin here has many fancy sets of books, so, well, <laughs> look... I'm not what they really call a harpy or the, the kind Scarpia of... Scarpia wanted that. to take possession from Mrs. Austin a couple of days early, Danny. He went to call on Mrs. Austin. Officer Brownlee stopped him at the door, told him uh, to see you. Yeah, well, so here I am. And I'm glad you're here too, Mrs. Austin. Uh, so what about the permission? Come around the beginning of the week, Mr. Scarpia. The beginning of the week, Mr. Scarpia. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine suggestion. You're real broke, aren't you, Mrs. Austin? Down to selling the furniture. I'm and... ill. That's all. Get her to Dr. Sinsky, Muggerman. And outside then, and begin tour of September City through prescribed area, coordinates of which have been determined by tastes and needs, small fatigues and small deals of a man you know, man you're looking for, man who, among other things, will give freely of information if the proper symbol is held close to his face. Police badge, for instance. Danny, you knocked me over with a feather. Danny Fane, wandering man, itinerant man, man about town. <laughs> what a place to meet, huh, Danny? Need the shelter in farms beside How the... How are you, Danny? Oh, very well, thank you. And you? Nice hotel, Danny. It uh, has charm. Old world. Uh, old uh, charm. Now, what are you doing in it? Uh, Danny, a public lobby... With a string and symbol. I'm entitled. You're entitled. Who will throw the first stone and say a fellow... What are you doing here, Benny? Uh, I've taken a veil, Danny. I'm legitimate. Oh, I'm glad. Well? Um, in organized charity. I accept contributions. For what? For, uh, organized charity. The ancient order of Jebs. Huh? Natural, natural. From this fresh coupon book, for one buck, any of these people here is entitled to a chance on a foreign sports car. And their contributions of one small dollar goes into the kitty of the... Who ancient, are the Jabs? Uh, the the, the do-gooders. Kindly folk who feel if a fella has a ge generous heart, he's entitled at least to a chance on a foreign sports car. In return for which the Jabs take baskets of fruit, turkeys... Canned goods, pickles, sliced Who bread, and... Who are the jabs, Benny? Uh, chums I know happen to be in a raffle business. Uh, you you stopped me off by a chance, Danny. It's... it's uh, tear up the book, Benny. Oh. Come on. To... You want what, Danny? 
Man was shot in the back last night. Died earlier today. Michael Ossie, yeah, I read about him. Know him? Uh, have you seen him around? Where? With Johnny. Johnny Wesley? There's another Johnny for you and for me. Go on. Uh, uh, Johnny kept Mr. Austin around so as Mr. Austin could lay off Johnny's hedge bets. Write it down for me, Benny. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, Johnny's a hedge better. Say, a New York boy is fighting another boy from Pittsburgh in the garden. Say, the odds are even money. Are you with me? Go on. Uh, So the odds are even money. So here, Johnny lays maybe five grand on the Pittsburgh boy. So he puts in a call to Pittsburgh. Finds out the odds on their hometown favorite boy is six to four. So he sends Mr. Austin down to Pittsburgh where Mr. Austin lays four grand, Johnny's money, on the New York boy. I see. Ain't it lovely? Ain't it, ain't it beautiful? That way, if the Pittsburgh boy wins, Johnny wins five grand here, loses four grand in Pittsburgh. If the New York boy wins, Johnny wins six grand there, loses five here. He weighs a thousand ahead. But ahead, I mean, sure. Johnny Wisey. Yeah. Sure thing winner. Thanks, Benny. Oh, I uh, don't want you to lose your place in the form, Mr. Prescott, so just... Uh... That's right. I'll go in and tell Johnny I'm here. Hey, what's the matter, Danny? You forget the password for the free sprinkler? Whisper to you again. Schmo. Just some more about Michael Austin. And I spilled my heart to you about Michael. The part where he ran your hedge bets for you, Johnny. Oh, they've been whispering lies to you, Danny. Oh? Yeah, yeah. Michael was a rich man. He didn't have to run for anybody. His pockets were full of mad money. You put it there, Johnny? So she could lay off your bets? After the whisper, then they screamed the lie to you, huh, Danny? You're kind of betting, Johnny. A hedge bet could run into thousands, which had to be laid on the line any place, any time, right out of pocket. That is the secret truth of my profession. You've got an eagle ear, Danny. You kill him? You kill him because he... Mrs. Austin, now, I read in the papers that she told you how Austin was killed. So what's the matter, Danny? You don't take a widow's word? Should I, Johnny? Mrs. Austin, I called her apartment to ask where do I send the flowers, and there was no answer. You holding her, Danny? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh, Mrs. Austin, that poor Mrs. Austin. Oh, oh, a widow. To spend her grief in jail. You know what, Danny? Tell me. I got the price of a lawyer. Not everybody. Well, the price I got in mind to pay this lawyer, he'll get her out of there. Make you believe. I bet she'll like that better than the flowers, Danny. Make a bet? No. Ah, you're smart. Bye, Danny. Danny Clover, Margovin. How's Miss Austin? She's okay. She turns it on when someone asks her how she is. Johnny Wesley been in to see her? No. A lawyer? Yeah, Danny, with a writ about five minutes ago. She going home? That's right. Hey, Danny. Uh Uh-huh? What did the lawyer bring a writ for? We aren't holding her. Just see that she gets out of there, huh? Escort her home if you have to. Okay. I'll be parked around the corner from her apartment on East 49th. Meet me there. Right. waiting for, Danny. Get in. Who are we waiting for? Uh, relax. No, just in case I spot him, I'll nudge you so I can do all the policeman-like things. Like what? Oh, like bop you with my elbow and say, well, look who's coming down the street. If it isn't old... Johnny Wesley? That's who we're waiting for, huh? What's, what's Let's you... give him a little time. Yeah. About five minutes. Yeah. That's not quibble, huh? Yeah. Oh, come on, Sylvia, get up. Hiya, boys. Sylvia and I were just talking. She just dozed right off. 
You didn't slug her, did you? Oh, tell him how gentle I am with goldfish. Yeah, real gentle. Only Mrs. Austin is raising a welt on her right jaw. Uh, Come on, Mrs. Austin. Let's get on our feet, shall we? That's a girl. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Feel better, huh? I mean him. I mean Johnny. What are you doing here, Johnny? Condolences. Yeah, I forgot to tell you, Sylvia, my condolences upon the death of your husband. Get out of here. I want my dough. Get him out of here, you... You... What is he? You gambler, Just you... Just give me my dough, that's all. I gotta have my dough. How much is it, Johnny? You'll never believe it. I don't know what he's talking $100, about. hundred thousand dollars. Bet money? You know it. Pretty big fight tonight in Newark, Johnny, that one. Yeah, that one. Listen, I got a fortune bet, and I need that money that she's got. It's my dough. Uh, ma'am, do you happen to have a hundred grand that belongs to this gentleman? You're crazy. That's your hedging money, Johnny? Yeah, my margin. This is the dough I gotta lay down in Newark before the fight. If I don't, I'm liable to drop a mint. Search the place. Tear it down. You won't find ten dollars. Probably won't even find a nickel. That broke, aren't you? Your husband went through all his money, didn't he? Well? Well, what? Was his money? Yeah, listen. Listen, I gotta have that dough. I gotta cover. I'll give you a percentage. After the fight, Sylvia, you... What's he talking about? That your husband went broke and suddenly had $100,000. My dough. Johnny's dough to lay bets for Johnny. Uh, The end of it's coming when Mr. Clover tells you how you shot your husband for the money. Tear the place down. Find it. Uh, A girl like you, suddenly broke, that's a terrible life to face. Even out of hockey furniture. What a tragedy for a girl like you. Where's the hundred thousand? We'll tear this place apart stick by stick. Oh, this one's too smart. That dough ain't here. And you can take his word for it because... because I... you've done something with it. Then find it. You had to put it someplace. Give it to someone. Oh, not her. No, not her. Hide it someplace. Not much time. We got here ten minutes after Austin was shot. Goodbye, boys. No dough, no murder rap. You'll get followed wherever you go, Sylvia. You'll never get How to that. How about that elevator dump. boy, Marlon? I thought he was very proficient, Danny. Up, down, smooth stops. Get him. What, what for? for? He mailed a letter for Mrs. Austin. Hey, that's right, an airmail letter. Think he'd remember to wear? Airmail. Shall I get the boy, Sylvia? I'll get the boy. Uh, wait. Send it to Memphis. General delivery. Killed your husband, didn't you? Slob was broke. Walking around with a hundred grand and he's broke. Definition of a slob. And a girl like you? Yeah, a girl like me. Broke's no good. Can't use it, fellas. It's real nothing. I'd rather be dead. Did I make it? In the minutes before dawn, Broadway lies huddled in a dreamless sleep. And the silent street is part of it. The long night, the time of no stars and the muted wind. Then from far away, listen, the whispers gather and take away the night. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway is my beat. Stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Charlotte Lawrence was heard as Sylvia, Sheldon Leonard as Johnny, Leo Cleary as Benny, and Vito Scotti as Mr. Scarpia. Bill Anders speaking. CBS, 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 radio's gonna follow you, follow you, the radio that's best. Praise, oh, praise, oh, praise that CBS radio. Jack Benny, Lionel Barrymore, and the Quiz Kids all return tomorrow. The stars, the shows America listens to most, they're back or on the way. So keep tuned to The Star's Address.
And remember, the comedy treat that can't be beat is Jack Benny time, Sundays on the CBS Radio Network. It is now 45 seconds past 8 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. But remember, next week, Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock, it will be... Time for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Musk Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Man They All Love. The Egyptian desert isn't the best place in the world for a man who likes to hunt. But once in a while, the fleet-footed gazelle makes things interesting. So a couple of friends and I decided to take the day off, drive up the Nile near Helwan, and try our luck. It was quite a way, so I was up about four in the morning. I was still half asleep as I went down the stairs from my quarters to the half-lighted cafe. The tambourine still reeked with oriental tobacco smoke from a few hours before. As I walked along the bar past the empty tables... I never felt so glad to get away from a place in my life. I was wondering what a little fresh air would smell like as I cut off the light by the front switch and threw open the latch on the door. When I opened up, I got some fresh air and a lot more. He plopped in with the door, spread eagle, like a sack of overripe potatoes, and he didn't move. I bent over and got a quick look. First thing that struck me was his unusual dress. Frock coat, headdress, heavy shoes, all in black. Just then, another figure moved from the shadows outside. A little beggar named Samak I'd seen a few times wandering the native quarter. Hey, All right, nothing here for you, Samak. But what is it? Imshi, move along. A man drunk with the liquor. Nobody's rolling him, Samak, on your way. But why not, Fendi? Anyhow, you're wrong. This guy isn't drunk, he's dead. I'll white his throat by the knife. So now it does not matter. I said cut it, Samak. Get out of this pocket. But Fendi... Yeah, give me that watch. I was first to find it, not you. Let go. Give me the... Uh, Fendi, look, 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 there's a name in their wallet. Sure. It's an identification. Please let me see. All right, keep your hands off. Anamali. Muskwais! Muskwais! What about it? Hey, come back here! Samak was gone just that quick. I caught the look in his eyes, and it was fright that sent him scampering off into the dark. Something about the wallet. So I took a closer look. And the name meant everything. It was the name of a man I'd heard a lot about, but had never seen before. Jonathan Mello. Jonathan Mello. A man of unknown nationality, he'd become a missionary for the Coptic faith, an ancient branch of Christianity centered in old Cairo. Several years before, he had journeyed to the African interior to bring information to the native tribes. Since then, few outsiders had seen him. But ever so often, a word had come as good works and personal sacrifices. And his name had become almost a legend throughout the Middle East. Yes, Jonathan Mello was a man greatly loved and respected by everyone. And here he lay murdered at the door to my cafe. His name had meant something to Samak, too. And I figured the little beggar would soon be spreading the word around. So I got the body inside and latched the door. 
I had another look at the wallet. It was empty except for a receipt from the Pyramid House in Cairo dated the day before. And I put in a hurry-up call to Captain Sam Sabai at his home. Fifteen minutes later, Sam was in my terrain, looking down at the lifeless form. So, this is the fabulous Jonathan Merrow. Yeah, it's what the identification says. Mm. That in his clothing leaves small doubt that he is the missionary. Do you know he was back in Cairo, Sam? It had not come to my attention, Jordan. He surely must have returned very recently. Looks like he should have stayed in the Sudan. Yes, it would have been better for all of us. Finding an enemy of such a man as this poses a very strange problem. Uh, you have much to go on. No. Jonathan Mello was known to lead a most exemplary life. Maybe there's some things we don't know. True, Jordan. For example, why he should be found dead at your cafe. Oh, now, look, Sam. No, no, you... no, 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 Jordan. You have many accomplishments, but the skilled use of the knife such as this is not one of them. A lot of Coptics might not agree with you, Sam. It is not necessary that they learn of your connection with this, Jordan. No, well, they'll find out. Leave that to Samak. Sure. Samak? A little beggar who came up a couple of seconds after I found Mello's body here. And the beggar knows who this man is? That's right. He got away fast when he found out. I see. You see where that puts me, Sam? Yes, I do, Jordan. Jonathan Mello's death will be a profound shock to his people. They will demand immediate justice. Yeah, after Samak gets a word around. I bet it doesn't take him long. Jordan, you say you were going hunting up the Nile. That's the way it started out. Let me suggest that you continue with your plans. Stay out of Cairo for a while. Are you suggesting I run away? Only until this matter is cleared up. Well, supposing it isn't cleared up, Sam. If I leave Cairo now, I'll never get back. Do you not realize that it is for your own safety? Sure, but you ought to know me better than that. Jordan, for once in your life, you must listen to me. It is my duty to protect you when it is possible, but I, I can offer no guarantees. No good, Sam. I'm staying right here. <sighs> Very well. But you have been warned. Sure, sure. Thanks. We will cut the body away secretly and trust that Samak does not spread the news. Well, Sam took the body, and along about ten o'clock, I opened up for business. That's when I knew Samak had been real busy. Not a single person came in that morning. The tambourine was just as empty at two in the afternoon. Even the Muslims crossed to the other side as they passed which meant they sensed trouble and didn't want to be around. I got out of the streets and felt the unrest growing. When a knife sailed out from somewhere and almost parted my hair, I decided it was time to get busy. I remembered the receipt in Mello's wallet from the Pyramid House. It hadn't meant much, but it might put some light on Mello's activities since he'd returned to Cairo. So I made for the place over on Sharia Rangoon. The sign on the window puzzled me, but I went on in. I can help you, mister. Uh... Yeah, with some information. Sorry, I don't sell that. Did you ever see this receipt? Sure, Mike. I wrote it myself for a customer yesterday. Hey, wait a minute. Where did you get it? Uh, that's not important. Uh, what did he buy? Liquor. What else? It... Maybe I don't tell you. You sold that man liquor? What do you think I sell here? Elevator shoes? What kind of liquor? Champagne, scotch, bourbon, arak, gin. The very best. Fifty cases. What did the man look like? All in black. Headdress, frock coat, heavy shoes. Wait a minute. You don't tell me where you got that receipt, I don't tell you. Yeah, maybe you mixed up anyhow. You think I forget him? When I gonna make him a special price for a big sale, but he pays me like that, all in cash for quick delivery? Delivery? Where to? His boat, the Delta Queen. Qu uh, worth four, it was. Don't you ask me. All right, thanks, I won't. Yeah, sure. I clam up for guys like you, mister. I don't gonna tell you nothing. <laughs> Uh, it didn't make a lick of sense, but there it was. Fifty cases of expensive liquor purchased by the circumspect Jonathan Mello. Well, that little receipt had set up a chain reaction that couldn't stop here, so I went on to the next link, located at Wharf 4 on the Nile. And the Delta Queen was some job. A sumptuous yacht that could have played stand-in for the Queen Mary. Brand new, with lots of shiny brass from stem to stern. Looked like our lowly missionary had been spending potatoes on a lot of things. There was nobody on deck, so I wandered down below. A passageway led to a big lounge, complete with a big bar. There were some cigarettes on a side table, American brand, so I took one. I reached for a match, but I didn't need it. And I saw her walking toward me, the flame of the cigarette lighter glowing on her face, green eyes, tawny blonde hair, and round shoulders. The perfect piece of equipment to make a layout like this complete. I accepted the light. 
thanks. Not at all. Was I expecting you? No, uh, I'm an intruder. Suppose I start screaming. Well, suit yourself, lady. I'm a little out of practice. Well, how do you like it? Mm. Everything's real ship shape. The boat? Yeah, it's nice, too. All the comforts of life, huh? Almost. But I liked it looking around, meet new people. Yeah. Your deal here looks good to me. Uh, who comes with it? Bourbon? Sure. The expensive kind. Our tastes are alike, aren't they? Maybe we have a lot in common. Oh, money, boats. I like Americans, too. I've been trying to remember. They grow them like you in St. Louis or Chicago. Now, you're right the first time. The name's Rocky. I'm Corrine. Here you are, Rocky. Thanks again, Corrine. Why don't we sit down? Over here. Uh, maybe I ought to check the passenger list first. We're alone, Rocky, for a while. Okay. Now, uh, why don't you ask me why I came here? Is that important? Oh, makes good conversation. Wouldn't you rather just... Yeah. You get on to sail fast, don't you? We like boats, remember? So does your boyfriend. Do we have to talk about him? Yeah. Tell me about Jonathan Mello. Don't you know about him? Only that he's passed up just about everything most men want for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all this is quite a switch. He's been a good man. He's helped a lot of people. Now he deserves the good things in life. Yeah, he hasn't missed a trick. Where does it go from here? We're getting out of Africa. From now on, we're going where the bright lights are. See the world. Why don't you come along? Just the uh, three of us? There'll be lots of people around. It would be easy. How about it, Rocky? Corrine, you know where Jonathan Mello is right now? He's settling some business. What kind of business? Oh, I don't know. It's with a Prescott exporting company, Jared Prescott. Jonathan says as soon as that's settled, we're leaving. Well, happy sailing, Corrine. Rocky, you could wait for him here. No, thanks. Why? Because I don't like things that don't make sense. And none of this does. The liquor, the yacht, you, and especially... What, Rocky? That's something you got to find out for yourself, Corrine. I don't want to be around when you do. There was no place to go now but to the Prescott Exporting Company. It had a big layout of offices just off one of the Moose Keeper's R's. I liked the taboo the girl at the desk was wearing, but I didn't like cooling my heels. So the next time she went out for a drink, I opened Prescott's door and went on in. He was on the phone. He was a big guy with a crew haircut. He smoked a fat cigar. The ashes falling in his white vest as he talked. Surely a man like Jonathan Mello can be found in Cairo. You'll find him, that's all. Maybe I can help you, Prescott. Who are you? My name's Jordan. Jordan? Jordan. Let's see here. I don't recall an appointment with you. you can get one now, if you don't mind. I do mind. What do you mean barging in here like this, Jordan? Came about the big deal. What deal? Get to the point. With Mello, Jonathan Mello. I understand he wants it consummated in a hurry. Why isn't he here? I had an appointment with him three hours ago. Have you seen him? Yeah, saw him early this morning. It's not doing me any good. Mr. Prescott, has it occurred to you that Jonathan Mello won't be here at all? That's ridiculous. Look, Jordan, I don't know what he's trying to pull on me, but you tell him ivory or no ivory. If he doesn't show up here before hey, the... Wait a minute. Ivory, did you say? Certainly I did. Let's not beat around the bush, Jordan. And... By the way, what have you got to do with it? Maybe there isn't any ivory. Look, I'm nobody's fool. Why do you think I sent a safari to the interior myself to check on it? My mistake. Jonathan Mello discovered the hoard of ivory himself. He has a right to sell, and I'm ready to buy. For how much? Fifty, hundred thousand dollars? We deal in Egyptian pounds here, Jordan. Besides, nobody's going to top the price. Mello knows that. Just how much do you know about Mello, Mr. Prescott? That's beside the point. Everyone knows about him. Yeah, I thought I did, too. A lowly missionary with a lot of high ideals. And get the picture now. Expensive liquor, a yacht, and a slick girlfriend to go with it. How he spends the money is none of my affair. But his own people will be interested. You know anything about the Coptics? I'm a businessman, Jordan. I'm not interested in Coptics or anything else except a perfectly legitimate deal. Okay, we'll leave it that way. Jordan, I don't know who you are or what you want, but you tell Mr. Mello I won't wait much longer. Either he shows up today or the whole deal is off. Sure, I'll tell him. Next time I see him. Mm -hmm. 
I had everything from Prescott but the answer to the jackpot question. Who killed Jonathan Mello and why? Well, I figured the ivory hoard he had uncovered somewhere in Africa had something to do with it. That's why I was scouting for a payphone to bring Sam Sabai up to date. I avoided the bazaar and had walked maybe a couple of blocks when I spotted a character hugging the shadows not so far back and staying on my tail. I stepped it up, figuring to double back at him when all at once he was in the center of the street and yelling. It was Samak, the little beggar who found me with Mello's body morning. That's when I climbed for the sprint record. I left a lot of natives far behind, but Samak had his robe up around his knees and kept coming. Samak was lagging too by then. I slowed to catch my breath when I saw another native running from the other direction right at me. Right then, I picked an alley. It was the wrong one. Not more than 30 paces ahead, it came to a dead end with nothing but high walls between me and the man running in. He had a knife like nothing I'd ever seen. A great curve-bladed scimitar, a yard long. I waited with my back to the wall as he came in for the kill. You are listening to The Man They All Loved, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Here's a special announcement for all you Rocky Jordan fans. Starting next Sunday, Rocky Jordan will come to you at a new time, 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Make a note of it so you can remember to tune us in next Sunday. The new time for Rocky Jordan is 5 Pacific Standard Time. Now we return you to Cairo and Rocky Jordan for tonight's adventure, The Man They All Loved. Imagine a man with his back to the wall at the end of a dirty blind alley in Cairo facing a character with blood-red eyes coming at him waving a huge curb-bladed scimitar. Well, that's me. Not the one with a knife, but the one backed against the wall. And the guy kept coming with Samak the beggar somewhere behind. Oh, help, Jordan, by the scimitar, you die! In the split second it took him to reach me, I thought of a million moves, but none of them worked. I knew one swing of that blade and I was finished. My eyes were on the raised scimitar, so I didn't see a third figure into the alley. But all at once he was there. A tall, dark-skinned man who had my assailant by both arms from behind, and the knife never came down. I had the feeling he could have crumpled the guy in his powerful hands, but he only slammed him back and rolling. Little Samak was already gone, and his chum got up running. Another time, Jordan, we we'll meet again! And I was alone with a man who had saved my life. His intelligent eyes watched me as I got my breath. Well, we... Maybe we better shake hands. I'm most honored, Mr. Jordan. Oh. Abyssinian, aren't you? Yes. I am Jethro, an Abyssinian and a Coptic. And... Maybe you don't know why they're after me? The beggar Samak tells everyone that he found you early this morning by the body of Jonathan Mello. Well, I, I still don't get it, but thanks. I've helped you, Mr. Jordan. Now you help me. You think I can help you? We both share certain interests in this affair, do we not? Yeah. Maybe you've been finding out some things about your missionary you didn't know before. Maybe he's not such a big man. Mr. Jordan... No one grieves more for the death of Jonathan Mello than do I. How well did you know him, Jethro? He was my greatest friend. To him I owe everything. He taught me kindness and understanding. It was he who provided the funds for all my education. Yeah, I used to hear things like that about him. It was his wish that with my training and education I would go back to the tribes and bring enlightenment to my people. You mind if I ask you something, Jethro? Not at all, Mr. Jordan. When did you see him last? Not for a long time. When he first brought me and my family to Cairo. Were you expecting him back? Yes. Let me explain that my father and I have a small construction business here. About a month ago, we received a letter from Jonathan Mello, who was then in the Sudan. It stated that he would soon be in possession of a great deal of money with which he wanted my father and I to construct schools and other installations for the tribes of Sudan. He was to arrive here a few days ago. But you never saw him? The next I heard was the news of his death. I wished to know why he died and why he did not contact us upon his arrival. Well, I can't answer the first one, but you'll find the second answer down on the Nile. 
I do not understand. It's all his. Brand new. And loaded with all the provisions for a big joyride around the world. Looks like all that money turned his head a little. Mr. Jordan, have you said that you will help me? Of course, anything. I wish to see Jonathan Mello's remains, if you can arrange it. Right away, Jethro. Let's go. A handsome young Abyssinian stayed with me, and I finally got to a phone and talked to Sam Sabaya. I briefed him real quick and then asked him about viewing the missionary's body. He said to come on down, and in another 20 minutes, Sam was leading Jethro and me down some steps at headquarters that led to the morgue. This way, gentlemen. Uh, right behind you, Sam. I had the remains moved to a room off the main hall. You will understand why. Oh, sure. Every precaution was taken to conceal his identity, Jordan. However, many people already know of Jonathan Mello's death. Yeah, I found that out. You would still do well to take my advice and hide out for a time. No, not interested, Sam. In here. Was this the one? It is. Yeah. Three stab wounds. Any one would have brought instant death. Somebody sure wanted him out of the way. Indeed. Will that be all, Jethro? Jethro only nodded his head and moved silently out. He had nothing to say to Sam, so he left headquarters. We were soon walking away down the Sharia Nagoon. The desert twilight had given way to sudden dark, and a dim street lamp every four or five blocks didn't help much. In spite of my being with him, he seemed alone and lost. It was hard to know what to say. Uh, tough, was it, Jim? Yes, but not a surprise, Mr. Jordan. How do you mean? That was not Jonathan Mello. But... Say that again. The man lying in the morgue is not Jonathan Mello. Are you sure? I knew him too well to be mistaken. If it's not Mello, who is it? I can tell you that too, Mr. Jordan. His name is Matson, a hunter whom I saw often before coming to Cairo. A man who would not hesitate to kill. Did he know Jonathan Mello? He did. Their paths crossed often in the Sudan. Why would he want to switch identity with your missionary? That is quite obvious, is it not, Mr. Jordan? And now I can be certain that the real Jonathan Mello is dead. At the moment, that is all that matters. Look, Jethro, uh, how about coming back to the tambourine with me? No. No, Mr. Jordan. I wish to think on this alone. We parted there, and I headed back for the tambourine. It occurred to me that I hadn't eaten since four that morning, but something else interested me more. There wasn't much question why the disappearance of Jonathan Mello... But that didn't explain the killing of his imposter, the hunter Matson. Well, I got back to the cafe, and good old Chris, my bartender, was real busy swatting flies. The tambourine had just one customer. Rocky. Oh, you got better liquor on your yacht, Corrine. Rocky, I've got to talk to you alone. Okay, I'm going to my office. Yeah? Rocky, where is he? Where's Jonathan? You asking or telling me? I don't know. He was to come back. I've got to see him. You'll never see Jonathan Mello, Corrine. Fact of it is, I don't think you ever did. I don't understand you. Then sit down and get it once through. Tell me, Rocky, what are you driving at? Jonathan Mello was never anything but a good missionary. But in his travels, he happened onto a fabulous hoard of ivory, worth enough to build a lot of schools and hospitals. I know that. Ah, wait a minute. Before he could do anything about it, a hunter named Matson found out the whereabouts of the ivory. He killed the missionary, he assumed his identity, and came to Cairo to sell the ivory and use the money in his own way. Oh, that's impossible. Oh, no, it isn't. Mello had been gone a long time. Few people would recognize him. You, for instance. His name made no difference to me. No, no. Only the money. What about Matson? He's dead. How do you know? Because I found him that way at the door of my cafe. Me and Samak. Who's he? I'm beginning to wonder. Maybe it wasn't a coincidence Samak showing up when he did. I figure he was working for someone. He made quick work of spreading the word that I'd done the killing. Then you're in trouble, Ricky. A lot of Coptics don't like me. Rocky, listen, the yacht, it's ready to go. We can get away if we hurry. You make a quick switch, don't you, lady? You know how I feel about you, Rocky. I think you feel the same way. It'll be wonderful, you and I. We've been all over that. Look at me, Rocky. Hurry, get back. Ah, he ain't you, George, and he's still afraid. He knows his time is short. He can't escape the Coptic revenge. The brave Mr. Jordan! 
Rager Samak was back in the job. I forgot all about Corrine right then and went through the broken window. Samak was already scrambling away and running hard. He kept to the alleys, always a few steps ahead of me. As he entered a dark passageway with buildings on either side that almost touched at the top, I realized he knew where he was going. I had to catch him quick. I was almost on him when suddenly there was another shadow and a flash of the scimitar. I ducked back in time as I did my feet struck something. My hands made a grab and came up with a piece of iron pipe. That was all. Against the biggest knife I ever saw. And this time, Samak's buddy was at it for keeps. He swung the huge blade with both hands. I parried the first one. Then the next one. Third time I was lucky, and now he was swinging wild. I followed the blade, ducked it, and came around with the iron pipe flat against his face. The scimitar landed 20 feet away. He piled up at my feet. I looked around for Samak, but he was gone. You're not through yet, George. The light from the room inside hit me as the door opened. He took one step into the alley, a cigar in one hand and a gun in the other. Right on time, Jordan. I didn't have an appointment, Prescott. Yes, you did. Drop what you have there. Samak led me to the right place, did he? He carried out his assignment very well. Only his pal with the scimitar bungled the job again. As a businessman, I should have known. When I want something done right, I have to do it myself. Yeah. Now, who gets all the ivory? Just you? That is my plan. You put on a great act for me back in your office. You knew Jonathan Mello and Matson were dead all the time. But I'm wondering how you know about the ivory hoard. When a man has ivory to sell, who else should he write to but a reputable dealer like myself? Sure. When you got Mello's letter, you sent Matson out to locate the stuff, got rid of Mello, and came back in his place. All I had to do was get rid of Matson, and the road was clear. Except for you. I'm next. Sometime tomorrow morning, they'll find you here. The victim of the Coptic's attrition. Come closer, Jordan. You see, I'm a very thorough man. I don't intend to miss. The shots echoed back and forth in the sandstone walls, and I wondered why I heard. Prescott hadn't moved. Then I saw the two spots in his white vest. The gun suddenly dropped from his hand... He pivoted slowly and fell back down into the dirt of the alley. You all right, Mr. Jordan? Yes. Thanks to you, General. Well, this is the second time today. It will not be necessary again. No. Samark's still loose, but nobody to work for. The police will find him soon enough. You know, I'm wondering something, General. Yes? Why did you do this? Just to get Prescott or to save me? How can I say, Mr. Jordan? I only know that... Now the way is clear for the great work Jonathan Mello wanted done. I'm happy for that. You can be happy for a lot of things. No. You see, he taught me the ways of peace, not violence. Tonight I've killed a man. I think Mello would understand. Yes, he would understand. That is why we all loved him so much. <laughs> It's CBS at a new time next week, 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan, starring Jack Moyles in the title role, is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Tonight's story by Gomer Cool and Larry Roman. Remember the new time next week for Rocky Jordan, 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you a story of a mind reader who discovers his nightclub act is not a fake. A story we call A Vision of Death, starring Mr. Ronald Coleman. Before our play begins, here is a word about Autolite from a good friend of ours. Greetings, I Wilcox. Why, it's that amazing, magnificent mystic and great glass globe gazer, Sabu the Swami. What's on my mind? You think of your best friend. Everybody's best friend. The Autolite stay full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Now the glass shows a glass even more powerful than mine. Well, that's the fiberglass retaining mat protecting every positive plate in the Autolite stay full battery. They prevent shedding and flaking and give the stay full longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. Now I see many smiling faces. On the thousands of drivers who visit their masterful, merry, and marvelous neighborhood Autolite battery dealers. For an Autolite Stay Full, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Now the crystal ball shows words of wisdom. I know. You're always right with Autolite. And now, with a vision of death and the performance of Mr. Ronald Coleman... Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. If I speak too rapidly for your stenographer, you'll tell me, won't you, Lieutenant? No offense, but um, he impresses me as someone who has to sit on the floor to put his shoes on. And don't hesitate to stop me if I seem to wander away from the point... I mean to say this is my first, and I hope, final appearance in a police precinct, and I should hate to give a sloppy performance. We were always known, Aurora and I, for the smoothness and gem-like precision of our act. And as for this murder, uh, rap, I suppose it's called, is concerned, an acquaintance with our act is the essential rabbit. Awfully good act. Smart, informal, occasionally humorous, and always mystifying. Well, the act always began with music, never with the cliché fanfare of trumpets or roll of drums. I would saunter out to the center of the floor and say something like, Good evening. You are about to witness an exhibition of mental telepathy. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce Aurora, my wife? Uh, they never failed to give her a hand. What would they applaud? Why, the, the vision she presented as she came toward me. There has never been anyone as lovely as Aurora. The most beautiful flash in the profession. Uh, Aurora, would you care to tell the audience or shall I? You tell them, Judge, while I tie the blindfold across my eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, all mind readers employ a gimmick. A gimmick is a trick, a device. For example, when the mind reader, threading his way through the audience, says to the mind reader, sitting blindfolded on the stage... A lady has given me a small object which I now hold in my hand. What is it? And the mind reader sitting blindfolded replies, A silver coin. The answer has not come through mind reading. No, it has come through the gimmick. A cue or signal communicated through the very question itself. But we don't do that. We do not. Uh, you will notice, ladies and gentlemen, that I never speak to Aurora at all. Are you ready, Rory? Ready, Judd. Here we go, then. You, sir. You have something? Good. Concentrate upon it, like a good chap. The gentleman <coughs> holds a and coin you, madam? in his hand. It is a Mexican peso bearing the date 1892. Oh, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's very clever of you, madam. I'll be surprised if she gets this one. The lady holds oh, in her hand you, young man? her other hand. <laughs> <laughs> a sucker once born remains a sucker till death. The audience never realized, never in all the years we worked, that although I was not speaking to Aurora directly, my chatter nevertheless was loaded with signals and cues for her guidance. By revealing the gimmick, we concealed the gimmick, and that, Lieutenant, is the neat plus ultra of gimmicks. Yes, it was as crude as that. 
but it enabled us to work 50 weeks a year here and abroad at an average of over a 1,000 a week. Of course, I always gave some credit for our success to our agent, Harry Arnold, although Rory was inclined to give him no credit at all. Good news, Judd. I've managed to book the act into the College Inn in Chicago with a four-week guarantee. Not bad, huh? Get him. He managed to book the act. Yeah. I suppose they never heard of us in Chicago? I suppose we weren't held over there six weeks when we played the Sans Souci in 1948? You think it's easy to get a four-week guarantee these days? Money is short. Money is tight. I've never yet heard you say money is long, money is loose. You have to sweat for your 10%, don't you? Yes, you do. In a pig's ear, you do. Agents. They're all like... Oh, there's gratitude for you. There's the milk of human memory. What were you when I first saw you? Nothing. Not this much. Playing ten a day under canvas in, in, in Menasha, Wisconsin, and paid off in bottle tops. I worked. I schemed. I sweated. Listen to, to you... him. You'd think he had to get out there on the floor every night. You'd think he was the one spent 11 months, 12 hours a day, memorizing the code. You'd think it was his name in lights. Agents. All they know is how to live off a dead whale. Scum of the earth. Look, I'm not going to take that from you, you hear me? You'll take I... it, baby, along with the 10%. You'll take it and you'll chew it and you'll swallow it and you'll keep it down, too. How do you like that? I'm warning you, kid. Don't push me too far. Now, don't push children, me too... children, on your way, Harry, and don't let it get you down. I think a four-week guarantee is pretty good. Oh, thanks, Judd. If it wasn't for you, Judd, I'd... Oh, why go into it? I'm going for a walk. But aside from these altercations between Rory and Harry, it was smooth sailing. We wore the best, ate the best, drank the best, stayed at the finest hotels. And every Saturday night after the performance, Harry would bring us our salary. He'd bring it in cash. Thousand, twelve fifty, fifteen hundred. I have the old performer's distrust of checks. <laughs> Been given too many with a high latex content. <laughs> anyway... Life couldn't have been more placid. And then one evening, about five weeks ago, soon after we opened at the Grove here in town, a frightening thing occurred. We'd just begun the act, and I was out in the audience. You will notice, ladies and gentlemen, that I never speak to Aurora at all. Are you ready, Rory? Ready, Judd. Here we go, then. Now, you, madam. The you... lady holds in her hand a compact. It is platinum and bears her initials R.C. Uh, 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 you, 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 sir. You, sir. The gentleman you, you... is holding you... an engagement ring. In it are three small diamonds. I, uh, I, uh, miss, the miss, miss, have lady, you, uh... The young lady is holding... It, it, it's a small cameo brooch and... Uh, <laughs> Rory, Rory, Rick, uh, 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 Maurice, Maurice, music, music. I picked Rory up from the floor and hurried with her to our dressing room, almost beside myself with anxiety. I placed her on the couch, dampened her towel, and put it on her forehead and began to chafe her wrists. Rory, Rory, honey, Rory. John, what happened? I was in the bar. Do you want me to get a doctor? No, 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 to... I, I don't know. Get out. Leave us alone. Get out, Harry. Get out. John. John. I'm here, Rory. Are you all right? Well, I guess so. I don't know what happened. Well, you fainted away. Try to remember what happened. Oh, I felt funny. I don't remember. No, no, try, try, Rory. Try. Try to remember. It's important. Oh, I, I can't. Why is it important? Oh, you don't know? Rory, you don't know? You were calling out the answers before I even had a chance to give you the cue. Do you believe in telepathy, Lieutenant? I don't mean the sort of thing Rory and I usually did. I mean real telepathy. Uh, I never did either until that night. I don't mind telling you I was badly shaken. I mean, after all, I knew we'd been using a gimmick, and suddenly it began to happen without the gimmick. It scared us to death. We didn't know what we were getting into. But we went on with the act, and in my mind, I began to search about for the answer. I found it, of course. You'll find a gimmick in almost everything if you look hard enough. I've got it, Rory. We've worked together so long that you know what I'm going to say before I say it. From my inflection, my pauses, even my movements. 
You see? Judd, that has to be it. Oh, this is marvelous. When Harry gets back, I'll tell him about it. And if I last until tomorrow, he can ask the management for more dough. Yeah, as soon as he gets back. Next Thursday. Tonight. How much more should we ask for? Well, we... Tonight? What made you say tonight? I don't know, Judd. Oh, you were there when he told me he'd be in Palm Springs till Thursday. What... What made you say tonight? I, I don't know. What difference does it make? Stop picking on me. So I made a mistake. So what? Well, I don't see how you could make such a mistake, that's all. Judd, leave me alone. I've been worried half crazy about really being able to read your mind. I've been under a strain. So Harry's coming back Thursday and not tonight. All right. You satisfied? He'll be here Thursday and not tonight. You, Judson Stone, mister? This dressing room, eh? Uh, what is it? A telegram. Uh, sign here. Oh, sign for it, will you, Rory? Uh, there you are, kid. I'm sorry I blew up in your face, Judd. I... Judd. What's the matter? It's... It's from Harry. He's coming in tonight. And he did, too, Lieutenant. Rory was so upset by it, she couldn't go on at all that evening. She had no explanation for how she knew, none whatsoever. I don't know, Judd. I just don't know. My mind seems to go blank, and I seem to hear a voice whisper in my ear, and Harry Arnold will be with you tonight. That's all. When we got to our suite at the hotel, Harry was there waiting for us. What happened? What happened? You both look like ghosts. Oh, Harry, I'll tell you some other time. Leave us alone, will you? All right, all right, I'm going. Just came back to wish you a happy birthday and to give you this. Birthday? Oh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Harry, thanks. What is it? Well, open it, why don't you? It's a bathrobe. A red silk bathrobe with your initials. That's right, it's a... How does she know? How do you know? Get out of here. Get out of here! John, make him get out! I won't be talked to like that. I don't care who she is. I won't be oh, talked Harry, to like that. Harry, shut up. Heavens. For heaven's sake, shut up and go away. What? Leave us alone. What? Go. Get out. Get out. You you too, Judd? She's got you talking against me too, huh? All right, I'm going. I'm going. But from here on in, it's strictly business between us. I wash my hands. <laughs> He kept his word, Lieutenant. From that time on, he kept himself to himself. And I was prepared to let it go at that, much as I liked Harry, until the night I was awakened no. by Rory, no. moaning in her sleep. No, no, please. Oh, oh, Rory, no. Rory, wake up. No. You're having a bad dream. Rory. No. What? What? Judd? Oh, shh. Just quiet. Is it all right? I'm here. I'm here. Oh, Judd. What, Rory? Voice. Whispering again? Yes. Oh, John. What? He's going to kill me. Harry Arnold is going to kill me. And that, Lieutenant, was the beginning of the end of that. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ronald Coleman with Kathy Lewis in A Vision of Death. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. <laughs> Rory, Rory, get a grip on yourself. He's going to kill me. Harry is going to kill me. Rory, don't be ridiculous. Stop it now. It was just a bad dream. Harry is going to kill Will me. Will you stop that? Will you stop saying Judd, that? Hold me. Right. Harry is going to kill me. Now you've had a bad dream, I tell you. He hates me. He hates me, John. John Harry is going to kill me. <laughs> I'm a rational man, Lieutenant. I've always felt, for example, that when Hamlet says there are stranger things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio, Horatio ought to reply, tell that to Sweeney. I knew there was no such thing as mental telepathy. I knew it as well as I know I'm sitting here talking to you. 
Up here in my head, I knew it. And yet, uh, the next afternoon, I found myself entering a gun shop and purchasing a revolver and a box of bullets, determined that before Harry Arnold could so much as injure one hair of Rory's head, I would kill him. Uh, I should have gone directly to the police first. <laughs> You're using hindsight, Lieutenant. I had all that out with Rory. Please, Judd, please. Go to the police and tell them about this. Let them handle it. Well, tell them what? That by reading his mind, we've learned Harry intends to murder you? They'll believe us. They've got to believe us. Oh, no, no, you're reasoning like a child. They, they, they'll decide that it's either a publicity stunt or else they were both lunatics. Well, if I tell them about the telegram and the birthday presents... But Rory, we have no proof. But we have to do something. What? Tell me what. You know he intends to kill you. I know he intends to kill you. But what can we do? I can't simply put a bullet in his heart next time I see him. How could I explain it? My wife had a premonition that he was going to murder her. <laughs> and you, do you know when he's going to do it? Or how he's going to do it? No. He hasn't decided yet. Isn't there anything we can do? Nothing. Except wait. I reacted to the waiting, as you might expect, Lieutenant. Sleeplessness, loss of appetite, growing irritability. I flared up at everyone. Waiters, chambermaids, elevator boys, the manager of the club. The manager of the club, yes. He finally said to me... Stone, what the devil's gotten into you? I'd really like to know. None of your business. Well, I'm only trying to be nice. Oh, shut up and let me alone. Yeah, sure, I'll let you alone. I'd let you alone right now if your contract didn't have another week to run. But after that, I'll let you strictly alone. You'll never work this club again, maniac. I began to drink quite heavily, quite noticeably. I was going crazy just from the waiting. And then, and then the waiting came to an end. It was around three in the morning. I was sitting up in bed in the dark, smoking, when Rory opened her eyes and said, Judd? Yes, the voice. Yes. He's he's going to kill me here. Right here in this room. Rory. Saturday. This Saturday at midnight. <laughs> I'm John. Oh, Rory, Rory, sweetheart. He's going to shoot me. He has a gun. And he's going to shoot me. He's going to get you. Downstairs in the manager's office at the club. And while you're there, he, he's going to come up here. Oh, Rory, Rory, listen to me. I want you to listen to me. You're mistaken, do you understand? You've been having another bad dream, and that's all there is no, to it. Oh, no, Jet, I swear it. He, he just thought of it. Just this minute. He's standing at a bar, standing there all by himself, drinking. And he, he's just this minute decided. Oh, you're making it up. Yeah, no. Uh, it's, it's the bar over at the Tuscany Hotel. I see it so clear. Oh, you're wrong. You're wrong. I'll prove you're wrong. Dad. Give me the bar at the Tuscany, will you? Over on Sunset. One moment, please. You'll see, Rory. He's not there at all. You'll see. It's just a dream. Just a bad dream. Tuscany Cocktail Lounge. Hello. Is Harry Arnold there at the bar? Harry Arnold? No, I'm sorry, he's not. He's not, huh? You sure of that? Oh, sure, I'm sure. He was here all evening. Left about a minute ago. I said goodnight to him myself. You want me to call? It wasn't a dream. Yes. No, 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 Rory. Don't, 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 don't worry. Trust me. Trust me. When Harry comes tomorrow night, you won't be here at all. But I will. Look, Lieutenant, my hands, see? Just the memory of how I felt at that moment when my hands begin to tremble again. Amazing, isn't it? Well, that was last Thursday night, or rather Friday morning, and towards daybreak, Rory subbed herself to sleep. But I was restless... I got dressed and went downstairs and got into my car. A long drive has always relaxed me, but when I got behind the wheel, I don't know what it was, possibly the fresh air, 
But all at once, I felt as though I couldn't keep my eyes open for another moment. I simply, I simply had to have sleep. So I crawled into the back seat, curled myself up in one corner, pulled the rug over me, and went out like a light. Hello, satin skin. Hello, Harry. I was awakened Don't around noon by the sound the of voices. You may see us. Look businesslike. Where is he? I don't know. Since he hasn't got the car, he must be out walking. Don't you have some papers or something I could be examining just to make it look good in A case... A pocket full here. All right. He fall for it last night? Just like he fell for all the rest of it. Red bathrobe, the plants in the audience. He even phoned the bar just after you left. Timed it beautifully. Oh, satin skin, satin skin. I can hardly keep away from you. After tomorrow night, we'll have all the time in the world for each other, Harry. You bought the whole story, huh? Midnight tomorrow, your place? Every word of it. Just do what you have to do. Remember to come to the dressing room before the 8 o'clock show and tell him you've set up a meeting with Stamper, the manager, in his office at 12. I want them to shake hands and be friends again, I'll tell him. Don't forget, when you come to the door at midnight, keep talking to the elevator boy. Don't let him go, whatever you do. You'll want him to testify it was self-defense. Don't worry, I won't forget a thing. You'll handle all the rest of it? Yeah, yeah, just leave it to me. No, I mean about his gun. That, that's pretty important, you know. Don't worry. It will misfire. It'd be difficult for me to tell you what I felt as they walked away, Lieutenant. One part of me felt the way a man ought to feel, I suppose, when he learns that the woman he loves is not only unfaithful, but plotting his death as well. But another part of me felt only relief. Relief at learning there was a gimmick in this, too. Yeah, they'd been fairly clever for amateurs. Harry had a good excuse for carrying a gun to protect the cash he brought me each Saturday. My own behavior in recent weeks would lend weight to what he would probably offer in his defense, but I must have been crazy. But for no reason at all, I'd pointed a revolver at him and threatened his life, that he had to shoot in self-defense. The presence of the elevator boy. That, that could mean only that Harry would shoot just as soon as I opened the door. I'd be found dead with a revolver in my hand and a heartbroken agent at my side. Tableau. Then I... Then I found myself hoping, as I never hoped before, that they'd come to their senses before Saturday, that they'd realize what a vicious, inhuman thing it was they were planning. But just before the eight o'clock show that night, there was a knock at the door of our dressing room. Come in. Judd, I've been talking to Stamper, the manager. He's sorry this bad blood between you wants to square it. I told him you'd be in his office at 12 to talk things over, all right with you? Yeah. We don't want it so that we never work here again, do we? I mean, there's no reason we should. No reason at all. Button my dress, Judd. See you later, Judd. Yeah, later. We did the show and then went up to our suites. I helped Rory pack a small overnight bag. I loaded the revolver and then there was nothing to do but wait. The minutes passed. Nine o'clock, ten, ten-thirty, and I waited. Judd. Yes? I don't want you to go. It's best that you do. It doesn't seem right to leave you here alone. Uh, things might not go as I planned. I might not be able to stop him. And if I fail to stop him... No, no, it's best that you go. Just wait at the motel until you hear from me. What time is it? Almost 11. Two minutes of 11. I'm out of cigarettes. Yes? This is Mr. Stone in 1101. Please send up a carton of players, will you? Right away, Mr. Stone. I want you to go now, Rory. Judd, let me call the police, please. It will be useless. We've gone into it, and it'll be useless. Then come with me. He won't find anybody here. Well, then he'd choose another place, another time. Here's your valise. You have your gun? In my pocket. You won't take any chances. I don't know what I'd do if you were hurt or anything. I won't take any chances. Uh, let me help you on with your coat. Oh, Judd, I love you so. Yes, I know. And I love you, Rory. I really do, you know. Ready? Yes. Eleven o'clock. He'll be here in an hour. Go now, Rory. Kiss me goodbye. Judd. The cigarettes. Get them, will you, darling, while I find change... Rory. 
Rory. Rory. Rory! I shall always remember the look on Harry's face, Lieutenant, as she sank to the floor. They'd concocted a bad dream between them and it had come true. I'll bet he still doesn't know how it happened, and if you pass his cell, Lieutenant, you might tell him. Whisper the word gimmick into his ear. That's what I said, gimmick. I gimmicked the clock while Rory was dressing. Set it back a full hour. It was 11 to her, but 12 to him. <laughs> I adore gimmicks. Don't you? Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Ronald Coleman. My occult powers do reveal that every driver's automobile has a life both long and bright when it has parts by Autolite. Well, that's fortune telling. There's no doubt about, Swami. You know, Autolite makes over 400 fine products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants from coast to coast. These include complete ignition systems used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars. Generators, coils, distributors, electric windshield wipers, voltage regulators, wire and cables, starting motors, and many more. They're all engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're all part of the Autolite team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next week on Suspense, our star will be Mr. Van Johnson in Strange for a Killer. And in weeks to come, you will hear such famous stars as Miss Joan Crawford, Mr. Jack Carson, and Mr. Jack Benny, all on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. In tonight's play, Kathy Lewis was heard as Aurora and Larry Dobkin as Harry. Others in the cast were Florida Edwards, Joseph Kearns, and Charles Calvert. A Vision of Death was written by Jerry Hausner and adapted for suspense by Walter Newman. Ronald Coleman may be heard each week on his own radio program, The Halls of Ivy. And remember, next week on Suspense, Mr. Van Johnson, as a man who suspects a murderer, is holding as hostages his wife and child. A story we call Strange for a Killer. Buy world famous Autolite Faithful Batteries, Autolite Resistor Type Spark Plugs, or Standard Type Spark Plugs, Autolite Electrical Parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by independent research the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign 
that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Stranger in the House. Helen decided she might as well be honest with herself. The suspense was getting her down. It had been six years since her brother Ted had left for the Orient on that government mission just before Pearl Harbor. And he was still out there, somewhere between Manila and Shanghai, alive or dead. Yes, it had come to the point now where Helen was wishing for any kind of a message, even one telling her Ted was dead. At least it would end the waiting. At least it would be better than not knowing at all. George, please. I don't want to talk about it anymore. He's been on my mind for so long now, I wish I could forget about him for a while. Oh, I'm rather surprised to hear you say that, Helen. Oh, I, I know it sounds terrible, but... George, it's been six years now. Six years of waiting, not knowing. I know, I Helen. can't stand it much longer, George. He's my only brother, don't you understand? Six years of silence. If, if they'd only tell us something... But you must realize there are thousands of women like you, dear. Just one of those terrible things about a war, that's all. Well, let's just wait, then. Let's not talk about him anymore. But I'm your lawyer, Helen. There's some things we've got to talk about. All right. Go on, George. Now, it's been six years. If we haven't heard from him by next year at this time, he'll be declared legally dead. What does that mean? Well, there's a reversion clause in your father's will, Helen. It means if Ted dies before you do, his share of the estate reverts to you. Why must you always throw that will in my face, George? Why must it always come around to money? Every time we talk about Ted, it's the same thing. I don't care about the money. But we... All I care about is having him back, alive and well. Now, please go, George. If it doesn't have to be settled till next year, let's not talk about it till then. All right, Helen. Uh, George. Yes, Helen? I'm sorry I blew up. I, I guess I'm just not myself. Sure, Helen. I understand. <laughs> Yes, Helen, the suspense is beginning to tell on you, isn't it? Six years of it. And just a few letters from Ted's your brother early in 1941, telling you of his arrival in Manila, then silence. No way you could get in touch with him, nothing you could do but wait. And you're still waiting, still rushing out to meet the postman, hoping each day will be the big one. George is more tactful now about the will. He doesn't mention it anymore, and you're very grateful. And then at long last, the suspense is ended. It's not the postman. It's Rhoda, your maid, coming into your bedroom one morning with a cablegram. When did it come, Rhoda? Just this minute, miss. A messenger brought it to the door. Arriving September 1st, Seattle, steamer President Jefferson. Love, Ted. At last. Oh, Miss Helen, your brother. At last. Yes. (gasps) Yes, Rhoda. At last. Pardon me. That's all right. I beg your pardon. Pardon me. Pardon me. Oh, Stuart, Stuart. Uh, yes, miss? I'm looking for Mr. Ted Van Norton. Where is his cabin, Just please? a minute, please. Uh, Van, Van, uh, Van Norton, stateroom 3C, third deck. Thank you. Oh, hello. Oh, I'm sorry. I must have the wrong stateroom. I'm looking for my brother, Ted Van Norton. What's the matter, Helen? Don't you recognize me? Uh, Who are you? Well, this isn't much of a homecoming after six years. Maybe I'd better introduce myself. The name is Theodore Van Norton, remember? Oh, there, there must be some mistake. Why, Helen. Helen, darling, you're joking, aren't you? Who are you? Well, I've already told you I'm your brother, Ted. You're not my brother. You're... You're an imposter. With the prologue of Stranger in the House, the Signal Oil Company brings you another curious tale by The Whistler. This Labor Day weekend, was part of your driving fun spoiled by the way other cars left you behind on the getaway or climbed ahead of you on hills? Well, don't give up. Cheer up. There's probably lots of pep and performance left in your motor that you're not getting out of it. 
That's why tonight, for the benefit of you drivers who may not yet have tried Signal's great new gasoline, I want to pass along the good news about this new super fuel that's engineered especially to put the fun back into driving. You see, science actually rearranged the atoms in gasoline molecules to put amazing power into new signal gasoline. Power that gives you quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti-knock. Ah, but even that's only half the story. For in new signal, there's an extra bonus of extra mileage. Well, after all, it stands to reason that some power that helps your motor perform so much more efficiently also helps you go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. And that's why Signal says, look to your speedometer for the best proof of gasoline quality. It takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. All you can do is stand there in the stateroom and stare at him. The effrontery of this stranger trying to pass himself off as your brother leaves you at a loss for something to say. He doesn't remotely resemble Ted. He's tall with a clean-cut athletic look to him. Ted was short and stocky. Perhaps he thinks it's funny, Helen. Perhaps he's one of those people with a perverted sense of humor, a practical joker. Yes, it's hilarious, isn't it? To pull a trick like this after six years of almost unbearable suspense. Well, uh, Lily, have we better get a move on? Are you stupid enough to think you can get away with this? Uh, get away with what? If this is some crude attempt at humor. Not at all. I'm quite serious. Where's my brother? Now, look, do you have to be that way? I explain why. Don't lie to me. Where is he? Uh, excuse me a moment. Oh, Stuart. Yes, Mr. Van Orton? Would you take care of my hand baggage, please? Yes, sir, right away. Thanks. Come on, Helen, let's go down to the dock. I'll call the purser. I'll have Wait you... a minute. Now, look. Here's the passport with fingerprints and photograph. Birth certificate, State Department credentials. Letters from you. They're forgeries. I'm sorry. They're genuine. You, you're not going home with me. I won't stand for it. Very well, darling. I'll check in at a hotel for the time being. But after all, you can't keep a guy out of his own home now, can you? I've never been so stunned in my life. He just stood there, smiling at me, saying over and over that he was Ted. You say he had identification, huh? Oh, everything, everything, even letters from me. I wrote them when Ted first arrived in Manila. Genuine? I think so. Well, they must be. He'd know better than to try to get by with forgeries. Helen, you're sure you're right. George, you don't think I know my own brother? Well, it's been six years. He's probably been in a prison camp. You make a lot of difference in a man's appearance. But Ted's dead. Huh? Or he would have written. Something terrible's happened, I'm sure of it. This man might have killed him. Yes, that's it. So he could get his hand on Ted's half of the estate. Oh, that's a pretty serious charge, Helen. Have to be sure of yourself. Remember, you're the only one in Seattle who can recognize him now. He left here over 15 years ago. Uh, do you have any pictures? No, I thought of that. No, no, there aren't any. Not since he was a little boy. He spent most of his time in the East with Aunt Ida. Oh? Huh? Where is she? She died some time ago. Well, there are a lot of ways we can check on him. State Department ought to know about him. He's been with them for over ten years. Uh, you say he's stopping at a hotel? Yes. You know, of course, Helen, that if he can prove his identity, he has a legal right to live here in this house. I tell you, he's a flagrant imposter. He's not coming here. If I have to hire someone to throw him out. <laughs> Is it? It's Rhoda, miss. What time is it? After eight. Oh, go away. I'm sleepy. I must see you, miss. All right, Rhoda. Come in. What is it? It's it's Mr. Van Norton. What? Where is he? He's in the bathroom, miss. Shaving. <laughs> Oh, all the unmitigated. Just wait. The nerve of him. Oh, I 
know. Well, good morning, good morning. What do you think you're doing? Hmm? Shaving. <laughs> morning ablutions. I, I can't say I'm used to having ladies barge into the bathroom when I... Get out of here! Uh, 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 uh. Temper, temper. How did you get in? Well, I couldn't get a room at a hotel, so... I took a taxi up last night, walked in the back door. It was open, you see. Well, you can leave the same way you came in. Uh, no, no, I'm here to stay, sister dear. I've got the proof in my pocket. And if you want to get me out, you can trot right down to the Hall of Justice and get yourself a court order. More coffee, Helen? No, thanks. Hotcakes, huh? Mr. Whoever You Are. Uh, the name is Van Norton. Theodore Van Norton. I must say, I've never seen such colossal nerve in my life. You flatter me. You're not at all concerned about the servants. Why, should I be? Aren't you afraid they'll recognize you? Oh, don't be silly. None of them were here when I left home. Fifteen years ago, Edward the butler was the last to go, I think. When was it? Thirty-eight, that was it, wasn't it? Oh, by the way, Helen, whatever became of old Edward? There are other people in town, you know. What about your teachers at Washington Heights School? Why, Helen, you know, I believe you're trying to trick me. <laughs> you know, Father sent me to Fox Hall Academy when I was 14. I never went to Washington Heights. Where are you going? You seem to know everything. Why don't you tell me that? Uh, Helen, we have some talking to do, darling, about the will. Father's estate, you know. Seems to me the executor owes me close to a million dollars. You knew it was coming, didn't you, Helen? That's the purpose behind the whole crazy business. It's still inconceivable to you that the man can actually expect to get away with it. And George was right. There are a thousand ways you can check up on him. And the imposter himself just gave you an excellent one. You make a long-distance call to the Foxhall Academy and talk to Mr. Rigby, the headmaster. Why, yes, of course, Miss Van Norton. I'd be delighted to come down tomorrow afternoon. Ted was always one of my favorites, you know. Any special time? What about two o'clock? Fine, fine. It'll be quite a reunion, won't it? Yes, indeed, Mr. Rigby. Quite a reunion. Mr. Rigby, this is George Chadwick, my lawyer. How do you do? Hi. Would you like to wait in the living room, Mr. Rigby? I think Ted is out on the tennis court. We'll call him. Thank you. Come on, George. Excuse us, Mr. Rigby. Of course. Do you still think I don't know my own brother? I never said that, Helen. I only said six years can make a lot of a difference. Oh, I'm afraid Mr. What's-His-Name is going to suffer a little embarrassment. You think Rigby will recognize him? Of course. He'll recognize him as an imposter. He knows Ted as well as I do. Hmm. What's the matter? I don't know. I checked those documents of his this morning and... Will you stop talking nonsense, George? I tell you, they're stolen. Heaven knows what happened to Ted or how this crook got a hold of his papers. All right, Ellen, all right. You better go and call him. Hello, sis. What's up? I was sorry to interrupt your tennis game. Ted. Oh, oh, it's Ted now, huh? Why, of course. I could have been mistaken, you know. Well, I can't say I expected this. I'd be a little foolish not to admit it when I'm wrong, wouldn't I? Come on, dear. Uh, where to? Just to the living room. You can go back to your tennis in a moment. Oh, there you are, George. Hello, Ted. Oh, hello, George. What's going on around here? We're going into the living room, George. Perhaps you'd like to join us. Oh, of course. Well, open the door, George. Huh? Oh, sorry. Hey, what is all this? I don't... Rigby! Ted! Teddy, old boy, how have you been? What, you old <laughs> son of a gun? <laughs> hey, what, what, what is this, Helen? A surprise? Why don't you tip a guy off when his old headmaster comes to see him? Oh, you're looking fine, Teddy. Yeah? Good Lord, it's been 15 years. Oh, sure. <laughs> Last time I saw you was after the Washburn game, remember? Yeah, yeah, that was it at Spokane. <laughs> Stinky was there, too. Say, do you remember when the bus broke down that night outside of Wenatchee? And you and I had a hit. 
You stand there stunned, speechless, just staring at them as they slap each other on the back, forgetting all about you. And George avoids looking at you. He's on their side now. You're sure of it. And worst of all, it's beginning to get you, too. He's not your brother. You know it. You're positive. It's ridiculous to go through all this rigmarole, but it seems to be your word against his proof, doesn't it? But there are still other ways, aren't there? Like another long-distance call. This time to the State Department in Washington, D.C. After being transferred to four or five different offices, you finally get through to the right man. That you check this matter thoroughly. I'm positive that the man representing himself as my brother is an imposter. You say you were with Mr. Van Norton when he filed his original application here in 1936? Yes, I saw him attach his photograph and fix his fingerprints. I simply want to see that application. I'll forward the file to our Seattle representative, and you can check it there. That'd be satisfactory? Quite satisfactory. Thank you. Hmm, I see. You say the file was forwarded here from Washington. That's right. I simply want to examine it, particularly the photograph. Mm-hmm. Excuse me a moment, Miss Van Norton. I'll have to look it up. Well, George? Well, what? I can't say I'm pleased with your lack of confidence in me. Well, who said anything about that? Oh, it's quite clear enough. Helen, I'm a lawyer. I'll believe black is white if they throw enough evidence at me. Mr. Rigby was a very convincing witness. He's a decrepit old fool, and it had been 15 years. I thought he was an intelligent man. I could have passed you off as my brother. He'd forgotten what Ted looks like. And does that explain why Ted recognized him? Oh. I don't know, Helen. Seems to me you're arguing against yourself when you say Rigby might have forgotten what he looks like. What do you mean? You might have forgotten yourself. After all, it's been six years, you know. A man can change. Don't be ridiculous. I know my own brother as well as I know the... Shh. Here comes the clerk. Here we are. Theodore H. Van Norton. Now, what did you wish to see? Oh, let me see it. Medical examination, education record, application. Where's the picture? On the other side. Oh, uh, Here. Satisfied, Helen? It, it can't be. I saw Ted paste his picture on myself. Something wrong? Of course there's something wrong. This isn't my brother. It's, it's that man. Helen, get a hold of yourself. What? Let me see. Yes, here they are. Fingerprints. Listen. Listen, clerk. I want this whole record sent to the office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Helen, you need a rest. Things getting it. That's one thing. They can't be forged, don't you see? They can't forge his fingerprints. I'm sorry, Miss Van Norden, but I have no authority. You've got to. I tell you, there's a stranger in my house posing as my brother. There's a million dollars involved. Just a minute, Helen. Now, it's most important, Mr. Robbins, not only because of the money involved. You see, Miss Van Norden is extremely upset. Of course, Mr. Chadwick. But you see, I can't simply turn over material like this. I'll make the necessary arrangements with the FBI, Mr. Robbins, and get authority from Washington. That be satisfactory? Quite, Mr. Chadwick. Quite. Hello, Ted. Oh, hello, Helen. I began to wonder where you were all afternoon. Oh, downtown shopping. Oh, the stores are frightful these days. Yeah, indeed they are. Reading? Yeah. How's Dick Tracy? I don't know. I haven't checked him today. Funny. You used to read Dick Tracy before you even looked at the headlines. I, I guess a guy gets a little serious after six years overseas. In a prison camp most of the time. Yes. I suppose so. Ah, you're looking calmer today. Did you finally decide I'm kosher? I... I want you to forgive me, Ted. It's... It's so unbelievable that I don't quite trust my senses anymore. Sure. Sure, you're a good kid, Helen. I don't blame you. Will you drink on it? Why not? What'll it be? Bourbon and soda? Oh, you're a man after my own heart. You know, I'm kind of surprised. I thought you'd be a tougher nut to crack. Oh, you expected me to be suspicious. Well, after that episode on the boat, I expected anything. Oh. Here you are. Thanks. What do we drink to? To us, of course. All right. To us. Yeah, 
Yes, ma'am. You're in charge of the fingerprinting department here? Yes. I'm Helen Van Norton. I brought in a highball glass yesterday afternoon with some fingerprints on it. Oh, yes. That's the one you wanted us to check against the prints in the State Department application file. Uh, where did you get that glass? A man is posing as my brother, staying at my house. They're his fingerprints. You're sure of the prints on the application? What do you mean? Are you sure they're the bona fide prints of your brother? Of course. I was with him in Washington when he completed the application. I saw him put the prints on it. I see. Well, that ought to settle it for you once and for all. What do you mean? The man at your house is your brother, Miss Van Norton. The prints are identical. I... can't be here. It can't... We wouldn't commit ourselves if we weren't positive. I... I see. Yes, of course. Thank you. Well, Helen, that settles it, doesn't it? You're beaten and you know it. But you still have one more out, just one. It's a desperate chance, but you've decided you have to take it. To determine once and for all whether or not this man is your brother. Whether you can trust your own mind. It's very late that night when you get quietly out of bed and walk downstairs to the telephone. The house is as quiet as a tomb. Everyone's asleep. I want to call Honolulu operator, Mr. Amato Tsubishi, 28 Kalua Drive, Honolulu. Will you wait? Yes, I'll wait. your party. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. Is this Mr. Subishi? Who is calling, please? I last talked to you in April, 1941. The name I gave you was Grayson. Do you remember that? Why are you calling? Do you remember me? Of course I remember you. I sent you $50,000 to... To take care of Mr. Van Norton. Uh, He was in Manila. You did take care of him. He's dead. He was killed in an accident in May of 1941. You're positive. Positive? Thank you, Mr. Subishi. Thank you very much. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Hear that? If you're a driver, that's a signal you should know. The trainman's warning signal that engineers start to blow a quarter mile before a crossing. And another signal it'll pay you to recognize is the big circle sign with yellow letters on a black background spelling out the word signal gasoline. The sign that identifies friendly dealer-owned signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. Wherever you see that sign, there you'll find not only top-quality signal products, but also more thorough, more conscientious service because your signal dealer being in business for himself naturally has more incentive to do those little extra things that will keep your car and you happy. Well, add it up, that's just about today's best recipe for longer car life. No wonder Signal Oil Company has grown so from a mere handful of stations in Southern California to an organization now serving seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And no wonder more and more wise drivers are letting Signal's yellow and black circle sign be their signal for the surer protection cars need today to help them run better and last longer. And now back to the Whistler. It was a relief to know, wasn't it, Helen? You can trust your own senses now. Ted is dead, and the stranger in the house is an imposter. Somehow, some way, you can prove it. And the $50,000 you paid Mr. Subishi back in the spring of 1941 is still a good investment. Because Ted's million dollars, half of the estate will be yours. All of it. You don't want to think about it anymore. It's been too bewildering. All you want now is your bed and the first good night's sleep in a week. You put down the phone and start toward the stairs. Sit down, Helen. How long have you been here? Long enough. 
I said sit down. I'm going upstairs. Sit down before you fall down. That's better. You just hung yourself, baby. There's a record of that phone conversation down at FBI headquarters. What are you talking about? You didn't have Honolulu, just in case you're wondering. You were talking to the boys down at the office. We had everything, you see, except the link you just gave us. We knew Subishi paid $40,000 to one of his boys in Manila. The guy who killed your brother. But we didn't know who hired Subishi. What made you suspect me? I didn't at first. I knew Ted had a sister. I knew there were a couple of million bucks in it somewhere. And I had three and a half years in a prison camp to think it over. A guy can do a lot of deductive thinking in three and a half years. So, you looked up Subishi? Yeah. He was dead. Knocked over by a truck the morning of Pearl Harbor. No, we had nothing but suspicion. Tough, isn't it, huh? You could have been a nice kid if you weren't a killer at heart. Yeah, it took us a long time to work it out. A lot of planning, a lot of names, a lot of people to run down. But when we got going, we knew you'd crack sooner or later. Who are you? Your brother's best friend. And, and you did it because you were his friend? Partly. Partly? Yeah. My name is McKay, FBI. And incidentally, this time I'm telling you the truth. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's program were Virginia Gregg and Gerald Moore. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton and Mark Smith, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. William Powell in tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, a story based on fact. The true report of a chase through a city in an effort to find a killer. It's called The Barking Death. Our star, Mr. William Powell. This is Harlow Wilcox. Say, uh, could your church use as much as $50,000? Well, you can help your church, hospital, school, or any other recognized local or national charity share in a total of $100,000 by registering now in the Autolite Family Charity Drawing. A total of $100,000 in cash awards to the recognized charities selected by the 25 persons named in this drawing. Now... It is our privilege to have you hear what the head of one of America's finest organizations says about this great event. Here is Mr. William Ziegler, president of the American Foundation for the Blind. This unique and generous Autolite offer deserves your attention. And when it comes to picking your favorite charitable group, remember that the American Foundation for the Blind needs your help to help our sightless people of all ages. To enter the Autolite Family Charity Drawing, print your name and address on a registration form at any of these Autolite Family car showrooms. D. 
DeSoto, Hudson, Plymouth, Studebaker, Dodge, Willis, Nash, Packard, Kaiser, or Chrysler. There's no obligation. And now, Autolite presents The Barking Death, starring Mr. William Powell, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. It's over now, and the town has settled down. Most of what happened I know, because I was a part of it. The rest I must imagine for you. Our town is not very large. 25,000 people, last census. Good town, proud of its police and fire protection, proud of its city administration and its health center. Then a thing happened to it. Terrifying thing. And this is the way it began. Right in here, Doctor. Massive bite. Here. Cheek. Mm -hmm. How long ago? Ten days ago. Medicated it himself. A few hours ago, his wife called me. Mm, she wouldn't speak to me when I came in, Doctor. Upset. Yeah. Well, Mr. Garrison here has been a patient of mine for a long time. Whole family. Well, she called me and said her husband was complaining of headaches. Then had a spasm when he tried to drink a glass of water. And a certain excitability. I didn't know about the dog bite until I came over. What do you think? Where's the dog? That one you hear out in the backyard. He's on a leash attached to a clothesline. Yeah, I'll get him down to the lab and run a saliva test. Observe him. What about Garrison here? Past your treatment? You need me to say it for you, Doctor? If this man's got rabies, it's too late for anything at all. The dog was a mongrel, mostly beagle, spotted black and white, both ears and its muzzle white. A man from the Animal Society was called in, and he took the dog to the health center. It was shortly after midnight. Mr. Garrison was kept under sedation, his symptoms being very painful. I got to the center about 8.30 the next morning and went immediately to the laboratory where the dog had been quartered. Yeah, yeah I got the list right here, Lieutenant. Three microscopes. That's right, Lieutenant, three microscopes, binocular. Uh, dissecting instruments, so must have taken a couple of fistfuls of them. I don't know exactly what, scalpels, probes. I guess that's about all. Hey, what's the matter? Oh, hi, Paul. Uh, hold it a minute, Lieutenant. Dr. Miller just came in. Robbery here last night, Paul. Got three microscopes. Yes, I heard you. Must have picked the lock. I found a piece of tin on the sidewalk when I came in. Well, you finish up with the police, then you can tell me about it. Hello, Lieutenant. Yeah, you, you got that? Well, the way I figure, it couldn't have been just one man. Those microscopes are pretty heavy, so there must have been a couple of them. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll leave everything alone. Joe? Uh, hold a minute, Lieutenant. Uh, yeah, what, Paul? The dog. Huh? In that cage. The lock's been sprung in that cage. Did you... Why, well, I, I don't know anything about it. Now give me that phone. Hello? Yes? Uh, this is Dr. Miller. Yes, sir? Something's important. Uh, Something... Dr. Kramer's just gave me a list of things that were stolen. Listen, there was a dog here, a rabid dog, and he's gone. What? A dog, a black and white spotted mongrel. And chances are a thousand to one he had rabies. And whoever stole those microscopes stole that dog. If that dog bites, well, rabies is 100% fatal. I guess you'd better let me have that description, Doc. Black and white spots. Mostly beagle, I think. <laughs> Where'd you get them crazy black and white spots, doggy? <laughs> Doggy, doggy, pooch, he's more hamburger, doggy. <laughs> Look at him. Look at him, Harry. Cliff. <laughs> nice, doggy. What'd you take the dog for, Cliff? Pretty doggy. Merchandise ain't enough for you, Cliff. Microscopes, all that junk, you gotta take that thing I down. like pooches, Harry. Now leave me alone. I like pooches. That dog's got to go. Oh. Got to go. Now listen. Out, out with that dog, Cliff. I ain't gonna live in the same room with no animal. Now I... wait a minute, Harry. So you like the dog. Well, both of you, good day. Cliff Scott... You and the pooch. Mm -hmm. Doggy. Doggy, you're not liked. 
Got to lose you, doggy. Now. Poochie, little poochie, we, we got to go for a little walk, poochie. And a petty thief took a walk with a dog, holding him in his arms against the chill autumn air. Took a walk while the town alerted itself, made aware of a danger, had leaders and interested people who came together and were briefed. <laughs> now, everyone, find a chair and sit down, please. Dr. Miller. Yes? My name is Mrs. Stone, and I... Mrs. Stone, there'll be ample opportunity to... I've written to... down a question, a question here, and I'd like to ask you. Is it the habit of this foundation to house a mad dog? The second part of my question is, who is responsible for the laxity in letting this dog escape so that he is a menace to the community and its people? That's my question, Dr. Miller. And as a housewife and a woman who, well, I would like to hear what you have to say. Now, Mrs. Stone, this meeting was called for the press and any interested parties just to answer that kind of question. The dog was under observation to make certain he was rabid. But the fact remains... What fact remains? Somebody was incompetent. That's all I have to say. Dr. Miller. Mr. Collins. My paper is questioning your methods. What about? All this publicity. A newspaper man and you... The duty to the community. What about panic? What about it? Well, scaring people about an animal on the loose, an animal that might kill you, People from the health department ringing doorbells, police, people up in the hills with guns hunting for a dog, a spotted black and white dog. A little ridiculous, huh? Is it? That's the question I asked you, Doctor. Yes, you did. Dr. Kramos. Yes, Doctor? Are you ready with the film? All ready. Will one of you people switch off that light, please? <laughs> Now, in this projector is just a few feet of film of a child suffering from rabies. I think all of you should see it. Okay, Doctor. All right. Now, will someone turn on the lights again, please? Uh, and I see Mrs. Stone walked out. Well, I didn't show that film to scare anyone. Just so we can get into a frame of mind. Just so we can be deadly serious. Somewhere in our town is an animal which has a deadly disease. And whoever he bites, if that person does not receive immediate treatment, that person will surely die. You mean anybody who gets rabies? Will surely die. Without treatment, it's 100% fatal. Now, Dr. Kramas, can I have that chart? Of course, Doctor. <laughs> Drawing a human nervous system. To make a simple point, the virus of rabies attacks the nerves, travels them till it reaches the brain. The closer to the brain the bite is, the less time it takes for the awful symptoms you just saw to appear then death. And I repeat it. Once the virus reaches here, it is 100% fatal. Uh, want a doggy, sonny? Huh? Free little doggy. You can have him. Honest? Just you be nice to him, that's all. My mother wouldn't let me have him. Oh, pretty little poochie. Feed him. Feed him right back here between his floppy little ears. I could keep him in the garage, though, and not tell Mom. Yeah, just so you be good to him. Now, that's he... my house right over there. Right in back's a garage, and nobody hardly goes in there. We use it for storage mostly, and Mommy wouldn't know I had him. Now, he likes meat and bones. I know about and... doggies. Need something warm. Uh, put a cushion down. Yes, sir. Well, handle him nice. What's his name? Uh, Pooch. Ah, uh, what kind of Look, name? Look, you want him or don't you want him? Come here, doggy. Come here, pretty doggy.
The boy, whose name was Peter Barrett, took the dog in his arms and walked away with it. And a half mile away, a jeep, outfitted as a sound truck, blared a warning. The three men's clubs of the town held an emergency meeting together. Searching parties were organized. The civil defense system was alerted. And a man, a health officer, directed all of it. A man who became tired. Paul? Yeah? Some coffee. Oh, thanks. I got it black. Yeah, 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 yeah. Put it down. Now who should take it easy? What do you want, Joe? Just take it easy. Sixteen hours. Well, Nothing. probably... No, I'll get it. Dr. Miller's office. This is Dr. Kremar speaking. Oh, yes. Oh. Oh, that's too bad. Yes, of course, I'll tell him. Well? Tell me what? Mr. Garrison died, rabies. They'll send some samples over to pathology for Negri bodies, but there's no question about it. Now we're sure of it. Rabies. Yeah, now we're sure of it. And the dog hasn't been found. And somebody's going to irritate that dog, and he'll bite. And the rabid dog is very easy to irritate. <laughs> Doggy. Hi, sweet doggy. Brought you a bone, doggy, and some milk. Gee, you look funny, Poochie. What's the matter? Oh, come here and snuggle up. Is that better? Autolite is bringing you Mr. William Powell in The Barking Death, tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. This is Harlow Wilcox. Tonight we are privileged to salute the Studebaker Corporation as a distinguished member of our Autolite family. So uh, I've got a date at my Studebaker dealers, and here I am. Hello, Mr. Wilcox. Hi. Say, what's this model? A car of the future? Well, it's a car of the future, all right, but you can buy one today. It's the new Studebaker for 54. You know, Mr. Wilcox, while other makers are talking about their dream cars... Studebaker is building and selling them. But, of course, the pace-setting Studebaker styling means more than just beauty. It eliminates needless dead weight and excess bulk. Now, that means terrific gas mileage and superb handling ease. Well, uh, can you get power steering on the new Studebaker? You sure can, and overdrive, too, if you wish. And, of course, our new Studebakers use many Autolite products, too. Well, thanks, Mr. Dealer. Autolite is proud of its long association with Studebaker and you Studebaker dealers everywhere. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. William Powell in Elliot Lewis's production of The Barking Death, a story based on fact and well calculated to keep you in suspense. A child of the town nuzzling his cheek against death. Something he was hiding away. Child's secret. As every child has, and is entitled to a secret. And in another place of the town, the place of test tubes and experiment and statistics, the town's health center. And my office. Uh, hello. Yes? Uh, Dr. Miller? Yes, what can I do for you? Uh, I'm Mrs. Rokey. You sit down? All those advertisements about a dog. Yes? On the radio and the newspapers. Yes? And... You, you, you know where... Oh, yes. You know where it is? Is that what you're saying? Oh, but first you must understand something, Dr. Miller. What? That I alone am responsible for catching the animal. You caught him? I certainly knew the risk I was taking. I... Wh where is he, Mrs. Rokey? 
Well, now, after all, if that animal's as dangerous as you say he is, I did a pretty brave oh, thing. Oh, there you are, Mrs. Rokey. Come on, let's leave Dr. Miller alone. Oh, you think you're smart. What's all this? She came up the back way. You, uh, just take your hand come away. Come on, come on. So what is all this, Joe? Uh, Mrs. Rokey got past the police, she got past the information desk, and she got to me, and she told me she caught a black and white spotted dog. She's got one on. I have. Yes, you have, Mrs. Rokey. In my car. Yes, you have, Mrs. Rokey. Then you go right down there and destroy him. We don't destroy animals, Mrs. Rokey. Never. Dr. Miller. Yes? Now, you listen here. I caught a mad dog, and She's I got expect... a little chihuahua down there, not the dog we're looking for. Mrs. Rokey wants her picture in the paper, don't you, Mrs. Rokey? <gasps> you don't really know what's going on right now, do you? Now, come on. Let's get out of here. Oh, all that bother about a dog. Oh, probably no such thing as rabies, anyhow. Come on. Uh, Mrs. Rokey. Mrs. Rokey, pray that that animal doesn't bite anyone. Ow! What did you do that for? Why did you bite me? Why did you bite my arm for, Fuji? <laughs> <laughs> Mama! Mama! <laughs> Mama! 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 Which happened in a white clabbered house. 1647 Whittier Avenue, garage detached near the railroad yards. And down Main Street, close to its east end, where there's more grass, the group of municipal buildings. The office of the lieutenant of police. From my point of view, Dr. Miller, police point of view. Now, which is that? What we seem to have forgotten. Two microscopes were stolen and various instruments. The disposal of same. That's my point of view, Doctor. Procedure. You care to tell me about it? Yeah, we're looking for the wrong thing. What do you mean? It's easier to find microscopes than a dog. Anyhow, I told you, procedure, routine. We've questioned men with known records, alerted... Oh, excuse me. Lieutenant Stevens speaking. Oh, where? Well, good. Bring him down here. I said routine, Doctor, and you didn't seem impressed. Suitably so, Lieutenant. Listen, there's only one thing that could make me jump up on this desk and shout array and go through all the antics you... Oh, now, just, just take it easy. It's not a time to get cryptic, that's all. Oh, thanks, Sergeant. That'll be all. Sit down. <clears throat> What's your name? Wood. Harry Wood. Vagrancy. Started out like that, sir. Yeah, that's what the sergeant told me over the phone. He said you yelled you weren't a vagrant, and they took you home to find out. And they found a microscope. Then he's the... I said routine, Doctor, and you didn't seem impressed. Spotting a vagrant is routine. Is it all right if I... Sure, do... sure, go ahead. Uh, you stole the microscope from the health center, didn't you? Yes, sir. Three microscopes and instruments and the dog. Yes, sir. Where's the dog? I don't know. Now, listen, you. What did you do with that dog? I said I didn't know. Cliff took the dog. What's he talking about, Lieutenant? Cliff, uh, the other man... There was more than one, remember? And he took the dog. And I made him get rid of it. How? I didn't ask him how he got rid of it. He got rid of it. Well, where is he? Where is this Cliff? Lieutenant, ask him where... Now, now, look. The sergeant said he went back to this man's room. No one was there. Or the two other microscopes. Or the instruments. I don't know where he went. I'm going to say it to you again, doctor. Routine. Mostly that pays off more than anything else. Now it's a matter of finding a man named Cliff. And 12 blocks away, across Main Street and down two blocks, there was a store. And there was a man in the store he had owned for the last 20 years. Smallish man, nothing extraordinary. Citizen of the town. About to become a hero. Yes, sir? Uh, Hold it. Listen to microscopes. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I see. How much? And two microscopes. I'm throwing over my entire practice and getting rid of everything. And I'll tell you something. Oh? 
Give me a good price on these two, and I got another one. Doctor. Huh? I said doctor. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Uh, Mr. Harding, our instrument man, is in the back. He should see these. It, well, you understand. Oh, sure, sure, sure. You're just the violin and suit man, and Mr. Harding's... The instrument man. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, wait here. I'll, I'll be right back. Uh, well, you just tell Mr. Harding the doc's in a big hurry. Quickly, the police. H Hello? This is Carl Roberts on 3rd Street, pawn shop. A man just came in, a little bit drunk, came in with two binocular microscopes, both of them Bosch and Rome. Says he has another one, claims he's a doctor, but... Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, just a second. Uh, serial number. Uh, G1135... Wait, no, Mr. Harding. Talk to the phone. Give me those. Now, sir. Get out of the way and give me those microscopes. You're a dirty little thief. That's what you are, breaking into the health center and stealing. And that's where these microscopes come from. Get out of my way. that animal you stole, that dog, the whole town is looking for. I said get out of my way. Oh, no, you do. Okay, you ask for it. Help. Stop him! Stop that man! Stop him! The man who owned the pawn shop had been in business for the last 20 years. A smallish man, nothing extraordinary, citizen of the town, who became a hero. Who caught a thief named Cliff Loomis. And Loomis confessed to his thefts. And a little later, I had a chance to speak with Loomis. Uh, about a dog. Look, I've been on a tooth. A I... dog with black and white spots and white muzzle. What do you want from me? You got your junk back? What's so important about a lousy dog? Look, the police have been to your room and he's not there. I asked you a question. What's so important about a lousy... Did he bite you? You crazy. Did he? Bones he bit. Me, he wagged his tail for a very nice dog. I want to show you something. Ah? Uh? Here, look at them. Go on, take them, Cliff. Pictures? Go on. Go on. Doc. Yes? You must be crazy carrying around pictures like these. Pictures of people dying, Cliff. That's what I mean, pictures like these. People bitten by a rabid animal. What does that mean? Like that dog you stole. What? It had rabies. Bit somebody, they'd... Unless they were treated in time. Nurk. Yep. I gave the dog to a little boy. Where? Where, Cliff? Doc. Where? I don't know. Listen, Cliff. No, no, I'm not kidding, Doc. I don't know. I told you I've been looped. This is the jolt that makes me all of a sudden not looped. And I'm telling you, too, I don't know where the kid is. Yeah? Doc, Doc, it was, it was now, it was somewhere near where our room was. I remember Harry said, get rid of the poots all. I went downstairs, and the first kid I met, I, it's, it's, it's hazy, Doc. Listen, we'll take a ride, Cliff. Uh, police, too? Afraid so. We're going to take a ride, and we're going to try to find that boy. Ring a lot of doorbells and ask a lot of questions. And find him, Right. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Tinker Doll. I didn't see you. I didn't mean to kick you. And now don't you cry. My mom isn't home, and I won't know what to do if you cry. I know. I'll play a tune. Better? <laughs> I got hurt, too. It doesn't hurt so much anymore. Poochie didn't mean to bite me. Should we play records, Tinker Doll? All right. Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son, Tom, went to 
bed with his stockings on. One shoe off and one shoe on. Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son, John. Hello? Hello. My mother isn't home, mister. Why are you holding your arm like that? It hurts a little. Why? Poochie bit me. Then he told me where the dog was. The dog with the black and white spots. The deadly animal who had bitten no one else. We had gotten there in time. The boy was treated and got better in a town that slept well that night. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. William Powell. This is Harlow Wilcox again. Have you signed up in the $100,000 Autolite family charity drawing? Well, if you're 18 or over, visit one of the following car dealers. DeSoto, Hudson, Plymouth, Studebaker, Dodge, Willis, Nash, Packard, Kaiser, or Chrysler. Just print your name and address on a registration form and have the dealer sign it. You don't have to own one of these cars. You don't have to solve or buy or write anything. So help your local church, hospital, the American Foundation for the Blind, or any other local or national recognized charity share in this huge sum. Remember, if you are one of the top 25 names in this drawing, the recognized charity of your choice can receive a big part of $100,000. So visit any of these Autolite family car showrooms. DeSoto, Hudson, Plymouth, Studebaker, Dodge, Willis, Nash, Packard, Kaiser, or Chrysler. Make sure to sign up tomorrow. Next week, the story of a man who wanted to apologize for threatening a stranger. And when he got there, the stranger was dead and the police were waiting. It's called Circumstantial Terror. Our star, Mr. Ronald Reagan. That's next week on... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Barking Death was written for Suspense by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Featured in the cast were Junius Matthews, Dick Beals, Ted Bliss, Joseph Kearns, Jack Crucian, Gene Wood, Paula Winslow, and High Everback. This is the CBS Radio Network. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to keep that weekly date with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Ah, uh, come in, Mr. Bell. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, my boy. How are you feeling after your Christmas holiday? Remarkably well, thank you, Mr. Bell, considering how extremely hospitable my friends have been. <laughs> Just a twinge or two of gout to remind me that an old man should treat tawny port with the respect that it deserves. I know <laughs> just what you mean, Dr. Watson. Well, draw up your usual chair, my boy, and settle yourself down. Yeah. That's it. All ready with tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dr. Watson? Yes, Mr. Bell. And when I was going over my notes on the case just before you arrived, I came across this white feather. It played a prominent part in tonight's adventure. A white feather? That signifies cowardice, doesn't it? Yes, it can, it can, Mr. Bell, it can. But this is a very special feather. It was plucked from a white cockerel, and it helped Sherlock Holmes to foil one of the most diabolical plots that we ever encountered. But first, don't you want to have your 
Our usual word with our listeners. Thank you, Dr. Watson. <laughs> Men, if you want to stand out in the crowd, remember, well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. And I'm sure you'll want to know why so many of America's most prosperous and successful men use Kreml hair tonic. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. It keeps hair neatly in place longer, too. Yet Kreml never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. Just make this test, men. After you apply Kreml, rub your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or on your hat band. Kreml always gives your hair such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. At the end of the day, your hair looks just as neatly groomed as when you combed it in the morning. Buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the story of the white cockerel? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure took place after Sherlock Holmes had given up his regular practice and retired to his bee farm on the Sussex Downs. I was staying with him there for a few weeks' holiday, and I remember coming down to breakfast one morning to find my old friend, his pipe clenched between his teeth, squatting on a stool, examining the contents of a large metal box at his feet. As he threw back the lid, I could see that the box was half full of papers, papers tied up with red tape in separate packages. After sorting through them for, for a few moments, he turned to me and said... A box of secrets, my dear Watson. A box of deep, dark secrets. Are they the records of your early cases, Holmes? Yes, my boy. These were all done before my biographer had come to glorify me. I've often wished that I had the notes on them. So that you might transmute my little adventures into those rather florid stories of yours? My stories aren't florid. They're factual accounts of what happened. Oh, don't be hurt, my dear oh, fellow. It's florid much too early in the day. Well, Watson, perhaps someday the world will hear of these cases. They're not all successes, but there are some pretty little problems among them. I'm sure there are. For example, here's the record of the Tarleton murders. And here's the case of Bambury, the wine merchant. What happened to him? He died, Watson, under peculiarly horrible circumstances. Oh, really? That case was one of my failures, I'm afraid. Aha! This adventure was really a little recherché. It's a full account of Ricoletti of the club foot and his abominable wife. Yes, yes, I, I vaguely remember her dreadful woman. Ghosts from the past, Watson. Ghosts to remind me that my heyday's long oh, past. <laughs> rubbish. I'm quite sure that if a case were to present itself at this moment, you'd be totally unable to resist it. You're wrong, old chap. Look at this note. Derived just before you came downstairs. Mr. Manderby, the local squire, apparently needs my help. And yet, I assure you, I'm not in the least tempted to give it to him. Oh, may I see it? Certainly. Yeah. Let's have a look. Dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I need your help desperately. Have the goodness to call on me as soon as convenience permits. The continued theft of chickens may appear to be a small matter. <laughs> chickens, good gracious me. But I assure you that there are sinister forces at work. <laughs> Asking you to catch a chicken thief. Well, really, Holmes. Yes, Watson, chickens. Something of a come down, isn't it? Well, do you know this, Mr. Mandeby? No. But surely his handwriting gives you a clue to his character? Well, it's legible and regular. A man of business habits, I should say, and of some force of character. No, no, Watson. Oh, sorry? Look at his long letters. They hardly rise above the common herd. That D might be an A, and the L an E. Men of character always differentiate their long letters, however illegibly they may write. There's vacillation in his case and self-esteem in his capital. That's amazing, Holmes. It's elementary, my dear Watson. And our long association together should remind you of the fact. I'm afraid you're getting rusty. Well, perhaps you're getting rusty too, Holmes. And since the sun is shining and this letter comes from a neighbor of yours, it might be rather interesting to... Uh... Call on Mr. Manderby. Exactly. I'd like to see if your analysis of his character matches the gentleman himself. In any case, Holmes, he may really be in trouble, you know. Watson, you're like an old war horse hearing a nearly forgotten bugle. Yeah, I dare say, Holmes. But even for stolen chickens, it's good to be in harness with you again. When that wistful tone creeps into your voice, I can't refuse you, Watson. Very well. Let's stroll across the downs and investigate the mystery of Mr. Mandeby's chickens. Mr. 
Mr. Holmes, I'm glad you and your friend came here so promptly. It would seem to me, Mr. Manderby, that uh, your wisest course would have been to call in the local police. I did. And the idiot scoffed at me. Indeed, Mr. Manderby? Why? Well, they said if they had to track down all the chicken thieves in these parts, they'd have no time for their more important duties. I must admit that I can follow their reasoning, sir. Well, I can't, since they seem to spend most of their time playing skittles in the Star and Garter. The local sergeant appears to have been selected for his complete lack of grey matter. There isn't one iota of imagination. He's unable to see in what respect this differs from an ordinary chicken theft. Well, in what way does it differ, Mr. Bandaby? Well, the chicken coops were broken into with considerable ingenuity. The thief could have taken uh, all he could carry. But he stole only one chicken, a white cockerel. A white cockerel? When did this take place? Uh, early last evening. Uh, that was when I uh, sent my note to you, Mr. Holmes. But in the early hours of this morning, a burglar broke into the house itself. And what was stolen this time? Again, the thief took only one object. My daughter's hairbrush. Does your daughter know of these thefts? No, no, I didn't tell her. The child's full enough of peculiar fancies as it is. A white cockerel and a hairbrush. Mr. Manderby, I came here against my better judgment, but thank heaven I did. Please let me talk to your daughter at once. Unless I'm very much mistaken, there's devil's work afoot. Alicia's uh, playing in the drawing room. I'll take you in. I think if you don't mind, Mr. Manderby, that uh, we would prefer to see her alone. Rubbish. What could you possibly wish to say to my daughter that you couldn't say in front of me? Well, since my friend has been kind enough to help you, sir, I think you'd better let him conduct his investigation in his own manner. Oh, very, very, very well. All sounds unnecessarily mysterious to me. Uh, I, I'll be in my study. Dreadfully pompous fellow. You were right in your analysis of his character, Holmes. Well, let's go in. Shh. Listen to the piano, Watson. What a weird tune. Yes. An odd, primitive melody to hear in the heart of the English countryside. Very curious. Come in. I'm sorry, Father. Oh, it isn't Father. Who are you, gentlemen? Miss Manderby. Permit me to introduce myself. My name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Oh, how do you do, my dear? Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I knew you lived in the neighborhood. But why are you here? At your father's request. Well, nothing's wrong, is it, Mr. Holmes? I'm not sure, Miss Manderby. That's why we've come to talk to you. Oh, may we sit down, my dear? Oh, yes, of course. Please forgive me. Thank you, sir. You play the piano excellently, Miss Manderby. Have you ever thought of concert work? Concert work? Oh, no, sir. Papa'd never allow it. He needs me here all the time. You don't see many people here at the house. No, Dr. Watson. Papa doesn't like me to cultivate any friends. He wishes me to devote all my attention to him. Extremely selfish and medieval point of view, it would seem to me. Oh, please, Mr. Holmes. You mustn't say anything against Papa. If he knew that we were talking about him, he'd be furious. Then uh, let me confine myself to you, Miss Manderby. Do you know of anyone in this neighborhood who might... Uh, Wish you serious harm? Uh, no, no, I don't. I, uh, as I told you, I, I hardly know anyone. Then why, my dear young lady, are you so obviously terrified of your own shadow? Oh, please don't ask me that. I haven't even had the courage to tell Papa. Possibly not, my dear, but Mr. Holmes is here to help you and to protect you. That's why he insisted on our seeing you alone. Yes, Miss Manderby. And uh, a trouble shared, you know? Very well, Mr. Holmes. I will tell you. I've got to tell someone. Last night I had a, a ghastly dream. I dreamed that I was in some foreign country, in the jungle. I was tied to a stone slab, and a group of natives danced around me, waving knives. And they were all wearing terrifying masks. Oh, my dear, it sounds like too much lobster for supper. Quiet, Watson. Oh, sorry. Uh, please continue, Miss Manderby. All the time I could hear a strange, haunting pipe playing in the background. It sounded like some sort of flute, and there was a drum beating out a slow, rhythmic beat. The same rhythm that you were playing on the piano as we came in? Why, yes. 
It's been haunting me ever since I awakened this morning. It grows like this. Suddenly, Mr. Holmes, I awakened from the nightmare. But I could still hear the melody continuing. I went to the window, and in the moonlight, I saw a tall man walking below. Could you recognize him? No, Mr. Holmes. He was disappearing through the shrubbery, and his back was turned. But his hands were raised to his mouth. And I could hear the same melody being played on it, some kind of flute. It was awful, awful. You haven't told your father about it? No, Dr. Watson. He wouldn't have believed me. Papa's always accusing me of being fanciful. Oh, but I'm not. Really, I'm not. Miss Manderby, I'm glad that you've told us this. Though I suggest that you continue to keep it a, a secret from your father. Very well, Mr. Holmes. Come on, Watson. All right, Holmes. Goodbye, my dear, and courage, Miss Manderby. You have friends now. Good day, gentlemen. I thank you. Holmes, what the devil's all this about? When I can answer that question, Watson, the case will be solved. As it is, there's work to be done. Ah, oh, there you are, Holmes. Yes, Mr. Manderby. Here we are. Yeah, I hope you find out what's wrong with the lassie. She uh, hasn't been herself today. A change from her normal self, where you are concerned, might be a benefit, sir. Yes, indeed. The poor girl seems completely terrified of you, sir. The problem of my daughter's relationship with her father is no possible concern of yours. I asked you here on a simple matter of detection. Detection, yes, but far from simple. I warn you, you're in serious danger of the loss of a great deal more than a white cockerel and a hairbrush. Be on your guard, Mr. Manderby. Dr. Watson and I must conduct a little investigation in the village. You may expect a call from us later in the day. Well, Watson, here we are at Larches. Charming house, but I still don't see quite why we're here. Because my inquiries uncovered the fact that this is the only house in the neighborhood with relatively new tenants. When something extraordinary happens in the peaceful countryside, look first for a newcomer. The owner's name is Mr. George Shapley. Let's see what information the gentleman can give us. Listen to that, Holmes. Sounds like a flute. Yes, Watson. And the melody is the same that Miss Manderby played for us on the piano. And this house is only a stone throw away from hers. Precisely. Yes, gentlemen. Mr. Shapley? Yes. My name is Holmes. And this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How are you, doctor? Uh, what can I do for you, gentlemen? I'm something of a student of music. We were walking past your house, and I heard what sounded like a flute playing a strange yeah, melody. It seemed to come from the direction of the stables over there. Oh, that. <laughs> it's my manservant, Harker. He's a West Indian. Brought him over with me from Trinidad. He's quite a musician, <laughs> in an amateur sort of way, you know? I wonder if I might speak to him. Of course you can, Mr. Holmes. I'll walk you over there. Thank you. We were thinking of getting up a little entertainment in the village for the church ladies' bazaar. Perhaps your man would uh, consider contributing his services. You can ask him. He spends two or three hours a day out here practicing. Harker. Yes? Come here a minute. Yes, Mr. Fepper. These gentlemen heard you playing. And wondered if you'd like to do something for some, oh, <laughs> some village concert or other. Oh, that's flattering. We're organizing a musical soiree for the church ladies in a few weeks. Yes, sir, man, and we'd like you to play for us. Oh, I'm only an amateur, but I'd be very glad to help, gentlemen. That uh, instrument you were playing, it had an odd quality. Was it a flute? Oh, yes, sir, though I doubt if you've ever seen one like it. Look for yourself. Good Lord. Looks as if it's made of bone. It is, sir, from a human leg bone. Really? It's about 200 years old and originally came from Brazil. It's quite a collector's item. I'm sure it is. Tell me, Harker, since you're from the West Indies and uh, obviously a lover of music, I presume you're familiar with some of the primitive melodies indigenous to that part of the world. Some of the tribal chants, for instance. Oh, yes, sir. I know many of them. Perhaps you'd play some at the concert. I'd rather not, sir. Primitive chants are dangerous medicine. 
and that evil powers are not appreciated or understood. I quite agree with you, Harker. Well, well, I'm much obliged to you, and uh, we shall count on you for the concert. Good day to you both. Come on, Watson. Uh, good day. Good day, good day. Good day. Good day. Good day. Watson. That servant's our man, Holmes. He lives within two houses of Miss Mandeby, and he plays the flute. Well, Watson, though I don't think the pattern is remotely as clear as you think, I'll agree that suspicion would seem to focus on the servant, Harker. I could even produce another clue that points to it. You could? I picked this object from his coat as he turned to you during the conversation. None of you noticed it. What is it? Look for yourself, Watson. Here. Great heavens! It's a feather from a white cockerel. <laughs> I thought you said we were going back to Mr. Mandeville's house before the day is over. We are, Watson. Why are we back here at your bee farm? It's 8.30 in the evening now. We shall call on Mr. Mandeville before long. My investigations are complete. What luck did you have well, with I yours? did as you told me and made exhaustive inquiries in the village. With what results? I couldn't find out much about Mr. Shapley. Nobody knows anything about the man except that he has a foreign manservant and that he paid cash for his house and deposited a large sum of money in the local bank. Uh, what did you discover? I see that you've been up to your ears in reference books. Yes, Watson. Books concerning the peculiarly revolting ceremonies connected with voodooism. Voodooism? That's black magic. But flourishing in our English countryside, apparently. A white cockerel is the second finest sacrifice in voodoo magic associated with the West Indian church. That accounts for the first theft. How about the stolen hairbrush? In all such magic, the possession of intensely personal objects, particularly human hair is considered to give great supernatural powers over that person. Then it's obvious that West Indian servant is trying to get power over Miss Mandeby. Holmes, you spoke of a white cockerel being the second finest sacrifice. What is the first? A human sacrifice. The sacrifice of a young girl. Great Scott. And tomorrow night the moon is full. I think that tonight the girl should be safe, though, of course, we'll go over there at look, once. Look, 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 Holmes. The lights of a carriage are coming up your drawer, mm. your driveway. There. And it's no social call. It's driving at a gallop. Come on, Watson. I have, uh, have nothing that's happened to Miss Mandeby already before we get her. Who is it? What's wrong? Uh, it's Robert Mandeby. What's happened, Mr. Mandeby? Alicia, my daughter, she's disappeared. The whole neighborhood's searching for her. For heaven's sake, both of you come at once. <laughs> We'll find out in a moment what Sherlock Holmes decides to do now. But first, men, why not start today and take better care of the hair you've got? Remember, one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of a highly specialized hair tonic like Cremel? Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why it keeps unruly hair neatly in place longer with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Cremel never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. It never leaves hair feeling sticky, gummy, or dirty. Your hair and scalp always look and feel so clean with Cremel. And if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, start using Cremel at once. Let it make your hair feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. Cremel is also fine to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. A quick massage with Cremel helps stimulate the cutaneous circulation of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. So for better groomed hair, a hygienic scalp, use Cremel daily. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, what happened next? You and the great Sherlock Holmes drove over to Mr. Manderby's house, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Bell, as fast as a pony and trap could carry us there. When we arrived, Manderby quickly led us to the shrubbery beneath his daughter's window. Yes, you, uh, you can see how the fiend got into the house, Mr. Holmes. By climbing this trellis work. Hmm... Footprints in the earth leading toward it, but none leaving. And the man, whoever he was, must have left the house by some other exit. An amazing deduction, Watson. There's no need to be sarcastic. Holmes, we should go to Shapley's house at once. It's obvious that that's where the danger lies. Before saying that anything is obvious, Watson, I'd like your help in trying an experiment. Yes, of course, Holmes. 
Well, what is it? Try climbing that trellis for me, will you? you give me all the best jobs, don't you? Let me hand, will you, will you? Here you are. Up you go. You know, Holmes, it seems to me you're wasting valuable time. Mr. Manderby, since you asked my help, I suggest you let me handle the case in my own way. Holmes, I don't think this trellis is going to hold my weight. Bravo, Watson. Your test has been invaluable. What do you mean it's been invaluable? I think I've broken my back. I'm sure you'll survive. Come on, old chap. Get on your feet. We'll go over to Mr. Shapley's house at once. I only hope we're not too late to prevent a tragedy. Coming from the stables, Holmes. Music, too. Listen. It's that West Indian playing his devilish chant again. Master Watson. Look, look, look. There's someone standing in the shadows by the harness room there. It's Mr. Shapley. Good evening, sir. Mr. Who? Dr. Watson. Thank heavens you're here. What's wrong, Mr. Shapley? Look in that empty store there. You can see through the broken plank in the wall. The one where the music's coming from. Good heavens, the Holmes. There's Miss Mandeby lying on the floor unconscious. Yes, with a dead white cockerel beside her and a fire smoldering in the corner. And do you think that servant of mine's in there playing his filthy music? I don't see him. Mr. Holmes, I've got a revolver. I'm going into getting. I think we'll come with you, Mr. Shaffer. No, no. It's my servant. I'll take care of you myself. Archie Watson. Give me that revolver. Give it to me, I say. What do you think you're doing, Mr. Yes, Holmes? You, you knocked the revolver right out of his hand. Pick it up, Watson. I have a profound dislike for seeing murder committed under my very eyes. Murder? But the potential murder is, is Harker, the, the servant. Indeed. Then why is his unconscious body lying in the corner it there? It can't be. The music's still playing. That's his flute. Yes, and it's accompanied by a drum. A remarkable feat, even for a man not lying unconscious on the floor. The music is undoubtedly that of a gramophone. You're remarkably quiet, Mr. Well, Harker. Of course he is. He's unconscious. My dear Watson, you're overlooking an important fact. It's a case of identity. The West Indian gentleman lying on the floor is the master, Mr. Shapley. This man is the servant, Parker. Let me... No, you don't. Grab him, Watson. I've got him, Holmes. Let go of me. You can't prove anything. I can and I will. You'll go to prison for this night's work. Watson, see what may be done to arrive at the house while I turn this man over to the police. How is Miss Manderby, Watson? She's, uh, she's going to be all right, Holmes. I took her home to her father's and left instructions for her, her care. How are you feeling, Jeffrey? Fine, thank you, Dr. Watson. But I'm waiting for Mr. Holmes to explain this nice happenings to me. Well, so am I, as usual. Then let me analyze this singular affair in its uh, logical progression. I early concluded that you, Mr. Shapley, were the master, and the other man was the servant. Right, Mr. Holmes, but I didn't know how you knew it. Your speech and manner suggested nothing else. You reversed roles, I imagine, because it was an easier way to rent a house in the English countryside. That was the reason, Mr. Holmes. In my previous visits, I've discerned a certain prejudice against foreigners. That's a shocking thing, but I, I wouldn't doubt it, Mr. Shapley. You decided to live here... Your health, I suppose. No, Doctor. I came to the English countryside for peace. Peace to conclude my studies on the origin and history of West Indian native music. I see. I've been working in close conjunction with Professor Griffiths of the Brighton College of Anthropology. It was he who concerned me to make graphophone records my works with a view to recording them for musical archives. And your servant saw his advantage. When you decided to change identities, he realized that if he disposed of you, he would be able to continue in his false character as the supposed Mr. Shapley. He could have taken over your large bank balance and retired under yet a third name with the proceeds. And then he concocted this elaborate plot involving voodoo and native chants, knowing that his master would be suspect. Precisely. He drugged his master, placed him in the incriminating trap, and then planned to burst in just ahead of us and shoot him. But, Holmes, the white feather you found on Mr. Shapter's coat... Undoubtedly planted there. Mr. Holmes, I still don't see how you knew that my man was responsible. The first clue was the trellis. It's obvious that you never claimed, climbed that. You're heavier than Dr. Watson, and it wouldn't support his weight. Your servant was a small, light man. Obviously, it was he. Well, I see it all now, and then, of course... When we heard the music while Mr. Shapley was still lying unconscious, it was obvious that the whole thing was a plot. Oh, what a what a shocking business. 
Yes, but I can't tell you how grateful I am to you, gentlemen. You saved my life. Mr. Holmes, I must insist on paying you a handsome fee. A fee? No, Mr. Shapley. I couldn't dream of accepting one. Some people in my country have been sufficiently inhospitable to a foreigner to make him believe it advisable to change places with his own servant. Presumably, this was done in order to obtain tolerance and peace. Surely the least I can do is to see that his stay on these shores is a tolerable one. Girls, I imagine most of you are planning to go out to a party or a dance on New Year's Eve. Or perhaps just spend a quiet evening with friends. Naturally, you want your hair to look its best. So why not follow this beauty tip from those divinely beautiful Powers models? We wash our hair with Cremel Shampoo. This amazing beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair revealing all its natural glossy luster. And so many women tell me how wonderful Cremel Shampoo is for washing children's hair. <laughs> well, you can readily see why. Because Cremel Shampoo is so mild and gentle on the hair. Its luxurious active foam removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, if only you could see how Powers Models hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights, I'm sure you'd want to try Cremel Shampoo right away. You can buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, Mr. Bell, next week I think I'll tell you a story I call the Darlington Substitution Case. It's a strange story of how Holmes saved a prominent British peer from scandal and disgrace by exercising the judgment of Solomon. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Mazarin Stone. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the Darlington substitution case. <laughs> ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson. Yukon 2, 8209. Ladies and gentlemen, before we commence tonight's Candy Matson story, it's a very great pleasure to welcome as our distinguished guest this evening the widely read radio columnist of the San Francisco Examiner, who conducts his own radio column under the title Day and Night with Radio and Television. Mr. Dwight Newton. Thank you, Dudley Manlove. Recently, I conducted a popularity poll to determine our readers' favorite radio program originating in San Francisco. Heading the list, and a top-heavy favorite, was your Candy Matson program. In behalf of the examiner readers who participated in the poll, I am happy to present this award, which reads as follows. 1950 San Francisco Examiner Favorite Program Award. This certifies that readers of the San Francisco Examiner have voted Candy Matson their favorite local radio program in a poll conducted by the underside writer of the column Day and Night with Radio and Television. Congratulations to all who participate on the Candy Matson program, to Monty Masters, who writes and directs it, and to you, Natalie Masters, the Candy Matson star. Thank you, Dwight Newton. We're doubly proud of this award tonight because next week's program will mark Candy Matson's first birthday. From all of us here at NBC in San Francisco to Dwight Newton the San Francisco Examiner, and most of all, you, the listeners, who've made this award possible, our very sincere thanks.
We continue now with Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. Just a moment, I'll be right there. How do you do? Uh, you, you are Candy Matson, aren't you? Yes, that's right. And who are you? Willa Gray. Come in, won't you, Willa? Is there something I can do for you? I, I don't quite know how to explain this, but it's my brother. Your brother? Maybe you've heard of him, Miss Matson. Gordon Gray? Why, sure. The songwriter? That's right. Who doesn't know him? He's written almost as many hit songs as Irving Berlin. What about him, Willa? Well, like many people I know, Gordon is a crime student for relaxation. He reads all the books, listens to all the radio programs, and naturally he's heard and read a great deal about you. Well, I'm flattered. When I suggested talking to you, he agreed immediately. Talking to me, Willa? What about? Well, it's his mental condition, Miss Matson. He suddenly become extremely childish. All day long he sits at the piano playing nothing but uncoordinated notes. Are you sure they're uncoordinated, or is it some new style he's trying to develop? Miss Matson, you're familiar with Gordon's work. Songs like Lazy Old June, The Tenderness of You. What he's doing now is just musical gibberish. How well I remember Lazy Old June. I was just a kid in high school at the time. Are you living with your brother, Willa? No, I'm not. Just as well, too. I don't think I could take it. Why do you say that? These foolish notes he plays... He says he's working on a thing to be called Symphony of Death. That someone is going to kill him. Why? Now you've got me interested. I hope so, Miss Matson. He won't talk to me. Every time I drop by, Gordon just sits at the piano, laughing horribly and playing these kindergarten notes. As I said, he's a great fan of yours. Won't you go and just speak to my brother? Sure. I'll see him. Gordon Gray with a shattered mind. What a pity, if true. Think of all the jukeboxes that would have to settle for promissory notes. Candy Matson, San Francisco's well-known gal private investigator. Merely trying to get her penthouse on Telegraph Hill cleaned, and she walks into a stack of memories. Memories created by a songwriter named Gordon Gray. Symphony of Death. It never became a popular composition, but it will always be on Candy's all-time hit parade, a tune she'll never forget, because it brought about a very strange chain of events and a fascinating finish to the entire story. Oh, and the in-between department? Well, here she is, the gal who never suffers from gaposis, Candy Matson. When I went into the cold, hard world to make a living for myself, Gordon Gray was an American institution. That's when he wrote his never-to-be-forgotten The Rhapsody of You. I'd had no idea that Gray was in San Francisco. The last I'd heard, he was in New York, working on the score of a brand-new musical. So when his sister confronted me like that, naturally, I was caught a bit off base. She wrote Gordon's address for me, like the rabbity little elf she seemed, ducked out as abruptly as she came. Then I dressed, drove over to an apartment house on Powell Street, just down from the family club. I pressed the button. It blew an ugly little noise back at me. I entered and went up the stairs to 221. The door opened. Yes? Mr. Gray? Yes, that's right. I didn't call you on the phone. I thought I'd just more or less barge in on you. I'm Candy Matson. Candy Matson? Do come in. Oh, please, do come in. Thank you. So, my little sister finally got up enough gumption to call you. Yes, she came by this afternoon. She, we had quite a nice little chat. A nice chat? With my sister? Impossible. A little mouse doesn't know how to put one word after another. Oh, here, here. Do sit down, won't you? Place is a mess. I've got manuscripts all over the floor, the high boy, the whatnot, everywhere. Uh, high ball, spot of sherry? Thank you. No, not right at the moment. As you say. <laughs> I beg your pardon? It's nothing, really. <laughs> I'm just thinking of my monstrous joke. I'm going to be killed, you know. Yes, so your sister said. Uh, uh, you mind... My sister, young... <laughs> she's young enough to marry a grandchild. Do you know what? She thinks I'm slipping my cable. Do you mind if I call you Gordon? I'd love it. 
Providing I can call you Candy. I'd despise myself in the AM if you didn't. Candy, you're just as delightful as I had you pictured. Thanks, Gordon. Now, frankly, what do you think? Are you uh, slipping your cable? Of all the idiotic... Of course not. Willa seems convinced you are. Willa's a mere babe, a suckling. What about this new thing you're working on, Gordon? This, this symphony of death? She told you about that, too, huh? That's part of my monstrous joke, Candy. Want to confide in me? Let me know what this joke is? I don't mind in the least. You have brains. Not many people have brains in this world, Candy. But you do. And because you have brains, I'm going to give you a challenge. Okay, let me have it. Oh, no. <laughs> the challenge will only come after he kills me. He? Who are you referring to, Gordon? <laughs> That's part of the challenge, Candy. I see. Do you really believe that someone's out to kill you? But of course. That's the delicious part of the whole thing. I'm going to be killed. It can't be avoided. That's why I'm writing my symphony of death. Oh, oh sure. Now I see. You're making fun of me, Candy. No, no, I'm not, Gordon, really. It's just that, well, I've never met anyone who was happy about the prospect of getting knocked off. I don't mind, actually. I've lived a full life. I've seen the world. Me lots of money. I've been wined and dined by people in all walks of life. My music will live after me. That's all I care about. Now I can understand. There. You see? That's why I like you. You have brains. Uh, shall I play my new composition for you? If you like. Very well. As you will discover after I'm dead. It's all part of my monstrous joke. <laughs> Excuse me. Pay no attention to the technique, Candy, my dear. My fingers aren't quite as supple as they used to be. <laughs> there, what do you think of it? Gordon, I think it's a great, monstrous joke. I knew you'd see it. It's part of the joke. You're really sharp. I knew it. That's part of the joke, and you can see it. You pay wonderful compliments, Gordon. Thank you. But don't you think this symphony of death is a complete departure from your usual style? From something like, well, the Rhapsody of You, for instance? Certainly, certainly. It's because of him. I had to write something dedicated to him, didn't I? Well, to scramble a dangling participle, who's him? The man who's going to kill me. <laughs> As I left, I tried to shake the picture of a cackling man playing one-fingered doodles on the keyboard, but I couldn't. The impression was indelible. When I arrived home, I was greeted by the sight of a familiar auto parked out in front. It was my number one boy, Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. I invited him up to sit a spell and chew the fat. What's new, Cupcake? I haven't seen you for several days. Seems like weeks. Ha! Huh, a compliment. That means you're after something. I am not. Can't I ever say something nice without you misconstruing? Oh, okay, okay. Compliment accepted. Good. What brings you around here this time of day, Mellor, dear? Aren't you on duty? That's the trouble. I've been on duty for almost 48 hours straight. I have to take a little breather for myself. Working on a deal? Yeah, a hot one. No leads, no clues, no nothing. For a slight consideration, I might be inclined to help you crack the case, Sherlock. Huh. By the way, what are you working on? Nothing but hope and what's left of the bank account. You mean to say the great lady private eye is temporarily at liberty? I mean to say just exactly that. Well, if I'm any judge of your business ability, you've got enough money tucked away to buy the Philadelphia Athletics from Connie Mack. <laughs> what do you do with all your loot, Candy? Sew it in hair mattresses and sleep on it. <laughs> oh, excuse me a moment, Mallory. Sure, go right ahead. Oh, hello, Willa. I didn't expect to see you so soon. I... I hope you won't think me a nuisance, but I just had to see you. I understand. Come in. No, thanks. You've been to see Gordon. I just spoke with him on the phone, and he told me. Yes, that's right. What do you think, Miss Matson? Very sad, Willa. How long has he been like this? Just a week or so. He flew in from New York, and I could see the change in him right away. How long ago did he leave for New York? He left Hollywood for New York last month. Was he all right then? Oh, yes. Just fine. He seemed so happy. He just finished writing the music for the new show in the East. But when he got there, the backers, as they say in show business, told him the music was no good. He said he'd return to the coast and redo it. 
But instead of going back to Hollywood, he came here. Took that apartment on Powell Street, and he's been holed up there ever since. Do you think being told his music was no good had anything to do with his present condition? Oh, I'm sure of it, Miss Matson. He's always been such a sensitive person. No, no, Willa. <laughs> I've known several people who snapped momentarily under a terrific strain. Maybe it's not as serious as you think. But what am I going to do? Well, first, he needs aid. Immediately. I know a Judge Conway here in town. I think he'll help you get Gordon committed to a sanitarium where he'll get the finest medical aid available. A sanitarium? Oh, no, Miss Matson, That would kill Gordon. Well, it's either that or have him get progressively worse. I, I suppose you're right. Could you, I mean, would you talk to Gordon? Explain what must be done? I don't think I'm capable. Sure, I'll do it, Willa. You sit tight and I'll call you just as soon as I speak with Judge Conway. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I imagine I should inquire as to how much you charge for your services. No, forget it, Willa. Getting Gordon Gray back to normal will be pay enough. You're, you're just wonderful, Miss Matson. Goodbye. Poor kid. So helpless. Poor kid is right. I couldn't help overhearing. She's about 90% mouse. She and Gordon must have been poured right out of the same mold as far as sensitivity is concerned. Is that the Gordon Gray Candy? The famous songwriter? That's the one. And he's cracked up? Mm-hmm. Downright shame. Well, thanks, pal. Just the sight of you has picked me up considerably. I'll be getting back to the grind. Nellie, dear... Hold me tight for just a moment, will you? Sure. Don't let Gordon Gray get you down, Cupcake. Well, it wasn't a very pretty sight. And I've got to face him again. Thanks for the hug, Mallard. I'll return it someday. Mallard released his grip and left. I snapped my ribs back in place and sealed myself for the ordeal ahead of me. It wasn't going to be easy, but it had to be done. So once again, I found myself ducking down Green Street, over Powell, across California, and down the roller coaster of a hill to Gordon's apartment. He answered the door, and I was met with just as much enthusiasm as before. Candy Matson, I was wondering where you'd been. You've been gone for ages, darling. Do come in. I've got a surprise for you. When did you get back from Europe? When did I get back? Oh... Just a day or so ago. Your letters were wonderful. I especially adored the one from Naples. What a time you must have had. Yes. Yes, quite a time, Gordon. How's the new symphony coming along? That's the surprise, my dear. It's completed. Long last, it's finished. To be perfectly frank, Candy, I, I think it's great. I've been in touch with Toscanini. He's going to give it its premiere performance at Carnegie next month. I've already sent him the revised manuscript. Can you picture it, Candy? A hushed crowd. Maestro wraps his baton. The orchestra comes to full attention. Then that magnificent, firm downbeat of Toscanini's. And Symphony of Death is making its debut. First, the Allegretto. Then, the Molto Andante. The audience is at first inclined to scoff, to think that Gordon Gray could write serious music, from lazy old June to Symphony of Death. Too much of a step, they'd say. Then, Toscanini glides into the conmoto. The audience tenses, not believing their ears. Little by little, they understand what Gordon Gray is trying to express. Then, as if it were not enough, Toscanini moves into the breathtaking finale. It soars, it moves. It transports everyone in Carnegie Hall into another world. And abruptly, symphony of death. The symphony of death is over. The audience arises as one. They, they shout for Gordon Gray, the composer. History's being made. More shots for the composer. But Gordon Gray isn't there. Gordon Gray's dead because of him. Gordon, listen to me. <laughs> because of him. 
The world will have to be denied any further music from the pen of Gordon Gray. I said listen to me, Gordon. Hmm? Oh. Go on. I want to talk to you. And you've got to listen very carefully. You're sick. You need help. Your sister and I are arranging to have you sent to a home nearby. They'll have you on your feet in short order. Sent away? Yes. That means he will visit me sooner than I planned. Very well, Candy. Tell Willa to do whatever she thinks best. I won't give her any trouble. It's for your own good, Gordon. Believe me. I know. Candy, you never went to Europe, did you? You were here earlier this afternoon. Isn't that right? That's right. <laughs> you just went along with the gag. That's right, Gordon. Yeah. You'll be here sooner. Much sooner than I expected. Gordon Gray went into the other room and lay down on his studio couch, face down. That's when I tiptoed out of the apartment. If only I could have peeked into the future, I'd never have left, because that was the last time Gordon Gray was seen alive. I went home, fixed myself something to eat turned the radio on low and sat down with a book called That Frail Vessel, a book about the behavior of the human mind. Out of one corner of my ear, I heard it. It was the 10 o'clock news over NBC with Sam Hayes, and there it was. The body of Gordon Gray had been found in his apartment. The book clattered out of my hands, and I sat there for a moment, stunned, but only for a moment. In another second, I was driving over to pick up an old pal of mine, Rembrandt Watson. There was a good reason for it. Rembrandt studying to play the cello. On the way over, I noticed the headlines. The police had the net out for Gordon's sister, Willa. Rembrandt was home. He was agreeable to going to Gordon and Gray's apartment with me. And before you could bat an eyelash, providing your batting average was good, we were in said apartment alone. My word, girl. What a garish-looking place. It didn't belong to Gordon personally, Rembrandt. He was merely renting it. He still doesn't deny the fact that it's garish. Can't be the truth now. Why did you want me to come to this Victorian mausoleum with you? Just a hunch, Ducky. Are you still taking cello lessons? Taking them? Girl, don't be ridiculous. I'm now giving them. Even better. <laughs> Just as I thought. The boys in blue haven't touched anything. The manuscript for Symphony of Death is still on the piano. Can you play single notes on the piano, Rembrandt? Well, I can try. Good. Run your hangnails over this. Hmm. Strange. This isn't music. Up a series of notes with no meter, phrasing, or regard for the proper time for the bar. Exactly. Play it just the way it's written. Very well. And call out the notes as you go along. I think I'm beginning to understand Gordon's symphony of death. As you say, C, A, D, and for no reason at all is a rest, Candy. D, A, D, and a rest. Go ahead. E, G, G, and another rest. Mm-hmm. And then it goes D, E, a, D, a long gap in the manuscript. You know what that spells musically, Ducky? Bad egg dead. Utter confusion. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I don't think so. As we say in the movies, continue on. F, A, G, G, E, D. No timing at all. That spells fagged. So am I. However, it goes on like this. D, E, A, F. Another rest, then B, E, E, finish. What? Through. It's the poop. Finish. Let's see now. Bad egg dead. Fagged. Deaf. B. Candy love. If you're going to the notes of the musical scale, you could spell practically anything out of A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, even from a tune like Ragma. But this means something. I know it does. Gordon told me it was going to be a challenge. What? Who's there? Don't be alarmed, Miss Matson. It's only me, Willa. Willa, how did you get in here? Don't you know the police are looking all over town for you? Let them look. I don't care. My brother's dead. I read it in the papers. How did you get in here, Willa? The cops are surrounding the place. I just walked in through the front door. Oh, wait till Mallard hears about this. Willa, you didn't kill Gordon, did you? No, Miss Matson. I didn't. Honestly, I didn't. I believe you, Willa. Because I think I know who did kill your brother. You do? 
tell me. Oh, please tell me. Down at the Hall of Justice. Okay, let's go. Oh, Rembrandt, bring along that bust of Beethoven sitting on the piano, will you? Oh, pleasure, dear. I'll be glad to. <clears throat> Candy, this thing must weigh at least 15 pounds. Well, you're the only man in the group. Oh? Oh. <clears throat> Very well. Come along, bust. Hall of Justice or likewise. <laughs> Candy, what are you doing here at a time like this? Can't you see I'm busy? Sure, I only want to see you busier. This is Willa Gray, remember her? Just the girl we're looking well, for. Well, save your breath, Mellon. Willa's innocent. She had nothing to do with Gordon Gray's death. Okay, you know so much. Who in tarnation did? Put that bust of Beethoven on Mellard's desk, Rembrandt. I was wondering how long I'd have to hold this thing. What in the name of Schenectady do I want with that? There sits your murderer. Andy, are you out of your head? No, it's so complex it's simple, Mallard. Gordon Gray works like a beaver for two months writing a musical score for a new Broadway show. He takes the score to New York. The producers tell him it's no good. It's the first time it's ever happened to Gordon. It does something to his mind. He broods. He comes to San Francisco. His mental condition becomes worse. So is yours. Where you're concerned, yes. But let me finish. Here, take a look at this. Uh, bad, egg, dead. Fag. Deaf, D. Okay, I give up. What does it mean? Bad, egg, dead. Gordon Gray is referring to himself. Fag, that means he had come to the end of his rope. His musical knowledge and creative ability were running dry. Gray had nothing more to live for. Okay, Miss Edgar Allan Poe. What does deaf D mean? Well, that had me stumped for a while, too. Then I got to looking at this bust of Beethoven standing on the piano. It seemed to dominate the entire room. Then I put two and two together and got Ludwig von Beethoven. B was an abbreviation of Beethoven. Beethoven was deaf, deaf B. I don't get it. You will. Beethoven is going to hit an all-time low. The answer lies inside that plaster bust, I'm sure. Stand back, Mallard. I'm about to splatter a genius. Take a look. Good gravy. A small fortune in greenbacks. That's right. And a note, too, if these eyes don't deceive me. Ah. Congratulations, whoever you might be. You learned the true meaning of my symphony of death. You've also just executed my killer, von Beethoven. Now perhaps he knows how it feels to be cracked up, too. Thanks for participating in my little joke, my last charade. This is my entire estate. Put it to whatever good use you may see fit. Gordon Gray. Oh, Rembrandt, do me a favor. Take Willa outside. The poor kid's pretty badly shot. It certainly does. Come along, young lady. I still don't get it, Candy. It's easy to fill in the gaps now, Mallard. Gordon's music was falling apart. He knew it. So he started swiping melodies from obscure Beethoven themes. But Gordon, with only his flair for writing popular music, couldn't grasp what Beethoven had originally intended. Consequently, the things he wrote were terrible. The more he copied, the more he realized that Beethoven was becoming an all-ruling obsession. It was Beethoven in the morning, Beethoven at night, Beethoven 24 hours a day until it drove Gordon completely out of his mind. That I can understand, but what's this joke he mentioned? Well, he was a great mystery fan. That's why he wrote this gibberish thing called Symphony of Death. A group of notes that spelled out bad egg dead, fag, death, be, and so on. All part of his warped mental condition. Well, that makes sense. Except for one thing. How did Gordon Gray die exactly when he wanted to die? Mallard, dear, I now know there are some mighty strange things in this world. Even a completely sick mind such as Gordon's has great powers of concentration. Gordon was like a, a captain without a ship, like a man who's been married 50 years who suddenly has no wife. You probably won't believe it, Mallard, but Gordon Gray, knowing that his mind was shot, and knowing, too, that every last bar of creative music had been drained from his heart, his soul, 
willed himself to die. Fantastic? Not necessarily so. There are many stories about animals who have done the same thing. And if animals can do it, why can't a human being with a so-called higher plane of intelligence do it, too? So that's what Gordon had done. Taken his life savings, sealed them into a plaster bust of Beethoven, along with his last laugh note, and sat himself down to die. In Gordon's mind, Beethoven had killed him. I can understand why, too. For just before we left his apartment, I found another manuscript. I had Rembrandt run over it. Note for note, it was the Moonlight Sonata, backwards. But in one respect, Gordon had outscored the old masters. He had completed his symphony of death, and Beethoven was in little pieces. That left him one up on another old master, a fellow named Franz Schubert. He'd left one entirely unfinished. The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. Actors heard this evening were Phyllis Skelton as Willa Gray. John Grover was her brother, Gordon Gray. Jack Thomas as Rembrandt Watson and Henry Leff as Inspector Ray Mallard. From the star of our program, Natalie Masters, and from her husband, Monty Masters, who writes and directs Candy Matson, and from the staff of the National Broadcasting Company, we wish to express our deep thanks and sincere appreciation to the San Francisco Examiner and Dwight Newton, radio columnist of the Examiner, for tonight's presentation, naming Candy Matson as the number one program in the San Francisco Metropolitan Bay Area. <laughs> Listen again next week at the same time for excitement and adventure. Just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. At this exact moment, your home is one of many millions in which this radio program is tuned in. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society, we feel that this nationwide home listening carries with it a very serious responsibility. Our equitable radio message must be keyed to home and family problems. Tonight's Equitable Society message is on education. If there are children in your home, you'll be particularly interested in this commercial about the Equitable Education Fund. Don't miss it in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Friendly Frame-Up. It is a truism in law enforcement circles that no criminal is easy to catch. Each one presents a new problem, demanding a new approach. Some, of course, are easier to apprehend than others. It is simpler to bring to justice the criminal who lives by crime alone, who earns no honest dollar than it is to trap the species of lawbreakers among us, who live a Jekyll and Hyde existence who operate a legitimate business as a front and a criminal business undercover. Those people are difficult to weed out because, for the most part, they take no active role in the commission of any crime. 
Mainly, they are the brains and the money behind the operation of a complex criminal machine. A machine which is built to stop at nothing. Tonight's file opens in a smoke-filled gymnasium. Sweaty fighters are going through their training workouts. One shadow boxing, one working with a sparring partner in the ring, another punching the heavy bag. It's 11 o'clock in the morning as Pete Webb, who manages these fighters, walks through the gym to his office. Work, Lefty. Keep going. Okay. Nice footwork, Jackie. See me later, will you? All right. Hey, Mr. Webb. Uh, Hi, Buffalo. No time for you now, kid. Catch me in an hour, huh? Okay. Louie. Right with you. Louie! Call back later, will you? Yeah. Uh-huh. Goodbye. Good morning, boss. Who was that? Bob Hudson. What do you want? The job. Are you kidding? Bob thinks just because I managed him, he was, when he was fighting, I should support him for the rest of his life. Bob dropped dead. What's coming this morning? Little Danny's in the jug. Where'd he get that? Yancey was in. He just visited Danny, got the whole story. What happened? Well, Danny said he met a guy on a train coming east. What kind of a guy? A bond salesman. Danny got him loaded, and the guy spilled that he was carrying some bonds. Uh huh. Well, it's perfect for Danny. He's always got those go to sleep pills in his kick. So he slipped some on the guy's drink and clipped his briefcase. Well, what went wrong? Well, the guy must have come too awful fast. He quit contact with the cops. They call it Danny in the station? No. Uh, not till he hit his apartment. What about the bonds? Well, Danny was afraid he might have a tail on him, so as soon as he hit the railroad station, he checked the briefcase of the baggage counter. Uh uh-huh. Then he put the claim check in an envelope and dropped it in the mailbox. Who'd he mail it to? Well, that's what Yancey came up to tell us. Danny mailed the claim check to you. No. Did it come in? No, Danny figured we should get it this afternoon. Then he wants for you to get rid of the bonds and get some cash to him for a mouthpiece. I see. Uh... Where'd he check the stuff? North Side Station. Well, when the baggage checks in then you run over there and pick the stuff up. Me? Yeah. Are you kidding? No, why? There's liable to be 50 cops waiting around that baggage counter. You just told me that he wasn't picked up till he hit his apartment. All right, he could have talked since then. Well, Daddy wouldn't talk. Then why don't you pick the stuff up? Well, uh... For the same reason I got, huh? Look, we just can't leave the stuff there. It's too good a score for us. We gotta get some... Wait a minute. What? I got an idea. Ellie. Yes, Bob. Where are you, honey? I'm in the bedroom. Okay. You're home early, honey. Any luck today? Yeah, I got a job. Oh, Bob, that's wonderful. Oh, I'm so excited. Wait a minute, honey. Don't get too excited. Why not? Well, will you hear who I'm working for? Who? Pete Webb. Oh, no, Bob. Well, Ellie, I had to find a job. Yeah, but not with Pete. Bob, how could you after the things that he's done to you? I know what he's done to me, but we also have to eat. But, Bob, there are plenty honey, of guys. That... For two solid months now, I've been pounding the pavement looking for work. I know, but... I found out real quick about my friends. They turned out to be a lot of guys who only wanted to be around while I was winning. But other people... Other people? Well, I take one look at this nose and these cauliflower ears and practically come right out and tell me they're not interested in hiring a punch-drunk fighter. That's why I finally called Pete. I understand, honey. I'm sorry. It's okay. What are you going to do for Pete? I don't know, but I told him no larceny. What did he say? He said the job was clean. When did he start work? This afternoon. I gotta pick up something for him. What? A package that's checked at Northside Station. The same afternoon in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching his desk. Jim, oh Jim. Oh, yes, Paul. I've been looking for you. Huh? I just left the boss. He's put us both on a case that just came in. Oh. What are the details of it? A man named Lawrence Black was on a train on route here from Cleveland. He was robbed of $21,000 of negotiable bonds. Oh, how was the job done? The thief slipped some knockout drops into one of Black's drinks. I see. When he came to, he gave the police at the station a good description of the man he was drinking with. Uh-huh. 
The description was so good, in fact, that the local police picked up the thief within an hour as he was entering his apartment. Oh, wait, Paul. If they picked him up, what's the case? What are we working on? The thief didn't have the bonds on him. Oh, I see. I presume the police searched his apartment. From top to bottom. But there wasn't a trace of either the bonds or the briefcase they were in. Well, are the police sure they've got the right man? The victim made a positive identification. Mm, I see. Jim, our job is to find out what he did with those bonds between the time he got off the train and the time he got home. Okay. Who's the thief, Paul? His name is Newton. He has a long criminal record. Newton, huh? Hey, what's his first name? Dan. Dan Newton? That's right. Hey, that could be little Danny. Paul, have you got anything on him here? A description, maybe? Got a whole file right here. Pictures and all. Oh, swell. You have a look at it, huh? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, that's little Danny, all right. You know him, Jim? Yes. Yes, and I think I know where the bonds are. Really? Yes, you see, little Danny has always used a regular pattern of operation. He rides trains, picks up a victim, clips him, then checks his loot at the railroad station as soon as he gets off. But, Jim, there was no baggage check found on him when he was picked up. No, no, there wouldn't be. His usual procedure is to mail the check either to himself or to a friend. Paul, what station did he arrive in? The North Side Station. Let's notify the police and have them send a man to that baggage counter at once. Hey, Bud, how about that bag? I gave you the check five minutes ago. Look, can I get some service here? Oh, brother. Hey, hey, you, is that the briefcase? Yeah. Well, it's about time. Let me have it. Here. Wait a minute. Hmm? Huh? You better let me have that briefcase. Who are you? Police. Here's the badge. What is this? Just give me the briefcase, Hudson. How do you know me? I used to watch you fight. Now, let's have the bag and come along with me. What for? This is an arrest. Hmm? I gotta take you in. Look, I don't get any of this. You just claim that briefcase. Well, so what? I'm picking it up for the guy I worked for. Hudson, that briefcase was stolen. Hmm? There's $21,000 worth of negotiable bonds in there. Well, wait, there must be some mistake. There's no mistake. I know the briefcase, and I've been waiting an hour to nail whoever picked it up. Whoever picked it up? Yeah, now come on. Wait a minute, I'm being framed. Come on, I said. Oh, no, let go of me. Hey, come back here. Stop or I'll shoot. Hudson, you hear me? Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. I'm down at the railroad station. We've gotten a bad break. Oh, what's that, Paul? A man picked up the briefcase about ten minutes ago. An officer attempted to arrest him, but he got away. With the briefcase? Yes. Oh, that is tough. The police feel they can pick him up pretty quickly, though. How's that? The arresting officer recognized the man. Said his name was Bob Hudson, ex-prize fighter. Yeah, I've heard of him. Hudson was wounded in the getaway. The officer fired two shots at him. He certainly hit him at least once. Any idea where this Hudson lives? The police are checking that now. Paul, have them call me as soon as they find his address. What's wrong? Just let me sit down a minute. Look at your shirt. That's blood. Yeah. Tell him what's happened. A bullet grazed my shoulder. Well, I'll call a doctor. Wait. No doctors, Ellie. Huh? The guy with the gun was a cop. Oh. I was framed, Ellie. Pete Webb framed me. Oh, no, darling. How? What well, bag I was to call for at the railroad station it was loaded with stolen bonds. $21,000 worth. And he sent you there knowing that? Sure. Hoping I'd get away clear. Oh, this is awful. Oh, you were right about Pete, honey. I shouldn't have taken that job. Oh, forget about that. Why did the cop shoot you? Well, it was going to take me in. I couldn't let Pete's frame go that far, so I busted away from him. Bob, you shouldn't have done that. Pete was in the wrong, not you. Well, I can never prove that from the city jail. Bob, you just got to let me call the doctor. I said no, Ellie. But I can't Look, just... I wouldn't be here anyway when he came. What do you mean? I got a call to make. What? I'm going to go see Pete Webb. I'm going right now. Oh, Bob, please listen to me. Your shoulder... The bleeding stopped. But you, you've got to let Ellie, me... Ellie, I'm going to go see Pete Webb, and I'm going to make him come down to the cops with me and tell the real story about those stolen bonds. A 
Just a minute. Hello, Louie. Hiya, Bob. Come on in. Pete, it's Bob Hudson. Oh, hiya, kid. Hello, Pete. What took you so long? I was beginning to get a little worried about you. No kidding. Hey, what's with the blood? In my shirt? Yeah. What happened? I got shot. Huh? By who? Cop. What for? You should know what for, Pete. I don't get you. The briefcase. The briefcase that you framed me into picking up. Oh, I sent you on there, and that's all. Well, stop I... the routines. Hey, where is the briefcase? I haven't got it. The cops get it? No. And where is it? I put it away in a safe place. It's going to stay there until I take both you guys and the bonds to the cops. You're going to take us to the cops? That's right. <laughs> Pete, this guy really is punchy. You did frame me. you got to admit that. Yeah. I admit it. But only to you, not the cops. I was just paying you back for an old score. What do you mean? The time you double-crossed me in Bay City. I never double-crossed anybody in my life. Remember the time I had you in a main at Bay City? I bet against you. I told you about it. You turn around and win the fight. I've tried to win every fight. You're in one now, you ain't gonna win. Oh, no. I'm taking you both to the cops right now. Hold the phone. Hmm? This gun says different. That ain't stopping me, Louie. That's what you think. No guns, Louie. This is better. Ooh! Louie, uh, yeah. take this blackjack. When he comes to, keep using it on him till you find out where he stashed that briefcase. Well, okay, boss. Where are you going? I want some action. I'm going to the fights. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Tomorrow on hundreds of football fields, boys and girls will raise their voices in the old traditional songs. The same songs you and I sang in our college days. Well, college wasn't all singing for me, Mr. Keating. I had a swell time, but I took medicine and studied pretty hard at it. Of course you studied, Harry. And there are hundreds of thousands of others just like you. That's why the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. What's more, that extra $72,000 is just half the story. Educated men and women have cultural interests and appreciation that they wouldn't part with for any amount of money. So, for many reasons, everyone agrees college is the wisest and best investment loving fathers and mothers can make for their children. Well, I certainly hope that my boy will get the chance to go. If I were you, I wouldn't leave it a chance. Why not make sure he'll go? Make sure with an equitable education fund. An equitable education fund? Never heard of it before. It's a surefire plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society, and it includes these important features. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, sounds okay to me, Mr. Keating. Where do I get one of those equitable education funds? The man to see is your equitable society representative. Give your children their chance to earn that extra $72,000 by getting in touch with your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Friendly Frame-Up. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI illustrates one major point. A point which cannot be stressed too strongly or repeated too often. It is absolutely impossible for a decent, law-abiding citizen to do business with a criminal. The two cannot mix any more successfully than oil and water. Because their minds and their hearts are so different. 
The decent man lives by the credo that he must work for what he gets. And that his fellow man is entitled to the same courtesy and dignity that he himself expects in return. But the criminal regards his fellow men as just so many potential victims. And he looks with contempt on those who work for what they want. Your FBI asks you to remember those things if you're ever tempted to enter into any agreement with a criminal. Remember them and heed them well. Tonight's file continues that same evening at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned to his office where Special Agent Meriden is waiting for him. Hello, Paul. Any word from the police on Hudson? Not since I've been here, Jim. Had any dinner yet? No, the drugstore's going to send up a sandwich and some coffee. That'll hold me for a while. The note you left for me said you went to Hudson's house. What happened? Oh, his wife was there. When I questioned her, she told me that Hudson had been given a job just this afternoon by his old manager, Pete Webb. Pete Webb? Yes. Webb's a local character who's on the shady side, but nobody's ever been able to get anything on him. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Hudson says that Webb sent her husband for the briefcase. Did he know what was in it? Well, she said no. She said that Hudson returned to the house wounded this afternoon after he'd been at the station, and that he'd gone from there to Webb's apartment. What for? To make Webb go to the police with him and admit that the whole thing was a frame. I see. So I left Hudson's and went over to Webb's apartment. Yes. Webb had gone out to the fights, according to a stooge of his named Louis Slater, who answered the door. Louis Slater? Hmm. Where do I know that name from? Oh, he's a petty larceny hoodlum. He said he'd heard of Hudson, but that he didn't know him, and that Hudson had positively never been to Webb's apartment. I don't trust people who are so positive. Neither do I, Paul, but I didn't have a search warrant, so there wasn't much I could do except take his word for it. I'll I'll get it. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Taylor. This is Spencer down at headquarters. Oh, hello, Spencer. We've got Hudson again, Hmm? and this time he won't break loose. Where'd you find him? He was unconscious in an alley off Main Street and First Avenue. He's over at City Hospital now. Still unconscious? According to last reports, he was. In fact, the doctors say they don't know if he'll ever come out of it. No. Well, thanks very much, Spencer. Right. Bye. Hudson is at City Hospital, unconscious, Paul. Come on, let's get up there. Come on, Come on, Kick that left out there. Kick that left out. Tell him to get you near the ropes. Hi there, Pete. Who's winning? What are you doing here? Thought you were going to wait for me at the apartment. Yeah, I was, but something important came up. I came to tell Don't you... Don't tell me nothing this round's over. Come on, Sailor. Come on, boy. Get in there now. Keep it left out there. Yeah. Now, what have you got? A guy from the FBI was around. He was looking for Hudson. What'd you tell him? I said I didn't even know the guy. Good. What'd you do with Hudson? I dumped him in an alley. Alive? Yeah, just about... That's bad. Look, you didn't say nothing about knocking him off. Okay, okay. Did you find out where you put the stuff? Yeah, I think so. What do you mean, think? Well, he never came to after you conked him. So I frisked him and I found this key. What is it? Well, it fits one of those subway locker boxes. It says so right here. Yeah. I figured it's probably a box on that station near where Hudson lives. Yeah, the key's got a number on it. Well, we can check. That's a good idea. Uh, look, Louie, why don't you go up and see if you're right? Are you kidding? No. Look, that's how Hudson got where he is. Look, Louie, I want to watch this fight. I'll see you at the gym in the morning. Hi, Jim. Oh. How is he? Oh, he's still unconscious. They patched up the bullet wounds, but somewhere Hudson took an awful beating. After he was shot? Must have been. You think he got the beating at Webb's place? Mm-hmm. Could be. I checked on what time Webb got to the fights tonight. He'd have had time to see Hudson and still get to the arena when he did. Hudson didn't have the bonds on him when they found him, did he? Uh-huh. Well, his pockets were empty, Paul. What did the doctor think of Hudson's chances? Oh, 50-50. He might pull out of it, but there's no telling. Oh. Uh-huh. Comes his wife now. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Mrs. Hudson. The nurse told me you spoke to the doctor. Yes, that's right. How is he? Is he going to get better? Well, Mrs. Hudson, it'll be a little while, probably, before the doctors know any more than they do now. Here comes one of them now, Jim. Uh, oh, yes, that's him. That's Bob's doctor? Yes. 
coming over here. Well, now be calm, Mrs. Hudson. Look. It's bad news. I, I know it. I can see it in the doctor's face. <laughs> hey, you tiger, did he come in his office yet? Yeah, he's in. Thanks. Uh-huh. Pete, I got some news for you. What is it? Well, you were worried about me not knocking off Hudson, huh? Uh-huh. He died this morning in the hospital. How do you know? I heard the rumor from a dozen guys, so I called the hospital. I see. They said it was official, and he also told me he'd die without ever coming to. That means he couldn't tell the cops where he stashed the bonds. That's right. Uh, where's that locker key? Right here in my kick. Where do you think we should start looking? Like I said last night, we go first to the subway station near where Hudson lived. Okay, let's go. Pete Blocker should be down at this end of the platform. Uh-huh. Wait a minute. What is it? It's a train coming. Oh. Express, Pete. It ain't, it ain't stopping. Well, come on. Louis, that looks like the locker's down there. Yeah. Now, let's just hope they got number 2177. We'll just walk by the lockers and take a gander at the numbers as we pass. Okay. Hmm. Do you see what I see? Good old number 2177. Uh-huh. Let's go to work. Here's the key. Okay. Fits, huh? Yeah. yeah. There we are. What's in there? Just what we're looking for. A briefcase. Oh, swell. Let's open it up, huh? Not here, stupid. Come on, let's get going. Wait. What is it? That guy coming toward us. He's the guy from the FBI. You sure? Yeah. Let's round and make the other exit quick. There you are, both of you. Not a chance. Oh, oh, they're coming your way. I see them. Wait, Pete, we're blocked off. All right, you two. Don't move. Nice going, Paul. All right, Webb. Let's have that briefcase. What is this? I don't think I have to explain. Well, Paul, let's call the hospital as soon as we can. Hudson will be happy to know we picked these men up. Hudson's dead. You just heard a rumor that he was dead. I planted that rumor with a fight mob. I hoped it would get back to you. The hospital said he was dead. They were instructed to say that. Hudson's not only alive, but he told us where the bonds were. He also told us that you probably had the missing key. This is nothing but lies. I think you'll change your mind when Hudson's testimony sends you both away for a long, long time. Pete Webb and his henchman, Louis Slater, were tried in a federal court and given 20 years for violating the National Stolen Property Act. They were then turned over to local authorities and sentenced to an additional long term for attempted murder. And thus, your FBI performed a double function in tonight's case. First, they apprehended the guilty criminals. And second, they proved the innocence of an accused man. It's the everyday job of special agents to arrest the violators of certain federal laws. And the story of their success in that job is in their record and in their reputation. But the second function performed in tonight's case is even more important. Because the basic foundation of good law enforcement must be public confidence. The knowledge that the public has that it will not be victimized in order to build up an impressive record of convictions that each individual questioned will be treated as innocent until he is proven guilty. That is why every special agent is instructed when he is appointed a member of the Federal Bureau of Investigation that the primary job of your FBI is to protect the American people and that a major part of that protection is seeing to it that no innocent man be found guilty of a crime he did not commit. In 
just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last word about the Equitable Education Fund. The outstanding feature of this plan is this. It makes sure that your children will be educated no matter what happens. Whether you live or die, they'll get the education you want them to have. So don't wait any longer. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that graphically illustrates the fate of a supposedly honest businessman who chooses to consort with thieves. Its subject, fraudulent bankruptcy. Its title, Merchants of Arson. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society broadcast are adopted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Merchants of Arson, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.